Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> to uh, Thelma Darling. Last name, Sam. Roger. Thelma Roger. Darling. I only asked, Sam. Let's get on with it. Yes, Sam, I'm sorry. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject? Uh, subject, the uh, Quarter Eagle Caper. Uh, dear Thelma Darling. Sam. Yes, sir? Isn't that redundant? Again? The salutation, Sam. Shouldn't it be Dear Thelma or Thelma Darling? But not both? Now, uh, get this, F. It's real deep. Her name is Thelma Darling. I have that, dear. Thelma Roger. Darling, it's a name. Her father was a darling before her. Oh, really, Sam? Can't you take a joke? On the egg type, you should taste the label. Grade double A, fresh. <laughs> uh, dear Thelma Darling, I'm stubborn. Not all of this will be news to you. The part that is will be bad news. The start of it was not a quarter eagle, but a bald eagle. He swooped in through the door of my office, landed in front of my desk, perched on the edge of a chair, and said... My name is Eagle, Mr. Spade. Junius J. Eagle. My card. Uh-huh. Eagle Vending Machine Company. Huh? And they call me the Gumball King. I'm proud of it. Uh, care to join me in a ball, sir? Uh, not while I'm on duty. Ah, oh, that's very good. Our new avocado flavor. <laughs> oh, yes, I've kept the Bay Area chewing for 20 years. And I will not be swerved from my purpose. Bully. Mm. I intend to fight them tooth and nail. Hammer and tongs. To the last ditch. Bravo. But I'll need help. That's why I've come to you. My competitors, Mr. Spade, are leaving no stone unturned in their contemptible campaign to drive me out of business. Uh -huh. Now they've resorted to outright sabotage. In short, they have hired hoodlums to destroy my gumball machines. Mm -hmm. They've already smashed eleven... And they won't be content until they've demolished my entire equipment. Uh, it sounds like a police case to me, Mr. Eagle. Well, well, I've been to the police. No, they don't understand my problem. Gave me a lot of double talk about juvenile delinquents. Ha, my foot. Cutthroat competition. You're sure of that? Well, what would you think? If theft were their motive, they most certainly would steal the pennies from the machines. But what do they take? My gumballs. And why do they do that? Uh, I'll buy it. Oh, well, by all means. Oh, here. Try this. It's our bestseller in Chinatown. We call it uh, Subgum. Uh, better not. I have to drive later. No, you don't have. <clears throat> now, I had the foresight to buy up a three-year supply of chewing gum at non-inflation prices. So I see. Well, you can see with what thoroughness they encompass my ruination. They are not only smashing my machines, they're making off with my gum. And uh, you want me to try and stop them? No, I do not. No. I want you to catch them in the act and find out who is paying them. Well, okay, Mr. Eagle. I'll uh, see what I can do. Good. Good. Now, in this envelope is a list of my machines and their exact locations together with a check for your retainer. Thank you, Mr. Eagle. I'll uh, keep in touch with you. Yeah. Oh, uh, Mr. Eagle, I meant to ask you, how many of these gum machines do you operate here in town? Three hundred. Mm -hmm. And guard them well. Three hundred? Three hundred nuts. Three hundred nuts, Sam? No, uh, 300 gums. Uh, gumball machines. Sam, mm -hmm. isn't it wonderful you took this job? I mean, because of my penny card. Mm hmm? I'm sorry if I wasn't listening. My penny card, Sam. My new one, that is. I've already completed my Lincoln series, and now I'm collecting Indian heads. <sighs> Scalps? No, Sam. Pennies. Mm -hmm. You see, this is the card. And these little slots you see right there, that's where you put the pennies. Mm. And they're classified according to the date and the mint where they're manufactured. Mm. Now, you see, Sam, see where the little S is on these? Mm. Now, that's for the San Francisco mint. Mm. And uh, the D, that's for Denver. Figures. And the ones with nothing, that's for Washington, D.C. Yeah, well, that's a very nice hobby. Uh, pardon me. Uh, um, 300 gumball machines. You see, that's what I had in mind, Sam. All those pennies. Indian head pennies are scarce, Sam. You have to go through a lot of pennies to find even one. Honestly, sometimes when I go past one of those penny machines, that's all I can do. Oh. F, this is all right between you and me, but don't ever mention your hobby to Mr. Eagle. No, no, I won't. Riddle me this, sweetheart. How does one detective guard 300 gumball machines scattered all over the city? Well, if they're going to smash all of them, you could just pick out one in the middle and somewhere and wait. No good. 
If it's an organized plan of sabotage, there might be some pattern. You seem to have given this some thought, though, Effie. How would you pick them? In the busy places, where they'd have more pennies. But they're not after the pennies. They take the gum. Well, then, maybe the quiet sections, where they don't sell much gum. Well, they've knocked over 11 so far, here, there, and everywhere. Busy spots, dead spots, no pattern at all. You know, Effie, hmm? maybe I've bitten off more than I can chew. I uh, wasn't sold on Mr. Eagle's theory that the caper was organized sabotage, but I decided to test it out anyway. I learned the operation did follow a pattern, unless it was coincidence that the 11 machines knocked over the previous night were the same 11 machines that had been refilled that afternoon. I checked with the Eagle Company's maintenance man and learned that only five had been refilled today. I picked the one that looked like the easiest to knock over. It was the one in the doorway of a darkened loft building near the Siemens hiring hall on Drum Street. At 9 in the p.m., I strolled down there. The block was deserted. I took a plant in the adjacent doorway and talked to myself until just before midnight. Then I shot up. My uh, heart skipped a beat as she passed under the light. Red hair. My secretary? Then I noticed how she was dressed. Not on the salary I pay her. She paused before the gum machine, opened a large handbag, stripped off her long black gloves, dropped them in her purse, and took out a small Boy Scout-type hatchet. She went at it with the enthusiasm of Carrie Nation busting up a saloon. I edged around the doorway as she bent over the mess of pennies and gumballs at her feet. When she reached out her hand, I took one more step, and that was all. She was up on her feet facing me, and I saw that hatchet sailing through the air straight at me. Hey! Now see what you've done. Yeah, I'm sorry. I won't let it happen again, I hope. Well, don't just stand there. Let's get out of here. That noise, it'll bring the police down on us. Yeah, you're right. Uh, no, not that way. The alley. And that's how I met you, Thelma, darling. Pausing only to pick up an Indian head penny for luck, I escorted you through the alley to Washington, up Washington's salon, jogged through Front Street, and followed that to Market, where we entered the happy hour bar and grill by way of the kitchen. You proceeded unfalteringly to the darkest booth. We sat down and caught our breath. You ordered a pirate's dream. Uh, by the way, I did get that recipe. Lime juice, grenadine, passion fruit, a sprig of mint, and six jiggers of rum. After two swallows, I heard myself saying, I... <clears throat> Now aren't you ashamed of yourself? But, Sam, why should I be? After what I've been through, I think I deserve a drink. <sighs> I didn't mean that. I uh, meant throwing that hatchet at me. I thought you were Merle. Who's Merle? Why, he works for Mr. Chiselhurst. Yeah, that figures. Now tell me who Mr. Chiselhurst is. Not who he works for, just who he is. He was acting as my agent for the sale of the pearl. Well, Natch, Natch. Now, look, please, don't make me say what pearl. It's called the Black Pearl of Galila Bay. Uh, my brother brought it back from the South Pacific when he was in the war. Oh, yes. When he went to prison, he gave it to me to keep for him. Uh -huh. So you decided to sell it? I had no choice. I needed the money desperately to finance his appeal. Finance it comes up next week. Mm -hmm. If I don't get that pearl back, I don't know what I'll do. You've got to help me. <clears throat> uh, what makes you think it's in a gumball machine? Mr. Chiselhurst took the pearl to show to a man named Junius Eagle, and that's when it disappeared. Mr. Eagle decided not to buy. And when Mr. Chiselhurst returned to the hotel... Eagle had found the pearl and substituted a ball of blackjack oh. gum. Then what? Mr. Chiselhurst had Merle follow him. Nothing happened the first two days. But day before yesterday, he followed him to his warehouse and saw him drop a single ball of gum into a barrel of them that was waiting to be loaded onto a truck. Mm -hmm. The pearl must have been hidden in it. Why else would he do a thing like that? Uh-huh. He would put a valuable pearl in a machine where anybody could buy it for a penny. I suppose it'd be safe for a few days. I don't know how these machines work. Well, now you know why I had to break those machines. No. -uh. You don't believe me? Mm-mm. -mm. Well, what are you going to do? Check the psycho wards and find out which one you escaped from. Hello? Uh, Mr. Eagle? Uh, speaking. Spade. Oh, yeah, I just got in. I, um, I've been out making my monthly collection. Mm-hmm. Hey, I want to talk to you. You're falling down on my job. Another of my machines. Yeah, I know. Drum Street. I nailed the hoodlum. Ah. Who's he working for? Uh, let me ask you one. 
Did a man named Chiselhurst ever try to sell you a black pearl? Hello, you still on the line? You stopped chewing. Uh, yes. I think you better come over to my house. Oh, right away. Hello. Hello. Nuts. When I came out of the phone booth, I wasn't surprised to find that you had flown the coop, darling, if I may call you by your last name. But I was surprised at what I found at my client's house. I rang the front doorbell and waited. Nothing happened. Then, through the glass door, I saw a man rush out on the landing at the top of the stairs. He half ran, half stumbled down the long flight to the entrance hall, yanked open the door, and tried to shove past me. I grabbed him. Get out of my way. Wait a minute. Let go. i got to get a doctor. You're bleeding. No, 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 not me. I've got to get a doctor. Why don't you phone? They ripped the wires out. Now let go, or it'll be your fault if he dies. I memorized his mug, lifted his wallet as we unclenched, and let him go. On the way upstairs, I checked his ID cards. Higgins, Morris L., employer, Eagle Vending Machine Company, occupation, maintenance supervisor. On the floor of the room at the top of the stairs was quite a sight. The floor of the room was covered almost completely with pennies. In the middle of it, sprawled forward like a miser who had been attacked while counting his hoard, was Junius J. Eagle. The wound in the back of his neck could have been caused by a small hatchet. There was a bookkeeper's account sheet open across the desk and scrawled across the neat rows of figures. There were three words. Spade, quarter, and eagle. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. to the Quarter Eagle Keeper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. That you, Higgins? Uh, yeah, yeah. Save yourself the trip upstairs. There's nothing you can do for him. Oh, dead, huh? Yeah. Well, I guess he won't need that doctor I called. We can use one anyway. Did you tell the Doc Eagle had been stabbed? Yeah, sure, sure I did. Yeah, well, that means the law will come with him or ahead of him. But I don't get it. He must have been killed for the money, but why didn't they take the pennies? They should have. It'd look better for you if they had. You're that detective he hired, huh? That's right. Now, look, Higgins, we haven't got much time. If you want to find out who killed your boss, spill everything you know to me now before the cops get here. Because they're going to hold you, and they'll hold me, too, if they find me here. But I don't know a thing, Spade. I just found him like that. How did you get in the house? I have a key. He gave me one, so when I came here to pick up the pennies, he wouldn't have to come all the way down to let me in. For now, tell the cops the door was open. Did he always collect the pennies from the machines himself? Yeah, yeah. He was a coin collector as a hobby. He liked to go through them and save out the odd ones. You always pick up the money at 1 in the a.m.? Oh, no. No, he called me tonight a little past midnight, and he asked me to come right over. Hey, look, look, you've got to believe that. I do. He said the same thing to me. What do you know about a man named Chiselhurst? Chiselhurst? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the name of the guy that ran into my truck yesterday coming down the California incline near Grant. He slammed right into the rear of my truck. Uh, I tangled with his chauffeur, some punk kid. Named Merle? Yes, yeah, that's what they called him. And there was a dame in the car, too, a redhead. Any report on the accident? No, no, the cop took it down on the, on the beat there. There wasn't no damage. Sounds like we haven't got much more time here. Oh. <laughs> what exactly happened the night the first gum machine on your route was smashed up? Come on. Well, first off, I went to a bowling alley on Turk Street and removed our machine there. It was discontinued. Wait a minute, where did you take it? Back to the shop? Oh, wait a second, I got it here in my book. Come on, come on. All right, I'm hurrying. Uh, here it is, 11864. Mm -hmm. No, no, I exchanged it for an out-of-order down on Drum Street. Did you leave the pennies in it? Oh, sure, sure, they only get collected once a month. How much gum? Was in it. About half full. I didn't refill it until today. Yeah. What's your system on the refill operation? Well, I carry about four extra machines in the truck. When I go to fill a machine, I take one of the extras already filled out of the truck and trade for the empty. Yeah. Then I fill the empty one in the truck, and that saves me from carrying the bag around. Now, is there anything else I can tell you? Yeah. Huh? Does uh, Quarter Eagle mean anything to you? No, no. Okay, now where's the back door? Uh, that Quarter Eagle. What was it? Was it a wrestling hole like the Half Nelson? I thought of asking Effie, but I was afraid she'd know. I was sure that if I could find Chiselhurst, I could get all the answers at once. That collision between his car and the rear end of Higgins' truck was a good lead in more ways than one. It meant that at least part of your story, darling, was true. But you neglected to tell me that you, Chiselhurst, and Merle had been tailing Higgins' appointed rounds of the gumball machine. I checked the police report on the accident. 
The car was registered in Great Britain. The report said transient, no local address, and so to bed. I dreamed it was next Thanksgiving, and I was eating a roast of quarter eagle. Then it turned into crow. Good morning, sir. Do you wish to place a classified ad? Uh, good, good morning to you, madam. Indeed, I do. Kindly write it on this blank. Uh, kindly read it off this blank. Well, Quarter Eagle, interested parties, apply Sam Spade. Sucker, three, se- three seven, five, nine, six. That's right. That's uh, nine words, sir. I'll have to charge you for three lines anyway. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, but it's not fit the print. <laughs> Barney's Beanery. Uh, Mr. Spade? Uh, yeah. Uh, you got it for sale, the quarter eagle? Who's speaking? I am speaking. Sergei Zacharias. Zacharias. Uh, you are numismatist? Uh, no, this is Mr. Spade himself. Uh, look, I'd like to talk to you personally. Where can I reach you? Oh, I am by my shop, two door from Belvedere Coffee Shop on O'Farrell Street. Okay, Mr. Zacharias, I'll be right over. <laughs> Why don't you do more talking last night? My client might be alive if you had. Oh, it's terrible. But how could I have known? You knew about the quarter eagle. Why did you spend that yarn about the pearl? How did you find out about it? Dead men sometimes do tell tales. Surely you don't think that I had anything to do with that. He was only hacked to death with a hatchet like the one you threw at me. That makes you look fine. All right, I killed him if that'll make you listen to me. Sam, don't go into that shop. Please, it's, it's a, a trap. Suit. You don't know that man, Zacharias. He's the cause of all our troubles. You mean he sold you that hatchet? Sam, please! Quit clawing me. Let go. I won't allow you to go in there. I won't. I won't. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here? What's the occasion of the squabble? Oh, well, no, it's Mr. Spade. Yeah, Clancy, this dame here just tried to pick my pocket. Oh! Ah, Pickpocket, is it? Glory be in such a pretty one, too. Never mind that, Clancy. Just have it locked up. I'll be down later to prefer charges. There, come on. Uh, hello? Anybody home? Okay, Shums. Just keep on walking. Straight through the back room. One move and I rip you wide open. Yeah, yeah. Better not, Merle. Your boss might not like that. Smart guy. Knows everybody's name. Oh, my dear sir. Uh, a most propitious meeting. Uh, you, you've uh, brought the quarter eagle? Where's Zacharias? Uh, he's uh, resting at the moment, in yonder closet. Oh, no, 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 uh, not dead. Merely under restraint, uh, bound and gagged. A necessary precaution. Well, uh, uh, shall we talk turkey, or rather, uh, uh, eagle? Tell your punk to take that knife out of my ribs. Who's a punk? Uh, now, 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 Merle. There's been quite enough violence. Check. I think I'll take that knife. <laughs> Leave it there. Now, sit down. Uh, Merle, Merle. Oh, headstrong boy. Uh, now, as to the quarter eagle, I'm willing to pay a reasonable reward for its recovery, but first I must tell you that Miss Darling, for whom I'm acting as agent for the sale of the coin, is indeed the legal owner, despite anything Mr. Zacharias may have told you to the contrary. Uh, what would you say to uh, $500? Uh, I would say no dice. Uh, 1000 I would say I'm still listening. Uh, sir, you you seem to exaggerate the value of that tiny gold piece. It was worth one human life to somebody. That sounds like more than a thousand bucks to me. Uh, you may find the market valuation of that particular mintage of the quarter eagle in my coin catalog. Ten thousand dollars. But, sir, uh, that valuation is based upon the mistaken belief that there were only two in existence. It was while rummaging in her grandmother's attic that Miss Darling came upon a third. Uh, when she brought it to me, I could scarcely credit it. It was a matter of official record. The two specimens had been stamped out when the die broke. And then it came to me. There must have been a third. Uh, namely, the coin which was in that rude stamping press when the die broke. Uh, closer examination of the quarter eagle now in your possession uh, revealed certain markings. Yeah. Some uh, defective feathers in the war bonnet on the obverse. Uh-huh. And a cleavage in the numeral four of the date, 1841. Yeah, yeah, all right. So how much is it worth? Uh, uh, well, as I say, the, the price last paid was 10000 I think we may safely assume it would bring several times that amount in today's market. But only, mind you, if, if but two specimens, not three, are in existence. Uh-huh. So you decided it would be more profitable to clam up about it and see what the owners of the other two coins would pay to keep this one off the market. Precisely, sir. How did it get in that gum machine? Ah, 
therein lies a tale. Uh, keep it short, will you? I'm getting hungry. Uh, well, sir, I brought the quarter eagle for Mr. Zachariah. Yeah. Who was acting as agent for the owner of the other two coins. Um, uh, an Australian sheep herder, I believe. Mm -hmm. Retired now. Yes, I'm uh, glad. Well, not to put too fine a point on it, Mr. Zacharias's offer was so poor that uh, I, I, I took umbrage. Oh, you didn't? Uh, I gave him a caning and left the premises. Really? But I'd gone no farther than the half a league up Turk Street when I became aware that two ruffians were skulking at my heels. No. Uh, sent, I had no doubt, by Mr. Zacharias uh, to rob me of the quarter eagle. Egad, sir. Uh, precisely. Uh, knowing full well that they would not dare to strike in a populous, well-lighted resort, yes. I entered a bowling alley at the corner of Hyde Street. Uh, 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 no pun intended. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, but there upon the wall, I spied a penny vending machine, and the word eagle caught my eye. Uh, association of ideas, no doubt. No doubt. But that, sir, is how I came to put the quarter eagle into Mr. Eagle's gum machine. Yes, I think I can take it from there. When you went back, the machine had been taken out by the Eagle Company's maintenance man, right? Uh, not quite. I caught him in the very act of removing the machine and followed him out of the building. Yeah, but then you lost track of the machine. I uh, found out why. Never mind that now. What I want to know is who followed Mr. Eagle home the night he was killed? Oh, uh, uh, I I'd rather not say. Then all bids are off. Uh, one moment, Mr. Spade. Yeah? Uh, am I to infer that your price for the quarter eagle necessarily includes uh, uh, bringing the murderer to justice? Just that, Mr. Chislehurst. <sighs> Well, I suppose there's nothing for it but to make the supreme sacrifice. Merle. Me? You double-crossing pig? But now, Merle, you know perfectly well you did away with poor Mr. Eagle. Shut up. I'll cut you to pieces. Gross insubordination. You deliberately exceeded your instructions. I wanted you to apply only sufficient violence to recover the coin. Instead, you seized the opportunity to satisfy your nauseating bloodlust. Really, Merle? Cut you to pieces. I'll cut you to pieces. Oh, all right, drop... Ow! Drop the shift, Merle. Nice, happy punk. Yeah, that, 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 that was a near thing, sir. The base and gratitude of that boy. Oh, well, what's done is done. Uh, when may I expect delivery of the quarter eagle? I uh, didn't answer him. To cover my embarrassment, I gagged him... Manacled him to Merle and delivered the package marked one murderer, one accessory to the dumbfounded minions of the law. And that, Thelma, darling, I regret to inform you, is still the crop. After I'd sprung you from the pokey, I got hold of Higgins and we went through every coin out of every eagle gumball machine in the city of San Francisco. It couldn't happen, but it did. Your quarter eagle is, shall we say, no place? Period. End of report. Say. I'm disappointed in you. Well, so am I, sweetheart. But I'll forgive you if you found even one Indian head penny from my penny card. Yeah, yeah, just one from that machine on Drum Street. Oh, thank uh, you. There you are, sweetheart. Oh, thank you. And it's an old one. And no older than I feel. Go type that up. Sam, this money is, is counterfeit. Are you sure? It's joke money. It says two and one half dollars. Hmm? You see where it should say one cent? Two and a half dollars. Let me see that. Two and a half dollars. If an eagle is a ten dollar gold piece, what is a two and a half dollar gold piece? Oh, no, let me see. Five dollars would be half. <gasps> Damn. Right. A quarter eagle. Yeah, that's just dirt on it. See, it's, it's gold, oh, really. Oh, look at it shine. Like the stars in your eyes, sweetheart. Oh, you darling. Mm -hmm. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff, Lorene Tuttle. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, we find ourselves in Dr. Watson's comfortable book-lined study. A blazing log crackles cheerily on the hearth. The cordial smile of welcome beams on the good doctor's friendly countenance. Well, good evening, Mr. Bell. Sit down, sit down. Thank you. 
<sighs> it isn't often you find such a perfect combination as this. Cozy room, cheerful fire, comfortable armchair. Not to mention an expert storyteller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bell. You're very kind. A setup like this takes your mind off your worries and troubles. So don't be surprised if I just sit back and relax and let you carry on. Well, that's what I'm here for. I've always said there's nothing like a good detective story for mental recreation. Most of our great men of affairs have been addicted to them, you know. Presidents, prime ministers, scientists, and businessmen. And the Sherlock Holmes adventures still head the list of all detective stories. What's it going to be tonight? Well, tonight, as I said last week, I'm going to tell you about the greatest shock that Sherlock Holmes ever gave me. The greatest shock? It must have been some voltage. You'll, you'll find that out, Mr. Bell, as soon as you had your little talk with our listeners. <laughs> of course. Men, well-groomed hair helps so much in giving a man that prosperous, clean-cut appearance. And I'm sure you'll be interested to hear why Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top-flight executives by men at the top. Kreml never plasters the hair down with sticky goo, which makes your hair and scalp feel so dirty. It never gives hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look. You see, Kreml is a very highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a unique and utterly different combination of hair grooming ingredients that's never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps unruly hair so neatly in place longer, with such a handsome, healthy-looking luster. What I especially like about Kreml is that after you use it, you can run your hand back over your hair and your hair never feels sticky or dirty. No greasy film comes off on your hand or your hat band. Yet Kreml keeps hair in perfect order from morning till night, looking so healthy and handsome. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the greatest shock Sherlock Holmes ever gave you? Well, it was in the second year of my married life. I hadn't seen Holmes for almost a month due to having successfully resumed my medical practice. When one day I received an urgent note from Mrs. Hudson. Mrs. Hudson, she was Holmes' landlady in Baker Street. She certainly was, and a long-suffering woman she was, too. Why she stood for Holmes, I never could fathom. His habits were calculated to try the patience of a saint. Yes, he was easily the worst tenant in London, and yet Mrs. Hudson adored him. A case of the king can do no wrong. Exactly, and yet she stood in the deepest awe of him and never dared interfere, however dangerous his proceedings might seem. So you can imagine my feelings when our note said that Mr. Holmes was in a dreadful state and she considered it serious enough to disobey his commands and to send for me. Well, I snatched my hat and medical case and set out for Baker Street post-haste. A terrified Mrs. Hudson greeted me on the doorstep. Her face stained with tears. Oh, Dr. Watson, thank God you got my note. Come in, sir, come in. Well, Mrs. Hudson, what's up? What's happened to Mr. Holmes? Oh, Dr. Watson, it's terrible. Just to see him lying there like that, I, I can't stand it any longer. He's breaking my heart. Oh, no, 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 Mrs. Hudson, this won't do you now. Pull yourself together. What's the matter with Mr. Holmes? Oh, he's dying. What? Yes, sir. For three days he's been sinking. Hasn't taken a mouthful of food. I, I doubt if he'll last a day out. Well, why didn't you send before me before? He, he wouldn't let me. Oh, you know what he's like, Dr. Watson, when he's got his mind set against yes, anything. Yes, indeed I do. But this morning, when I went in and saw him there, his bones sticking out of his face, his great eyes all bright with fever, and his lips with that awful crust oh, on them, and his hands twitching and twitching, I couldn't stand it any longer. I couldn't stand by and watch him die, could I? I thought to myself, orders or no, I'm sending for you. Yes, I should hope so. So I said to him, but Mr. Holmes, this is an extremity. He didn't say anything. I don't think he even heard me, Doctor. He's out of his head most of the time, croaking and moaning to himself. Oh, Dr. Watson, it's a pitiful sight. Poor Mr. No, Holmes. No, 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 perhaps it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> I pray heaven it's not. Well, I'll go up and see what's to be done. Oh, yes, sir. But I'm afraid he's not long for this world. Poor Mr. Now, now, Mrs. Hudson, you pull yourself together. He mustn't know how you feel about him. It'd upset him. He hates to be pitied. I'd, uh, I'd better go in alone. Yes, sir. Holmes? I say, Holmes? I, I doubt if he can hear you, sir. You'd better go right in. Very well. Oh. Oh. Good heavens. He is sick. Oh, Dr. Watson, you must save him. Shh, Mrs. Hudson, you, you stay outside. He's running round and round in a circle. Faster, faster, he's catching up to us all. Holmes. Holmes, old fellow, it's me. Eh? Holmes, it's me, Watson. Don't you know me? Watson? Watson? Oh, yes. I, I seem to remember. 
What? Of course. So she sent for you after all. I, I wondered how long she could hold out. Holmes! My, my poor fellow! Yes, we seem to have fallen on evil days. Hey, Watson? Never thought you'd see me in this shape, did you? Oh, I fall bear at your funeral and now look at me. <laughs> it's, it's all right, old chap. We'll fix you up. Have you about again in no time. Just let me take your pulse. Uh, stand back, Watson, stand back. If you value your life, don't touch me. Don't touch me. But why? Because I was, wish it. Isn't that enough? Well, I only wanted to help. Then do as I say. I, I know what's wrong with me. I, I'm the only man in London who does it. It's a terrible disease and contagious, that's it, Watson. Contagious by touch. So keep your distance or you'll catch it, too. Great heavens, Holmes, do you suppose that matters to me at a time like this? It wouldn't affect me in the case of a stranger. Do you imagine it prevent me from doing my duty to, to my best friend? Stand back, Watson. It's out of your power. You could do nothing. If you stand where you are, I'll talk you. You mustn't excite me. It, it might be fatal. Very well. If I must, but... Uh... What is this sickness? A colic disease from Sumatra. Only a few men understand it. I, I contracted it down along the docks from the Oriental sailors. I've been doing some recent research down there. It had a medical criminal aspect. Very interesting, Watson. Very interesting Asiatic diseases. Asiatic cruelty. Strange pathological possibilities. But water doesn't run uphill. It's funny, eh, Watson? Water? You, you can't write in water. I, I've tried. I, I've tried, but you, but you can't. Holmes, you're not yourself. A sick man is like a child. You could be master elsewhere, but when it comes to the sick room, it's time for me to take charge. I'm going to examine your symptoms and treat you. Stop it. If I've got to have a doctor, at least get me one I can trust. Holmes. Don't you trust me? As a friend, certainly, but facts are facts. You're just a general practitioner of not very much knowledge or experience and very often muddled. Yes, decidedly muddled. Holmes, that remark is unworthy of you. It shows the state of your nerves. Very well. What do you know about Tapanuli fever? Or the black form of the corruption? Well, I've never heard of either of them. You see? Very well, let me call in Dr. Ainstree. He's the greatest living authority on tropical diseases. And he happens to be in London now. I can get him here inside half an hour if you'll just... No, no, I won't have him. I won't have him. I'm the one who's sick. I'll be cured my way or not at all. There's only one man who can save me. Oh. Oh, dear. I, I, I'm exhausted. I wonder how battery feels when it pours electricity into a non-conductor. Holmes... Holmes, you're wandering again. Let me at least pour you a glass of water. What a mess this table is in. Don't want water. Give me the moon. Hello? What's this curious little ivory box? I've never seen that before. Don't touch it, Watson. Don't touch it. But, Holmes... It's mine. I won't have it touched. Give it to me. Handle it with tongs. Like this. That's better. It's mine. Yeah. Mine. Holmes, Holmes. Get back into bed, the Simpsons. And, and give me that box. No, no, you can't have it. It's, it's mine. I'm going to take it to bed with me. It's mine. My own little ivory box. Nobody shall take it from me. Very well. Now, now keep covered up. Uh, that's better. You'll kill yourself if you aren't careful. Watson. I say, Watson. Yes? Have you any change in your pocket? Yes. Any silver? A good deal. How many half crowns? Half crowns, let's see. One, two, three, five. Not enough, Watson, not enough. However, they'll have to do. Place them in your watch pocket, Watson. Very well. Now, put the rest of your money in your left hand trousers pocket. Hmm? Thank you. Yes, but why? It will balance you so much better that way. Holmes, this is the end. You're wondering. You're delirious. I'm going to get Ains still, or the man you mentioned. I don't care which. Very well. If you must, let it be Mr. Calverton Smith. Calverton Smith? I never heard of him. Possibly not, Watson. It may surprise you to know that the only man on earth who understands this disease isn't a medical man. He's a planter. A planter? Yes, millionaire rubber planter. An outbreak of this malady on his plantation in Sumatra caused him to study the disease. He's now in London. Good. What's his address? 13 
Lower Burke Street. Uh, 13 Lower Burke Street. Very well. I'll fetch him at once. I warn you, he may not come. There's no good feeling between us. His, his nephew died, you see, Watson. I, I had suspicions of foul play. I, I told his uncle so. The boy died horribly. You must soften him, Watson. Describe my condition. Be beg him. Pray him. Get him here by any means. He he's the only one who can save me. You will bring him to me, Watson. Don't worry, old fellow. I'll bring him here and have to knock him unconscious to do it. No, you must persuade him to come. But be sure to return ahead of him. Not with him, Watson. Ahead of him, you understand? Very well. It's vital, Watson, vital. One thing more. Yes? I'm worried about oysters, Watson. What? They're so Why prolific. oysters? They're so prolific. Pretty soon the world will be overrun by oysters. Oh, Holmes, you're off again. There was I. <laughs> Strange how the brain controls the brain. You still here, Watson? I, I thought you'd gone long ago. Well, I'm going at once. I'll be back in no time. If you want anything, ring for Mrs. Hutz. First, the ocean will be overrun with them. millions of them, millions of oysters. Oh, Dr. Watson, how is he? Here's Mr. Listlard of Scotland Yard. He dropped in to inquire about Mr. Holmes. Hello, Dr. Watson. How do things stand? How's the old boy? He's a very sick man, I'm afraid, Lestrade. Uh, yes, yes, I heard some rumor to that effect. Lestrade, you're a cold-blooded fish. Ah, uh, possibly. But I think I'll stay around until you return. How about a dish of tea in the back parlor? Hey, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, you. Speaking of tea at a time like this, I'm ashamed of you. With Mr. Holmes lying upstairs practically on his deathbed. All right, I'll bring you a cup. But I hope it chokes you, that I do. Nine, eleven, thirteen. Ah, here we are. Oh, suppose he's not at home. He must be. He must be. Yes, sir. Is Mr. Calverton Smith in? Yes, sir. Will you take my card in to him at once and tell him it's it's urgent? Yes, sir, but uh, he's in his study working. He don't like to be disturbed. But it's a matter of life and death, don't you understand? I must see him. Here, here. Perhaps uh, this will help. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> I'll do my best. Will you step inside, sir? I'll be a minute. A gentleman to see you, Mr. Smith, sir. Says it's urgent. Who is he? What does he want? Oh, here's his card, sir. Watson? Dr. Watson? I don't know him. How often have I told you, Staples, I'm not to be disturbed when I'm working in my study? But he says he must see you. It's a matter of life and death, he says. Tell him to go to blazes. I'm not at home. I won't see him. Tomorrow morning... Oh, perhaps. but you must, sir. It can't wait. I won't leave until I've told you What's the whole... What's this? What's the meaning of this intrusion? I said tomorrow, didn't I? I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, but I'm see you now. It's about Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? Sherlock Holmes, did you say? Yes, I've just come from him. Well, well, but what about Holmes? He's desperately ill, dying. That's why I've come to you. Holmes dying? Oh, dear, dear. I'm sorry to hear it. I only know him through some business dealings, of course, but I have a great respect for his talents and his character. You see, he is an amateur of crime, as I am of disease. Uh, for him, the villain. For me, the microbe. Uh, yes, I, I believe my offenders are even more deadly than his. Mr. Smith, it was because of your special knowledge of Eastern diseases that Sherlock Holmes has sent for you. Eastern diseases? Eastern diseases, dear me. Don't tell me that he's contracted some oriental disease. Yes, Mr. Smith. He's been making some professional inquiries on the docks, working among the oriental sailors. Oh, so that's it. Oh, dear, dear, I, I trust the matter is not as grave as you suppose. How long has he been ill? About three days. Uh, delirious? Yes, from time to time. Oh, dear me, this does sound serious. Yes, it would be inhuman not to go to his aid, wouldn't it? The case is certainly exceptional. I'll come with you at once, Dr. Uh, Watson. With me, well, uh, you see that... Uh, well, I'm afraid I, I can't return with you, sir. I, I have some other appointments, uh, uh, patients that I must see. I'll, uh, uh, I'll see you later. Oh, yes, 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 sir, sir. I quite understand. I'll go alone. Oh, yes, that would be better in any case. We must avoid too much excitement, too many people. Uh, yes, Dr. Watson, you can rely on my being with Mr. Holmes within half an hour. <laughs> Thank you. 
In just a moment, we'll return to Sherlock Holmes and find out if Mr. Culverton Smith is able to... to cure the detective's strange malady. But first, more and more men today are beginning to realize they should take better care of the hair they've got. Remember, if you want your hair to look healthy and handsome, you need a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kremel hair tonic? Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day long and always gives it such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kremel stimulates circulation right in the surface of the scalp, leaving your scalp feeling so alive, so invigorated. At the same time, Kremel removes loose dandruff. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, remember Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel to keep your scalp more hygienic. Your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, I see what you meant by the greatest shock Sherlock Holmes ever gave you. And I can hardly wait to hear the rest of the story. What happened after you'd seen Mr. Culver? Well, Smith? I hurried back to Baker Street as fast as I could, just as Holmes had instructed me to. Mrs. Hudson met me at the door. Any change, Mrs. Hudson? Has anything happened while I was gone? No, Dr. Watson. He called me in to light the gas a few minutes ago. He won't have a top full. He says it hurts his eyes. How did he look? Oh, a little better, I should say. He's awful weak, but he's not delirious anymore. Good, good. Where's Lestrade? Oh, he's about somewhere. Down in the kitchen, annoying the cook, most likely. I never did see such a man for eating. Heartless brute. Well, I'll go up to Mr. Holmes. Here I am, Holmes. Did you see him? Yes, yes, he's coming. Admirable, Watson. Admirable. I knew I could count on you. What did you tell him? I told him about the sailors in the East End and uh, that you were delirious. Quite right. Yes. You can now disappear from the scene. What? I'll do no such thing. I'm going to wait and hear his opinion. So you shall, Watson, so you shall, but not where he can see you. There's no hiding place in the room except the space behind the head of my bed. Suppose you crawl in there. Crawl in there? Watson, I'm a sick man. I must be human. It's got to be behind the bed or not at all. I don't want you discussing the case over my dead, my inert body. You can hear what he says perfectly from your hiding place. Oh, there he is now. What's it to be, Watson? Behind the bed or out of the room? Oh, very well, if you insist. I'll... I'll wedge myself in there. There's not much room in here. Quick, Watson, quick if you love me. Oh, it's a tight fit. I can't, I can't move a muscle. Good. Don't speak. Don't move. Whatever happens, don't budge. Just listen. Listen to every word. Don't move. Don't move. It's a gentleman by the name of Smith, Mr. Holmes. He says you sent for him. It's all right. I understand the case. You can leave us. Yes, sir. Oh. So there you are, my fine fellow. Pretty bad fix, eh? Oh. Holmes. Oh. Holmes, can you hear me? It's me, Smith. You? I... I hardly dared hope you'd come. I should think not. But here I am. Coals of fire, Holmes. Huh? Coals of fire. Very good. Very noble of you. You're the only man who can save me. You realize that, eh? Do you know what is the matter with you? The, the same the same thing that killed your nephew. Yes, dear Victor. He was dead on the fourth day. Strong, hearty fellow he was, too. Surprising that you should both contract such a strange, out-of-the-way disease in the heart of London. A disease, too, of which I had made a special study. Very smart of you to notice that in Victor's case, but rather uncharitable to suggest that it was cause and effect. Oh, I... I, I knew that you did it. Oh, you did, did you? Well, you can't prove it. You've got to find nerves spreading reports like that about me and then crawling to me for help when you're in trouble. Oh, don't... Don't hold it against me. Let 
Bygones be bygones. I'll put it out of my head. Oh. Only cure me and I'll forget it. Forget what? About Victor Savage's debt. You've as good as admitted it, but I'll forget it. I, I swear I will. It'll make little difference whether you forget or remember. You'll never see the inside of a witness box. Oh, no, quite another shape box, my dear Holmes, I assure you. I'm not interested in my nephew anymore. It's you I'm after. So, you think you contracted this disease among the sailors, eh? That's the only way I can account for it. And you think you have brains. Consider yourself smart, don't you? Well, I'm smarter than you are, Mr. Holmes. Think back. Think back. Can't you remember any other way you could have got this thing? I can't think. My mind's gone. For heaven's sake, help me. Yes, I'm going to help you. I want you to understand how this happened to you. I want you to know before you die. Uh, oh, oh, it's terrible. Give me something to stop the pain. I... Oh, so now it's painful, eh? Yes, the natives used to do some squealing toward the end. Now listen... Can't you remember any unusual incident in your life just before your symptoms began? Uh, no. Uh, no, nothing. Else. Something came by post. Remember that? I'm too sick to remember. Well, I'll help you. You hear me? You shall hear me. Uh, yes, I... Oh, oh. The pain, it's, it's killing you me. You remember a box? A little ivory box. It came by post on Wednesday. Do you remember? Yes, yes. It, it had a spring inside. I, I cut myself... It, it true blood. It was a joke. That was no joke, you fool. That spring was covered with the germs of this disease. Who asked you to cross my path? You've got what was coming to you. I sent that box and it has killed you. I, I remember the box, the, the little ivory box. There it is on the table. Ah, so it is. Yes, by George, the very one. Well, it may as well leave the room in my pocket. Here, Mr. Sherlock Holmes... Here goes your last shred of evidence. Oh, you can have it, only save me, save me. Now at last you know the truth. You know I've killed you. You knew so much about the fate of Victor Savage that I've sent you to share it. Now, now what are you going to do? Do, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Why, now I shall sit here and watch you die. I... Uh... I can hardly see the, the light. The, turn up the gas. The shadows begin to fall, do they? Very well. I'll turn it up so that I may see you better. There. Uh-huh. And now, is there any other little service I can do for you, my friend? Yes, you can give me a match and a cigarette. You... What's the meaning of this? You're not sick? You've been malingering. You're not sick at all. Not sick, just weak. Yes, the best way to act a part is to be it. I give you my word that for three days I haven't touched food, drink, nor tobacco. It, um, it has been rather irksome. Ah, yes, here are the cigarettes. Ah, that's better. Very much better. I hope it chokes you. I've a mind to do it myself. Not so vindictive, my dear Mr. Smith. I fancy I hear Lestrade step on the stair. When you turned up the light, that was his signal to come and get you. Well, you... Come in, Lestrade. Come in. No, you trapped him, Mr. Holmes. Yes. Here's your man. You can arrest him. On what charge, may I ask? The murder of one Victor Savage. And the uh, attempted murder of one Sherlock Holmes. Take him away, Lestrade. Take him away. Oh, no, you don't. I'll knock your head in. Look out, Lestrade. (laughs) It's all right, Mr. M. I've got the handcuffs on him. A nice trap this is, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. It'll bring you to the dock, not me. You asked me to come here to cure you. I was sorry for you, so I came, and now you make charges against me. Insane charges for which you have no proof. My word is as good as yours, Holmes. Remember that? Good heavens, I'd totally forgotten. My dear Watson, a thousand apologies. You can come out now. Uh, about time, too. I'm just about numb crouching behind there all this time. Uh, Mr. Smith, allow me to present my witness, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he found your conversation most enlightening. Well, that settles that. Come on, you. Keep moving. Well, now uh, you're pulling my leg. The, the spring didn't really prick you, did it, Holmes? Uh, no. Uh, well, you see, my dear Watson... Uh, a thing you have to understand is that neither you nor Mrs. Hudson are particularly convincing when it comes to acting. So it was necessary to impress you with the reality of my condition in order to obtain results. 
And then, you may believe that I poo-pooed my your professional ability, but you can put that down as a part of the delirium. I have the highest regard for your talents, both as a doctor and as an historian. Oh, now you're pulling my leg. Look here. You didn't, as I said, really get uh, pricked with that spring, did you? Oh, certainly not. I always handle strange packages with suspicion. Well, what I want to know is how you managed to assume that ghastly appearance. A three days of fasting does not improve anyone's beauty, Watson. For the rest, a bit of Vaseline on the forehead, belladonna in the eye, rouge on the cheekbones, and a crust of beeswax on the lips all produce a rather satisfactory effect. Only, I couldn't afford to let you get too good a look at it. Or take your pulse and temperature. Quite. And now, if you will tell Mrs. Hudson that her invalid has recovered sufficiently to desire large steak with plenty of fried onions... Ah, I've been promising it to myself for hours. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell us about next week's story. But first, girls, many of those beautiful powers models come out here to Hollywood to become movie stars. And I must say, one can't help but be impressed with their gorgeous, lustrous hair. Now, here's how they keep it so shining bright. Powers models use Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying shampoo has been especially developed to actually glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair, revealing all its natural glossy luster and highlights. Yes, and remember, Cremel Shampoo is wonderful for washing children's hair, too. Most emphatically, yes, because there are no harsh caustics or chemicals in Cremel Shampoo. And its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the scalp and hair of all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Girls, if you could only see how beautiful Powers Models hair radiates natural glossy highlights, I'm sure you'd want to try Cremel Shampoo right away. Remember, no other shampoo leaves the hair more shining bright and sparkling clean. Get a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week, I think I'll tell you about the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. Persecuted millionaire? It sounds intriguing, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Bell. In fact, I don't believe that Sherlock Holmes and I ever encountered a problem with such a bizarre and such a fantastic solution. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was dramatized from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Dying Detective. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. This is ABC, the American... William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Distemper is a human failing, but don't ever try blowing the lid of your coffin. You'll only frustrate yourself. A national broadcasting company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A long-legged blonde follows you to the ends of the earth. Don't always feel flattered, friend. She might only be tailing you. (laughs) 
such was my case on the public streets one sultry summer's evening. A doll panting after me, but keeping a discreet 50 or so yards between us. I got a look at her face without turning around. How? A gimmick standard with cops. A pocket mirror held in front of me. My pursuer was good-looking, with twin dimples in her cheeks and an aristocratic hook to her eyebrows. I let her follow me into a cocktail lounge. Inside, I watched her fidget at the far end of the mahogany bar for a couple of minutes. When the sweat began to spoil her makeup, I joined her. Hello. Look, you're wrong if you... Uh, if I confuse you with a pickup, I don't. Well, then... Cry wolf if I'm wrong, but I get the impression we've been inseparable for hours. Inseparable? I left my office at 345. I've been east, north, south, and west, and now it's 515. In all that time, the shadow I threw was you. Well? No, you're right. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but follow you. I'm your dream man? I meant nothing personal. Oh, that deflates me. If I can explain. Do. At 345, outside your office building, I didn't dare come up. Why not? I discovered that I myself was being followed. Oh. You were strongly recommended to me confidential investigator I could trust implicitly. To whom do I owe that bouquet? Never mind. I followed you hoping we could eventually talk somewhere without being observed. Like this. What makes you think we're alone with each other now? What makes... You mean the person following me? I do mean. I haven't seen him for the last hour. Shadows don't generally quit any more than you did. Now look around. He's not in here. Describe him. Unusually small man with an enormous head. Totally bald. He wore an odd candy-striped suit. You're describing a freak. He did look freakish, yes. Tell me, lady, uh, how do you uh, feel generally? I'm quite sane, believe me. Which brings us to your problem. Well, it's... More precisely, my husband's problem. Well, introduce yourself. Vera Baxter. My husband is J.C. Baxter. You say that like J.C. Baxter is a muckamuck. My husband is someone substantial. Rich, upper class, a figure in the business world? All of those things, yes. He hasn't been himself for months. He's morose, secretive. He can't eat, he can't sleep. I believe my husband is submitting to blackmail. Does uh, J.C. know you're aware of his situation? No, he doesn't know. He's always been violent on the subject of his own privacy, his own private affairs. Mr. Craig, I'm frightened for him. And for myself. Then you want me to pinpoint what it is that has your husband in the toil? Yes, watch him. Follow him if need be. See who the persons are who telephone and molest him and... Uh, and? If humanly possible, help my husband out of his predicament. Don't you maybe mean if morally possible? A fellow yielding to blackmail, he's generally a little dirty himself. I played tail on the monkey to J.C. Baxter for 36 hours, on foot and by automobile. J.C. leading the parade in an expensive custom job hardtop. And me rattling behind him in a jalopy no self-respecting junkie would even buy for salvage. I knew the trip wasn't just a waste of gas by the route J.C. was taking. All back roads and the fringe areas where the city began to look like the Sahara Desert. I watched him slow up crossing a small bridge. I could guess what J.C. was up to on the bridge even before I saw the parcel go sailing over the bridge rail. I let him speed off before I stopped. A familiar payoff pattern. Money thrown into a specified area. A blackmailer wanted dough, but didn't want to be identified taking it. I went to see how much was in the parcel. From the weight to the parcel, there was plenty. Plenty was an understatement. I only needed to look to estimate the payoff at $10,000. No bill bigger than a twenty. I restored the parcel. The anonymous caller would find it in the bushes below the bridge. He'd find the dough, and he'd also find me. (laughs) 
The moon was out and the cricket serenade was going full key when somebody came looking for the money. A little guy, not too much taller than the reeds. And a big round head to him, the size of a circus balloon. When he finally found the parcel, I found him flush on the jaw. <laughs> He came to with his balloon head noticeably deflated. He had a complaint. Oh, I'm bleeding from the ear. And I'm bleeding from the heart. Hey, what'd you want to go and hit me for? I get uncontrollable fits of violence. Hey, who are you? A cop. Your name? Lou. Lou what? Too hard to pronounce. Make a try at it. Zyma Particus. Zyma Particus. Oh, we'll settle for Lou. Yeah, I figured you would. Now, tell me why J.C. Baxter thinks your silence is worth $10,000 to him. Why J.C. who is what? The ten grand you had your fat little hands on in this parcel. Why do you rate it? Uh, let me take this slow, huh? You're telling me there's $10,000 real money in that bundle? I am. And that it's coming to me? You had possession of it when I count you. Well, sure, sure, I had it all right. There's no doubt as to that. Only I thought it was just uh, some old paper. Work up an act, you'll only promote yourself into bleeding all over. Mister, let me tell you, I only came down here looking for old newspaper. What for? For the frogs. So I could make a bundle when I catch them. Catch frogs? You see. Uh, you see over there by the pond? So? Frogs. When the moon is full like now, there's millions of frogs. Here, see this flashlight I got on me? What about it? Well, I sneak over to the bank there and I shine the flashlight right in their eye. It hypnotizes the frogs. All I have to do is pick them up and wrap them. Now, what do you want with frogs? The Valencia Laboratory over on Mercer Boulevard. You know the medical students? I get a quarter for every frog. That's your story? Yeah, so you see, you, you got a case of mistaken indemnity. You don't want to lose um, Zy... Zy... Hepaticus. Thanks. <laughs> my own name had me. <laughs> yeah, we can fix that. How's that? Shorten it. Shorten it to a number. Let's go. Irregardless, I'm pinched, huh? Irregardless. Come on. The frogs won't miss you. Riding back to town with my frogman in custody, my jalopy began to shake as if age and abuse had finally gotten him. Hey, the heat shimmying from side to side. Yeah. The wheels are wobbling front and rear. Like, uh... Old age. Like all the bolts have worked loose. Hey, come on, stop before we turn over. You said arrest me. You didn't say kill me. Bolts had come loose, all right. Uh, any minute, you'd have lost four wheels. Yeah, but not from natural causes, Buster. Not? Human hands did this while I was down in the reeds pollywogging with you. Well, hey, why would somebody... The want... answer to that's in the car now approaching. You want to bet? The guy behind the wheel with a big beak pushing through a handkerchief he wore as a mask. The play was his. Who wanted to argue with a gun? Hey, you there, shorty. Me? Yeah, you. Climb into my boat. Me switch cars? You're rescued. By the boss, is it? You talking one air comes out the other. Right now, I don't know what you're talking about. Sure. You only know from frogs, liar. So long now. Now you, big stuff. That presumably is me. Give me a lip, I'll plug you. I'm speechless. All right, hand over the parcel. Parcel? Oh, yeah, the parcel, here. Parcel at the back window. Okay, you've got it. The contents are intact? Check with your stool. I'm asking you. I held out a dime. You want it? <laughs> no, you keep it as a tip. That incline over there, you see it? Yeah, I see it. Well, start climbing it. What for? Exercise. Be glad I'm leaving you in shape to climb. Watch me go. He watched me go, and then I watched him go. No rear license plate I could read. He had black tape over it. I was up against pretty resourceful competition. That much was very plain.
When I finally escaped from my country exile, I organized a progress chat with my client, Mrs. Vera Baxter, in an apple orchard. They lived like that, the lucky Baxters. A big house in an apple orchard where the goldfish pond left off. That it's true. My husband is being blackmailed. He's dancing to a handsome tune. Ten thousand so far, I can vouch for him. It's my nightmare realized. The leg man in the situation is a midget with a watermelon for a dome. The man I saw following me. The same, undoubtedly. The gent ordering him around is self-conscious about his kisser. Covers it up with a handkerchief. But I caught one facial detail. His nose. It's a pelican beak. That mean anything? No, nothing. I've never seen anyone my husband's in negotiation with. Just what I told you. Just letters, whispering telephone calls, and mysterious conferences in the garage. Yes, that's right. Mrs. Baxter. Yes, Mr. Cray? I'm stymied. I've only got one next approach. What? Your husband, J.C. himself. Grab the dog by the tail. I've got to talk directly at him. Oh, no, please. Oh, without involving you. He won't know you brought me into it. What will you say? One artful dodge or another. I've got a lot of experience at being noncommittal. Well? All right, if you think you must. I, I have to get back to the house now. I'll wait ten minutes and then ring the doorbell. J.C. looked as morose as a guy could get and still want to live. Face tight, every muscle in place. Very close to the screaming Mimi. I find your visit a little fantastic, Mr. Craig. In my business, the fantastic is everyday stuff. But to single me out, why? How is what you really want to ask. How I found my way to you. I'll only tell you what I have so far. Let your imagination fill in the rest. You're paying hush money. You threw 10000 over the rail at Ramapo Bridge. Now, confide in me. I'll mind my own business, and I'll thank you to mind yours. For your own sake, Baxter, any rap is worth facing up to when the alternative is giving in to blackmail. Blackmailers keep coming back again and again. You won't have a dime left or a shred of self-respect. My advice is, open up and get done with it. I dared what you suggest. I, I wouldn't have a shred of reputation. You lick your wounds, take your lumps, and start all over again. Life's a long time. You can fall down and get up. Now, who's blackmailing you and why? I have nothing to say to you. Okay, then. I'll go. Uh, I'm in a puzzle to stay, Baxter. I can be delayed, but I can't be stopped. I'll be back with the answers one day. Bet on it, Baxter. Oh, wait. Now, you're smart to get it off your chest. This is in strict confidence. Sorry, I can't make blind promises. I was abroad three months ago. I became involved with a young lady, a young lady tourist. Oh, platonically, mind you, nothing compromising. We were only companions. Go on. There were talks. I was lonely. There were dinners and walks on the promenade. Visits to museums, the tulip fields in Amsterdam. Just a harmless diversion. But the young lady tourist made more of it, huh? She distorted our situation. I've been receiving letters here at home. Demands for heart balm, redress. Her broken heart. I'd misrepresented my status. I'd not told her I was already married. No foundation to any of her claims? All lies, a blatant fakery. I was only an escort, a friend. Why are you paying blackmail? To prevent scandal, to forestall any needless hurt to Vera, my wife. You feel that vulnerable? To pay tribute to a lie? My social and business situation is sensitive. My colleagues, all of them, blue noses, very provincial. For the merest breath of notoriety. And also, my wife is a woman of certain delicacy of spirit. A perverse sense of pride and propriety. I could never make her understand. Vera would turn against me. You see my trap. I see it all right, only I'm not so sure I believe it. You don't believe me. A man your size in the world, Baxter, top dog, a high social level, a howling business success. You don't figure to be stupid enough to yield to a blackmail built on a tissue of lies. No, I don't think I believe you. That's very arbitrary of you. 
Whatever's got you playing obliging sucker is motivated by something a lot more potent than an old-fashioned badger game. Now, this girl, what's her name? I'll not disclose that to you. And you won't either disclose what she's really got on you. She and company, that is. I've already told you all there is to tell. You fed me a line of bunk. I'm sure you can find your way out. Yeah, out and right back in. Watch for me. I'll be back to tell you some of the things you've left unsaid. Goodbye now. In due time, I got to identify Baxter's young lady tourist. It wasn't too tough. I accomplished same at the customs desk of the International Airport. The passenger list of the plane Baxter had returned from abroad in three months before. Only one of the passengers qualified for the description of young lady tourist. Paula Wiley, age 23, residence, Manhattan, New York, 216 Marlborough Heights. I found Paula at home, at home and about to decamp, dressed to go out, and two suitcases at the door. Who did you say you were? Barry Craig, my credentials. Police? Private investigator. I bring you greetings from J.C. Baxter. Oh, you're not going to deny knowing J.C., how is Mr. Baxter? Oh, he's got an ulcer growing in all directions. Where were you going? Oh, away. The, uh, the Adirondacks. I have a summer job. Nice ad lib. I suppose I should resent your talking. Oh, but you can't. Guilt's all over you like prickly sores. I'll give you a choice. Choice? Talk to me here, or let's do it at the tombs. The chairs are more comfortable here. Uh... What am I being accused of? Blackmailing J.C. Baxter. He complained to you? Uh, how else would I be here? Why, the dirty, underhanded... Uh-uh. Now, try to live up to your ladylike looks. What did Baxter tell you? All kinds of things. It's still inconceivable to me that it dare. Dare send me after you? Yes. You did say he engaged you. Well, call him up and ask him. Confirm it. Be smart, baby. Hang Baxter with his own noose. What's Baxter trying to scare you out of? I'm not sure you're not handing me a line. A, a come on. Oh, take the gamble. You're gambling anyhow. Blackmail has its risks. I take you on good faith. You won't get rich. I'm resigned to being poor. Baxter, I was with him in Amsterdam, Holland, the Diamond Center. We were picnicking and taking color pictures of the tulip fields. But Baxter was there for another purpose. Buying up diamonds. Industrial diamonds. He didn't know that I knew what he was doing. You looked beautiful and dumb. You can guess the rest. Baxter never declared the diamonds at customs. He smuggled them into the United States. Yes. And that's the real blackmail gimmick. Yes. Now, the uh, two gentlemen sharing your gold mine, who are they? Why must you know that? Well, I like to know all the company I keep. Ben Stacy. He's a sort of boyfriend. He handled all the contacts with Baxter. I never personally appeared in the situation. Well, uh, where does Stacy hang his hat? Down the block, the Baker Apartments. And uh, who is the little fellow with the pumpkin head? Lou. Stacy uses Lou for odd jobs. And other times? Lou works in the Imperial Bowling Alley. He's a pin boy. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, here. For you. Hmm. Money. Five hundred dollars. There'll be more for you another time. Oh, the things I could do with five hundred bucks. You're not going to refuse it. Take it, I'd lose my license. Let alone my self-respect. Oh. Then you're a cop after all. You're disillusioned? No, I half expected an outcome like this. But I took the gamble. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Yes? My heart's never been in the thing with Baxter. You see, it's my uh, maiden debut in crime. You're lucky. Lucky? Lucky to be caught first time out. It could prevent your becoming a habitual criminal. Let's go, huh? <laughs> With Paula in custody, I looked up Ben Stacy at the Baker Apartments. 
No answer to the door buzzer. A formal entrance doesn't pan out. You try an informal one, which I did. I found Ben Stacy receiving at home. He was in. He'd just been playing possum. Dead possum, that is. On the floor, flat on his back, face up and his eyes blind. The manner of death required no guesswork. He had a hole on the side of his skull the size of a quarter, a bullet hole. There was an ornamental touch to the corpse, a square of gold glittering close by his shoe top. A gold cufflink. Not Stacy's. Stacy wasn't wearing French cuffs. The murderer's cufflink, apparently. It lay there like it had been lost in the struggle between killer and victim. It took less than 60 seconds to find the $10,000 Stacy had relieved me of on the highway. It lay on a bureau top, exposed to the casual eye. I had two brief calls to make, out of respect to the dead. The morgue and homicide. In the tombs, Paula wept for the dead. I got Stacy into this. It's my fault he's dead. You cry like he meant something to you. I was, in a way, in, in love with him. Did you maybe, in a way, kill him? Kill? What possible reason? Eliminate a partner. It happens, doll, among the best of thieves. You were going away when I caught you. Get out of here. You get out of here. In the Imperial Bowling Alley, the balloon-headed Stooge Lou looked like he only wished he'd lived the king of I can't leave here till 6 p.m., mister. The short of pin boys. Very sad. So come around and see me then, huh? So a morning band on your sleeve, Lou. Huh? Hey, somebody died? Yeah. Your once in a while boss. Stacy? Stacy. Uh, what you want to go and tell me for? You'd rather I hadn't? Now I won't be able to keep my mind on the pins. Hmm, better that way. Now you can concentrate on your troubles. Troubles? You're fingering me for the Stacy killing? You're a suspect, chum. Please join me. Uh, oh, wait till I set up the alley. And lend a hand there on number four, huh? Like I told you, they're short-handed today. In a more fragrant setting by the shade of ye old apple tree, Mrs. Vera Baxter clutched her heart. Murder? Murder it is. You've really got a domestic nightmare now. Oh, no, you can't let your suspicions... I can't exclude your husband as a suspect... He had a pretty impressive motive against Stacy. But he's incapable. He's a gentleman. An ungentle crook. A crook? Smuggler, I should have said. But the characterization of your mister doesn't really surprise you. No. No, it doesn't surprise now. Last night in my husband's study, I pried open a drawer. What did you find? Diamonds. A bag full of diamonds. Diamonds he bought in Amsterdam and smuggled across. Your husband had a little racket going for himself. It's incredible to think that he'd stoop to... To profit? The truth out in the open, that's what you hired me for. Yes, the truth. I don't know how to live in fear. I, uh, I now show you a gold cufflink, this one. Can you identify it? Well? Uh, I'm not sure. Your eyes tell me you are sure. No good trying to evade, Mrs. Baxter. It's a link to a set I gave my husband. I had them specially designed at our jewelers. I I feel faint. Yeah, who wouldn't feel? What does the cufflink mean, Mr. Craig? I can't say positively, but uh, it could mean the chair for J.C. Baxter. Oh, no. While the DA's office figured out which of the three was eligible for electrocution, Baxter, Paul, or Lou, Mrs. Vera Baxter decided to be the best wife a husband ever had. She was in my office in the bright and early a.m. My husband couldn't have murdered this man, Stacy. Why not? I believe the word is alibi. You can alibi his time? I can. Jay was at home with me all that day and evening. Well, that's a sudden thought. Oh. I was too upset to even think yesterday. You wouldn't be telling a big lie. I'll swear to what I say. Jay couldn't have done this murder. 
Funny thing, I'm inclined to agree with you. I've been doing some clear thinking myself. You don't need to alibi him to save him. A nice try and a nice lie, but unnecessary as it happens. No, your husband couldn't have done the murder. Neither could the other pair. Not the other pair? Paula or Lou. You see, while the corpse lay on the floor, the 10,000 lay on the bureau, where I found it. I don't follow your reasoning. Neither Paula or Lou would eliminate Stacy and overlook the loot. Only the loot could be their motive to kill. Cut Stacy out, grab everything. And if your husband killed Stacy to stop blackmail, he would cart the $10,000 away. Not only to recover his money, but to provide a red herring. Make it look like a job done by Paula or Lou. I'm glad you're exonerating my husband. But if you also eliminate the others, then who? I boil it down to one last suspect. You. Me? Uh-huh. You murdering Stacy to implicate your husband. Your revenge. What revenge would I want? Revenge for infidelity. You all along thought your husband was paying blackmail to conceal an indiscretion. You didn't know until last night that his actual crime was smuggling. Not philandering with Paula, but smuggling. I'm afraid you played some kind of a crazy joke on yourself, lady. I don't know what to say. Oh, don't say anything. Think for a long time. And when you're through thinking, make a simple confession, huh? You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Murder by Error, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of Death's Little Helper, about which Barry Craig has this to say. We call next week's story Death's Little Helper. It deals with a beautiful girl and a couple of highly unbeautiful corpses and winds up when a killer realizes that death doesn't need any help. Good night, folks. See you next week. National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production. William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Gene Bates, Julie Bennett, Herb Vigran, Hal Gerard, and Herb Ellis. Eddie King speaking. Here tonight's exciting Dragnet Adventure on the NBC Radio Network. Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring... Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean Bold Venture Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Is your name Slate Shannon? That's right. And this is Miss Duval. I'm very happy. Then I'm happy, too. Hello. My name is Cameron. I have a plantation outside of San Tomas. Sugar. Sugar? For the time being, just call me Sailor. What can we do for you, Mr. Cameron? I've never come to a man and 
and beg before in my life. Well, then you've come to the wrong man. You don't have to beg anything from me. It's about a girl. A young girl. Wild, impetuous, and spoiled. No, thanks. Mr. Shannon already has one. Sailor, why don't you go and put a new point in our desk pen? Where am I going to get a new point? Post office is closed. Please. It's about my daughter. It's about Kathy. Kathy and the Blue Moon. Oh, yes. There's a gambling ship in the bay called the Blue Moon. Look, if you're a man in trouble, I'll listen to you. If all you want to do is hire someone to spank your daughter for gambling, get yourself somebody else. Because nobody else can do what I want you to do. You haven't told Slate yet what it is. Maybe you won't Do you mind if I make my own decision, sailor? Go ahead, Miss Cameron. Kathy's involved with a man named Norton. Oh, yes, I've heard of him. He owns the Blue Moon. How did your daughter get mixed up with a guy like that? I don't know. All I know is that since she's met him, she's... Well, she's changed. She's a stranger to me. She's on that boat all the time. I have an easy solution. Why don't you just tell Mr. Norton to buy your daughter from the boat? I've tried that. He laughed in my face. He told me... Hold it a minute. Sailor, there's a guy over there at the cigar counter. Take care of him. Well, go ahead, sailor. I'll remember every word Mr. Cameron says and tell you later. All right, Cameron? Well, Norton knows something about Kathy I don't. I know my daughter. It's more than just a lust for gambling. Please, will you help me, Shannon? Go there, talk to Kathy. Convince her that she she need never go back to that ship again. Please, please, I'll, I'll give you anything. Put your wallet back. Your daughter's in trouble with Norton? I'll, I'll try to straighten her out. You don't understand, Shannon. I'm a rich man. When I bring Kathy back, you'll give me a box of lump sugar? You knock too loud, Paul. You disturb our boss. Tell Greg I want to see him. Our boss sleeps. His brain goes all the time. He needs rest. Wake him up, Mickey. I've got something for him. I don't wake up, boss, till he asks me. Wake me up, Mickey. Who wants me? It's your croupier, Paul. The wheel jockey says he's got something. He can keep it to himself till you get your share of sleep, boss. Let him in. Our boss says for me to let you in. I'll let... Uh, you have something for me, Paul? Well, give it to me, but make it tender, because I just woke up. I uh, was in Shannon's place a little while ago. And you had fun. Rub my neck, Mickey. There's a crick in it. Yeah, thanks, boss. Ah. Oh, that's good. That's very good. There was someone else there. Kathy Cameron's father. Now the other side, Mickey. Ah. He's sick with worry about his daughter. Wants Shannon to take her away from you. You three must have made a jolly group. They were so wrapped up in it. Shannon, his girl, Cameron. They thought all I wanted was to buy a pack of cigarettes. You're a good boy, Paul. The thing of many talents. Shannon's coming out here to the boat. I thought you'd need to know. Paul's a good boy, isn't he, Mickey? I'm better for you, boss. He can't do the things for you I can do. He can't... Of course he can't, Mickey. Nobody can that's why I keep you around, isn't it? See? See? That's why he keeps me around. That's why he... Sure, can't... Mickey. <laughs> so they want to take Kathy away from me. And Kathy will never leave me. Because I fixed it that way, didn't I, boss? Mm-hmm. Because you threw yourself in front of her car because she thought she'd killed you. That's why you've got to keep out of her sight because for as long as she thinks you don't exist, she belongs to me. Till I use her up. Her and her daddy's money. And so clean. She loses it to me at the roulette table. Clean and legitimate. Boss, this Shannon could... No one's going to spoil it, Mickey. Not a well-paying corpse like you, I give you my word. Look through the porthole, Greg. That's Shannon's boat coming alongside. Go hold his hand, Paul. Then bring him to me. I want to tell him how he can't part two sweethearts like Kathy and me. You do me and my gambling ship great honor, Mr. Duval, Mr. Shannon. Your boy brought us to you. We asked for Kathy Cameron. He didn't want to deny me the pleasure of meeting you two. He has standing orders to deliver to me first the illustrious, the renowned. You see, Slate, I keep telling you that's what we are. You never believe me. Go on, Mr. Norton. You were saying... That I would have shuddered if you came aboard and deprived me of yourselves. Gee, you're smooth, Mr. Norton, the way you talk. 
A waxed mustache. That's the only word for you. Smooth. So you saved yourself a shot in Orton. Now, is it all right if we go find Kathy? She may not care for you disturbing her at the gambling table. Now, what did you want with Miss Cameron? We're going to take her back to Havana with us, Norton, because her father's lonesome for her. He's a funny guy. He thinks his daughter ought to spend more time at home. Any objections? Uh, I only asked you because you stuck your nose in. <laughs> no objections. I only fear for you. You think you can stop me? I know I can. However, Miss Cameron is in the casino on A deck. And uh, please sign the guest book. I'll want something to remember you by. <laughs> Number 12 on the black. Black page, 12 page. Miss Cameron? What? Mind if we talk to you? Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Place your bets. Mind if we talk to you? Go away. I can't do that, Miss Cameron. Why don't you two try the poop deck? It's a good place to jump from. Jump from? Oh, your preposition is dangling, Kathy. Your father must have picked the wrong finishing school for you. My father? Oh... You made me miss my bet. Sailor. I know. You want me to kibitz that hot game of old maid over there. Come on, Kathy. Let's get some air, you and I. Oh, you're hurting my arm. It's an advice I use to make myself clear. Come on. I made a suggestion to you before concerning the poop deck. Or if that doesn't suit you, why don't you try it from this rail? Oh, you're just a kid, Kathy. You've got to grow up a little more before that kind of talk becomes you. Oh, you think I'm a kid? Nineteen, twenty? Kids that old and women over forty use lipstick the way you do. Another suggestion. A girl nineteen is better for you. Want to know why? I'll put my arms around you and show you. Hey, take it easy. And hold you. Okay, Norton. Yeah! <clears throat> huh. Did you notice, Miss Cameron? I only had to do it once, right in back of the neck. Get him out of here. I think I'll give him back to Miss Duval. <laughs> Don't you think I'm considerate? Mr. Slate, he stood on moonlit deck. Man from behind hit him in he neck. Lady sailor she bring from ship blue moon Her winnings to date, Mr. Slate in a swoon Because they tried to do one very good deed Bring daughter back to father who cried his need He wave at them, a face full of war Mr. Slate, he say, don't cry, I go You see, Slate, you didn't make such a hobby of helping people, this never would have happened to you. Yeah, that's just what a fellow needs at a time like this, sailor, a kind word. Now you are hurt, Mr. Slate, because you love a good deed too much? <laughs> yeah, I live for the moment when I can bring a wandering girl back to her daddy. Let Norton have her. I don't think I could go through this again. You go through with it. Your neck is my neck. I read that once in a poem. I'm going back to the Blue Moon, sailor. Mend me real nice because I've got some things to do there. I want to look good. Uh-uh. If you go back, they'll kill you. Those were Norton's parting words to me. He said, tell him not to come back. Next time, I'll give them to you in pieces. You're a complicated man, Slate. I could never put you back together again. Give me another whiff of your smelling salt, sailor. That ringing noise is back in my skull. You're a ham bone. That's the telephone. Shannon's place, Sailor Duval. Mr. Shannon, please. Oh, uh-huh. For you, Slate, the man who grows sugar. He's in a tizzy. Anyway, he makes sounds like a tizzy. I'll let you know. Slate Shannon speaking. Forget it, Mr. Shannon. Forget it or I'll call on you. I don't need you any longer. Where are you, Mr. Cameron? I'm at home. But you're not to come here. You're not to... Get me a clean shirt, sailor. I've got to see a man who doesn't need me. <laughs> I told you What's this all about, Cameron? Did anyone follow you here? I didn't bother to look. Let's go inside. If they followed inside. you... Inside. Norton's got you scared, too, huh? You don't know what you're doing coming here. Who did he threaten? 
You or your daughter? Get out of here. You made a big noise when I first met you, Cameron. Now all I hear is chicken. Your daughter needs help. What happened to all your worry about her? I'll kill you. I'll kill you. You're kidding. Oh, let go of me. You're going to oh. calm down. There. That's better. Now, don't let us throw you. It's just a matter of age and condition. They'll kill her. Now, they won't kill her. That's not what you're afraid of. Yes, yes. They're taking all your money through her. Killing you would be a safer investment. That way, they'd get the money a lot faster. I... I don't want to die. Well, neither do I. You started something with me. Now it's got to be finished. stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall and the second act of our story. I give you two words, Slate. You're crazy. Yeah, I get psychotic when I'm beat over the head. Now look, it's three o'clock in the morning. Go get some sleep. I've gotten better prizes than you in the bottom of a crackerjack box. Why don't you do what I tell you? Look, if you tried to handle the bold venture now, you'd drive her into the rocks. In your condition, you... have got a condition. The man said he'd kill you if you came out to the blue moon again. He said that... Aren't you going to help me aboard our boat? All right. Sometimes I wonder why I even bother. I had a spaniel once who had better manners than you. Talk to me, Slate. Out of the way. You're going to give me trouble. Who are you talking to? Out of the way. Taylor. What do you want? Come here. Look at the motor. Wires all over the place. Someone's... Someone's come aboard. Who's there? I can't see your face. Who is it? But you can't see my gun, can't you? Who are you? How about you, Mr. Vall? Can you see it? Uh, move it a little to the left. Thanks. My, it's pretty in the moonlight. If you get that boat fixed, take it north. If you take it south, you might get too close to the blue moon. Then everything will blow up in your face. I've been pushed around long enough. I've got about... And next time, I'll put the bullet into your head, Shannon, instead of into the woodwork of your boat. Want to try? No? <laughs> See? You can be sensible. Good night, mechanics. You do yourself nicely on my money, Paul. Your apartment, charming. The decor, excellent taste. And now that I've performed the amenities, you have something for me? It'll take Shannon a long time to fix his boat. And you convinced him not to annoy us anymore? Mm, it's hard to tell with a man like Shannon. Yes, you're ever so right. And it's up to you, my dear Kathy. If Shannon should discover you're a murderess, a hit-and-run killer, they'd take you away from me. And that would make you desolate, wouldn't it? You wanted me to do something? Just tell me. Don't claw at me like a fat cat. Emotions have their way with you, don't they, my dear? All right. Call Shannon's place. Ask for Miss Duval. Tell her to come here because you need her so desperately. In ten minutes. You do need her, Kathy. So you won't waste your precious life away in prison. Shannon's place. Sailor Duval speaking. This is Kathy, Miss Duval. Kathy Cameron, is Mr. Shannon there? No, he's sitting up with a sick boat. He's up now. Good. To... Listen, you must come here alone. 16 Paseo Gomez, apartment 12, in 10 minutes if it matters to you whether I live. Well, that's the other side of town. How do I get there this time of night? There are no cabs. What do I do? Wave a wand over a pumpkin? Oh, you must. Please, find a way. Well, maybe King Moses will lend me his jalopy. 
What's wrong, Kathy? Why do you In want... In ten minutes, Mr. Valley. The way you wanted it, Greg? Your choice of words was exquisite, my dear. And it is a matter of whether you live. <laughs> Dum, da, dum, dum, da, da, da. Hey, watch out, you crazy fool! <laughs> Look, I, I didn't see you. I, oh, you're hurt, aren't you? I'll go get help. Hey there! Am I glad to see somebody? This man ran. I saw what happened. Get a doctor, will you? Your car was weaving from side to side. You ran this man down. What are you talking about? He just ran out in front of the car. And you tried to run away. If I hadn't stopped you, you'd have just left the man lying there. You know something? You don't have anything to worry about as long as you listen to me. You know something? Now your voice fits your face. First it was your face. You spin the wheel on the blue moon. And your voice happened a little while ago, aboard our boat. Wait a minute. It doesn't matter who I am. You hit that man. Ouch! Hey, you out of your mind, lady? Did I pinch you too hard? You're supposed to be dead. Hey, we got a clever one on our hands, Paul. Yeah, she's done being clever. Throw her in the car, Mickey. The boss will tell you where to throw her after that. Welcome, Mr. Slit. I got coffee perking for you in the kitchen. <sighs> Thanks, King. You didn't have to wait up for me. What I have and have not to do, Mr. Slade, is my own affair. I go bring your coffee. No, no coffee. Stay here, King. Sing to me. Right now, I need sleep. I do not think sleep will come to you, Mr. Slade. You just sit there and watch it. It will not come because Miss Salo is not here. She wants to roam Havana this time, and I'd let her. I got other things on my mind. Two hours ago, there came a phone call. Miss Saylor, scribble address on pad, borrow my auto. Here is address. I think you better go look for her, Mr. Slate. Because <laughs> you're afraid she'll have gone with that heap. Take 20 bucks out of the register, King. That'll take care of it. Because the call came from Miss Kathy Cameron. Huh? I told you sleep would not come, Mr. Slate. You banging on the right door, mister? Yeah. Banging on the right head. Oh! Ah. Ah. Now we'll drag you inside. Come on, up on your feet. Get with it, Buster. Start talking. What's the matter with you? Oh. Up. This is where we were ten seconds ago. Start talking. Uh, not gonna get you anyplace, Shannon. You know my name. Huh? Oh. That's for taking the liberty. What did you do with Sailor? Blue Moon. She's there. How come she's there? You're going to answer me, Buster, because you happen to be fresh off the Blue Moon. You're the guy who spins the roulette wheel. I tried to frame her. Didn't work. How? Make like hit and run. Blackmail. Little guy, Mickey, used to make a living at it. Run in front of the car, make out he's hurt. People get scared. Pay off. The sailor was too smart. Didn't bite. Same gambit you pulled on Kathy Cameron, huh? Get out of it, Shannon. You know, for a guy who spins a roulette wheel all day, how come you keep one in your apartment? Hobby. Uh-huh. Hobby. And you'll enjoy this. I read where a croupier in Monte Carlo practiced and practiced. He got good. He could put that ball in the black slot or the red slot almost every time he wanted. You're buying grief. He couldn't do it every time, but his average was great. All right, all right. Like you and Norton are doing to Kathy Cameron. Blackmailing her on a hit-and-run caper. She pays her off by playing the wheel, loses money every night. Knows it's rigged against her and can't do anything about it. <laughs> Stealing money legal. Uh-huh. Because I woke you from a deep sleep. Oh! I give it back to you. Hey, amigo, your boat for hire? Let me hear a number, senor. Five bucks. Not the right number. Try Carlos with the catboat. Ten. Ten bucks. 
Put your money where my hand is. Here. Eight bucks and change. The blue moon, Skipper. She's anchored a few miles out. First, I count the change. Well, look, you. Do you want the blue moon, senor? Then let me count the change. Ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine. Oh, here is the other penny. You, you almost didn't make it, senor. You want I should wait for you, senor? Yeah, wait. I give you a hand up the side. Now, there's rope hanging down from the side. Just hold the end of it. I'm going up hand over hand. And I'll pick a cabin, Shannon, and see how your luck is. Sailor. 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 Hey, it's the middle of the night. Yeah, isn't it, though? I'll get back to you. Sailor. Is that you, Slade? Let me in. I can't. The door's locked. You got a hairpin? What's the matter? Night wind playing hard with your hair, too? Slip it under the door. All right, here. Where did you learn how to pick a lock? A friend of mine taught me. Gee, that reminds me. I owe her a letter. Stay like this, sailor. It's been too long since I felt your arm against my cheek. Just think. All this while, there's only been a hairpin. Get back in there, sailor. Put your hair up. I'll be back. Get get away, Shannon. You made a mistake, Shannon. I'm going to find you in that boiler room and kill you. I see you, Shannon. Well, I've got to hand it to you, Shannon. You tried. Too bad you had to die on a coal pile. You almost did. Come on down to the coal pile with me. I'll bring you. Start with this. I can still hear you. Can't hear you anymore now, Norton. Slade, are you all right? Look, I spoiled a nice clean shirt you washed for me. I'll wash your other one. First, there's a couple of guys on this boat. I've got to collect them for the police. What about Kathy? She's got nothing more to worry about. Her father can get her. Well, it happened again, Slate. You did your good deed, and you got your lumps for it. Don't you get tired of it. Till the next time. Let's get out of here, sailor. All fixed, sailor. The last wire's in place. The bold venture's gonna run like a dream. Fine. Where are we going? Well, I didn't say we were going any place. I just said the bold venture'd run like a dream. You want to hear it? If it makes you happy. All right. Wait till you hear that motor purr. What kind of a dream does that sound like? Oh, I had it running a minute ago. Let me try. What'd you do to it? Touched it gently. You want to see how? See? Your eyes, your cheeks, your lips. You purr too, don't you? <laughs> Full speed ahead, sailor. There's a smooth sea tonight. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. Hey, Phil, when I get 
rich. You know what I'm going to do? What? I'm going to buy a motorboat just like this. That's what I'm going to do. You're a piker, Joe. When I get rich, I'm going to buy a lake like this. If you're a good guy, maybe I'll let you use my lake for your motorboat. <laughs> Still no sign of that party you're trying to find yet? Yeah, not yet. Hey, what's the story on this thing we're on? They didn't tell me anything at headquarters except to meet you up here and take orders from you. Well, we got a tip from some citizen that he saw something dumped in the lake. So we got to find it. And, hey, I think we did. Huh? And look over there. That's it, all right, Joe. Nice work. Yeah, I'll kill the engine. Any idea who it is? Yeah, some mug, probably. Got in bed with his boss or his mob and was invited to take a bath the hard way. <laughs> Lean over with me. Help me drag him aboard. Right. It's a fine job for two cops. Oh, well, it's better than directing traffic. I'll grab his legs. Get a grip on his coat. Right. right. You ready? Yes. All right. Here goes. Here you go. All right. That's it. Oh. Rest it on the deck, Phil. Okay. That's the idea. Ah, yeah. yeah. yeah, that's that. Hey. Recognize the guy, Joe? No. No, he's no local hood, I can tell you that. Yeah. The pal in his coat hasn't been touched. I guess whoever knocked him off don't care if we are able to identify him. I guess not. Anything else in his clothes? Uh, yeah, yeah, this wallet. Uh, no dough. Uh, take a look at his identification card. Name, Walter Peters. Address, Harrison Hotel. In case of accident, notify... Hey, do you see what I see? I think so. Well, it's a good thing this was a waterproof wallet, or maybe it was a bad thing. Depends on what Inspector Faraday says when he sees what we're looking at. You've got something there. How do you like that? In case of accident, notify Boston Blackie. And now meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> Blackie, what do you mean? You don't know the dead guy. Wasn't your name in his wallet? Didn't you see it? In case of accident, notify Boston Blackie. I saw it, Faraday, and I read it for you so that you'd know what it says. But I still don't know, Peters. I never saw him in my life. Wait a minute. You're holding something back, Blackie. Yes, my temper. Now, excuse me, Inspector. I have a date with Mary. She's much prettier than you. Her apartment is much nicer than the morgue here, so I really must run along. You stay here if you like. Talk to Peter's body. Your mind and his have a great deal in common. Blackie, we fished Peter's body out of the lake this morning. Congratulations. What'd you use for bait? Ha ha. Skip it. I'm sorry I got you down here. But after your name was on that card, I thought you might help us find out what racket this guy was in. You thought? That's where you made your first mistake. Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Joe, what is it? We uh, just had the police laboratory go over the clothes we took off that dead guy, Peter's. So? So nothing. Except that we found they were hand-tailored, good material, and were soaked with salt water. After you dragged them out of a lake, what did you expect? They'd be soaked with kerosene? No, I just thought I'd tell you, that's all. You see what I'm up against, Blackie. I get no help at all from anybody. I wouldn't say that. Salt water, you said, Joe? That's right, Blackie. And the body was fished out of a lake? Hmm. Hey, that's right. Lakes don't have salt water in them. That's what I was thinking. Oh. You know, Faraday, this is getting interesting. That guy must have been drowned twice. But why? Why, he asked me. How do I know why? I don't even know why he was drowned once. Oh, Blackie, the next time I come to pick you up at your apartment, I'm just not going to do it. You're not making any more sense than Faraday generally does, Mary. The next time you come to pick me up, you're not going to... What kind of talk is that? <laughs> you know just exactly what I mean. Aren't we ready to go yet? Patience, my dear, patience. The show doesn't go on for an hour. Oh, I get bored sitting in my seat reading theater programs. Well, you could talk to me, you know. Well, isn't that what I'm doing now? I'm so much more comfortable here. You know, I have... A... Now, I know why I wanted to leave here, Blackie. That's either somebody who needs your help and wants it, or Faraday who needs your help but never wants it. Let's not answer the door. Aren't you at all curious, Mary? Oh, yes, I am. I'm dying to see how the play we're going to starts. Well, uh, suppose that is somebody who needs help at the door. I wouldn't feel right about not answering. Oh, golly, I guess I wouldn't either. I'll go. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I knew you'd feel that way. Maybe it's only the boy with the papers. No, no, nothing that good could happen to me. Uh, yes? Blackie here? Um, yes, yes. Oh, please he, come uh, in. I'm Boston Blackie. Thanks. Hi, Blackie. I'm Beth. 
Uh, Bess? That's right. I run a tugboat down at the waterfront. Uh, who's this? I'm Mary, uh, and I'm pleased to meet you. Is there something I can do for you, Bess? Yeah. Get rid of this dame so you and I can talk. Blackie, did you hear that? People on the next block could hear that. Uh, Miss Wesley is a friend of mine, Bess. Anything you want to say to me, she can hear. Okay, okay. Blackie, you ever hear of a guy named Walter Peters? Mm, not that I can... Oh, yes, I did. That name belongs to the body the cops fished out of the lake today. It's down at the morgue now. That's the guy, all right. Like to know what the score is about his getting knocked off? Yes. Well, it's nothing to nothing. The cops have got a corpse that means nothing to them, and maybe I can put you next to a murder that means nothing to me, but does to you. In that case, why not tell me about it, Bess? Why not find out for yourself? If you're as smart as you're supposed to be, you won't have any trouble. What am I supposed to do? Be aboard my tug, the Alamo, first thing in the morning. You're on your own from there, in. Sounds like you're building a mystery for no reason, but I'll be there. <laughs> I thought you would. So long. Goodbye. Goodbye, Bess. Be aboard her tug tomorrow morning. Mary, I wonder what that means. Well, for one thing, that means you'll have to wait until tomorrow morning to find out. You didn't mind leaving that Mary Wesley friend of yours on shore, did you, Blackie? I wouldn't say that exactly, Bess, but Mary isn't much of a sailor, and she didn't mind. Now, suppose you give me a hint as to why you wanted me on board this morning. Figure that out for yourself. I got trouble enough handling the wheel on this tug. Hey, I want you to take a look at my crew, Blackie. A one-man crew. Hey, Daddy! Yeah, Bess? Come on, take a minute, will you? Hold everything, I'll be up. You want me to take a look at your crew, and Danny's your crew, right, Bess? You don't know how, right? Well, Bess, what is it? What's up? Say, who's this guy? Never mind. Just a paying passenger, that's who he is. I'm heading for my supplies this afternoon. How's the coal? We could use some. That's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure. That's all, Danny. Okay, okay. I'll be in the galley if you want anything. Well, Blackie. I don't believe it. I saw that guy dead in the morgue only this morning. He's Walter Peters. Glad you came aboard, pal. I'll know in a minute after I talk to him. That's where you're wrong. You ain't gonna talk to him. Oh, the traffic's worse in this harbor than at Sixth Avenue. Get out of that barge, out of the way, you! Uh, say, did you say I'm not gonna talk to him? That's what I said. You see, this ain't as simple as it seems. Well, what makes you think it seems simple? And, Bess, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to talk to that guy right now. Blackie! Blackie, come back here! Oh, if I didn't have to handle this wheel, I'd... i make you come back! You're big enough to have a good chance of doing it, too, Bess. But I've got to find out what this is all about. Hey, you! You down there in the galley! Yeah? You wanted to see me? I most certainly did, and do. Look, who are you? Who wants to know? I'm Boston Blackie. Oh, you're Blackie, huh? That's right, and uh, I, I think you're Walter Peters, only Peters is dead. I saw him in the morgue myself. Now, what goes on here? I can't tell you on account of best, but look, Blackie, I'll meet you later. Keep your shirt on. I'll be in your apartment at four o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> Blanky, either get out of my office or start walking up and down. You're getting me dizzy. What's your excuse when I'm not here? Now, listen, Faraday. You listen. I'm getting a call from the FBI any second. They think they've got a lead on who Walter Peters was. What I want to tell you is that Walter Peters wasn't anything. He is. I saw him an hour ago on a tug. Mm. Walking up and down is making you dizzy, too. Faraday, I tell you, I saw him on a tugboat. I talked to him. He wouldn't crack on the tug, but... He said that he'd meet me in my apartment at 4 o'clock. If Walter Peters comes up to your apartment at 4 o'clock, there'll be four guys carrying him. That's probably the FBI. Hold everything. Faraday speaking. Inspector, this is Jameson, Harbor Squad. Yeah, Jameson. What happened to Walter Peters' body? What happened to Walter Peters' body? Well, it's in the morgue. That's what happened to it. Oh, is it? Well, I'm calling from the morgue now. The guy in charge ain't here, and neither is Peters' body. What? Just thought you might know something about it. So long, Inspector. Blanky Peters. I know, I know, I heard. Well, pal, what goes on from here in? 
You still think I didn't see Peters? Oh, this is all I need. First, a guy has fished out of a lake, only his clothes have salt water in them. So he's been drowned twice. Listen. Now it turns out Walter Peters is alive. Now, take it easy, No, it can't be. I don't believe it. I won't believe it. Blackie, get out of here! Walter Pe... I mean, Faraday speaking. Jones, the FBI, Faraday. We finished checking on that Walter Peters for you. We know who he was. Oh. One of the cleverest smugglers we ever ran across. Customs never could get anything on him. They examined him and his luggage with a microscope, but he kept bringing in thousands of dollars worth of jewels every trip he took. I can believe it. The guy is a miracle man. Oh, well, what do you mean, Inspector? Now, how would you expect me to know? Thanks, Jones. So long. So Peters is a smuggler, eh, Faraday? And apparently somebody tried to knock him off, but he beat the rap somehow and is hiding on Bess's tugboat. Well, that makes sense. Oh, it does, does it? Nothing makes sense on this case, including you. Blackie, how come your name was on Peter's identification card? Oh, are we back to that in case of accident notify Boston Blackie thing again? We sure are. Maybe you were working with this, Peters. Maybe you were in the smuggling thing. He crossed you, you knocked him off. Oh. He had your name on his card so that we'd have a lead to his killer. And you're telling me all this bunk about talking to a dead man just to throw me off. Faraday. I know. I know, it's ridiculous. But it shows I'm thinking... Blackie, what could have happened to the morgue keeper and Peter's body? I haven't the slightest idea, unless Peter's wasn't dead, and I did talk to him on board Bess's tug. How are we going to find out? That's what bothers me. I guess we're going to have to wait until 4 o'clock this afternoon when that guy I met on the tug is due at my apartment. Well, before that, maybe I can do something about it, though. Yeah? What? I've got an idea that tug will be able to pull me out of this situation. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. The body of Walter Peters, smuggler, is fished out of a lake by police. And Boston Blackie is drawn into the case when his name is found on Peters' identification card. Later, Blackie is certain he talks to Peters aboard a tug owned by a gal named Bess, even though Peters is apparently dead. When Peter's body is found missing from the morgue, Blackie is confused, but he knows he has an appointment with the man he met on the tug. With several hours to spare, Blackie and Mary are en route to the tug once more and stop off at the morgue first. You'd better wait out here, Mary. I'll go into the morgue myself. It won't be a minute. Oh, Blackie, I don't care how long you take, as long as I'm waiting outside. There is something about a morgue that... Well, uh... Most of the people inside don't seem to mind. Mm -hmm. Be right with you. Okay with me. Oh, hello, Jameson. You on duty here? Hi, Blackie. I'm still in the harbor squad, just trying to get a lead on the Peters murder. Oh. Listen, I was in Faraday's office when you called in to say that the morgue keeper and Walter Peters' body were missing. Oh, that. Well, they're not missing anymore. Uh, say that again slower this time. They're not missing anymore. The morgue attendant had gone out for coffee before I got here. When he came back, he told me where he was and what happened to Peter's body. What did happen to it? Well, it was claimed a relative of his, a big gal named Bess something or other, came in for it and took it with her. Well, that clears that up. Or does it? Huh? Never mind. I can't very well explain something to you that I don't know the answer to myself. Thanks, Jameson. Nice seeing you. Right, Blackie. I'm uh, sorry you can't stay till something breaks on the Peters case. I got nobody to talk to in here. <laughs> you got plenty of people to talk to, only nobody can answer you. <laughs> so long. <laughs> well, that was fast, Blackie. Yes, it was. I'm glad I stopped by. I've got some information, even if I don't know what it means. Let's see, if it's two o'clock now, I have until four to keep my appointment. We're going down to the waterfront, Mary. Are we? What for, to get a lead on the Peters case? That's right. If Peters is really dead, I want to know who killed him. If he's alive, I want to know what's going on. And I have an idea one person can give me all that information. A girl named Bess. Faraday. Faraday, this is Blackie. Blackie, go away, far away. We'll play a game. You get lost, nobody will look for you. Blackie, don't bother me. If you think you've been bothered before, listen to this. Bess is missing. Bess? The gal I told you about. The one that owns that tug. Not only is she missing, but the tug is gone, too. Uh, neither of them are here in my office. Why bother me? She's the key to 
this whole case, Faraday. I'm down at the waterfront now. Nobody has seen her or the tug since this morning. Now I want you to call out the harbor squad and try to find out what happened to her. But she's the gal who called for Peter's body at the morgue, isn't she? That's right. Well, what's making you so sure she's the key to this case? Well, I've just figured out something. Peter's was a smuggler. She ran a tug. This thing's beginning to make sense. Not to me. It's making sense, not miracles. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe she and Peter's were a team. Don't ask me about the rest of the story. I don't know it yet. But I've got to get back to my apartment to meet the guy that I think is Peter's. And I want you to look for Bess. I'll get down to the harbor right away. Blackie, why is it that as soon as you're mixed up in something, all of a sudden everything is mixed up? Bill, Joe, yes, yep. make sure you don't overlook a thing. Even if you think it's only a log, you see, yell and we'll stop this launch. Right, Inspector Faraday. That tug is still afloat anywhere. We'll find it. I don't care if we find the tug. I want to find that gal, Bess. What time is it? Uh, 3.30. In half an hour, Blackie's got a date with a guy he thinks is Peters. And if it turns out to be Peters, you'll be searching for another body. Mine. This thing is getting me a little wacky, too, Inspector. I don't... Hey, see... Inspector! There's a body in the water, swimming, on the port side. Uh, where's that, Bill? That's the left, Inspector. Oh, you don't have to tell me. Hey, that's right. There is somebody in the water. It's a dame. Head over that way, Joe. I'm heading toward her. She's alive. That's something. Careful, Joe. Don't run her down. Don't worry. Whoa, she's a big gal. Better lean over the side with me, Bill. Yeah. Come on, Joe. You help us, too. Come on. Okay, Inspector. Okay, now. Reach down and help her up. Yeah. She looks all in. Hey, lady, let's have your hand. Yeah. That's it. Get ready to grab her other hand, Bill. Okay. Joe yeah. and I'll pull. Okay. Ready. Right, Inspector. Ah. Ah. There she goes. Oh. Oh, she's really all in and no kidding, Inspector. So am I. Put her on the deck. Yeah, that's the idea. She must be conscious or she couldn't have been swimming. I'm conscious. All right. You, Faraday? Yeah. I'm Beth. I got a tugboat. I used to have a tugboat. Working out of the harbor. A guy wrecked it. Tried to drown me. We'll get him, Bess. You just lie here and relax. Bill, get some hot coffee and blankets. Right, Inspector. So somebody tried to drown you, eh, Bess? Probably somebody who wanted to stop you from telling us who killed Walter Peters. Who was it tried to knock you off, Bess? Who was it? Yeah. It was Walter Peters. <laughs> What time is it, Mary? Twenty after four. Hasn't changed more than a minute since the last time you asked me, Blackie. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Twenty after four. That guy isn't going to show. No question about that. Mm. We're on everybody's hate parade today, aren't we? Faraday hasn't even called back. Well, maybe his harbor police haven't found any trace of Bess's tugboat, and he hasn't got anything to tell me about. Faraday's a good cop. That tugboat is still afloat. He'll find it. What did he say when you phoned him and told him Bess was missing? That kind of talk isn't meant for your ears, lady. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, black. Oh, I'm sorry. Mary, how do you figure this case? You should have a theory about it. It's so completely wacky, I can't find anything to hold on to. Well, as a matter of fact, I do have a theory. You know, I... Oh, maybe that's oh, the guy I had the appointment with. Don't go away, Mary. Don't worry, I won't. Hello. Blackie, this is me. That guy show up? Not yet, Faraday. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because he isn't going to show up. We just fished your friend Bess out of the harbor. What? Try to drown her, she says. Only I don't believe it. What do you believe? I think Bess killed whoever it was that was supposed to meet you. You told me yourself she didn't want you to talk to him. She knocked him off, then faked this swimming business so it would look like he tried to kill her. You say Bess is safe? She's in the Willis Hospital. Claims she's suffering from shock, but she's faking. You want to see her? You bet I do. I think you've got this thing all lopsided, pal, and I'm going to straighten out that case and you at the same time. This is the room, Blackie. Bess is in there. Thanks, pal. You're a pal. Come on in. Yeah. Hello, Bess. Hi, Blackie. Glad you're here. Well, I'm glad somebody is. Blackie, this dame is trying to tell me that Walter Peters tried to drown her just now. Doesn't she know we know he's dead? 
Wait a minute, Faraday. Danny Peters is dead. Walter Peters tried to kill me. Now, that's really wonderful. As if I understood what you were saying. I can tell you, Faraday. Danny and Walter Peters were twins, right, Bess? That's right. They had a smuggling racket going. Danny Peters would get his luggage examined at the customs, get it okayed, disappear for a moment, and Walter Peters would take his place going through the gate, his luggage all fixed up with counterfeit seals. Good figure in Blackie. That's how it was done. Walter would walk out with a load of smuggled stuff, and Danny would hide on board the ship until night, when I'd come and take him off in my tug. Okay, okay, that explains their racket. But whose body did we find in the lake? Danny Peters' body. Walter killed him and put his own wallet in Danny's pocket so it would be found. They had a quarrel. Walter hid out on my tugboat, and I was afraid to say anything to anybody because he, he threatened to kill me, too. So it was, was Walter I talked to on board your tug? That's right. Oh, I just wanted you to see him, not talk to him. I knew you'd find a way of putting this thing together once you got a look at Walter, Blackie. Only you talked to him. He knew what I was up to, and so he tried to drown me. Where is he now? Probably at a little joint near the harbor. Nellie's place. Nellie's place, eh? That's all I want to know. Hello, Peters. Oh, it's you, Blackie. Sorry I couldn't get to keep that appointment at your apartment. I'm not. If you'd come up there, you'd probably have filled me with a pack of lies and got me even more confused. Trying to knock off Bess gave your hand away, but good. Bess is alive? And kicking. Kicking all over police headquarters. My friend Faraday wanted to send some cops down to pick you up, but after all the trouble you gave me, I figured I'm entitled to the fun of bringing you in. You call it fun, eh? What do you call this? I call that a sucker punch, leading with your right. Here, lad, learn a lesson. And here's a little homework to practice on. Anybody feel the need of any higher education? Smart boys. A couple of you help me drag him out of here and into my car. Mr. Peters seems to have petered out. Blackie, about the only thing in this case I don't understand is why Danny Peters' body was drowned in salt water first and then dumped in a lake. Well, I coaxed his killer to tell me, Mary. (laughs) There was a fight on the barge. Walter knocked Danny overboard, and when Bess fished him out, he was dead. Walter wanted that body as far from the harbor as possible, so he carted it to the lake and tossed it in. Oh, well, there's one more thing I just thought of. How come your name was on the identification card found on that body? Well, that was to make sure that Faraday was called in on the case so that when the body was found, headquarters in the city would list Walter Peters as dead. Walter knew that my name would bring Faraday on the run. That's why he put the name on his identification card and put it in his brother's pocket. All of a sudden, I think of more questions. Here's one more. Why did Beth claim the body of the dead man from the morgue? Well, Walter made her do it, I guess. He was getting a little panicky and didn't want that body around for fear that there was something on it that might lead to him. He hadn't realized the salt water clue we found right away would tip us off that something was screwy. Now, are there any more questions? No more questions. (laughs) That's good. Say, I was just thinking of something. You know this business of brother killing brother goes all the way back to the Bible. Yes, I know it does. Cain and Abel. That's right. And Walter Peters tried to emulate Cain and get away with killing his brother. Only he wasn't able. Oh, Blackie.
Kandu, the magician. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The makers of White King Soap present for your enjoyment, Chandu, the magician. Today, Chandu, master of illusion, offers you one of his mysterious and amazing tricks. Chandu calls this trick the Assyrian money changer, and it changes pennies into dimes. You want this trick? Want to mystify and entertain your friends? Want to be a magician just like Chandu? All right. Get that White King box top, send it with a quarter, straight to Chandu, Los Angeles 21, and receive your first Chandu magic trick by return mail. What fun you'll have saying, See this penny? I lay the penny on the table. Now I cover the penny with the mystic ruby block. So coot, I say. Then remove the block, and the penny's gone. Now it's a silver dime. The trick is easy. So easy a child can do it. But it is clever. So clever it is very hard to detect. Start your collection of magic tricks right now with Chandu's Assyrian Money Changer. Just send 25 cents in coin and a White King soap box top to Chandu, Los Angeles 21. Be sure to print your name and address plainly. Despite the death of the sinister Roxor, the secret inner council of which Frank Chandler is a member has learned that Roxor's plan to rule the world is still going relentlessly on. Under Jan Metzos, its foreign minister, already a small Balkan country has been taken over as a gateway to the east. But Chandler knows Metzos is under orders from beyond the border, and he has come to the Balkans to unmask Metzos' chief and defeat the deadly plan. Now Chandler has discovered the presence of Vicente Gomez, an unsavory intelligence agent, and plans to baffle the plotters by sending Gomez away with the gypsy tribe. Meanwhile, looking into the crystal, Chandler and Dorothy see Jan Metzos and Dimitri plotting the death of young Nicholas, formerly the crown prince. But Chandler does not know that Dimitri, a master of black magic, plans to cast a dark enchantment on the regents one by one, and that Bob has already fallen under the spell. Now, just as Dimitri leaves, the sound of horses' hoofs is heard in the courtyard of the castle. Chandu, the magician. Betty and Bob. Good heavens, who's that with them? Why, it's Lupu. Hello there. Oh, Dimitri, I'm sorry you're going just when we get home. Yeah. We'll see you later, though. Boy, are we drowned. Come in, quick. Well, I'm glad to see you, Lupu. Almost I thought I would not find you, Chandu. Mother, did you think we were lost? We rode up the hill in a gypsy wagon. Yeah. We thought Lupu was chasing us all over La Bova. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you know him? You saw him that night in the cafe in Paris with the gypsy girl. But the rain was coming down in buckets, Uncle Frank, and it was so dark, and he just kept following us around corners. Well, never and... mind now, dear. You and Bob go up and get some dry clothes on your soap. Okay. Was Dimitri sore because you wouldn't let me go riding with him the other day? He didn't say anything about it. Oh. Oh, I wish we'd been here. I know you don't like him, Mother, but I think he's fascinating. He told Betty. me that... Go and change your clothes, dear. You too, Bob. I'm going, Mother. I'll find you something to put on, Lupu, while your clothes dry. Oh, <laughs> you think a gypsy must change his clothes because rain falls on his head? <laughs> I will sit by the fire, Chandu. <sighs> oh, but this room's always cold in spite of the fire. This castle is cold with black secrets and with fear. What? Ah, uh, Ramani knows. Ah, Ali. I am sorry I frightened them, Pani. I thought the young ones were running away from the rain, not from me. And I did not know how to find you, Chandu. When I saw them, I... Well, didn't you get my letter in Paris? I sent it to the cafe. Nah, it did not come. Or someone else took it. Ah, it may be. Marco Pravadi was often there. But you had told me to come here, so I came. Over the Ramani Road. Frank. 
It was Marco we saw that night. So you know him, the black-hearted devil. He went all the way to my sister's home in California to steal some papers from her husband. Jerusalem. If I had known that, I would have taken them from him at the point of my knife. But he didn't get them, Lupu. They weren't there. But my husband recognized him and Marco disappeared. Dobra. I will kill him when I see him again. No, Lupu. We'll talk about Marco later. Tell me, have you another horse with you? Ah, no, Chanduan, no, a fine horse. <laughs> I have won it from the blacksmith in a small town last night. Oh, I can imagine how. <laughs> ah, no, no, it was a wager. <laughs> he said he could drink more wine than I. I laughed at him. We sat all night at the inn drinking pitchers of wine. And this morning, he could no longer drink. So now I have his horse. <laughs> it is yours, Chandu. Well, thank you, but I don't want it for myself. Ale, Chandu? I want you to take a man along with you and your tribe. And keep him away until you come back in the spring. Ah, you have discovered the man with his scar on his hand. No, not yet. This man's come here to work for Dimitri. So may his bones turn to water and his tongue to hornets. I'll be satisfied to see him just out of the way. Let's get some of your clothes out of the wagon for him. Oh, Frank, don't take Lupo out in the rain again. He's just getting dry. Neat, neat, Spiny. Where is this man, Chandu? In a small room at the back of the castle, tied up and gagged, just in case. Come along, Lupo. Now, Gomez, you're going to vanish as if the earth had swallowed you. <laughs> <laughs> you will be more strong after the winter in gypsy camps, Gomez. Here, give me the jacket, Lupu. Here you see, Gomez. A fine, bright jacket. Beautiful green trousers. <laughs> Even boots. Huh? Yeah. That's it, Lupu. Uh, tell me, do you know how to ride, Gomez? <laughs> I take it you don't. Well, you'll learn. Open the door, Lupu. Metzos and Dimitri will never know what happened to you, Gomez. Tostachi, Lado. Tostachi, Tostachi. I I am sorry to ask you to carry this great piece. Uh, up, Gomez. Uh. Gee, what a gypsy. Tell your people not to lose sight of him for a moment. Roshi, he will not be seen in this country again. But you come back here as soon as you can. I'll need you. I will come soon, Chandu. Good. However this thing ends, we've won the first round. Good luck, Lupu. Frank, is that you? Yes, now. Don't worry. Gomez is gone. What on earth is all that? Books from the old library. I want to know what they were looking for. Who? Well, the man Betty saw in the attic, for one. And you know there were books and papers all over that library floor when we first went in. But maybe he found it, whatever he was looking for. I don't think so. Well, he wouldn't have gone up to the attics. Well, he hasn't been back, though. Frank, tell me. Are you sure Roxor really did fall into that well? Roxor? Why, well, doubt I wasn't six feet away when it happened. He was running after Robert, and he just didn't see that that cupboard had been taken off the well. Why did you ask that? Because, well, one after another, his men keep appearing here. Even Dimitri said something about Roxor. Well, Roxor had men all over the world. You know that, not? And as Gomez said, a man must live. Just the same, I... For Pete's sake, Uncle Frank, what are you doing? I'm just going through these books. If I don't find anything, we'll bring in some more. Can't we help? What are you looking for? I don't know, but... Well, here's something they missed. American currency. Yes, and it's been here a long time. It's the old size. How much is it? About five hundred dollars. Hmm. Left for a man who never came to get it. Uncle Frank, isn't that what that man was looking for in the attic? He was looking for something more important than money. I'll recognize it when I see it. You look so strange, Frank. And there's something about this money. A feeling of mortal terror. As if a man had sat in that room and looked into the eyes of death. Holy Moses. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. If half of what Gomez told me about this castle is true, it's not surprising that money's associated with death here. Oh, 
You looked as if you were seeing even worse things. Oh, Uncle Frank, look. Mm. Here's a book with a picture of this castle right in the front. Look. Well, let's see. Ah, the castle now called Sistova. Erected on the site of an ancient pagan temple by Ivan the First. Oh, don't read it, Frank. Put it down. Mom, why do you care what was here before? This castle's six or seven hundred years old. I don't want to hear about it. Please, Frank. All right, Dad. I'll look at it later. Well, let's see some of the others. Well, well, here's one called A Brief Balkan History. That ought to be harmless enough. Hey, hey, it won't open. Oh, Bob, who ever heard of it? Well, shake book? it, Bob. Huh? Hey, it rattles. Oh, it's a box. Let me have it. Oh, isn't this fun? Maybe it's something that was put in there hundreds of years ago, and we'll be the first people to see it. Can you get it open? Yes, I can slide my knife along under the cover. By George, we found it. They were in such a hurry, they missed it. What is it? It's supposed to go with the map we found in the attic. It's a detailed plan of the castle. Does it show that underground room? What underground room, Mother? Uh, whoever that is, don't say anything about finding this plan. Go to the door, Bob. It takes Lugos ten minutes to get there. I'm closer. I'll go. Oh, hello. From Mr. Mason. For my uncle? Won't you come in? The queer there. I will wait for him in the carriage. Well, I'll give it to him right away. It's a letter from Mr. Mason, he said. Oh, thank you, Betty. I hope his wife's not worse. Hmm. It doesn't say. It just says, I have some very disquieting information. Please come down to the consulate at once. Would you like to be a magician? Would you like to mystify your friends with magic tricks? Chandu the Magician has a magic trick for you. Chandu calls it the Assyrian Money Changer. It changes pennies into dimes. And we'll send it to you for just 25 cents and a White King box top. This trick is fascinating. Listen. You lay a penny on the table. Cover the penny with the mystic ruby block. So coot, you say. Then remove the block. Now the penny's gone, and instead you see a bright, shining silver dime. Wonderful, isn't it? And it's so simple, you can do it not once, but again and again and again. Your friends will never catch on. Now, to get Chandu's Assyrian money changer, just mail 25 cents in coin and the top from a box of White King soap to Chandu, Los Angeles 21, California. That's Chandu, Los Angeles 21. And remember, nothing washes like soap. There is no soap like White King. You'll love White King. Chandu the Magician is presented for your enjoyment every weekday evening. Frank Chandler is played by Tom Collins. The makers of White King invite you to listen tomorrow at this time when the story resumes. Chandu, the magician. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Damon Runyon Theater. Once again, the Damon Runyon Theater brings you another story by the master storyteller, Damon Runyon. And this one, Breach of Promise. And to tell it to you, here is Broadway. Thanks. How I happen to know this story is a story in itself. 
But I will skip that and tell you about Mr. Jabez Tuesday and a doll named Amelia Bodkin. It also concerns Harry the Horse and Milkier Willie. And how they get mixed up in something like this is quite a story, which I will tell you in a minute. Now, back to the Damon Runyon Theater and the famous story, Breach of Promise. Well, one day a certain party by the name of Judge Farber sends word that he wishes to see me in his office. Of course, he is no more a judge than I am. And he is never a judge. And he is a hundred to one in my line against ever being a judge. But he gets his name from being very smart and being able to help certain citizens out of difficulties when the need for that arises. Well, I call on Judge Farber, and he takes me into his private office, and the scene is as follows. Broadway, I'd like very much to get in touch with a couple of friends of yours. Friends of mine? Mm Mm-hmm. Who might they be, Judge? They might be anyone. But these particular friends happen to be Harry the Horse and Milkier Willie. Huh? Why do you wish to contact them? I have a little job for them. Ah? What is the job? Well, it's out-of-town work that requires tact and, uh, some nerve. The nerve is with them, Judge, but by no stretch of the imagination can I conscientiously recommend their tact. I have a client who is willing to pay quite a large sum of money to, uh, obtain some letters. Letters? Letters. Well, you see, Judge, as much as I like to help out a friend, I am afraid I cannot do this. Why not? Because if I steer them into anything that is bad, they will come to see me. I do not like Harry the Horse and Milkier Willie to come to see me with anything on their minds but their hats. (laughs) I see. Well, suppose you just tell me where they live and I'll contact them. They do not live exactly anywhere. But, um... There is a certain spot in Clinton Street where information might be picked up. Mm Mm-hmm. Thank you, Broadway. Thank you very much. If I can ever return the favor, please let me know. Judge, I hope I am never in a spot where I need a favor like the ones you are able to return. Well, that is the start of it. And I do not hear anything more of the matter for several weeks. But one evening, I am in Mindy's enjoying a little cold borscht, which is most refreshing in the hot weather which is going on at the time. I say I am enjoying it, but not for long, because all of a sudden, there is a blast of air, and the scene is as follows. Broadway? Broadway, our pal. Harry, milk here. What is the matter? You swallow something? My tongue, I think. But you... We are looking for Judge Farber. Do you see him around lately? No, not exactly. Why? Well, we wish to thank you anyway for the job of work you throw our way. It is an interesting job. Is it not, Milky? In fact, most interesting. It, uh, it turns out well for you? Mm, well, yes and no. Uh, do you wish to hear about it? Well, I... You go ahead with your Bush, and I will give you all the details so you will understand why we wish to see Judge Farber. All right, Harry. Well... It turns out that the job is not for Judge Farber personally, but for a client of his. Yeah, and who is this client but Mr. Jabez Tuesday? The millionaire? The same. The one who owns all the restaurants. What does he want with you? I am coming to that. Well, we go to see this Mr. Jabez Tuesday. He lives at a Fifth Avenue hotel where he makes his home. And me and Milk here go... Oh, yes, Uh, yes, I I see. You're the two gentlemen whom uh, the judge sent to do... Oh, that is, uh, you're the two men whom I We wish are to, uh... here, Mr. Tuesday. Get to the point. Yeah, to the point. You, well, I want you to get some letters for me. Uh... Oh, no, Nick. That is out. We do not crack a post office. Oh, you don't understand. There is nothing to understand about cracking a post office. It is just not being done. Well, these letters are in a private home. Oh, that is different. The... Proceed, Mr. Tuesday. Is I, uh... Well, I wrote them to a Miss Amelia Bodkin, and there are, well, certain things in the letters I wish I hadn't said. 
What do you write? You, uh, certain things which, uh, well, you see... What you mean to say is that you write things which this doll, Amelia Bodkin, could use to put the blast on you. Precisely. Why do you want these letters? Well, because I'm going to be married, and I do not think my fiancé would appreciate the, the fact that I wrote them. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid Miss Bodkin may sue me for breach of promise. What is that? Well, it's when someone promises to do something and then fails to do it. Oh, we have got another name for it. But it is practically the same thing. And we go about correcting the situation a little different. Will you do this for me? We must uh, settle first the matter of finance. Well, I'll pay uh, $10,000 for those letters. <whistles> that sounds like you once are a busy fellow with a pen. Uh, Valerie must never find out about them. Now you bring in a ringer. Uh, who is this Valerie? Oh, she's my fiance, Valerie Scarwater. Uh, she comes from a, a fine family. Any breath of scandal would would result in wrecking my coming marriage to her. Okay. Now, what's the layout? The what? He means where are the letters, and uh, is the crib hard to crack? You what? He means is it a tough job? Oh, oh no, no, not at all. Uh, Amelia lives in Terrytown. Uh, there's only a butler uh, beside her in the house. But uh, you've got to make it look as though you didn't just go after the letters. If they are missing, and it's better than six to five, someone will say they are taken. That is very logical, Harry. It is more than that. It makes sense. Uh, look, the letters are in an inlaid silver box. Take the box along with other silverware. There is other silverware? Yes, a uh, Paul Revere teapot. Paul Revere? The jockey? The teapot is worth quite a bit, so you can make the whole thing look as though it's an ordinary burglary. Ordinary? You wrong us, Mr. Tuesday. Oh, I'm sorry. But you'll do it. Mr. Tuesday, for ten G's, Milk Gear and myself will take the letters off the front of the Giants' uniforms. Well, that is the start of the story that Harry and Milk Gear tell. But it is by no means the end. In fact, what starts out as a nice, ordinary deal ends up quite complicated. Anyway, Harry and Milkier borrow a car from a friend and they drive out to Tarrytown. They are approaching the home of Miss Amelia Bodkin and the scene is as follows. Milkier. What, Harry? What is this you tell me about being able to drive a car like a racing driver? What's the matter? I am not doing all right. It would be better if you kept more on the road. I am looking for the house. I will look. You will watch the road. Try to stay with it a little more. It's pretty out here, ain't it? Do not look at the scenery at night. Hey, look. There's a house up ahead. Uh-huh. We will case the place first. Then we will see about making an entrance. This is a pipe. Just the old doll and a butler. Yeah. Milk gear, why are you driving on the left side of the road? I am left-handed when I am a kid. I guess I never get over the habit. Take it easy now. And turn in there where the gate post is. Then we stop the car and case the place from there. Sure. Milk gear, you will slow up. We are not yet to the gate post. Milk gear, you must not stop the car all at once. Ease into it. Harry, if you wish to drive, I will move over and you may do so. Easy, easy. Hey, look out! <laughs> Well, from what Harry the horse tells me, Milkier misjudges the distance and does his stopping by means of a concrete gatepost, which is considerably harder than the car. Also, it is considerably harder than Milkier's head, which is quite a feat in itself. Anyway, it is somewhat later when Milkier wakes up. He is in a nice white bed with nice clean sheets. The room is very pretty. In fact, the only jarring note is Harry the horse sitting by the bed, looking at him. Then the scene is as follows. I am glad to see you are awake. In fact, I am glad I am able to see. What happens? We are without a car. Ooh, my head. If you will put your hand up there, you will find that your head is now being held together by embroidery. I'm hurt? You do not feel anything? No, why? Should I? <laughs> I guess not. Milk ear. Do you know where we are? No. We are in the home of Miss Amelia Bodkin. Then I make it. But while you are out like a light, there is a doctor. Why? Because you need one. Are you hurt? No, I jump before we hit. 
You leave me to take the rap alone? Look, it is better this way. I do not go along with that. Just listen to me. For what? It is better this way. Now, instead of having to crack this place, we are now inside. The hard way. The letters we are here to get are in this house. The doctor says you cannot move. The doctor is crazy. Maybe. But now you will stay here and find out where are the letters. Get it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. This is essential. Uh Uh-huh. Now you... May I come in? (laughs) Certainly, Miss Bodkin. Certainly. Oh, you're awake, aren't you? Yeah. You know, you were very lucky. That cut might have been worse. Here, let me look at that bandage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Hmm. Hmm. Hungry? Hungry? I... Yeah. Yeah, I guess I am. Good. I made some nice hot broth. This is very elegant of you, Miss Bodkin. Nonsense. I'm only too happy the accident happened where I could be of some help. I am very sorry I knocked over your gatepost. Little sticks. I didn't like it anyway. I've been meaning to have it removed for a long time. (laughs) My friend saves you the trouble. (laughs) (laughs) Well, now I'll get the broth. Yeah, thanks. Now, don't move around too much. The doctor says you're to be quiet. (laughs) What is so funny? I am laughing because I remember the time you once walked from Lower Broadway to Times Square with two slugs in you. (laughs) Now all you got is a scratch. (laughs) And some hot broth. (laughs) She's a nice old doll, ain't she? Yeah, a nice old doll, but you never can tell about people. Here she is, a nice old doll, with some letters she is going to use to put the blast on Mr. J. Bish Tuesday. Yeah. Sometimes I am not very happy about human nature. You've got any idea where the letters are? No, you've got to find that out yourself. Myself? What about you? You crazy, I cannot stay here. Why not? It is not my head which is caved in. Yeah, I see. I see. So now all you got to do is be smart. Is that possible? What do you mean? Eh, nothing, nothing, but... Uh... The broth on the bed table, Charles, thank you. Will that be all, Miss Amelia? I think so, Charles, yes. Oh, this is Charles, Mr. Re- Miss, I don't know your name. Oh, uh, mine is Harry, and this is my friend, my friend... My name is Clarence. What? But I would not like for it to get around. It will go no for you. Well, now that's settled. Now let's have some of this nice broth. You are going to feed him? The doctor says he mustn't move too much. Harry, you hear what the doctor says. I must not move too much. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I will be getting back to town. We have got some business to attend to, and the sooner it is settled, the better it will be for all parties concerned. You know that, Mil... Uh, Clarence? Ta-ta, Harry. I will see you later. I will keep in touch by telephone. Uh, Charles, show Mr. Harry out. Yes, Miss Amelia. No, some nice hot broth. This is a very nice thing you do, Miss oh, Amelia. Careful, it's the only thing I can do for a fellow human being. Oh, careful, huh? it might be too hot. You, uh, cook this up yourself? Yes. Don't you like it? It is good. In fact, it is by far the best soup I ever eat. <laughs> Why, thank you. Oh, it's so seldom that I get to make anything for anyone but Charles and myself that I... You are going to say something, Miss Amelia? Yeah, I'm almost ashamed of what I was going to say. But go ahead. Say it. You are among friends. Well, it, it's just that your accident... I mean, it happened here... Do you like homemade apple pie, Mr. Clarence? I do not think I ever eat any. No, come to think of it, I do not. Then you will. And roast beef? Yorkshire pudding, brown potatoes, and I have a whole cellar full of canned fruits just waiting to be put into pie. Look, Miss Amelia, maybe it is better if you do not go to so much trouble for somebody you do not even know. But I want to. It gets rather lonesome here. And you seem so nice. Yeah? I seem nice? Now, Now, this isn't getting you some nourishment. Come, come. Eat the rest of the broth. Well, 
Well, that is the way it goes. Milk Year is now in a nice spot to get the lettuce and the 10,000 fish. But what happens? Well, I will tell you about it in a minute. And now, back to the Damon Runyon Theater and the famous story, Breach of Promise. Well, Milky and Willie stays in Miss Amelia Bodkin's house. It comes up some days later, and Milky is able to sit up. Personally, I think Milky could walk around with no head. He is that tough. But he has got to find the letters. So, what goes on is as follows. Do you care for more coffee, Mr. Clarence? Huh? Oh, no, no thanks, Charles. Then I'll take out the tray. Uh, uh, Charles. Yes, Mr. Clarence? Look, drop that Mr. stuff. You and me can talk man to man, huh? I suppose so. Uh, Miss Amelia, it seems to me that a nice old doll like she is should be married a long time ago. What happens that she is not? I think because she is in love with someone. Is that not the usual reason for marriage? You don't understand. The man she loves is Mr. Jabez Tuesday. You've heard of him, haven't you? Yeah, in a roundabout way. Well, they met a long time ago. Then he invested some money in a business. It was her money. He never pays it back? Oh, yes, yes. With interest. But it, it just seemed that, that he became too busy. He came here less often. Now we see him only about once every five or six months. Uh-huh. Uh, does Miss Amelia have any proof that they are once in love? Proof? Well, yeah, you know, a guy writes letters, stuff like that. Oh, yeah, she has letters. Uh-huh. Funny about dolls, they keep things like that. That's the reason I asked. You know, dolls are soft that way. Yes, they are. She probably keeps the letters all tied up in a blue ribbon, huh? No, they're in that silver box right over there on the window table. Ah. Well, uh, thanks, Charles. For what, Clarence? For nothing. Yeah? Milky, this is Harry. Yeah. What is happening? I know where the letters are. Okay, okay. Uh, put the snatch on them and get out of there. Sure, tonight. I borrow another car. We will pick you up. Okay. It is a cinch, huh? Yeah, a cinch. Okay, see you later. Come in. I, I heard the phone ring. Uh-huh. Harry wants to know how I am. Oh. Well, I, I thought the phone might be for me, but I... I hope I didn't disturb you. No, not at all. I, I really came in for something. Yeah? I, I came in for this box. The box? Yes, there's something in it. Oh, it looks like it is a valuable box. Oh, it's very old, but what's in the box is worth a million dollars. A million? Maybe more like ten thousand. What? Uh, uh, nothing. Mr. Clarence, would you think me a foolish old woman if I talked to you about something? Like, for instance, about what? These are letters. Yeah, yeah, I see. I've kept them for years. Now I'm going to burn them. Huh? What for? You say they're worth a million? Not anymore. They were as long as I thought he'd come back. You are not really going to burn them? Yes. They don't mean anything now. He's going to marry someone. But look, if these letters... Oh, I mean, uh, the love letters, huh? Yes, they are. But then why burn them? Uh, m maybe you could sell them. Oh, no, that's silly. Not the way I oh, look at it. Here's one I've read it a thousand times. He wrote it to me after we'd had a quarrel. A silly, stupid little quarrel about another girl. Yeah? Well, well to get back she to the selling, I would like... She blonde hair. Oh, she was very pretty. Much prettier than I. I was jealous. And he and I had a fight. We didn't see each other for two days. Yeah, that, that's swell, but do not burn these letters. Oh, then he wrote me this letter. Listen, I'll read your part of yeah. it. Yeah. Sweetheart, can you forgive me? I was foolish and I admit it. 
Right now, I'm thinking of the last time I saw you with the evening sun turning your brown hair to bronze. No blonde hair could look like that. Darling, I hate blondes. I shall always hate them, and... <laughs> we made up then. Yeah, I see, but well, still, we ought to get back That's to... that, I guess. Plans change, don't they, Mr. Clarence? Not much. Uh, where are you going? Uh, to my room. With the letters? Why, yes. Why do you ask? Well, well look. You say you are going to burn them. Yes. You do not wish to change your mind? You actually seem disturbed about it. Well, you're very sympathetic. And I'm just a foolish old woman. Well, no, no, you I'm are not. I'm sorry I embarrassed you, but I, I wanted to talk to someone. Someone besides Charles. Look, Miss Amelia, I am thinking that burning those letters will be a very distasteful job. Why do you not let me do it for you? That's very kind and thoughtful of you. It is nothing at all. I really do hate to burn them myself. I... If you will give me the box? Well, I... It's the least I can do for you, Miss Amelia. All right. Here. Thank you. You will not regret this action on your part. You can use the fireplace there. Good night, and thank you. Good night, Miss Amelia, and thank you. This is Milker. What's the matter? Nothing. I just want to tell you that that this is going to be tougher than I think. What are you talking about? You say you know where the letters are. Yeah, but strictly speaking, they are not now in the same place. Look, it is all very well for you to be in such a soft spot, but do not forget that there are ten G's awaiting us. You will please remember. I remember. But there is something else that comes up. Do not pick me up tonight. In fact, do not pick me up until I give you the word. Goodbye. Well, that is the way it stands. And the next day is Saturday, and the day that comes after is bound to be Sunday. And it is on Sunday that something happens at Miss Amelia Bodkin's house. Milk here is sitting on the porch with Charles and Miss Amelia when a big town car drives up in front and stops. And the scene is as follows. Jabez! Oh, Jabez! Mr. Tuesday, sir. Mr. Tuesday. Hello, Amelia. Oh. Hello, child. Amelia, darling, can you ever forgive me? Jabez, why, what do you mean? Oh, I was a fool, a stupid idiot, and I... Oh. Oh, oh, Jabez, this is Mr. Clarence. Mr. Clarence, this is Mr. Jabez Tuesday. Yeah, I recognize him from his pictures, which are in all the papers. Uh, I... Yeah, how do you do? Pretty good, I guess. Yes, I... Uh, so Sit down, they... Mr. Tuesday. Enjoy oh, the air. Jabez, it's so nice to see you. Oh, Amelia, I want to talk with you. I, I must. Why, of course, Jabez. We can go in the house. I'm sure Mr. Clarence will excuse us. With a great deal of pleasure. <laughs> go right ahead. Yes, please. yes, excuse us, please. Come along, Jabez. This is very odd. It is? Why? Why, Mr. Tuesday never comes out here on Sunday, and... Uh, Maybe there is something that changes his mind. He seemed very excited, didn't he? Yeah, he does seem a little upset. Wonder why. Charles! Yes, Mr. Clarence? Look in the window. The window? Yeah, yeah, right here. They... They're kissing each other. Uh-huh. Charles, it looks like Miss Amelia has got her guy back. I don't understand. Maybe you are not supposed to, Charlie. Just take things as they come, I always say. Just take things as they come. But you can bet your last bob that Miss Amelia Botkin will be Mrs. Jabez Tuesday any day now. it seems that Mr. Jabez Tuesday and Miss Amelia Bodkin get together. But there is still a few things that need a little clearing up. And they get cleared up when I hear the rest of the story, which I will tell to you in a minute. Like 
I say, there are a few things that need clearing up. And the clearing up comes that night in Mindy's. Harry is just finishing telling me what happens before, and the scene is as follows. So, that is that. It is? But uh, there are a few things I do not understand. Uh Uh-huh. No, no, what I mean is, what happens? Well, it happens that I sent the letters to Miss Valerie Scarwater. What? You sent Mr. Tuesday's letters to Miss Bodkin, to his fiancée? That is what he does. At first, I am burned enough to put the blast on milk here. Yeah, but I sent the letters to Miss Scarwater. And it seems she is a blonde, so it is better than even money she does not like the letter referring to blondes. So, she slugs Mr. Jabez Tuesday with an 18-carat vanity case and turns him out. Then is when he discovers he loves Miss Bodkin. But what about your 10 G's? You do not get them. Oh, yes, we do. We have got Mr. Tuesday over a barrel. He gives us the money. But there is one thing for which we are very mad at Mr. Tuesday, and that is why we wish to locate Judge Farber. You get 10 G's and you are mad? Yeah. You remember he tells us that we should collect the silverware so this looks like an ordinary robbery? Yeah, I remember. Well, as it turns out, we do not get the silverware. In fact, we go back there some nights later to collect it, and we are turned away by a shotgun. After he promises us we can have the silver. So? So, we wish to locate Judge Farber to find out if we can sue Mr. Jabez Tuesday for breach of promise. And so ends the famous story, Breach of Promise. For another great Damon Runyon story, listen in again next week to... The Damon Runyon Theater. The Damon Runyon Theater with John Brown as Broadway is directed by Richard Sandville and the stories adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. This is a Mayfair production. Tonight, the makers of Anison for the fast, prolonged relief of headache pain bring you another thrilling adventure of Ellery Queen, the celebrated gentleman detective. Ellery Queen invites you to match wits with him as he relates another story of a crime he alone unraveled. Before revealing the solution, he gives you a chance to solve the mystery. Anison's guest, armchair detective, who is here with us in the studio, is Jose Ferrer. And now, here's your Anison host, Ellery Queen. Thank you, Don Hancock, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's case is about one of the toughest kid gangs I have ever met. I call it The Adventure of the Green Gorillas. Jeep. The coast clear? Yeah, Nux. Big guy in his flop, Nux. His lights on, Shimmy. Let's go. This is it. Here it goes. Maybe Johnny Rack's on the lamb. Ah, Rack ain't scared of lousy cops. Freeze. Hey. Bunch of kids. It's grand. Johnny, wait a minute. What do you want? We're a committee from the Green Gorillas. Our gang runs this neighborhood, Mr. Rack. We got them all scared stiff. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm impressed. Come on, what do you want? Well, could you listen to a business proposition, Johnny? Sure. Inside. Gee. Thanks, Mr. Rack. Hey, Shimmy, this is something, huh? Cheap, look at his rod. Hands off, kid. Hey, Mr. Rack, you killed four guys, didn't you? Did I? All right, make your pitch, kids, and fade. What's on your mind? Well, Johnny, my name is Nuxarelli. I'm Jeep Williams. And I'm Shimmy Odess. Up to now, Johnny, we've been pulling kid stuff. But we got a secret leader, the main gorilla. We get our orders from him, see? And now he wants us to go in a swiping cars. We just lifted one, Mr. Rack. A brand new bus. Mm-hmm. There ought to be heavy sugar in that racket. We lift the cars, you dispose them for us, Johnny. On a 50-50 split with the organization. How's it set, Mr. Rack? Would you do it? Come here. Huh? The three of you. Any right guy that pals up with Johnny Rack's got to be able to take it, see? Take what? That's... Oh! oh. 
Hey, what you want to sack nuts for? Oh. <laughs> no, Mr. Rack, not me. Oh. <laughs> well, congratulations. Come on, get up off the floor. Yeah. Now, about this stolen car operation. Nick's on those new cars. They're too hot these days. Pick up good used ones and maybe I'll help you out. Hey, did you hear that, Jimmy? We're in Jeep with Johnny Rack. Well, thanks, Johnny. What do we do with the new car we just swiped? What do you do with it? Where is it? Parked right outside your house. Oh, you stupid little... Get it away from there. Ditch that heap up town, quick. And then come back. Little punks. So you're Bobby Brown. Oh, yes, sir. Why, Inspector, he's just a child. I'm 16. Yeah, Bob is small for his age, Miss Porter. He's an orphan. Supports himself selling papers. Lives at the Y. Knows Groove Street inside out. And he's plenty tough. Now, Bobby. I can handle myself, Sarge. <laughs> that sounds okay to me, Ellery. Bob, juvenile delinquency is on the rise. Gangs of street kids are mugging, breaking into stores, stealing cars. They've even got guns. We're especially worried about the green gorillas, Bob. Yeah, I know him, Inspector. And if they ain't straightened out now, they'll wind up like that Groove Street hero of theirs, Johnny Rack. Who's Johnny Rack? A gangster? Yes, Nicky. A cheap rat who's about two jumps ahead of the chair. In fact, lately, Rack's been showing some interest in this green gorilla gang. I didn't know that, Billy. Really. <laughs> Dad, that makes the assignment dangerous. I'll be okay, Mr. Queen. I want this job. You want it? Why, Bobby? I got my reasons. Uh, maybe Bob's father dying in the chair for killing a cop during a robbery has something to do with it, huh, kid? Just give me a shot at it. You know what we want you to do, Bob? Join the Green Gorillas and find out who's giving them their orders. The secret head of the gang. That's it. Grab their leader and they'll fold. We've got to. They're headed for a lot of trouble. Oh, well, there must be some other way to find out. Nicky, there isn't a member of that gang older than 15. No, this has to be an inside job. And only a kid from the streets can get in. I'll be okay. All right, Bob. Now, look. I'll stick as close to you as I can. But the first time you feel the heat's on and I'm not within call, don't go to the Y. Don't go to any of the places you usually go. Come to my apartment. Understand, Bob? Yes, sir. I had a duplicate key made today in case you come when nobody's home. Carry it with you at all times, Bob. Here, take it. All right, sir. Getting you into the gorillas won't be hard if you follow orders. Well, what's my orders? Well, Bob... Tonight, you're going to be on Groove Street committing a crime. Committing a crime? That's right, Nicky. Bob's going to roll a drunk. Who, Mr. Queen? Me. Hey, kid, where is that bar? Huh? It's right there, mister. The Sally, Mr. Queen? Yes, Bob. But this is an alley, kid. It's a dark alley. Oh, well, the joint's at the other end. Come on, mister. Where? I don't see a thing. Well, it's further in the alley, mister. Okay, Bob. You think they fell for it? I think so, Mr. Queen. They spotted us. Jeep, Jimmy, over here. They went in this alley. There they are. Sock me with this rubber hose. In the shoulder, Bob. Hard. Yeah. Hey, let go of me. Now, yeah. oh, Bobby, hit me. Yeah. Ow. Yeah. Oh. Now roll me, Bobby. Take my money away. Okay. Yeah, where's this sucker's roll? Oh, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh. All right, guys, jump. Yeah. Hold him. Uh, give me back my dough. Shut up. Oh, your dough. Uh, it's his dough, ain't it? <laughs> no, it's our dough. A hundred and fifty bucks. Oh, wow. Hey, chump, you know who we are? The Green Gorillas. And you're operating in our territory. Jimmy, how's the lush? How cold. Hey, this punk used a rubber hose. He's half nux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's your name? Brown. Bob Brown. Bob, your mama wants you, Bobby. Shut <laughs> up, Jimmy. Where you from, Brown? Stucker Street. Look, that's my role. I rolled them. The green gorillas only split with the green gorillas. Bobby. <laughs> you kid around with my name once more, I'll shove your teeth right down your throat. Why, Bobby? <laughs> oh, 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 you what? stop hitting him, Brown, or I'll plug you. Huh? Let me at him. I'll monopolize him nuts. I'll tear him apart. Stop blowing, Jimmy. Stuck you with your eyes open. Jeep, store the heater. Huh? Ron, I'm going to do something for you. You can give me back that dough. Okay, I will. What? I'll give you back half of it if you join the Green Gorillas. That's our bylaws. Every gorilla splits 50-50 with the organization. What do you say? 
Uh, if I play lone wolf, I get it all. Like tonight? <laughs> Look, Mug, it's better to run with a smart mob. You protect it. And you don't have to figure out your jobs. They'll figure it out for us. Oh, yeah? By who? You don't believe we got a secret leader? The head gorilla, that's by who? He's the brains. Not even Nux knows who he is. We get written orders left in a hideout spot. Button up, Jeep. Well, Bron, you want us? I don't see what you want to take him in for. Ah, pipe down, Shimmy. This guy's okay. We can use a guy like him. Be smart, Bob. Okay, I'll join. <laughs> that's better. Sure. Well, what do I do? Come to the empty warehouse in the corner of Dockery and Kessler Street tomorrow night. Half past eight. It's going to be an important meeting. A real big shot's coming to talk to us. What a break. What big shot? He don't believe nothing. Johnny Rack. Oh, hey, the drunk's coming out of it. Yeah. Jeep. Huh? Give me the rod. The rod? Here. Knox, what are you going to do? Plug him. You're going to let him have it, Knox? What's the matter, you yell at Jeep? You know what Johnny Rack said. Stand back, fellas. Oh, he's stinko. He didn't see nothing. Come on, let's blow. What do you say? Okay. Scatter. Right. Come on. Sergeant, Nicky, you can come out now. Ellery. Oh, I thought that little gangster was going to shoot you. So did I, Maestro. I'm still shaking. Oh, it was just a bluff to impress the other kids. He's trying to act like Johnny Rack. And Rack's going to be in that warehouse tomorrow night. Not so good. No. Oh, gosh, I hope nothing happens to Bobby Brown. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the beginning of our mystery. And now, back to our story. It's the following night in an abandoned warehouse on the east side. What are they doing in there now, Ellery? They're still swearing in new members. Here, Nicky, look through this peephole. Need to get that amplifier working? Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying, Inspector. Well, where's Johnny Rack, Ellery? There are just boys in there. Apparently their hero hasn't arrived yet. Sergeant, fix that amplifier. They're going to swear in Bobby Brown. Yeah, I, I think I... I got it. Hey, there it is. All right. All right, gorillas. That's friend Nux, aged 15. We got to vote on one more candidate. This guy here. Take a good look at him, boys. Hiya, fellas. That's my Bobby. Shut up, Feeney. What's his name, Nux? Hey, what did he ever do? He's Bob Brown from Stucker Street. Oh. 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 Last night he rolled a drunk 150 bucks worth. 150 bucks? Yeah. yeah. He can handle himself, too. Jimmy O'Desk can tell you. Hi, huh, Jimmy. I slapped me when I wasn't looking. Hey, you. Okay. Okay, we vote. All against? All in favor? All in favor. Here they come. Quiet, Nicky. Quiet. Chief Williams, swear in Bob Brown. Bob Brown. Roll up your right sleeve. Right. Ellery, that poor Jeep has a knife. Shh. It's part of their mumbo jumbo. Brown? You gotta swear in your own blood. Like this. Oh, hey. oh, the little brutes. Dip your finger in it, Brown. Now, say it to me. I swear to follow the orders of our secret leader. I swear to follow the orders of our secret leader. I will never snitch on another gorilla. I will never snitch on another gorilla. The penalty for rats is death. The penalty for rats is death. Everybody! Bob, you're in. Get him around set, Billy. Yes, he's over the hump. There shouldn't be any danger now. Hold it. You little punch. It's Johnny Rack. Give him a hand, fellas. Oh, that's their hero. No vision. Look at Rack eat it up. Okay, okay, okay. Something's wrong. Look at Rack's face. Ellery. So you think you're a smart mob? What's the matter, Johnny? My nuts, you're just plain stupid. You gotta use your noggin in this racket. What do you think you're doing, playing potsy? We, you done something wrong, Mr. Rack? Yeah. You just took a stoolie into your gang. Henry, oh, hold it. Man. A stoolie? For the cops, Johnny? He ain't stooling for the YMCA. Oh, yeah. Need to get set. Oh, yeah. Necessary fire. Gotcha, Inspector. Wait, wait. Quiet! We swore in four guys tonight, Johnny. Which one's the canary? Yeah, Mr. Rack, tell us who it is. Yeah, tell yeah, us. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
This kid calls himself Bob Brown. I know it. I know it. Hey, Brown, huh? Jimmy. Do something. They'll hurt him. Inspector, we better show. Hey, Cavern and Billy. Just a bit longer. This may smoke out that secret meat hole. Johnny, where'd you get your information? Why, you little punk, I said it. Ain't that enough? We all know you're a right guy, Johnny. A big shot. Yeah, sure. But we don't want to make a mistake. This is an important thing. Could you give us some proof? (laughs) Okay. You, Stooley. Empty your pockets. Come on, Brown, do it. Empty his pockets? Don't tell me. Is there a key in this stuff, Nux? The key? The key? Yeah, Johnny. Here's a key. Ask him what door it fits. Ellery, the key you gave Bobby in headquarters. Brown, what's this key? Nux, it's... It's just a key, that's all. Yeah, just a key. The key to the apartment of Ellery Queen. Queen, that's oh, right. Hey, wait, wait. We gotta go ahead with our meeting, fellas. We can't keep Johnny Rack waiting. It's okay, Nuts. Fetch, Patsy, yeah. Yeah. take this rat brown in a secret hideout. Keep him there. We'll meet you there after the meeting. And give him what's coming to him. Come on, come on. Yeah, you don't leave. Leave. Oh, that's you a secret hideout. Maybe that's where that boy... Yeah. Maestro. Why'd you tear the apparatus out of the wall? Take it all with you, Billy. Get it out of here. Inspector, what? those two boys are hustling Bobby out. We'll tell him to the hideout. Bobby will be okay. Come on, Billy. I bet we pick up their leader, Inspector. Nikki, go with Dad and Billy. Well, what about you, Ellery? I'm staying here. Go on, Nikki. But Ellery. Nikki, I'm going to show up that cheap gangster rat in front of those kids. What? Now get going. You're going out there to face him alone? Ellery, you haven't even got a gun. I mustn't have a gun, Nikki. That's the whole point. Now beat it. You mustn't be found here. Ellery, you fool. Well, here goes. So you must stick with Johnny Rack and you'll... Wind up in the hot seat, Rack, with you. Jump him! Nobody here. You're alone, Quinn. I don't get it. He's got no cops with him. He ain't even healed. How do you figure it, Johnny? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. But there's one thing, sure. <laughs> he's here, he's alone, he's got no rod. But let's have some fun, huh, guys? <laughs> yeah, it's <sure. laughs> All right, Queen. Down on your knees. Don't be silly. Huh? You don't seem to get it, sucker. This is a real rod I'm pointing at you with real bullets. Now get down. Hand me that gun. Hand, hand you my rod? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what I'll do with you. Take it away from me. Oh, <laughs> I, crack, I will. What? Oh, Stay where you are, Queen. Don't move. Don't move. Look at him, boys. The great Johnny Rack. He's shaking. What's the matter, Johnny? You scared of him? <laughs> scared him? What a dirty... And why don't you plug him, Rack? Yes, Rack. Why don't you? I'll plug you when I get... Good and ready. You're stalling, Rack. Shut up. You can play big bad man in front of a gang of kids hungry for excitement. But when the chips are down, Rack, you're a yellow rat. Shut up. You can shut me up, Rack. Just shoot. Hey, Johnny. Why don't you shoot him? Listen, in my time, I've knocked off... Sure you have, Rack. In a dark alley in the back. That's how rats always kill. But you won't shoot me here, Rack. You have over 20 witnesses. Sure. I'm no sucker. Then you're not going to shoot me, huh? (laughs) Rack. Give me that gun. Hand it over. I'll take another step. Then I'll have to take it away from you. Stay back. Take a look at your hero now, fellas. Anyone would think I had the gun. Dirty lousy. And now I have. Hey. Here, nuts. Hold this piece of junk for me. Me? Yeah, Mr. Queen. Now, Rack. Let's see how good you are without a gun. Oh, I'll kill you for that, Queen. I'll kill you. Well, come on. Up on your pants, you know Rack. Johnny, right. you're wide open. Hey, look at him. He's really well, get it. up. You are going right. to kill me. Uh, on your feet, Rack. Uh, or have you had enough? Yeah. Have I had enough? Jay, not that. Hold it, boys. 
There's your tough gangster. Look at him. Pretty? That's where you guys are heading. There's something about crime that makes a rat out of a man. There's something about fighting crime that makes a man even out of a rat. There isn't a cop on the force, any rookie, who couldn't and wouldn't have done just what I did. Think it over. Hey, Maestro. Bobby, come on. Son, Hello. Sonny, all right. Hey, Sarge, look what Mr. Queen done to Johnny Rack. Get up on your feet, you two-bit punk. Lay off me, will you? Yep. Hey, what's this piece of paper just fell out of his pocket? Let me have that, Sergeant. So, you were acting the big shot even when you told these boys about Bobby Brown, eh, Rack? What do you mean, Henry? Here's how he knew Bobby was working with me, Dad. This note. Johnny Rack. Tip off Nux O'Reilly. A guy named Bobby Brown is being taken into the Green Gorillas tonight. He's a stoolie working for Ellery Queen. He's got a key to Queen's apartment in his pocket. Signed, the Chief Gorilla. Rack, where'd you get this note? Where'd you get it? We oh, shoved it under my door this afternoon. You got nothing on me. You're wrong, Rack. We found enough hot car records in those kids' secret hideout to pin a 20-year rap on your hide. And also on these young hoodlums, Ellery. Dad, I have a hunch we may not have to press charges against these boys. I think they're seeing things a bit differently. Right, Nux, Jeep, Shimmy, all of you? You sure opened our eyes, Mr. Queen. The only thing is... That secret leader of yours, Nux, the chief gorilla, is that it? Yeah, Mr. Queen, we don't know who he is. He'll take revenge on us, Mr. Queen, if we even... But he won't, Shimmy. Because I'm going to produce him for you right now. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our mystery for tonight. Nikki, will you introduce our guest armchair detective? Yes, Ellery. Tonight, our guest is the very distinguished actor and producer... Jose Ferrer. Hello, Mr. Ferrer. Uh, good evening, Ellery. I understand that you have produced and are currently starring in the Broadway dramatic success Cyrano de Bergerac. That's right, Ellery. And I wish I were as sure of the ending of your story tonight as I am each evening of the outcome of ours. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into that problem of ours, Mr. Ferrer. Our question tonight is in two parts. Who do you think is the secret leader of the Green Gorillas? And how do you know? Well, I... Haven't any idea who the leader is. Oh, <laughs> now, Mr. Ferrer, don't tell me we've got. I wrote. Load. Listen, I wrote down a list of the people in the story, and I don't know who on earth could possibly be the leader of the Green Gorillas. Mm-hmm. Isn't there anything in those notes and illustrations? <laughs> I know it is neither one of you, and I don't think it's me. But that's <laughs> well, let's see now. Suppose we help Mr. Ferrer along. Do you think we should? He needs it. Or shall we let well, him stew it out? How far? How far would you like to help him? Well, let's see. Suppose we help him along by saying that uh, he'll find out in just a minute what the solution is. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Ferrer. Thank you. And now, here is Don Hancock. Oh, hey, come on, Maestro, yeah, let's hear it. Now. What do you say? If you give me a chance. And we just found a note in Rack's pocket from the chief gorilla the secret leader of you kids. He revealed the fact that Bobby Brown was an undercover agent for me. How did this secret leader know that? That is funny. Yeah, well, maybe he saw through that lush roll and act you and Bobby put on last night, Maestro. Or saw Bobby coming out of police headquarters yesterday. Uh, Possible, granted. But this secret leader knew even more than that. He knew that Bobby was carrying a certain key. He said so in his note. Well, it's a cinch at some kid in this gang. Maybe he accidentally saw the key, Ellery. I'll grant that possibility too, Dad. But the secret leader knew still more, according to his note. He knew that key Bobby was carrying was a key to Ellery Queen's apartment. How did he know that? How could he have known that? It's a duplicate key I had made. A duplicate key is made of unmarked brass or some other alloy. You can't possibly identify it as Ellery Queen's key or John Jones's key just by looking at it. Dad, how did you know that was my key? Why, you said so, Ellery, in my office at headquarters. In other words, I identified it. Now, who was present in your office at headquarters when I identified that key as the key to the Queen apartment? Why, you, me, Vidi, Nicky, and and Bobby. Mm Mm-hmm. And Bobby. Bobby? Boys, I want you to meet your chief gorilla, the secret leader of your gang, 
Bobby Brown. Sergeant, oh, you... grab him. No, oh, no, you don't. Let me go, you flat foot jerk. Let me go. I'll give you what my old man gave that other flat foot. Let me go. Let me go. Now, let me show you fellows what suckers you've been. This kid, your great leader, the one you were all scared of, the one you took orders from. What did he do as soon as the heat was on? He knew we were out to break up your gang because by accident, Sergeant Veely picked him to play undercover agent in the guerrillas. He didn't have to take the job, but he took it. Why? Because like Johnny Rack, he's a rat. He knew the gang would be broken up, and he saw a way to get in solid with the police so that after you guys took the rat, he could become secret leader of another gang and laugh at you and the police, too. Oh, Don't believe him, guys. It's a lie. You didn't have to write that anonymous note to Johnny, but you wrote it, Bobby. Knowing you were never in danger. That we were covering you every second. And that the boys would take you to the secret hideout where the police would follow and find those hot car records which implicated the whole gang. You ratted on your pals to save your own neck. What are you guys acting so surprised about? What did you expect? Honor? One for all and all for one? Hero stuff? A pal never squeals? Malarkey, you've been reading too many funny papers. This is the way it really is. Johnny Rack. Bobby Brown. If you wanted real excitement, real pals, real hero stuff, you'd get on the other side of the fence. But, of course, that takes guts. Come on, Dad, let's get these two out of here. <clears throat> right, son. Let's go, Rack. I want a mouthpiece. Let me talk to a mouthpiece. You too, little Caesar. Yeah, sure, Sarge. Just don't let those guys get at me. Coming, Nicky? Right, Ellery. Uh, Mr. Queen. Hmm? Oh, yes, Knox. Uh, what is it? Well, the boys are me. We've been sort of... Mr. Queen... Would you mind if we changed the name of our organization from the Green Gorillas to the Queen Gorillas? We'd sort of like to give it a whirl your way. Come around in the morning and we'll talk it over. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the solution to our mystery. Thanks again, Jose Ferrer, for being our guest armchair detective this evening. And, as mementos of your visit with us, Anison is proud to present to you this beautiful Gruen Very Thin wristwatch, this autographed copy of my new anthology, The Queen's Awards, 1946, and a subscription to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Now, Ellery, what about next week? Well, next week, Don, Nikki and I run down to Florida for a short vacation from crime. But, of course, we run headlong into a case filled with a lot of thrills and a lot of laughs. I call it The Adventure of the Big Brain. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcast. Good morning, Mr. Hampton. Good morning. Mr. Rumgo is expecting you. I know, sir. Will you please come this way? Nice and cool in here out of the street? Yes, it is very cool in here. Mr. Rumgo is in his office. Mr. Hampton to see you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Hampton. This is a great pleasure. Good morning, Mr. Rumgo. I had heard that you were in Bombay. The news gets around, eh? When it concerns an eminent lover of precious stones such as yourself, naturally we hear of it. Very nicely put. I always love coming to Bombay. I'm on my way home to London, catching this afternoon's plane. And uh, of what service can I be to you, Mr. Hampton? I'd like you to look at this. I bought it yesterday. Thank you. I know you're the one jeweler in Bombay who can identify it. A black ruby. That's what I hoped you'd say. A cabochon ruby. Weight, 202 carats. Color, almost violet. I know all about it. I handled it once. There is no other ruby like it in all the world. I backed my hunch. I knew I'd got a bargain. It depends what you mean by a bargain, sir. 
I would not buy it at any price. Money is not everything, even to a jeweler. Mr. Hampton, do not keep it. But what's wrong? What you don't mean... Get rid of it. No matter what the cost, give it away. It is not called the Black Ruby for nothing. It will bring you disaster and death. BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Stim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Black Ruby. What's that noise? Sounds as if something's gone wrong. One of the engines. Good. I well, can't see anything out of this window. Well, I've flown enough to notice something's up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Rawlinson speaking to you. I have to report that we have an emergency. One of the engines has just cut out. Now a second has let us down. Oh ah, I knew it was something. What the devil's going to happen, eh? Well, we'll soon know. We also have what we term a runaway propeller. And we have come too far over the Indian Ocean to turn back. So I intend to ditch. Oh, 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 I hope there are no sharks down there. Oh, I, oh, I can't swim. Oh, I can't swim. There is no cause for alarm. A ship is below us. We are in radio contact with her, and she is aware of our plight. Please put on your life jacket, fasten your safety belt, and follow the instructions of the stewardess. Don't panic, and good luck. Good morning. Oh, good morning. You're Mr. Hampton? Yes. Dr. Morell's expecting me. Yes, I know Mr. Hampton. Come in. <laughs> what are you staring at? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I was just... What? Oh, I can't help wondering what it must be like to, to have gone through what you did and, and find yourself back in London alive. Feels pretty good, Miss Rail. Oh, I'm so sorry if it annoyed you. Uh, will you come... Mr. But what you're telling me is merely the after effects of shock. Uh, your wife must have been profoundly affected when she heard about the airplane. No, it wasn't until after she knew about the Black Ruby. Now, she's convinced, Dr. Morell, this hoodoo threatens our lives. And, of course, she's got the air crash to support it. And your wife is adamant that you get rid of it? It's ludicrous to believe an inanimate object can possibly influence anyone's life. I fear that superstition dies hard. I don't have to tell you how many people agree with your wife. The jeweler I took it to in Bombay to okay it told me he wouldn't handle it at any price. Warned me it would bring death and disaster. I haven't told my wife that or about the other chap. Who was that? The man I bought it from. Now, he came to my hotel just before I left and confessed he hadn't told me about its evil reputation. I privately decided he wanted to get it back for another customer who was offering more than I'd pay. Mm, possibly, you have no reason to believe that there is any other motive behind your wife's objection to its remaining in your possession? Uh, Sonia is a bit neurotic, has been for some time. Before this present matter? Yes, she's been very nervy, full of silly fears. Uh, to what do you attribute her state of mind? Well, I'm a rich man. Perhaps that's the trouble with Sonia. I mean, she's got everything she could want, money and security. The two are not necessarily synonymous. Uh, for example, uh, the fact that you yourself are wealthy enough to be able to follow your bent uh, may be a reason for your wife to feel insecure. I don't understand. Uh, you travel in quest of precious stones uh, such as this ruby. Yes, I do. Uh, does your wife accompany you on these journeys? Oh, Sonia hates traveling. She, she's not particularly interested in precious stones. Consequently, your marriage suffers from long absences away from her. Uh, you appear independent of her, and a situation is created in which the seeds of insecurity are sown in your wife's mind. I, I hadn't looked at it that way before. But it's become much graver the past few days since I got back. Sonia's deadly serious about this, and I'm afraid she might do something drastic. Has your wife any special interests uh, with which to occupy her mind? Oh, she does plenty of entertaining. I mean, lots of friends. 
Too many, unfortunately. What is so unfortunate about making friends? Well, she is an extremely attractive woman, Doctor. Plenty of men always around her. I see. Uh, I mean, one chap she's got in tow now. Well, I, I don't mean there's anything to it, but he's a bit of a no-good. Doctor, I was wondering... I don't know how to get Sonia to come and consult you as a patient. I understand. Uh, but I'm giving a little dinner party the day after tomorrow. I'd like you to come and meet her. I don't know if you're interested in precious stones. I should like to meet your wife. Fine. I'm very grateful to you. I'll confirm with Miss Frail if I'm free that evening. Uh, she's in the laboratory. Uh, Miss Frail? Coming, Doctor. Oh, oh, yes. What is it? Let it test you by nearly knocking it down. I shouldn't do that, my dear Miss Frail. Uh, we don't want to be annihilated by poisonous gas. Oh, you don't mean, Doctor. Oh, no, it's all right, Miss Frail. <laughs> I was merely joking. Oh. Oh, you made my heart turn over. As if I would leave anything of that nature there while you were about. Oh. Have I any evening engagement the day after tomorrow? I, I don't think so, Doctor. I'll just check. Are you interested in precious stones, Miss Freya? Oh, they're very pretty, yes, but I've never owned any, except a brooch my grandmother gave me, which I'm afraid I lost. Oh, I'm sorry. You wouldn't be if you'd seen the brooch. Yes, it, it was rather hideous. I was wondering if you'd care to come to dinner with Dr. Morell. You might like to see this ruby I've been telling him about. Oh, I'd love to. Uh, no, no, we've, uh, we've no engagement, Doctor, that evening. Good. I'd expect you both. I'll show you up. There you are, driver. Thank you, sir. Sonia, you there? I'm just coming down. Can I give you a sherry? No, thanks. Sure? Yes, quite sure. Well, I'll go and give myself one. By the way, I've asked Dr. Morell to our little dinner party. Oh, yes? And Miss Frey, the secretary, is coming too. I wish you weren't asking anyone at all. Why, Sonia? You know why. And you know why you're asking the others. Just to show off that horrible ruby. Oh, Sonia, my dear, do Oh, try. you can laugh at my But fears. I'm not laughing. It's only that I want to reassure you. You can do that by getting rid of it. I won't feel safe until you do. But, Sonia... Even if you have to give it away. If, if you loved me, if I really meant anything to you, you'd do as I asked. Uh, what's that? The ceiling. The chandelier. Look out, quick! <laughs> it's all right, Sonia. You're all right. <laughs> it might have killed us. It might have killed us. It must have been too heavy for the ceiling. It's the ruby. The Black Ruby! You look so lovely, Sonia. Aubrey, dear, you always say that to me. Well, I always mean it. That's what's so marvelous about you. It doesn't matter if I see you for lunch or if we go racing or... Oh, well, I like you are now in that heavenly dress. You always look wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad you liked my dress. <laughs> it's the first time out. I uh, hope you didn't mind my nipping in before the others arrived. It was a chance to see you alone. No, of course not. Will you have some more sherry? Mm, yes, thanks. Uh, what's this about this Dr. Morell coming? Oh, I suppose Guy thinks I need a psychiatrist. You know, this fuss I'm making about his ruby. Doesn't trust your wifely intuition. Oh, let's not talk about it. I know something terrible is going to happen, but it's... It's no good. Well, I want to talk about it, Sonia. I want to try and help you. But if Guy won't get rid of it, what can you do? Well, I, I don't know exactly, but at least you know I'm sympathetic. You're awfully kind, Aubrey. How can I help it? You know I'd do anything for you. You shouldn't talk like that. I, I can't bear to think of you worrying, Sonia. Supposing something did happen, I agree with you. This thing may have some ghastly hoodoo on it. Surely the chandelier yesterday oh, wasn't... Oh, was terrible. We might easily have been killed. If I were your husband, I wouldn't hesitate. Hello, Aubrey. Uh, oh, hello, Guy. The others haven't arrived yet, Sonia, my dear? No. I was a little early, I'm afraid. Uh, my watch was fast. Got a drink, I see. Yes, thank you. What wouldn't you hesitate about if you were Sonia's husband? Uh, huh? Uh, weren't you saying something when I came in? Yes, I, I was telling him about the chandelier crashing down. Yes, it sounds a darn near thing. It was horrible. 
But I can't attribute it to anything supernatural. I mean, if that's what Sonia's trying to make you believe. You seem pretty sure of that. Do you believe in the evil eye? I don't know that I believe in it. I like to keep an open mind. Well, as I've tried to explain to Sonia, the blessed chandelier might have fallen at any time. The fool who put it up screws into the laughing plaster yes, instead of beam as it should have Oh, that, that sounds like Bill and Helen. Oh, hello, Sonia. Hello. Hello, guys. Nice to see you, Helen. Hello, Bill. Hello, Hi. Helen, darling. How nice of you to come. Hello, Bill. Oh, good evening, Sonia. Oh, hello, Guy. Good evening, Aubrey. Hello there. Hello, Helen. Why, it's dear Aubrey. Well, I hope it won't be too stodgy an evening for you. Stodgy? What's stodgy about a whacking great ruby? Ah, when are we going to see it, Guy? Well, I'm going to keep you in suspense for a bit. Must we see it at all? Share of you, Helen? Oh, thank you, Guy. Well, you use the cocktail, won't you, Bill? Oh, thanks. What's the matter, Helen, darling? Oh, it's, it's nothing. What is it? Oh, it's re- nothing, really. I wasn't sure that we ought to have come. Oh, enough. do shut up, Bill. I'm perfectly Not all right. Knock back some sherry. Come on, it'll do you good. Ah, here's Miss Frail and Dr. Morell. Good evening, Mr. Hampton. Now, let me introduce everybody. Now, uh, this is my wife. How good of you both to come. How do you do? How do you good do? Good evening. Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds, Dr. Morell, Miss Frail. Good evening. How do you do? Good evening. Good evening. And this is Mr. Aubrey Green. Oh, hello there. It's all right, Sonia. I hadn't forgotten. Anybody. How do you do, Mr. Green? Good evening. Uh, what about a drink, Miss Frail? A sherry or a cocktail? Uh, thank you. I'd like a sherry. Doctor? I would like some sherry. You know, this is a, a very great thrill for us, Dr. Morell, the famous criminologist in person. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Well, I suppose you're used to being asked about crooks and crimes, eh, Doctor? Uh, the subject seems to arouse a certain amount of interest. It must be fascinating. And uh, what about you, Miss Frail? How does this life of excitement agree with you? Oh, one grows used to it, you know. I fear Miss Frail is growing increasingly blase. But I expect <laughs> it all becomes routine, coping with criminals and misfits. Even murderers don't come off a conveyor belt, Mrs. Hampton. Each is an individual human being. You know, I bet you're always being asked the old jackpot question, Dr. Morell. Why are you so interested in a lot of thugs and killers? Yes, it's a question that often comes up. And uh, what's the answer, Doctor? There, but for the grace of God, go I. Uh, you mean anybody might be a criminal, whoever he is, according to the way he's brought up? In other words, environment makes the murderer. Precisely. Well, uh, shall we go in and have dinner? <laughs> Jolly good idea. I'm starving. Right, come along, then, everybody. How about this guy? Glad you like it. Oh. What's the matter, Aubrey? Were you hoping he'd ask you to have some more? Yes, I was, rather. Oh, don't be sick, guy. Of course you can have some more. Of course, my dear Aubrey. <laughs> thank you. How about you, Dr. Morell? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, would you like some more coffee, Miss Frail? Yes, just a little bit. Bill, another spot of brandy? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. I'd like some more coffee. Here you are, Helen. Oh, thanks. I say, isn't it about time the big moment arrives? Ah, yes, the ruby. Oh, I'm longing to see it. Are you, Miss Frail? It sounds fabulous. Guy, you're not really going to show it around. At least there's no enormous chandelier hanging over oh, our head. Please, I wish you wouldn't. Oh, we must now, Sonia. That'd be like asking us here under false pretenses. Don't you agree, Dr. Morell? I should be interested to see it. Dr. Morell, you say it's a lot of nonsense that it can affect the lives of my husband or me. On the contrary, I would say that it has obviously made a great impact upon you. Well, it would certainly affect my bank manager's view of me if I owned the thing. It's funny, but... I've never been mad about jewelry. I don't know why. Oh, very convenient for your boyfriend, Miss Frail. To you, Dr. Morell, I suppose I'm being foolish and hysterical, believing that merely by its presence here, the ruby can cause something dreadful to happen. Uh, there have been many jewels which have supposedly exerted a baleful influence over their owners. Uh, rubies, particularly. Uh, perhaps because of their blood-like color. And they originate uh, from the mysterious... The East. Orloff ruby, for instance, and the Great Mogul. Uh, despite these legends uh, that have grown up about them, However, examination of the facts fails to support the notion that either good or evil follow in their wake. Obviously, they, they attract violence because of their value. And to possess them, people have gone to extreme lengths. Even murder. Oh, so it's not the ruby. It's those who want it who cause the trouble, eh? But what about that dreadful plane crash? If Guy hadn't had the ruby on him, it would never have happened. And the chandelier yesterday. Uh, the accidents you mentioned both have a logical explanation. Well, let's look at this wicked old jewel anyway. Come on, Guy, I'll take a chance. Yes, looking at it can't do any harm, sure. I think you're mad. Sonia, please. Oh, do show it as old time. Right. Here it is. Have you had it in your pocket all the time? Yes, in this little case. So that's why you spilled the soup. Open the case, Guy. There you are. Oh, oh, sir. oh, it's absolutely oh, marvelous. Wonderful. It's 
such a fantastic color. Almost. Well, more violet than red. Well, that's why it's called the black ruby, because it's so dark. Uh, one reason, yes. It's because of its black history. Because of the death and tragedy it's brought. Oh, may I hold it, Mr. Hampton? Of course. Look, I- I'll take it out of its case. Thank you. Uh, don't drop it, Miss Frail. Oh, of course I won't, Doctor. Oh, it's just like having something alive there in one's hand, almost as if it's breathing. Uh, breathing fire, eh, Dr. Moreau? Very impressive. Now, uh, after you, Miss Frail... The only chance I'll ever get of holding so much money in the hollow of my hand. There you are, Mr. Green. Thank you. Oh, yes, it certainly is out of this world. What's its weight, Guy? 202 carats. How old would it be? It's been in one Maharaja's family for 300 years. Oh, have you still got it, Aubrey? Helen would like to see it, wouldn't you, Helen? Uh, uh, Helen, uh, Helen, what's wrong? Uh, what's the matter, Mrs. Reynolds? She's faint. Helen, darling. Yeah, Dr. Morell, quick. If somebody would open a window... I've got a bit of stuff in. Yeah, yes. yes. I'll open it. Oh, oh, that's better. Lovely cool air. Is she all right, Doctor? There's nothing to worry uh, about. Uh, oh, uh, she's coming round. Uh, what happened? Oh, it's all right, darling. Not it's to worry, right. my dear. You're among uh, friends now. I suddenly felt everything it went black. Just a slight fainting attack. I've never done anything like this before. Oh, I thought you weren't looking so good before we oh. came. Feeling better? I just think I'd like to rest. Oh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll take you home. Yes, please. I, I'm so sorry, Sonia. Do forgive me, Guy. Well, of course. So sorry it happened. I, I'll get a taxi right away. There's plenty of the corner. Well, would you like me to come along with you, Bill? Oh, I don't think uh, it's necessary. No, I, no trouble at all. Just in case you need a hand. Can you stand up all right, Mrs. Uh, yes. Now, hang on to me. I'll go and see if Guy's got a taxi. Uh, is there anything I should give her, Doctor? Uh, just rest. I'm sure she'll be perfectly recovered by morning. I feel all right. Really, Taxi's I do. Taxi's here, Bill. Oh, thank you, Aubrey. Oh, come on, darling. The taxi's here. Well, uh, good night, Doctor. Good night, Miss Frail. Good night. Good night. I'm sure Mrs. Reynolds will soon be better. Oh, good night, Sonia. I'm so sorry about do, all this. Do forgive me for breaking up the party. Good night, Helen. I'll phone you in the morning. And now I suppose, Dr. Morell, you still think that horrible ruby can't affect people. Well, where did Mr. Hampton put it? Oh, oh, it's there in the case. My answer remains the same as before, Mrs. Hampton. Uh, you cannot blame its presence for the room's overheated temperature, uh, which contributed towards the fainting attack. Oh, poor thing. She did go out suddenly. Sorry about that, Dr. Morell, Miss Frail. I- is Helen all right? Yes, she's gone home with Bill and Aubrey. Aubrey? Yes, Helen. I see. He thought Helen might need his help. Oh, oh well. But, Guy, for the last time before anything really terrible happens, will you get rid of it? By the way, where is it? Oh, it's in its little case. Oh, did did you put it there? No, I thought you did. What is it? Guy! It isn't here. The ruby's gone. Doctor, the Reynolds house. Wait for us, driver. Okay, sir. Come along, Miss Frail. Oh, I can't think why all this mad rush, Dr. Murray. No, Miss Frail. No, I mean, well, where's the doorbell? Oh, oh, you've run it. I mean, well, if Mr. Reynolds took it or his wife, well, they must have come back home, so, so they're bound to be there. Uh, oh. Hello, Dr. Morell. Hello, Mr. Green. I was just going. How's Mrs. Reynolds? I thought I'd come along to see that all was well. Helen's much better. She'll be quite fit tomorrow. Oh, I'm so glad. She's upstairs with her husband. You were about to leave? Yes, I I was. I heard the bell, you see. We've got a taxi. Perhaps we could give you a lift. No, I I don't suppose I'm going your way. No, perhaps you're not. In any case, I'd sooner walk, you know, get some fresh air. All I wonder if you'd be good enough to mention to Mrs. Reynolds that I'm here. Uh, Yes, of course. Who's that, Aubrey? Oh, that's Bill coming down now. Oh. Oh, it's you, Dr. Morell. And Miss Rail. How's your wife? Oh, uh, Helen's... Well, I... I, I wasn't expecting you, Doctor. No, I, I called in case Mrs. Reynolds wanted any further attention. No, she's all right. That is... What is it, Bill? You look a little pale yourself. It's a shock, I suppose, and... Now you turning up, Dr. Morell. Oh, we didn't mean to bother you. Oh, no, no, of course not. It's not that. It's only that... Well, since you're here, Doctor, you might as well know. Your wife isn't really ill? She's not ill, Miss Frail. She's... Look at that, Dr. Morell. Quite interesting. The black ruby. But how the... 
where did that come from? Well, you see, Doctor, I've had a bit of a business setback. Oh, it'll work out all right, but Helen was somehow scared that I'd had it. Went on about not being able to face giving up everything. I tried to explain that we weren't going to end up in the gutter, that it didn't work out, but... Well, there it was. Oh, I'm so sorry. Then, before we came out tonight, she started talking about this ruby. Some idea that if only it was ours, I'd be saved from ruin. I didn't think that she was serious. And then I realized that she was. That she had some idea of getting hold of it. Well, there really is the evil eye on that thing, isn't there? It's brought nothing but trouble. Thank you. Got something there. Here, Dr. Morell. You'd better take it. Thank you. Oh, Doctor, don't touch it. I am convinced, Miss Frail, that I'm impervious to its baleful powers. I, I don't think it'll burn a hole in my pocket. Oh, oh, dear. She must have slipped it into the pocket of her dress, and then... You mean she pretended to pass out as a cover-up? Oh, I suppose so. Well, oh, she certainly acted the part very well. I wouldn't have dreamed she was faking it. I know. It, it isn't like her at all. Her faint wasn't pretense, but perfectly genuine. I should have thought that was apparent enough. I'm sure of it, poor thing. Well, perhaps it was a strain after she'd realized what she'd done. It could be. And what makes it worse, Doctor, is that when I found it, she pretended that she didn't know about it, that it must have got there by mistake, or... Or what? That I had stolen it. And uh, it was the shock of its discovery and her belief that you were responsible which caused her to faint? Yes, I suppose so. Of course, it's ludicrous. I wasn't even sitting next to her. Oh, no, you were sitting next to me. Where is your wife? Oh, she's gone to bed. She won't speak to me until I've returned the ruby to Guy Hampton and admitted that I took it. And you propose doing that? Oh, what else would you expect me to do? Even if she'd admitted taking it herself. That reveals a very commendable side to your nature. Uh, but your self-sacrifice is hardly necessary. What do you mean? Uh, merely that by your action, you would be shielding the wrong person. Wrong person? It wasn't your wife who took the ruby. It wasn't Helen. Well, uh, then who? Who, oh, Dr. Moore? I, I, uh, that is, I... Uh, Are you absolutely gasping for that pressure, Mr. Green? Well, I, I uh, only... Uh, didn't it occur to you, Mr. Reynolds, that Mr. Green's interest in your wife's welfare was a trifle overdone? What do you mean? What are you getting at, Doctor? From the amount of attention you were giving Mrs. Hampton during dinner, I should have thought you made it apparent where your interest lay. Look here, Dr. Morelli. Added to which, it was Mrs. Reynolds to whom you sat next after dinner. It was you who slipped that ruby into our pocket. What? With the intention of recovering it from her subsequent I, 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 Why, you rotten thief. When your wife detected its presence, Mr. Reynolds, she mistakenly believed you to have taken it and fainted from shock. Uh, that was why Mr. Green switched his attentions to her and insisted upon accompanying her home. That's true. You've never shown any interest in Helen before. It's always Sonia that you've chased. Uh, well, the idea of leaving her just to help me see my wife home is utterly phony. Well... Well, I, I suppose I'd better act the gentleman and admit it. You're bang on the target, Dr. Morell. I did take it. Oh, oh. Why? You... I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm i a bit broke, that's all. It, it was just a sudden impulse. A crazy idea. I can't say how deeply I regret it. You'd have let Helen take the blame. Oh, that was just bad luck. I meant to get it away from her in the taxi. Oh, what a swine you are. So, what are you going to do about it, Dr. Morell? Uh, that remains a matter for Mr. Hampton to decide. Uh, meanwhile... I'll leave him to your tender mercies, Mr. Reynolds, uh, whilst I return the ruby. I'll take care of him, all right. Come along, Miss Vale. Yes, Dr. Reynolds. Isn't the taxi driver going a bit fast, Doctor? Is he, Miss Vale? I hadn't noticed. Oh. oh, well. What a horrid man that Mr. Green is, Dr. Morell. Do you think Mr. Hampton will put the police on to him? It's unlikely. I fancy he'll prefer to avoid any scandal that might result... Does this taxi have to take the corners on two wheels? After all, we've got the precious ruby now. If it makes you nervous, Miss Frail, you might ask the driver to slacken speed a trifle. Yes, I think I will. Doctor, that car! Are you uninjured, Miss Frail? Yes, Doctor, I think so. Are you? You all right in here? Well, it isn't your fault if we are. That car, the way it come round that corner. Oh, I expect it couldn't be helped, driver. <gasps> the ruby, Dr. Morell. It's the black ruby. Oh, I'm sure I'm very sorry. What are you talking about? But don't you see? The hoodoo. Really, Miss Frail? The evil eye. It's working. Oh, please, let's get it back to Mr. Hampton quick before both of us are killed or something dreadful. Do calm oh, yourself. It's the black ruby. 
Disaster and death. That's what it brings to anyone who has it. Disaster and death. How long is it my study, Dr. Morell? You've been very quick. Oh, not quick enough, Mr. Hampton, I can tell you. Oh, what do you mean? Here, sit down, Miss Fay. You, you look a bit shaken. Oh, not quick enough to get that horrible ruby back to you. What do you mean, you've got it? Of course, Dr. Morell's got it. He's brought it back with him. But it's marvelous, Doctor. Who, who taken it? As I suspected, when I observed uh, that uh, young man become suddenly solicitous towards Mrs. Reynolds. Aubrey Green. Yes, I noticed him change his interest to Helen. Why, thou rotten crook. Wait till I tell Sonia this. She's gone to bed. She's pretty upset. I understand. Oh, Doctor, do please give it to him. Very well. It's frail. What is it? What's wrong, Doctor? I somehow fancy you'll have a further item of news with which to acquaint your wife. Look. <gasps> the ruby. Smashed to pieces. It must have happened in the taxi crash. Taxi crash? Yes, our taxi hit a car or a car hit us. I'm sorry. I was thrown against the door. Well, it's all to do with the ruby. But that's just it. It can't be the black ruby at all. What? A genuine ruby is terribly hard to break. Precisely. That chap in Bombay I got it from. When he came round to my hotel after I'd seen the jeweler, he must have switched the real black ruby with a fake. No doubt that is what occurred. It, it isn't the black ruby after all. So there was no hoodoo. No evil eye on it. The air crash, the chandelier. The taxi. Nothing to do with it. Perhaps uh, this will at any rate convince your wife... Uh, that the only injury anyone can suffer from the evil eye or hoodoo powers is that which they bring upon themselves for believing in such foolish superstition. Another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Guy Hampton, Norman Woolland, Sonia Hampton, Virginia Winter, Helen Reynolds, Louise Gainsborough, Bill Reynolds, Richard Bebb, Aubrey Green, Desmond Carrington, an airline captain and other parts, John Baker. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Mr. Wolf? Yeah, he's right here. Who's this? Archie, hang up. Don't ask questions. You, uh, you have a wife? Archie, it's past your bedtime. Well, I'm afraid, Mr. Wolf, uh, it's past his bedtime. Your bedtime. It's a client, boss. That's what I was afraid of. Foolish. Hello? Hello? Well, why do you look so bewildered? He's coming right over. He says he's got a date. With murder. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the detective genius who rates the knife and fork the greatest tools ever invented by man. The ponderous, brilliant, and unpredictable Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures or with this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story, The Case of the Calculated Risk, was as strange and baffling as any Nero Wolf had to deal with. It started late one night when a big-shouldered man sporting a reddish beard and billing himself as Dave Caffrey pushed his way in, walked up to Nero Wolf's desk, and rocked him with this opener. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to kill a man. I beg your pardon, sir? I'm going to kill a man with these two hands. I've been told strange things across this desk, Mr. Caffrey. This is the first time a murderer has confided his intention to me in advance. This man you speak of... I'm not telling you his name. I'm not telling you where I'm going to meet him. The session tomorrow is going to be private and personal. 
But if anything happens to me between now and then, I want you to take over. Mr. Gaffrey, do you seriously think I could assist you in a matter of private vengeance? That's not what I'm asking. This guy deserves to die. I plan to kill him with these two hands, me, myself. But if I slip up, if he gets me first, I want you to see that justice is done. And I assure you, sir... I told you this guy deserves to die. Let me tell you why. Years ago, down south, there were three men in business together, partners. Me and two others. You know, Bugarchi, if Mr. Gaffrey doesn't mind... You're wasting your time, Wolf. The names I'll use will be phony. I won't give you anything you can check back on. We'll take our chance, sir. Please proceed. It happened in a town about 40 miles from the place where we had our business. We'd gone there to collect some money, the three of us. Carl, Mitch, and me. Dave Caffrey. But all we collected was bad news. So bad that Carl hadn't even given our right names at the hotel. Said he was scared some of our creditors had come hitting up on us for what we owed. Three of us had had some drinks, and we'd been pacing around for nearly an hour. I can still remember the way Mitch stood and looked at me. And then up at Carl, when Carl suddenly pulled to a stop and came out with this idea of his. So, Dave, you got 6,000 cash on hand. You counted it, Mitch. Well, didn't we make it 6240, Carl? Whichever. We've got this 6,000 odd, plus some slow accounts receivable against debts of 38,000. With three of us trying to live from the business, we haven't got a chance. Well, we ain't got much of a one, Carl, but... It's hopeless, Dave. With two partners, though. Two partners? You reckon on pulling out, Carl? I say we cut cards for it, Mitch. Low man drops out. Break up the partnership? After sticking together all these oh, years? Oh, wait a minute, Dave. Wait a minute. Maybe Carl's right. Maybe this could work. Carl, you mean the low man drops out clean? Right now? Right now, Mitch. Other two to take over assets and debts and see if they can get this thing back in the black. Okay, Carl. Get the cards out. Dave? Well, that's what you guys want. Okay, then. Here's a new deck. Shuffle them, Mitch. All shuffled. Cut them, Dave. Go ahead, Mitch. You get first pick. Spread them if you like. Here goes. Ah, six. Your turn, Dave. Okay. Nine o'clock. Huh, lucky guy, Dave. That puts you in uh, whatever Carl pulls. I'll pull it fast. There she is. Denise. Sorry, Mitch. That leaves you elected. Well, Mitch, I'm sorry, too. I guess we all had a fair whack at it, but... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me see that ace again, Carl. Easy, Mitch. I said I was sorry, Look, but... Dave. Yeah, what is it, Mitch? All the aces are marked. <laughs> Carl, I'm going to cram this dick right down your crooked throat. Oh, Look out, Mitch. He's got a knife. Sure. sure. Oh... Carl, you... All right. I've cut him for keeps. What do we do now? What do we do? Look, Carl, I, I didn't mark those cards. I, I didn't kill Mitch. And what's more... Shut I... up, Dave. We're both in and out now. Come on. Let's get out of here. Now, now what, Carl? Look, Dave. This is where we split up. Two men together, easy to trace. You head one way, I go the other. Yeah, but the door, I, I got no money. Here, I'll split up the 6000 This is your head. Here, stick the envelope in your pocket. Now, grab that trace. Get set. I'll catch the next one going the other way. Get going, Dave! And that's how it was, Mr. Wolf. It all happened so fast that I... Mm, this man you call Carl, <laughs> he would seem to be one of the world's choice creatures, Mr. Gaffrey. When I thought to look in that envelope he gave me, I found $40 and a few folds of wrapping paper in it. I was mad enough to... Well, I got off the freight and intended to go back, but... Then I picked up a paper. And read all about the murder of your friend Mitch with the statement that Carl had accused you of the crime. And that the police believed him in view of your escape. That's it. Classical, but not at all original. Well, I was young then and stupid. And I'd had those drinks to start with. And you spent the intervening years hunting down the man Carl, am I correct? Yeah. I tramped the country from east to west, from north to south. Tramped it for years, searching for him. And yesterday I located him. He's a big wheel these days up on that 37th floor of his. 
But tomorrow when I get... Yes, to... Mr. Caffrey, the 37th floor of... Never mind what building. Now, wait a minute, Caffrey. If you expect Mr. Wolf to help you... I you... don't want him to help me. I'll help myself. But if I slip off, I know Wolf's reputation well enough to know that he'll never rest till this, this rotten, chiseling murderer is sitting in the chair. That's why I've come here. Just to provide a backstop in case my dear friend of long ago manages to get the best of me. How will we know? You see this envelope? Read what it says. Nero Wolf, 601 West 35th Street, New York. Delivered to him in case of my death. That's right. And this envelope was $500. Nearly all I've got in the world. Along with it, the full details on that knife. Real names, dates. The proof you'll need in case I don't finish it up. Go on. Tonight, Mr. Wolf. I'm going to give this envelope to the manager of the hotel where I'm stopping. I'm calling on, well, Carl. Tomorrow at noon, right after his secretary goes to lunch. If I'm not back in my hotel at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the hotel manager will deliver this envelope to you. Is that clear? Perfectly. But you don't think I'm going to allow you to go through with this wire planter? You can't stop me. And don't have Goodwin follow me. I'd lose him in two blocks. Good night. Shall I try to tail him, boss? It's no use, Archie. Get Inspector Kramer on the phone at once. I want the police to help us head off this murder. Nero Wolf speaking. It's Archie. I'm calling from the morgue. And? They found Caffrey's body in a subway washroom, mugged and stabbed. Wallet gone, pockets cleaned out, no envelope. Just two hours ago, he was here. No envelope, eh? Gone. Witnesses? None so far. Homicide's calling it straight mugging and robbery. As it well might look, except for... Except for a guy named Carl. How much do I tell Kramer? All of it. I see inspector to start queries throughout the South on the original killing. The original killing? Look... It's our best chance of getting a description of the man called Carl. The original killing and the partnership. Starting from, say, eight years ago and working back to the middle 20s. Tell him to concentrate on towns on railway lines. Putting out pictures of Caffrey and... Pictures and dentistry. Fingerprints to Washington. Kramer will know. And if I come across a haystack, do I keep my eye out for needles? We are going to find Carl, Archie. We are going to find him if it takes him now till doomsday. Mr. Wolf, let's face it, we're licked. Licked, Archie? Three days now. We found Caffrey's hotel here in New York. No traceable phone calls. Not a witness has turned up on that subway washroom party. And Kramer says he's getting nowhere with those answers from the Southland. The original story is bound to come slowly, Archie. We are asking a check on the unsolved killings of a dozen states over a 20-year period. Hmm. Then what now? You start trudging, Archie. Trudging? Through office buildings, through 37 floors of many office buildings. You keep trudging till we find him. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. This is a big city, remember? I might have to go through hundreds of buildings. This morning, Archie, the municipal reference library informed me that there are exactly 34 buildings of 37 floors or higher in Manhattan. Now, when you rule out the United Nations building, hotels Okay, and... okay. Maybe not so many 37 floors, but lots of offices per floor. Maybe 40 or 50. Call it 30 times 40 and you've still got uh, uh, 1,200 to start with. And you don't know what kind of business, you don't know what Carl's real name is, you don't even know what he looks like. There could be 4,000 men like him. 4,000 affluent men, aren't you? Yeah, well, all right. <laughs> Caffrey said he was in the chips, though. You know, for a guy who's been bumming around, that could mean anything from 10 grand a year up. Hey, wait a minute, that cuts your field to 1,000. 1,000 tall men? Tall? I've been over those notes. Caffrey didn't say he was tall. As plainly as you could ask. Caffrey was almost your height, but he said Mitch stood and looked at me. And then he looked up at Carl. Up, Archie. That makes Carl your height or taller. Yeah. Well, maybe Caffrey and Mitch were sitting down and Carl was... Uh... Caffrey told us the three were standing at the time. Check your notes. I've studied them. Okay. Maybe that does cut it down some. Yeah, it's still a lot of citizens that start checking for a southern accent. Don't rely on accent, Archie. Carl has had many years to lose any accent he might have had. Yeah, that's true. And so we narrow it, Archie. A man almost surely tall. A man not using the name he was born with. A man with an unexplained gap in his past. I ought to be able to reach right out and tap him. 
You go skeptical again, Archie. Well, it's still a pretty big haystack. Let's see if we can't trim it some more. On these building lists I've been going over, I've ruled out for now the members of professions requiring lengthy formal training. Medical men, lawyers, scientists of most kinds. Yeah, that's chopping it down. I'll admit that. I'll have further eliminations as we get into it. And I'm putting soil pans on a second list this afternoon. Some of the credit references I'll handle by phone. So I start trudging, huh? You start trudging. And remember, Archie, since you'll probably be operating through secretaries, you're looking for a murderer named Carl, not for a new set of telephone numbers to brighten your winter. Tall? I don't know what you're peddling, Goodwin, but if my boss put his elevator shoes on and stood on a box... He'd still be down somewhere around my necktie. If he stood on his money, though, (laughs) we'd need a helicopter to get up near his shoelaces. Oh, Miss Tunis, do you mind if I sit down? Why, of course not, Mr. Goodwin. Oh, thanks. You know, I've been in 12 offices on this floor, and you're the first girl who's seen the importance of this survey first crack out of the box. (laughs) Well, I'm sort of new here, and, and I try to pay attention. Oh, when... you're not just beautiful. You've got a head on you. Is Mr. McLean in? Well, he's at lunch right now. Lunch? But... Oh, that reminds me. Know any good restaurants up this way? Well, I was just going to the downstairs drugstore myself, but I wouldn't say Well, that... come on. Put your bonnet on and let's skip the drugstore. <laughs> this meal is on the Executive Resources Survey. Yeah, boss, the boil down. Tinsley, McLean, Fernandes, Tessero, and Cabrin. All five of them tall, all five a little misty in the background. You and Saul have done well, Archie. Very well. But I'm crossing off Fernandes and Kaplan. Why? The Credit Bureau report clears Fernandes, and Kaplan was on a special war job. The FBI x-rayed his record twice. Leaving J.P. Tinsley, Carson McLean, and Philip Tesro, huh? I'd like to see all three here, Archie. Get them here one way or another. And so you do admit that Tinsley isn't your real name. Mr. Wolf, are you a blackmailer or what? I'm a licensed private investigator, sir. Any disclosure you make will be kept in confidence... Provided it doesn't touch on the case I'm engaged on. You haven't said what the case is. I don't intend to. If you prefer to explain this mysterious gap in your background at the district attorney's office... Well, I'm using the name Tinsley because I've got an undivorced first wife out on the coast. We broke up 20 years ago, but uh, she said she'd see to it that I never married again. And she knew where I was today... Well, I I don't say I'm a saint, but uh, she's a vindictive woman. I see. May I have names, dates, and places starting 1924? I can't quite understand your interest, Mr. Wolfe. It's rather complicated, to put it briefly, Mr. McLean. I'm working in the interest of a client. Our people have found this puzzling gap in your background, and I'd appreciate such clarification as you may be able to supply. But I told you, Mr. Goodwin, I was raised and educated in the Orient. Until 32, I was in business with my father in China. Where you say your father died? Died. With the Depression, I returned to New York, started this importing business in a small way, weathered through the early 30s, and I think my bankers can assure you of my standing today. They've done so. Carson McLean and Company has an excellent credit rating. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. To switch somewhat abruptly, Mr. McLean, would you happen to remember how you spent the evening of the 19th? Of this month? Of this month. Well, I could hardly... Wait. You say the 19th. Would that have been on a Tuesday? Yes, it was Tuesday. Well, that simplifies it. I'm nearly always at the office on Tuesday nights dictating the revisions in our weekly wholesalers' lists. Let me see... Yes, I was there on the 19th. Had a tray sent in. Miss Tunis and I worked till just after midnight. Miss Helen Tunis. The secretary Mr. Goodwin spoke of. She's been with me for two or three months. Miss Tunis can confirm this dictation on the night of the 19th? Of course. 
Now, Mr. Wolf, your manner is so persuasive that I'd scarcely realize you're asking some extraordinary searching questions. May I ask why in the world you... If you'll indulge me, Mr. McLean, my prying is nearly concluded. You say you were in China until 1932. Mr. Tesro, I'll be brutally frank. We know that your name's not Tesro. And we know that you served a prison term from 34 to 38 for arson. I'd like some straight answers. I didn't say I wouldn't answer your questions. The past can remain your own, provided... Now, look, Mr. Wolf, I've been going straight for 12 years. And this business of mine is on the level. Now, if this is a shakedown... I... I'm asking where you were on the night of the 19th. And I'm telling you I stayed in town. I ate alone. And I went to a movie. I caught the 11.35 for Stanford. And that's all there is to it. You're denying that you were ever in business in the South? I was born in the South, but I haven't been back there since I was a kid. What about the arson? I put in four years squaring for that mistake. Let's start again, Mr. Tesro. You say you were in Cincinnati in 1931. Okay, Mr. Wolf, three candidates and we're still on the one-yard line. Our one-yard line. Tesoro McLean Tinsley. No, no, rule out McLean. He gave references enough for those years in China... And with Helen Tunis, he's got the one firm alibi we've laid on to. Caffrey was killed before midnight. With conditions as they are in the Far East, Archie, it would be weeks before cables came back on McLean's claims. Uh, claims? You figure the whole Chinese background's a fake? I want you to see Miss Tunis again, Archie. Taking all precautions for her safety. And this is one time I give you permission to ply her with all the attentions you can contrive. <laughs> Are we far enough to pull tails on any of these three? I've got Saul Panza on Tesro. And Saul promised to have men on Tinsley and McLean. Pictures of the three have gone to Kramer for circulation in the south. No. Oh, no answer yet from the coast on Tinsley, huh? Not yet. For the moment, Archie, you'll concentrate on Helen Tunis. Helen, I've got to see you tonight. I'd love to, Archie, Now, look, but... Helen, I phoned you to come out in the corridor this way because I didn't want McLean to know we're talking. Do you still say you got that new mink coat on your own money? Mr. Goodwin, I don't know what right you Helen, have Helen, if you to... get five guys to buy you stuff, it's your business, Mr. But... McLean said his wife might be sent hectives around. Well, you can go right back to your old Mrs. McLean and tell easy, her that I... Easy, Helen, easy. He was dictating to me. You know, baby, the harder you lie, the prettier you look. <laughs> but if this is a fake alibi and if you keep propping it up, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Bad trouble. Now, how about it? Do I see you at your apartment tonight, or would you rather come down with me to Nero Wolf's right now? Archie, I... All right. I can't go with you now, and I've got a dinner date with my aunt tonight that I can't break, but I'll try to be back at my apartment by 11. Archie! Near Wolf's being. This is Archie, Mr. Wolf. I'm at Helen Tunis' apartment. Well? I could cut my throat for not making her come with me this afternoon. Trouble? Not for her anymore, poor kid. I got here three minutes ago and found her strangled. Couldn't have happened more than half an hour ago. McLean. McLean. Didn't Saul Panzer say he was getting a tail on him? He was a new man and he lost him. I should have left you on McLean, Archie. Yeah, we were both wrong. What do you want me to do? Phone the police immediately. This is 32nd Street. I'm only three blocks in a job from the office. What if I come back and call from there? Come back, then. I'll phone Kramer myself. Mr. Wolf, I'm still kicking myself for that. Look out, Archie. Too late, Mr. Wolf. Keep coming right in, Goodwin. With your hands up. No, I wouldn't try that. McLean. And keep your hand out of that desk drawer, Wolf. This time you're too late, McLean. My hand's in the drawer, and I think I'll leave it there. You don't think I'd shoot? I'm sure you would. But you've got two of us to cover now. No, Archie, don't try to draw yet. How'd you get in here, McLean? He surprised me after making his way in through the area way below, and of course, it had to be Fritz's night out. I caught your fat friend just two seconds before he could get in his call to the police, Goodwin. I overheard his talk with you from the hallway here. My apologies for not crying out sooner, Archie. Get your hand out of that drawer. Pull it out without the gun, Wolf, or I'll let you have it now. I refuse to, McLean. 
Seems obvious that you mean to kill us in any case. I'm afraid that's true, Wolf. But when you called me here and Goodwin started making dates with Helen Tunis... Poor kid, I told her not to talk to you. She didn't, Goodwin. I've been scared of you and Wolf since I followed Colby here that first night. Colby? You knew him as Caffrey. I caught up with him afterward in that subway washroom. No. Keep that hand up. And watch that gun of yours, Wolf. When I found that envelope on him and read the letter to you contained in it, I knew he hadn't spilled the whole South Carolina story to you. South Carolina? Would the original knifing have been taking place anywhere near Hampton or Jasper County? Hampton County. But our business is over the line in Georgia. It doesn't matter now. Uh, pity, Archie. We learned this afternoon that we were growing warm on South Carolina. Mr. McLean, may I ask what you hope to achieve by this insane project of disposing of Mr. Goodwin and myself? I'm buying time, Wolf. I've 90,000 in small bills in that bag there, plus a plane ticket to Buenos Aires. I've got a silencer on this gun. If you two aren't found till tomorrow morning, I'll be out of the country before they start looking for me. You don't think the police will put out an alarm for you when they find the body of Helen Tunis? Goodwin left it to you to report that, remember? Let's remind ourselves to be prompter on reporting death, Sachi. Starting with our own, Mr. Wolf. Glad you can take it that way, Goodwin. You actually think you can knock the two of us off? I'm about to find out, Goodwin. One moment, McLean. You've never been a real gambler. You know that. With marked cards, of course. But you're not the man to face a sure loss now. A sure loss? The loss of your life. Within seconds after you try to pull that trigger. I told you I had a silencer. You think anyone will hear the shots? There will be more shots than you count on. My hand's on a pistol now in this drawer, and Mr. Goodwin has a thirty-eight in his shoulder holster. You can't shoot through the desk, and Goodwin won't get a chance to draw. You're an intelligent man, McLean. Vicious, but intelligent. May I describe the certainty of your immediate death if you don't throw that pistol on the desk and give yourself up? There are two of you, I know that, but... McLean, you must be aware that in the actual fact... Exceedingly few men are killed instantly by a single shot, even from a pistol of heavy caliber. The one you hold is a thirty-two, And it's a forty-five in that drawer, McLean. I assure you, McLean, that neither of us will surrender the weapons we have. Should you start shooting, we'll both do our best to draw and keep firing till you're dead. You're stalling, Wolf. What have I got to lose by trying for you both now? Your life? I'll correct that. The loss of some six or eight weeks of your life, possibly months. Whatever the time necessary to bring you to trial and to convict you and execute you for the murders you've committed. Suppose I cancel you out and then take my chances with Goodwin. A better choice, but still a dubious one. I am fat, exceedingly fat. And for perhaps the first time in my life, I'm thoroughly grateful for that. My bulk affects the calculation, McLean. McLean, you could pull off all seven shots and still not hit Mr. Wolf where it counts. If you have to start, you better start on me. You exaggerate, Archie, and I thank you for the gallantry of it. No, it's quite likely that with two or three shots, McLean might well dispose of me, but not uh, with your first shot, McLean, and we'll not permit you many more than your first. Look, if I promise to do no more than tie you two up to give me my head start, Will you toss in your guns? Of course not. Do I speak for us both, Archie? Check. I say let's start it now. Uh, Wolf, if I give you half of what's in that bag, would you forget these admissions I've made and help on my defense? I've told you I refuse to bargain. I think that I should count five. If your weapon hasn't been tossed on the desk by then, I'll do my best to get my pistol into action. Are you in the court, Archie? Start counting. Wait a minute, Mr. Wolf. One. If I... Trade half that bag for no shooting and one hour's start. No tying up. Just your promise that... Two. All the bag for a half hour start. Ninety thousand. Three. Are you ready, Archie? All set, sir. Uh, except if you're the one who walks out of this, call up every number in my little red book, huh? And tell each girl I was thinking of her just before you got the five. Agreed. I resume four. Okay. You win. Holy sweet Susan, it worked, it worked. A commendable choice, McLean, for us at least. You see, I'm afraid I forgot to mention one slight factor which might have operated in your favor. What's that, boss? I must confess, Archie, that my forty-five is in the upstairs den where I took it to oil it last night. 
Holy cow, you didn't have a gun? Why, you dirty... Take it easy, I... McLean. I've really got one. Oh, by the way, Mr. Wolf, yeah. signal's off on those women, huh? When my heart gets back down out of my throat, I'll call them myself. I'll trouble you for a beer first, Archie. And then if you'll be good enough to phone Inspector Kramer, you can bid him pick up his triple murderer. The one-time cutter of cards. Fortunately for us, who's never been a real gambler. <laughs> ah, I've been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Gerald Moore as Archie Goodwin and Lorraine Carter, Bill Johnstone, Howard McNear, Herb Butterfield, and Vic Rodman. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Phantom Fingers. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Another Philco Radio Mystery Program on the air. Another chance for you to win your share of $50,000 in cash prizes. Have you entered the Philco Radio Mystery Contest yet? Do it now. Everybody's excited about this great contest of skill that rewards the winners with $50,000 in cash prizes. Every week at this same time over this same station, your Philco Radio Tube dealer brings you transcribed the Philco Radio Mystery Contest. Fascinating mysteries for you to help solve. The new, entirely different radio program where you get the thrill of showing how good a detective you are. Remember, in order for you to stand the same chance of winning a share in the $50,000 cash prizes as everybody else, you must have Philco Radio Mystery Book Number 2. Get your free copy right away from your Philco Radio Tube dealer. Nothing to buy, just ask for your copy. This big book tells you all the details about the $50,000 cash prize Philco Mystery Contest. It's filled with facts and diagrams. It will help you win. Now let's have some mystery. If you already have your book, be sure it's open to pages 4 and 5. Follow the action on the diagram as you listen to the broadcast of Philco Radio Mystery Number 5, Death Boards the Sea Serpent. Phil Coe and her friend Tom Taylor have gone fishing way out in Great Salt Bay. A few moments before our story begins, they've sighted a cabin cruiser some distance away, drifting about aimlessly with its engine running. And since no one has answered their repeated calls, Phil and Tom have gone over to the cruiser in their fast sea skiff. As the scene opens, Tom has just succeeded in boarding the boat and making his skiff fast to the cruiser's stern. Hi in there. Anybody aboard? Here, Tom. Help me aboard. All right. There we are. Thanks. I'll cut the engine. You go forward and drop the anchor. Aye, aye, Captain. Good heavens, Tom. What is it? Come back here. Okay. Look at this woman. She's unconscious. Say, nasty gash in her head. I'd better run down into the cabin and get some water and a towel. Yes, hurry, Tom. There must be somebody else around. The table down here all set for four. There must be a sleeping cabin further forward. Better investigate. Oh. Oh, gently now. You've hurt your head. Oh, Jack. Where's Jack? Where's my husband? Here you are now. Sit on this seat. There. That's it. Hurry, Tom. Coming. Oh, see, so you brought her too. I found a woman asleep in the forward cabin. She's coming right up. Jane. Jane, dear, what's happened? Oh, Alice. Alice, where's Jack? I don't know. I've been asleep. What happened? 
Someone hit me on the head. Hit you? Oh, why, Jane, that's ridiculous. Well, I tell you, someone hit me. Do you feel better now? Yes, a little, thank you. Who are you people? What are you doing on the C-7? This is Jack Wilson's boat. My name is Phyllis Cole, and this is my friend Tom Taylor. We saw your cruiser drifting, and when no one answered our calls, we came aboard. May I ask your name? You may. I'm Alice Jocelyn. Jane Wilson here says she was hit on the head. I'm worried about Jack. That's Mr. Wilson, my husband, Miss Cole. Alice, is the dory back there? No, it's gone. I suppose Jack and Ed went fishing in it. And Ed is Ed Jocelyn, your husband, is that correct? That's right. Oh, I'm worried about those two men. Something awful must have happened. Since Mrs. Wilson believes someone hit her, I want to ask a few questions, if I may. Well, we'll be glad to answer any question you may ask, Miss Cole. Won't you sit down, all of you? Sit here, Phil. Uh, no, thanks. I'll sit on this little steering seat here by the wheel. Oh, oh, goodness. What's the trouble? Oh, there's an exposed nail in the steering seat. I've torn my new slacks. Well, you certainly have. If I were you, I'd sit down again until you find a needle and thread. Sit here, I'll stand. Oh, thanks. Now, Mrs. Jocelyn, you said you'd been asleep. That's right. Your friend Mr. Taylor woke me when he came down into the guest cabin. Have you any idea how long you'd been sleeping? Well, what time is it now? Almost one. And I must have been sleeping about one hour. Were you bothered by any unusual noises? No, I slept the entire time. I didn't hear a thing. I sleep very soundly. You call this Jack Wilson's boat. I take it that you and your husband are guests? Yes. Alice and Ed Jocelyn are old friends of ours. I see. Now, Mrs. Wilson, please tell me what you were doing before you were struck. Well, Ed Jocelyn and I were in the after cockpit. Ed was getting his tackle ready to go fishing with Jack and the dory. My husband, Jack, was on the forward deck getting his fishing tackle ready. I don't know where you were, Alice, but you said you were down in the guest cabin asleep. That's right, Jane. Well, about 12.30, I went below to give some last-minute instructions about luncheon. I thought I heard Alice call Ed from up on the forward deck, but I couldn't be sure because Noggy had the radio on so loud. To whom did you give instructions about luncheon? To Noggy. Who is Noggy? The Wilson's Japanese steward. Of course, Jane, that explains everything. It was Noggy that hit you. You had trouble with him last night, you know, about our dinner. Yes, yes, perhaps it was Noggy. Well, anyway, I gave instructions to Noggy, and then I came back up here. Just as I was stepping out to the after cockpit, I was struck on the head. Where is Noggy now? I'd better go look for him, Tom. Right away. Oh, Alice, I'm so worried about Jack and Ed, too. I'm sure something has happened to them. Oh, Jane, they often go out fishing in the dory when they're going to do any chumming. But they never go out of sight of the cruiser. Oh, and besides, they never go away and leave the engine running. Oh, I know something awful has happened. I know it. I just know. Oh, Mrs. Wilson, why don't you go into the cabin and lie down? Oh, thank you. I, I will. You'd better stay here and help Alice watch for the men. Call me if you see them coming. I will, Mrs. Wilson. Poor Jane. She's so excitable. Yes, she is. I think she'd better be taken into port for medical attention. Can you handle the cruiser, Mrs. Jocelyn? Oh, good heavens, no. I wouldn't know one of these levers from another. Besides Ed and Jack, and Noggy is the only other one who can run this boat. All right, come along now. We're not going to hurt you, but... Sir, Noggy, no, I've done anything. Well, it's Noggy. Where did you find him? In the rope locker up under the forward deck. He was hiding in there. Yes, sir. You bet. Noggy, hide. Oh, just a minute, Noggy. Why did you hide in the rope locker? I... Come out, say, luncheon, sir, if please. And see Missy Wilson out flat, blood all overhead. Noggy very much scare. Go and hide in locker till honorable sir come pull him out. Uh, tell me, Noggy, while you were preparing luncheon, did you hear any unusual sounds? Any noise at all out here on deck? No. Her cold radio, she play too loud. It play all time while I get lunch. Noggy, like keep radio loud. Make everything more happy. You certainly were playing it loud, Noggy. What do you mean, Mrs. Jocelyn? He had it turned on full volume. I dare say he had a purpose in keeping it so loud. Noggy, why did you hit Mrs. Wilson? Uh, I no hit nobody. What do you mean, Mrs. Jocelyn? Uh, let's not be hasty, Mrs. Jocelyn. After all, we don't know that Noggy did hit Mrs. Wilson. Well, if you're going to defend that steward, I'm not going to stay here another minute. You'll find me in the guest cabin. Don't mind, Mrs. Jocelyn, when she fly off handle... She very nice sometimes. Apparently, this isn't one of her times. Noggy, you said you ran forward to the rope locker. Did you see or meet anyone on your way? Oh, no, nobody. I don't want to embarrass you, Phil, but perhaps Noggy can bring you a needle and thread. Oh, sure. 
Maggie have plenty needle, plenty thread for sewing. Oh, I didn't realize it was as bad as that. Uh, Noggy, I tore my slacks on that nail there in the steering seat. Oh, Maggie, forget the hammer nail in. Yesterday, uh, Missy Jocelyn get big tear, too. She run big boat while men out in little boat fishing. Oh, Noggy, how's forgetting the needle and thread, huh? Oi, sea Say, here comes the Coast Guard. Who is it? Is it Ed? I don't know yet, Mrs. Jocelyn. Oh, well, it's... maybe they have bad news about Jack. Oh. Fix this line, will you? Right. Let her come. That's it. I got it. I'm coming aboard. Okay, jump over. Oh, oh they're towing our dory. Oh, where's my husband? What's happened? Oh, just a minute, lady. We're coming to that. Captain Brent. Coast Guard. I've been looking for this cruiser. Captain Brent, I'm Phyllis Cole. Oh, afternoon, ma'am. I've heard a lot about you. This is my friend Tom Taylor. These ladies are Mrs. Wilson and Mrs. Jocelyn. Jocelyn, eh? Boy, send Mr. Jocelyn over. Right, Captain. Alice, Alice, something terrible has happened. What do you mean, Ed? Where's Jack? Okay, Mr. Jocelyn. I'll tell him your story. We were fishing. Jack upset the door. Ed. One minute, Jane. One minute. I righted the boat and go for him, but it was no use. <gasps> Captain Brett picked me up, and then we found Jack's body floating on the water. Tom, <laughs> you'd better take Mrs. Wilson inside. Nagy will help too, sir. Oh, you stay here, Nagy. I can do it. Poor Jane. Her husband drowned. Oh, it's horrible. He wasn't drowned, Mrs. Jocelyn. He was murdered. Murdered? Yes. He was dead before he was dumped into the water. His skull was bashed in with a bottle. We found pieces of glass in the wound. My guess that Mr. Jocelyn did the job. Then rode him out and dumped him. No use of my lying, Captain Brent. You're right. I did it. Oh, Ed. Ed. All right. Come along, Jocelyn. We're taking you ashore. Oh, one moment, Captain Brent. Yes, Miss Cole? Mr. Jocelyn didn't kill Mr. Wilson. Mrs. Jocelyn is the one you want. Well, that's preposterous. I've given my confession. Yes, Mr. Jocelyn. But your wife, Alice, has already given hers, although she hasn't meant to. Oh, Ed. Ed, help me. I'll do all I can, Alice, darling. All I can. Don't you want to tell the whole truth now, Mrs. Jocelyn? Yes. Yes. This is the truth. Jack Wilson and I were sitting on the forward deck. He was mending his fishing tackle. Jane Wilson and Ed were in the after cockpit. Ed was getting his tackle ready to go fishing in the dory. Go on. For the past year, I'd been borrowing money from Jack Wilson and hadn't been able to pay it back. This morning, he threatened to tell my husband about it. Jack and I argued it. Then I lost my temper. There was a bottle lying on the deck, and without knowing what I was doing, I hit him. Oh, I didn't mean to kill him. Honestly, I didn't. Then I, then I called my husband, and he came forward and found that Jack was dead. Oh, oh I can't go on. I'll tell the rest. I planned to get the body in the dory quickly. I knew that Jane Wilson was in the main cabin with Noggy. But when I got back to the cockpit, Jane was coming out. I, I had to hit her so she wouldn't see me with Jack's body. Then I shoved her back into the control cabin. I told Alice to start the engine and run the cruiser into Baytown with Jane. I was going to take Jane to a doctor and say that she'd fallen while the men were out fishing. I ran about a mile and and I saw your boat and lost my head and went below and made believe I was sleeping. And the rest we know. Darling, darling, if you'd only told me about the money you borrowed, I'd have paid him back. No, Ed, you couldn't have. It was way too much. Oh, Ed. Ed, what will they do to me? (laughs) Did you know it was Alice Jocelyn all the time? Then it ought to be the easiest thing in the world for you to write down three reasons why Phil Cole, the famous girl detective, suspected Alice, too. It certainly pays to listen carefully to every one of the Philco Radio Mystery programs. $50,000 in cash prizes in this easy, spectacular contest. Huge weekly prizes, mammoth grand prizes, just for answering the contest questions asked in Philco Radio Mystery Book Number 2. Of course, you have your copy. If you haven't, get it now from your Philco Radio Tube dealer. It's free, nothing to buy. And you must have this book to enter the contest. It contains the official entry blanks on which you must write your answers. Listen to Philco Radio Mysteries every week at this same time over this same station. Don't miss one of them. Don't miss any detail of any program either. 
have Philco radio tubes in your set so that reception will be clear and good. Names of the major winners in this week's contest will be broadcast as soon as possible on a following Philco mystery program. Next week, another chance to win your share of the $50,000 cash prizes in this mammoth radio contest. Next week, another Philco mystery program. Next week, at this same time over this station, hear Phil Coe, the girl detective, solve the double X mystery. In hotels, restaurants, and homes of distinction, wherever hospitality is a gracious art, the best serve C-R-E-S-T-A, B-L-A-N-C-A, Cresta Blanca, Cresta Blanca. Yes, the famous name of Cresta Blanca is a symbol of good taste wherever distinguished people gather. When you serve superb Cresta Blanca California wines, you pay guests the truest compliment a host can offer. Distinguish your dinner table by serving Cresta Blanca Burgundy or Cresta Blanca Sauterne, yours to enjoy for gracious dining. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you Gloria Swanson as star in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Presented by Roma, that's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, for your everyday pleasure. Tonight, Roma Wines of Fresno, California, bring you Gloria Swanson in Murder by the Book, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear for Suspense. I must have been asleep. At first I thought it was one of those dreams. And then I realized the phone was really ringing. I seemed to remember. It had rung before and I hadn't answered it. But maybe it had been only this once. Ringing a long time. Because just as I got there, it stopped. Hello? Hello? I suppose I had had one of my spells. I never could remember very well just after them. But I know I'd been working, or trying to. It was my latest, and I thought it would be my best. It was about a woman who kills her husband. But I'd had all kinds of trouble with the end. Everything was all right up until the explanation, how she did it. I knew, of course, but uh, somehow I just couldn't write it. It wouldn't gel. It had been going on like that for weeks. And today, I must have had another spell. I've been having them ever since the accident. Ever since Ned was drowned. They'd begin with a headache. It would get worse and worse. And I'd lie down. And when I'd wake up, I wouldn't remember for a while. Sometimes when I woke up, I wouldn't even be in the same place. Instead of lying on the couch or on my bed, I'd be sitting up in a chair or at my typewriter. Once I even found myself sitting in the car on the garage. It was a strain of everything, of course. That's why I'd started going to Dr. Winter... And now it seemed as though my poor nerves were faded for one shock after another. Because now Dr. Winter was dead. You see, he'd been murdered. Yes? Emily? Yes? This is Harry, Harry Bailey. Where have you been? 
Why, I've been right here, Harry. Well, why don't you answer your phone? I've been trying to get you all afternoon. I'm... I must have been asleep. Oh. How's the book coming? Not very well, I'm afraid, Harry. Still stale, eh? Oh, I guess so. I, I'm awfully sorry, Harry. I know I promised it to you weeks ago, but... Oh, forget it. Those things happen. Listen, Emily, I've got a great little proposition for you. It'll make you some money, it'll get your mind off the book for a while, and it'll be worth a million dollars worth of publicity for us. Oh, what's the catch? Well, I was talking to young Hayes. He practically runs the old man's newspaper chain for him now, you know. And he wants you to cover the winter case for the whole syndicate. Oh. Now, uh... wait a minute before you make any snap judgments. In all the time I've been your publisher, I've never given you a bum steer yet, have I? But, uh, Harry, I'm not a reporter. That's just it. You write it from your point of view, the way it looks to the country's foremost woman detective story writer. The clues, the evidence, how it all fits together. Truth is stranger than fiction and so on. You see what I mean? Well, oh, I don't know. You see, well, I was a patient of his, Harry. All right, all the better. Famous man murdered in small resort town. Just so happens, famous woman mystery writer lived in same small town. Even was a murdered man's patient. Knows everybody with their first names and so forth and so on. Emily, this will put your name in headlines in every city in the country. I know that's the trouble. You see, well, what, what will Cora say? Why? What's it to Cora? Well, I'll, I'll grant you she may have had a slightly exaggerated idea of his importance, but after all, she was his man Friday for the past year. And now to have her own mother, stepmother anyway, writing it all up in the papers and making capital out of it. Oh, don't be silly, Emily. Somebody's got to write it, and you'll do it with sympathy and honesty and understanding. What's the greatest thing that could happen as far as getting a fair break in the papers is concerned? And it's a chance and a lifetime for you, Emily. No kidding. Oh, I'd like to... As I say, well, oh, all right, Harry, I'll do it. Atta a girl. Listen, I'll have Hayes drop the contracts right away. Anything you say, Harry. Swell. I'll be in touch. Night now. Good night, Harry. Hello, Mother. Oh, hello, darling. Who is that? Harry Bailey. He wants me to cover the winter case for the Hayes syndicate. He what? I told him I would. Oh, Mother. Oh, Mother, how could you? Why not, Cora? Because. Because it's bad enough that he's dead without dragging it through the papers all over again. But it will be in the papers anyway, darling. And as Harry says, at least I can give it sympathy and understanding. Sympathy and understanding. Why, Cora. Please, Mother. Please don't do it. Stay out of it. We'll, we'll only get more heartaches out of it, that's all. Why, Cora. You know, you almost sound as though you were afraid. Are you afraid of anything? Afraid? All right, then maybe I am. Maybe that's just what I am. Afraid. I had never really understood Cora. She was Ned's child, not mine. I was only her stepmother. Not that we weren't the best of friends, but she'd always been a little strange. More like her mother, I imagine. And then the shock of losing Ned and this on top of it. There were times when she seemed almost in a daze. Well, it's hard to blame her. The next day, Harry phoned to say the contracts were all in order, and I was to report to a Lieutenant Hahn of the Homicide Bureau, who would permit me to interview the girl they were holding for the murder, and in general act as my guide, philosopher, and friend. But upon appearing at his office, I found the gentleman with his hat on his head and his feet on his desk, who didn't bother to remove either, and really stared at me. Something? I'm Emily Carlyle. I was told to report to you. You're Lieutenant Hahn? Uh-huh. I was told that you would sort of uh, show me the ropes. Uh-huh. I uh, deduce from your attitude that you're not particularly pleased by the prospect. I cannot tell a lie. You deduce right. Well, isn't this nice? We're not going to get along. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Miss Carlyle, or is it Mrs.? Miss, my married name is uh, Wales. I was married to Ned Wales, you know. Uh-huh. Suppose we clear the air a little, Lieutenant. I take it the barrier between us is the old one of professional versus amateur, dealer in fact versus dealer in fiction, and uh, you disapprove of fiction? Oh, I got nothing against detective stories or detective story writers. I even read them myself once in a while. For laughs. Well, that's encouraging. What? To find that you can not only read, but uh, laugh. <laughs> okay. 
Then uh, just what is the difficulty, Lieutenant? I don't like to see people tried in the newspapers. I have no intention of trying this girl. Uh, what's her name? Uh... Claire Ogilvy. I have no intention of trying her. All I want to do is present the facts, tell the story. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess you want to see her, don't you? Among other things, yes. Unless, of course, you have something better to do. No, you're my assignment from now on. I'm in the doghouse. Well, I can think of less appropriate places. <laughs> okay. Why? Well, this is a big case. National sensation, special prosecutors, hullabaloo in the papers, special feature writers like you. Yes. And I'm in a minority of one around here, so nobody likes me. Stop being cryptic, Lieutenant. What are you driving at? They got a big thing on their hands and they want a conviction. I don't agree. About what? About the girl. You see, I think she's innocent. <laughs> That was interesting. The girl was even more interesting. She was about uh, 25. A pretty girl. And she was lying on her bunk in the cell, staring up at the one dim light in the ceiling. She didn't even look around when we came in. This is Miss Emily Carlisle, the writer, Claire. She wants to talk to you. <laughs> I'll be back after a while, Miss Carlisle. Go away. Leave me alone. I can't, Claire. I have a job to do. That makes you different, I suppose. No, but I still have a job to do. That's what they all say. They've got a job to do. On me. Who's trying to do a job on you, Claire? Oh, a lot of smart people who make their living at it. Like you. You mean that uh, they're trying to say that you killed him and uh, you didn't? I loved him, you fool. Why would I kill him? Why would I kill him? Why, why did you confess to killing him? He was dead, wasn't he? What difference did it make? That's what they wanted me to say, so what difference did it make? Then you didn't kill him? <sighs> All right, I killed him. That's what you want me to say, too. All right, I killed him. I don't want you to say anything, dear. I just want to, to know what happened. He was killed, murdered. That's what happened. They say you quarreled with him. I dug my nails into him. I wanted to hurt him. There was blood in my dress, and so I burned it, and they found that. And when I'd heard what happened, I, I ran away, and they found me. Oh, they've got everything fixed just fine. They had a job to do, that's all, and they did it. And the sooner they get it over with, the better. And then everybody will be happy. Maybe even me. Oh, why did you quarrel with him? Have you ever been in love with some man, and then one fine day you found out you were just the last of a long list of other women? Have you? Have you? Yes. As a matter of fact, I have. Oh, well, then you know why I quarreled with him. Yes. All right, then, and I'll tell you something else, too. I didn't kill him, but now I wish I had. You hear me? I wish I had. Well, I suppose she told you she killed him, and you believed it. First she said she had killed him, and then she said she hadn't. You didn't answer the second part. She indicated you have certain evidence. Okay. Come in here. Now, the uh, DA's got the original sample, but pictures should give you a rough idea. What's that? A piece of a dress that was found under the bed. They matched it to the dress she burned, uh, more or less. And uh, what's the plaster thing? Cast of tire marks. <laughs> Don't you read Dick Tracy? Oh, I've used plaster casts of tire marks myself in my books. But, uh... They look a little vague. They are. You know something, Lieutenant? I'm inclined to agree with you. About what? About the girl. I think she is innocent. Oh, so you can write it from the whodunit angle, huh? Less asperity, Lieutenant, if you please, and a little more attention to detail. <laughs> By the way, why is everyone so anxious to believe this particular girl did it? Because they think they can make it stick. Why look further? Because it's good for them. They make their reputations that way. Just like your boss makes circulation. Let's face it. You and I know what Dr. Winter was like. There must be a dozen girls in this town who have just as much reason for killing him as this one. For what I said. As for the confession, she's obviously an hysteric. Any good alienist could break that down. Said that, too. And as far as this stuff, I, I don't know much about tires, but this dress pattern is as common as a common a cotton handkerchief. There must be 50 of them within a mile of where we're standing right now. Same goes for the tires. I've told them all that. And there must be something wrong with your methods, Lieutenant. 
Now, um, what do we deduce from all this? I'll tell you what I deduce. What? As a woman who's killed a man in this town, a murderess. A murderess that's still on the loose. <laughs> For Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Gloria Swanson in Murder by the Book. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented by Roma. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those better-tasting wines from the world's largest reserves of fine wines. Vacation time is in full swing, and that means more time for baseball, tennis, golf, fishing, gardening. Whatever form of recreation you choose, here's a delightful way to cool off and refresh yourself. Just serve a tall, cool Roma wine and soda. Half-filled glasses with robust Roma California Burgundy, delicate Roma Sauterne, or any Roma wine. Fill up with ice and soda, sweeten to taste, then sip and be surprised. You'll agree with everybody that refreshingly delicious Roma wine and soda really is a treat that beats the heat. Treat your family to Roma wine and soda tomorrow. Serve Roma wine and soda whenever guests drop in and all summer long. And for better taste, be sure you use America's favorite wine, Roma wine. R-O-M-A, Roma wine. And now, Roma wines bring back to our New York soundstage Gloria Swanson as Emily Carlyle. In Murder by the Book, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. At first, I was quite excited about the whole thing, about covering a murder case, I mean. It was good for me. It took my mind off myself, the book I should have been finishing and couldn't. And uh, poor Ned being drowned last summer... That had been more of a strain than even I realized. I knew that now. Not that I wasn't terribly fond of Ned, but we hadn't been as close as we once were. But it had been a shock. That's why I'd been going to Dr. Winter myself. It as much as told me that the spells I had were a, were a direct result of what happened to Ned. Oh, it shows you how tiny and yet how strange our little world can be here. Here I was... Writing up the case of Dr. Winter's murder for the newspapers. Of course, right away I discovered that the evidence against the girl they were holding was all circumstantial. And Lieutenant Hahn got me prints of the pictures. A piece from the dress they said she was wearing and, and attire marks. And uh, I, I went out to do a little checking of my own. First I went to Gorman's department store. Actually, it's the only real store for women's things in town. Well, 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 Miss Carlyle, long time no see, eh? <laughs> uh, what can I do for you? I was wondering if uh, you could identify a dress for me, a certain dress. A dress? Why, sure, what kind of a dress you have in mind? No, I don't want to buy one. I just want to find out about one, a, a particular dress, this dress that this picture was taken of. That's only a piece of it, of course. Oh, 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 that? Yes, you've uh, sold quite a few of them, uh, haven't you? uh uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, say, I hear you're going to write up this winter case for the papers. Is that right, Miss Carlyle? Why, yes, I am. As a matter of fact, this dress... Uh, oh, I, I know this dress, all right. We had them last spring, sold like hotcakes, four dozen of them. Uh, did you keep any record of uh, who, so, who you sold them to? Could I get a list? No, uh, no. Uh, no complete record. Mostly cash sales, you know. Made up a partial list, that's all, a partial list. Well, that's what I want. That's better than nothing. Going into competition with the police department now, huh? <laughs> no, I'm trying to help them, Mr. Gorman. Uh, if you'll give me... You'd better see them about that yourself, then. Lieutenant Hahn. Gave him the list three weeks ago. You'd better see him. Oh, I didn't know he had one. He never told me. The cops don't always tell everything they know, eh? <laughs> uh, you go see Lieutenant Hahn. He's the man you want to see, Lieutenant Hahn. I felt a little silly. Why hadn't he told me? But then, of course, I had never asked him. My next stop was Morton's big service station on the corner of North and Main. They did practically all the tire business in town. How do, Miss Carlyle? Fill it up? Why, uh, yes, uh, I guess so. Oh, uh, but I wanted to ask you something. Sure, Miss Carlyle, what is it? 
Well, uh, you see this thing? Hmm? It's the imprint of an auto tire, and I wonder... Oh, from the winter case, huh? The cops was already in here. I heard you was working on the case, Miss Carlyle. Mm, in a way. And I was trying to find out about this tire, I mean. Well, that uh... tire, ma'am, that's a 616 Goodstone. It's pretty new, too. You can see from this middle tread here, you see. I don't see how anybody could prove much by this here. Uh, do you sell many of these? Uh, what did you call them? 616 Goodstone. Oh, yeah, plenty. That's what I mean. I don't see how you could prove much without that tire. You find them on all kind of cars. I know, but... Look uh, here, you got them on your own car, Miss Carlyle. Same kind, 616 Goodstone. Almost new, too. You see what I mean? Oh, yes. Yeah, I see. Yeah, plenty of them kind of tires around. Hey, you want that tank of gas now, Miss Carlyle? No. No, thank you. Never mind. <laughs> Funny how you never notice things like tires, if you're a woman anyway. They did always handle things like that, and then afterwards, Cora had done it. Cora. Huh. And of course, as the boy had said, there were hundreds of tires like it. Hundreds. Cora wasn't home yet, and I wandered around the house and tried to think, but I didn't get very far. I was afraid one of my headaches was coming on. I decided to try and write my first article. But when I sat down at the typewriter, I... Remembered I hadn't put the cover over it the last time, and it was all dusty. I went to the room closet and rummaged around in the basket we keep there for old rags. I just started to dust off the typewriter when I noticed it. The rag I held in my hand. It wasn't just an ordinary rag. It was a piece of a dress. And it wasn't just an ordinary dress. It had a cute little red and white print pattern. The kind of a dress the police said was worn by the woman who had murdered Dr. Winter. Coming in. Instinctively, I thrust the rag that was in my hand into the desk. Mother, you home? Oh, hello, darling. Been shopping? Oh, just a few odds and ends. What have you been doing? Oh, a little of this, a little of that. Mm. Um, Cora, what about the car? Won't we uh, be needing new tires pretty soon? Well, no, I had new ones put on all around only a little while ago. You remember? Uh, I'd forgotten. When was that? Oh, six weeks ago, anyway. Then it was before? Before what? The, the murder. Will you stop it? Do you have to go through with this thing, Mother? I think it's better for me to write it than some stranger, don't you? If you wish. But it's so different from what happens in stories. For instance, I can't even remember what we were doing the night... The night it happened. Can you? We were home. Are you sure? Don't you remember? It's... Isn't it silly? You had one of your headaches. I was in my room. You were in yours. Then I was asleep all evening. I suppose you were. But you don't know. You weren't with me. What a pity. I'll Hello. start supper. Oh, Cora. Yes? Whatever happened to that old print dress? It was yours, I think. What print dress? You know, with a red and white flowered print. You did have one like that, didn't you? I haven't seen it for quite a while. But it couldn't have just disappeared. The last time I saw it, you had it. And then I don't know what happened to it. I had it? Don't you remember? No. Would, uh... Would this be it, Cora? Oh. So this has all been a cross-examination, has it? There were certain things I had to know, Cora. Well, I won't stand for it, do you hear? You can do anything you like about yourself, but I won't let you drag me into it. I won't. You were in love with him, too, weren't you, Cora? <laughs> yes. Yes, now are you satisfied? Yes, I was in love with him. I was in love with him. When I woke up, the sun was shining, and I was lying on the bed in Cora's room, and Cora was gone. I made some coffee, and then I went down to see Lieutenant Hahn. What's the matter, Miss Carlyle? You look sort of played out. Uh, I had rather a restless night. I, I've been thinking about this thing, Lieutenant. Uh, I've, uh, I've been thinking about it a lot. Been doing a little checking up, I hear. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, why didn't you tell me you had that list about the dresses? Was it uh, because you knew that someone in my house had bought one of those dresses? You're speaking of your stepdaughter, Cora Wales. Yes. We did know it, of course, but we knew the same thing about a couple of dozen other women. It didn't make much difference. Oh. Got any new ideas? Look, Lieutenant... I've been writing a new book. 
Or trying to. About a murder. A woman who kills her husband. I didn't know how to finish it. But now, look, it's all sort of mixed up in my mind, but you know the old theory about a murderer will always return to the scene of the crime? I don't get it. I know. Uh, put it this way. If someone killed because the person they killed knew something, they'd have to kill anyone else who knew that same thing now, wouldn't they? You still going on the theory the Ogilvy girl's innocent? I know she's innocent. You know? Well, that's pretty strong talk, Miss Carlyle. Well, call it woman's intuition. Call it whatever you like. I just know that there's someone... Look, Miss Carlyle. Maybe I had you wrong yesterday. I can see you're not kidding about this thing. Not that I pretend to know what you're talking about, but if you've really got something, you better tell Papa. No, no, you, I can't. You say you think somebody's going to come back to the scene of the crime. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I think. I, I just know that... Um... Look, Miss Carlyle, I don't like it. You're upset and you're frightened. No. I, I want to help you. No, no, I, I have to, uh, to do this my own way. Do what? I don't know. Well, I can't very well use a rubber hose to get it out of you. But I just want you to remember that whatever I do, it's part of my job. What? What's part of your job? To see that nobody else gets killed around here, including you. I could feel the headache coming on as I left his office. I almost ran to my car. All I could think of was that I had to get home before it happened. But it was coming over me awfully fast, faster than it ever had before. The house was empty. I threw myself on the couch and pressed my hands over my eyes. The pain was horrible, horrible. And then suddenly I had the feeling that I wasn't alone, that someone was standing there, standing over me. Someone I couldn't see. Someone who was crushing my brain, squeezing my temples in a kind of terrible, invisible vice. Someone who was trying to kill me. <laughs> I was having a dream. Another of those horrible dreams. I was dreaming that I'd gone upstairs to Cora's room and she was there packing her things. She didn't see me or hear me. And I crept into the room very softly. It seemed as though I had a heavy poker or something in my hand. I crept up very softly behind her. I raised the poker and then she whirled around and she saw me. You knew it wasn't an accident, didn't you? You knew he didn't just drown. You knew I killed your father. I pushed him. And I went to and when I went to Dr. Winter, he found out too. Something buried in my subconscious, he said. And he made me tell him. He told you all that, didn't he? So now I'm going to have to kill you too, Carl. I'm going to have to kill you. All right, Miss Carlyle, all right. You better come along now. I hear the doctors keep talking about schizophrenia. That's a double personality, you know. They seem to think I did all those things without even knowing it. Drowning Ned. Trying to kill Cora. That's what the spells were, they say. The other personality, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But I wish I could talk to Dr. Winter. I went to him first about the spells. He said he could cure me if I told him the truth. Only, of course, I can't talk to him now. He's dead. I killed him. In just a moment, we will hear from Gloria Swanson, tonight's star of Suspense. Presented by Roma, that's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Yes, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. That's because Roma Wines taste better. Taste better because Roma selects and presses only the choicest California grapes. Then these natural juices are guided unhurriedly by Roma master vintners and winemaking resources unmatched in America to full-taste richness. These Roma wines are placed with mellow Roma wines of years before, and from these, the world's greatest wine reserves, 
Roma later selects for your pleasure. Treat your family and guests to the better taste of Roma California wines. For everyday use, or for friendly entertaining, serve Amber Roma Sherry, Ruby Roma Port, or Golden Roma Muscatel. Roma adds so much to your pleasure, and yet now costs so little, that you'll want to keep a supply of better-tasting Roma wines on hand. Remember to ask for Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. This is Gloria Swanson. It was a great pleasure to appear on tonight's broadcast of Suspense. Next week, Suspense will originate from Hollywood, when Roma Wines will bring you Vincent Price. Good night. Tonight's Suspense play was written by Robert L. Richards. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Vincent Price as star of Suspense, produced for Shenley by William Spear. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Wilkins at Global Casualty, Johnny. Oh, hi, Tom. How are you doing? Lousy. Right now I've got one big headache. A hundred thousand dollar headache. Try an ice bag and go back to bed. A bag of ice would cure me all right, but not the kind of ice you're thinking of. Hmm? A hundred thousand bucks worth of uncut diamonds, Johnny. They've been stolen and we wrote the policy on them. A hundred thousand? That's a fat lot of rocks, Tom. And a fat fee if you can recover them for us. You interested? Oh, that's the understatement of the week. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the picture postcard matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and a quarter. Taxi to the office of Global Casualty where Tom Wilkins was waiting for me. Well, looks like we're bucking a pretty well-organized outfit in this deal, Johnny. The way they pulled the job shows they'd planned it out pretty well. How did it happen, Tom, and where? The diamonds were being taken by special courier from Zurich, Switzerland, to Amsterdam. They got lifted at the Zurich airport. How? The airport was crowded. The courier was carrying the diamonds in a leather briefcase strapped to his wrist. A fight broke out suddenly. In the confusion, the courier was slugged and the case cut loose from him. After which the fight suddenly stopped, huh? Yeah. It was obviously a rigged brawl. By the time the police arrived, the people involved had disappeared. With the uncut diamonds. Mm -hmm. Sounds like their timing was pretty good. Too good. How about the courier? You get a look at the guy who slugged him? No, it happened from behind. Anybody in the airport crowd able to describe the guys who'd rigged the brawl? No clear description. Somebody mentioned that one of the men involved was stocky, sort of a bull neck. Oh, great. Probably only a couple of million people answering that description. True. Zurich police turn up anything? Not a thing. Well, look, Tom, I'm an insurance investigator, not a magician. You better get yourself another boy. Whoa, Johnny. We got one lead, and it could be enough if it's on the level. Oh, well, let's have it. The robbery was day before yesterday. This morning, I got an airmail special delivery letter from Zurich. Here, take a look. Uh Regarding the recent diamond matter, I have information which may enable you to recover them. For a reward. So I see. And he wants to talk to somebody about it. Yeah, and I nominate you. It's signed Sebastian. Any idea who he is? None at all. As you see, I was to reply to general delivery in Zurich. I did. Told him you were the one. Uh Uh-huh. How do I find him? I'll read on. You're to register at the Polo Hotel in Zurich. He or she will contact you there. You think it's on the level? I don't know. Could be a phony. Somebody trying to ace in and promote a fast buck. It's happened before. Sure, and this could be another one. But right now, it's the only lead we've got. We've got to take a chance and go along with it. I can't say I care for the postscript here. Extreme caution necessary. Leads me to think there's one thing you'd better be real sure about, Johnny. What's that? That you don't get contacted by the wrong guy. And so, with the sun sinking slowly in the west and my morale slowly following suit, I said goodbye to my cheerful friend and set sail for distant shores. Item two, $622, plane fare and incidentals to Zurich, Switzerland. It was a quiet, uneventful flight, and I had a lot of time to think. 
and I didn't much like what I was thinking. Whoever had lifted the uncut stones wouldn't exactly like the idea of an informant spilling the beans to me, and I had a slight hunch I'd be lucky if beans were the only thing that got spilled. My plane landed at Zurich in the late afternoon. I hired a cab, that's item three, one dollar, to take me to the Polo Hotel. The city looked bright, fresh, and clean. It gave me a lift. And the sight of a very pretty girl walking quickly to my cab as we were ready to pull away from the airport didn't hurt either. Oh, darling, I... Well, oh. hello. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I've made a mistake. Darn it. I thought you thought were... I was somebody else. Yeah, that's the trouble with having an ordinary-looking face. Well, I wouldn't call it ordinary. But, but please... Well... Please, I, I wonder, could I share your cab into the city? Oh, by all means. I guess my friend was not on that plane after all. Oh, that's rough. Okay, driver. Oh, this is very good of you. Well, I'm a real prince when you get to know me, Miss... Schaefer. Ilsa Schaefer. Johnny Dollar. And speaking of getting to know me... Driver, please, pull up. Well, hey, how come? Oh, I am so sorry, Mr. Dollar. I just remembered something I have to do. We were just beginning to get acquainted. I know. A pity, isn't it? Well, look, wait, don't... Well, perhaps this will make up for it. Well, offhand, I can't think of a better start. Now, if you'll only... Goodbye. Hey, Ilsa, wait. Hmm. Well, if this is the customary Swiss hospitality driver, sign me up. Then I realized that Ilsa had forgotten her purse. I had the driver cruise around a few minutes, but we didn't see her anywhere. So I dropped her purse off at the lost and found office of the taxi cab company, then went on to the Polo Hotel. It was in the newer quarter of Zurich, on the lower slopes of the Zurichberg. I went inside and started for the desk in the lobby, but I didn't quite make it. Turn here, please. Sorry, I'm heading for the desk. I said turn here, please. You know, I can't say I care for the way you keep nudging me in the ribs. That wouldn't be a gun, would it? Yes, it would. Now, if you will, please come with me. Okay, mister. Where to? To the side entrance. I'll say one thing. I sure didn't expect all the reception committees. The first one I like much better. Huh? Skip it, will you? Outside. That car over there. Hey, look, isn't it about time you tell me what this is all about? There's no use pretending you do not know. The diamonds. Oh, you think I've got them, maybe? I do not think. I'm sure of it. Well, this may come as a nasty surprise to you, mister, but I... I have, have no time to waste. She entered your cab with a purse. She? And... Ilsa? And left without it. And she was, uh, shall we say, very friendly to you. Oh, that I remember. And I have no complaints, believe me, but she didn't give me any diamonds. I warn you. They weren't in her purse, either. They checked the contents at Lost and Found. Get into the car. Hey, look, this routine won't get you anywhere. Into the car. Hey, take it easy, friend. You're trying to poke a hole in my ribs. Okay, okay, very nice. Take it into the car. I jerked the door open suddenly and knocked him off balance. I swung at him, but he ducked and lunged at me. I went sprawling into the street in front of an oncoming car. One of the fenders hit me a glancing blow and I bounced against the curb. By the time I could get to my feet again, my friend with a gun had disappeared and so had his car. I wasn't hurt, but it took several minutes to convince the very scared cab driver who'd accidentally hit me. He should be scared. Expense account item four, twelve dollars and seventy-five cents. Telephone call to Tom Wilkins at Global Casualty Bank in the States. I'm glad you called, Johnny. Uh, any luck so far? No luck, but sure a lot of action. Well, what do you mean? Well, first off, an attractive little doll shares my cab for a few blocks, plants a kiss on me, and scrambles out, leaving her purse behind. What? Then a strong arm collars me and tells me the girl must have passed the diamonds to me in the cab. Oh, but that doesn't make sense. Well, anyway, that's what happened so far. Plus, my almost getting run over in the process. Look, Johnny, I knew this wouldn't be an easy assignment, but... Uh... Yeah, I know. Yeah. Don't worry, Tom. I'm still all in one piece. But I'm beginning to realize what Sebastian meant in his letter about extreme caution being necessary. Has anyone contacted you yet? No, only the aforementioned pair. No sign of this Sebastian, whoever he or she is. Well, I still don't understand Neither why... Neither do I. Either the boys who stole the diamonds have lost them, or there's another outfit trying to get their hands on them. In which case, I'm right in the middle. Johnny, Sebastian's still our only lead. You've got to give him plenty of chance to contact you. Yeah, I know. we Will do. But be careful. Look, I'm with you, believe me. I went up to my room and stretched out on the bed to wait. Two hours went by. Nothing happened. 
Finally, I went down to the lobby. Expense account item five, 30 cents, two English language newspapers. I settled down in the most conspicuous chair I could find and waited some more. Still nothing. I worked my way through the newspapers slowly. Then, finally, somebody came over to the chair that was back to back with mine. I took a quick look. He was well dressed, dark wavy hair, medium height. But he paid no attention to me and started reading his newspaper. Looked like a wrong guess. Maybe I'd have to wait until tomorrow. So I started to get up. Mr. Dollar. Mm, what? Please, put your newspaper in front of your face and do not turn around. Okay. Who are you? Sebastian, who wrote the letter to your company in the United States. Oh? It must not appear we are talking to each other. Somebody watching us? I would not doubt it. So you want to talk about the robbery of those uncut diamonds? How do I know you have any real information? I will give you proof presently. But first, let us talk about the reward. What is the amount? Depends on how good the information is, Sebastian. I am talking about the diamonds. Oh? Suppose I were to tell you that I was in a position to guarantee their return. Go on. For $25,000 and no further investigation, I will arrange for the return of the diamonds. I'd have to have proof that you know what you're talking about. Of course. Let me see. My back is to you. Is it your right hand which is closest to the wall and shielded from the lobby? Yeah. Put it down beside your chair. Do not take the newspaper away from your face. Okay. Here. Picture postcard. Yes. Addressed to me, as you see. The writing's in German. What does it mean? It is the equivalent of your American expression, having wonderful time, wish you were here. Signed by F. Gruner. Who's he or she? A friend. Look at the picture on the other side. The Kleibach Inn? Yes. An inn in the town of Kleibach in the Alps, several hours from here. Hey, wait a minute. Are the diamonds at the Kleibach Inn? No. But this postcard is part of the key to their location. Part of the... Oh, now, look, Sebastian, this just isn't good enough. I can't... Someone is coming. I cannot talk further with you here. It is not safe. Do not worry. I will furnish all the proof you need. When? Tonight. Now, listen carefully. I am going. I will leave my newspaper on the floor beside my chair. Wait a few minutes, then get up. Drop your paper, and when you pick it up, pick up mine also. Then what? On an inner page of my paper, I have written my address. Come there in two hours. If I am not there, wait for me. Now, just a minute. How can I... Please. There is no time for further questions. Two hours, Mr. Dollar. In my room. Two hours later, I went to the address he'd given me. A small apartment in another part of the city. Now, answer He hadn't arrived yet. I went inside and waited. Fifteen minutes went by. No sign of Sebastian. And then something started pecking away at my brain. A faint sound. I finally pegged it. A dripping faucet. It came from the bathroom. The bathtub was full. In it, floating face down was Sebastian. Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a perfect stranger wants to get acquainted and a beautiful girl asks me to go skiing. Trouble is, either or both of them could be trying to kill me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Herniger of the Zurich Police, Herr Dollar. Oh, yeah, Inspector. I talked to one of your men last night. Yeah, when you report the murder of this man called Sebastian. Yeah, any line on this killer? Not as yet. We are somewhat at a loss as to motive. That I think I can supply. So? Sebastian apparently had information about the robbery of some uncut diamonds here in Zurich. So? Yeah, and he was willing to sell his information. But somebody called off the sale permanently. So find the man who lifted the stones and we'll have Sebastian's killer. Perhaps. You don't sound convinced. It appears quite possible, Herr Dollar, that Sebastian was killed by a woman. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Location, Zurich, Switzerland. Expense account continued. Item six, one dollar even. Cab fare from the Polo Hotel to police headquarters. Inspector Herniger was a big man who moved and talked slowly. But one look at his very cold, slate gray eyes told you his brain was moving a lot faster. Herr Dollar, I believe you told my lieutenant last evening that you were an insurance investigator. That's right, Inspector. And that you are in Zurich to investigate loss of a hundred thousand American dollars in diamonds at the airport a few days ago. Right. Well, uh, perhaps you had better supply me with such background as you may have. Gladly. The robbery itself, of course, you know about. A fight broke out at the airport. We know that it was, as you say, rigged. To create confusion. Yeah, and in the confusion, the courier who was carrying the stones was slugged. His briefcase was cut away from his wrist. Whereupon the assailants quickly melted away into the crowd. The exactness of their timing suggests that they were well organized and had planned the robbery in some detail. The next day, the company I'm representing got a letter from this man, Sebastian. He claimed to have information on the robbery and would help us recover the stones for a price. And you were sent to contact this Sebastian? Yeah. Or rather, I was sent here so that Sebastian could contact me. And did he? He did. But as it turned out, he practically had to stand in line. I am afraid I do not follow you. Well, first off, a very attractive young lady popped into my cab as I was leaving the airport for the hotel. I asked to share the cab. Oh? Two blocks later, she had the driver stop, planted a kiss on me, and jumped out. Indeed. You Americans seem to work fast, Herr Dollar. Yeah, I'm afraid I can't chalk up the incident to my personal charm, Inspector. She left her purse in the cab, and I gather the idea was to make somebody else think she'd pass the diamonds to me. And who would this somebody else be? A guy who jumped me in the lobby of the Polar Hotel. He was pretty convinced I had the stones. Mm. And how would the dead man Sebastian fit in? Well, it's my hunch. Sebastian was a member of the outfit who stole them in the first place. He could have been trying to play both ends against the middle. How do you arrive at that conclusion? Well, look, we know there were several members of the group... Okay, so they're bound to take a big loss when they fence the diamonds. They'd be lucky to get half the value, which would be 50000 True. Split three or four ways, that would cut the shares down considerably. But if Sebastian could engineer the return of the stones and collect a $25,000 reward for it, he'd be way ahead of the game. And Sebastian was secretly negotiating with you. Yeah, behind a newspaper in the hotel lobby. He wanted me to meet him in his room later so we could talk. I went there. I found him in the bathtub dead. And he had given you no specific information as to the location of the diamonds. Only this, Inspector. A picture postcard? Uh Uh-huh. The Kleibach Inn. He told me Kleibach was a small resort village up in the Alps. I know the place. Uh, The card is addressed to Sebastian and signed by F. Gruner. He said Gruner was a friend of his. Perhaps the diamonds are at the Kleibach Inn. He said no, that this card was only part of the key to finding them. And he gave you no indication as to what the rest of the key to their location was? No, no, none at all. I gather that's what we were going to talk about in his room later. But somebody else apparently had different ideas. Yeah. Say, look, you you said over the phone that Sebastian's killer could have been a woman. Well, he was struck on the head from behind, but only hard enough to stun him. His death was due to drowning in the bathtub. Many times in our experience, women have chosen such a method. The woman, then, could be Ilsa. Yeah. 
Or perhaps one of Sebastian's gang who learned of his plans. Very annoying, Herr Dollar. Many possibilities. But nothing tangible. Well, I'm heading for that place on the postcard, Inspector. The Kleibach Inn? Yeah. At this point, part of a key is better than none. Expense account item 7, $16.20 American. Transportation and incidentals to the Kleibach Inn. The postcard didn't do justice to the place. The village nestled in a little meadow below some towering peaks. Oh, above it was the inn, a chalet-type building that looked out over the valley. And it was a peaceful scene. A few cows in the meadow with jangling bells. A lot of snow on the peaks. A sky of startlingly clear blue and a few wisps of clouds nudging the peaks. Inside, the inn looked spacious and comfortable with a friendly fire crackling in the huge fireplace and a friendly-looking fellow behind the desk. Welcome to the Kleibach Inn. Well, thanks. Uh, please sign here. Okay. Thank you, Herr Dollar, is it? Yeah. You the manager? Yeah, I am Otto Friedrich, your host. Well, maybe you could help me, Otto. I am at your service. All right. Take a look at this postcard. Oh, what's the matter? That is not the good picture of the inn. I had some new ones made. You see, the lighting is wrong in this picture. The entire north wing is in the shadows. Now, in the good picture... Yeah, the... yeah, well, what I want to know is, uh, do you sell these cards here? Not those cards, no. I have the new cards. See, here's one. Now, see how much better... Well, how about in the village? Do they sell the old cards there? <sighs> yeah, I'm afraid so, in one or two shops. I have told them a hundred times I will give them the new ones if only yeah. they will. You see, it's... Yes, a... it's the lighting. You ever hear the name Sebastian around here? Sebastian. Sebastian, Sebastian. No need to memorize it. Just tell me if you've heard it, please. Is it a first name or a last name? There you've got me. Sebastian. No, I do not remember hearing that name. I'll be glad to check my register well, how, for how, uh, how about F. Gruner? He's the one who sent the car to Sebastian. Gruner. 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 Perhaps I heard the name in the village somewhere. Oh, I will see what I can find out. Okay, thanks. In the meantime, I hope you'll be comfortable here and enjoy your visit. Ski equipment is at your disposal. Thanks. But I'll enjoy my visit a lot more if I can find F. Gruner. <laughs> Okay, okay, coming. Yeah? Oh, I say, I, I'm looking for a chap named Dollar who's supposed to be occupying this room. I'm Johnny Dollar. You? Are you certain? Reasonably, why? Oh, what a pity. Well, I'm sorry, old man, but there's not very much I can do about it. Oh, I, I didn't mean that. I, I, I say, you must forgive me. Must I? Well, I mean, well, you see, I used to know a chap in London named Dollar. Delightful fellow, really. Uh, incidentally, I'm Geoffrey Harris. We had ripping times together. How jolly for you. Yeah, and when I heard that a chap named Dollar had registered here at the inn, well, naturally, I thought it must be old Bunny. Bunny? Yes, old Bunny Dollar. Oh, Bunny was just a big nickname, you see. Well, that's reassuring, Harris. You know, there is a bit of a resemblance... You wouldn't mind a chance to be his brother or cousin, would you? No, no. Well, after all, Dollar's a bit of an odd name, and I... No, I'm to... sorry. If you'll excuse me, I'm on my way downstairs. Oh, splendid. Well, so am I. Oh? <laughs> it's quite a coincidence, is it? Is it? Well, running to you in this way, I mean, uh, you're absolutely sure that you, you don't know Bunny Dollar? This, I can guarantee. Oh, what a pity. He's really worlds of fun. Oh, yes, I can imagine. Well, what do you know? Uh, what's that? Hmm? Oh, uh, nothing. I, I just spotted an old friend over at the bar. See you later, Harris. Oh, I see. So I can see your point, old man. Well, hello, Ilsa. Uh, oh. It is Ilsa Schaefer, isn't it? Why, you're the yeah, one. that's right. Johnny Dollar, the one you shared a cab with back in Zurich. <laughs> yes, of course. What a coincidence. Isn't it? Incidentally, Johnny, I want to thank you for turning my purse in. It was foolish of me to leave it in your cab. Just an oversight, huh? Well, yes, of course. I mean, you didn't by any chance leave it in the cab on purpose, huh? Well, of course not. Why would I do a thing like that? Oh, maybe so somebody else would think you passed something along to me in that cab, besides a kiss. Oh, that kiss. I suppose I shouldn't have been so impulsive. Oh, I didn't object to that. But I did object to a muscle man jumping me and acting like you had given me something. 
Oh? What was I supposed to have given you? You don't have any idea? No. Honestly, I don't. Okay. We'll let that ride for the time being. Mind if I ask what you're doing here at the club again? Oh, this is a favorite spot of mine. I like to ski. Oh. You don't seem convinced. I really am quite a good skier, Johnny. Are you? As a matter of fact, I plan to go skiing in the morning. Would you like to come with me? Well, now, that might be pretty interesting. Uh, just a minute. I'll go check with Otto, see if I can borrow some skis. Be right back. All right, Johnny. Ah, Herr Dollar. And how are you enjoying your stay so far? Just fine, Otto, fine. Now, look. About that girl over at the bar. Fräulein Schäfer. Oh, a most attractive young lady, no? A most attractive young lady, yes. Um, this seems to be a favorite spot of hers. I'm very happy to hear that, Herr Dollar. I suppose she comes here often, huh? This is her first visit to the Kleibach Inn. You're sure about that? Of course. I would certainly remember a young lady like her. Yes, this is her first visit, but I hope it will not be her last. Don't count on it, Otto. So Elsa was lying about coming here often. That could mean she'd lied about a few other things, too, like leaving her purse in my cab accidentally. She might have been trying to make it look like she'd passed the stolen diamonds onto me and thus take the heat off herself and whoever she was working with. I remembered what Inspector Honiger had told me, that Sebastian's killer could be a woman. I went back to the bar. Did you arrange for the skis? Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm all set. Good. Tomorrow morning, then. All right, where? Well, I had in mind the North Slope, but uh, perhaps you would not like that. Why not? Some people consider it too dangerous. Oh, I don't think I should worry about the danger, do you? Mm-hmm. After all, Elsa, I'll be in the best of hands. Thank you. I'm sure you'll take good care of me. I will certainly try to, Johnny. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, skiing's a strenuous sport, so is hunting. Put them together, and it's liable to kill you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Otto, the innkeeper. I have a telephone call for you from Police Inspector Honegger in Zurich. I will put him on. Go ahead. Hi, Inspector. Any line on Sebastian's killer? Uh, Not yet, Herr Dollar. That also means no line on the stolen diamonds, huh? I do not know. 
You recall the picture postcard Sebastian gave you before his death? The picture of the Kleibach Inn? Sure. He said it was part of a key to the location of the diamonds. That's why I came up here to the inn. But I haven't found any sign of them. We have been watching Sebastian's apartment. This morning, the second part of the key arrived in his mailbox. Another postcard? Yes. I am sending it on to you. See what you can make of it. Looks like we're in the middle of a game of some kind. Have you been able to locate the missing murder suspect, Ilse Schaefer? I've not only located her, in five minutes I'm going skiing with her. What? Herr Dollar, do you think that is wise for you? It's one way of finding out if she ties in. I just hope it doesn't turn out to be the hard way. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Global Casualty in Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Location, Clybox, Switzerland. Expense account continued. <music> Item 7, $3 American, rental on ski equipment. Ilsa Schaefer told me she'd come to Clybox to go skiing, and I wanted to make sure that was her reason. There'd been too many coincidences about her to suit me... First, the way she'd popped into my cab in Zurich, then popped out two blocks later, leaving her purse behind. Right after that, I'd been jumped by a strong arm who was sure Ilsa had passed the stolen diamonds to me. And now she turns up suddenly at the Kleibach Inn. I spotted her waiting for me at the ski lift. Come on, Johnny, you're late. In her skiing outfit, she could have passed for Miss Switzerland. But one nasty little thought kept coming into my brain, kept marring the picture. She could also be Sebastian's killer. We rode the lift up to the top, then took off along the ridges. She skied like she was born to it. Easy, smooth, and gracefully. It had been four years since I'd last been on skis, and as I struggled to keep up with her, I must have looked like a rusty snowplow. We worked our way out on the crest of one of the ridges. Let's stop here a moment. Well, that suits me fine. You winded? This is not exactly sea level. You'll get used to it. You see, I really can ski, Johnny. Oh, that's an understatement. Do you have a cigarette? Yeah, sure. Here. Thanks. Isn't it beautiful up here, Johnny? Yeah. You see that little dot way down there? That is the inn. A long way down. That's what I like about skiing. Everything is so remote, so far below. When you're up here... All that down there, it it just doesn't exist anymore. It's always there when you get back, though. (laughs) You you are too practical, Johnny. But, you know, it's fun being with you. Thanks. I still can't get over it. What? Well, the coincidence that I should share your cab in Zurich and then run into you again at the Kleibach Inn. But I am glad. Aren't you? Can't say that I... (laughs) Johnny! Must have come from that other ridge behind the rocks. (laughs) Closer. We're sitting ducks on this ridge. Quick! Down the left side of it. There is a shortcut. Let's go. Keep low, Elsa. Who could be shooting at us? We'll figure that out when we get out of range. He's still right with us. We'll be out of sight in a moment. Could be a moment too late. There. We are past the shoulder. Yeah. Slope's pretty steep here. This is the quickest way. The shoulder of the ridge will keep us out of sight. Maybe. What do you mean? We get going much faster and we're going to take off. Hey, ahead of us, a cliff. Johnny, stop! What do you think I'm trying to do? Johnny, Johnny, watch out! Can't Johnny! Can't... Oh, brother. Oh, Johnny. Four feet more and I... Thank heaven. This was a real great route you picked, Ilsa. Oh, I... I can't tell you how sorry I am. Sorry I didn't go over the edge. Oh, of course not. I mean, I'm I'm sorry that in the excitement, I forgot about the avalanche. Avalanche? Yes, several months ago. It took away part of the slope and left this sheer drop. Forgot about it, huh? Well, I I just told you I did. I noticed you didn't have much trouble stopping in time. But I was behind you. Oh, yeah, that's just where you were, behind me. 
What are you trying to say, Johnny? Just that this is one coincidence too many, Ilsa. We just happen to stop on the top of the ridge right where I make a grade-A target. Then you just happen to forget there's a sheer drop on this shortcut you got me to take. But I explain Come on, that... we're going back to the inn. The fire feels good, doesn't it? Johnny, Johnny, what is it? What's the matter? All those things you said up on the ridge... I'm waiting, Elsa. Waiting for what? For you to open up and tell me what this is all about and how you fit into the deal. Deal? Oh, cut it out, will you? You didn't just happen to share my cab back in Zurich. The whole thing was rigged so it would look like you passed those stolen diamonds along to me. Stolen? Johnny, I don't know anything about stolen diamonds. I suppose you also don't know anything about a man named Sebastian. Yes, I know Sebastian. What has he got to do with... about his murder? Murder? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Why, why, I I can't believe it. Sebastian did. Yeah, and you've already admitted you knew Sebastian. Now, let's have the rest of the story, straight. Oh, well, Sebastian was a friend of mine. Friend? Nothing more. He had asked me to share your cab at the airport and to leave my purse in it. Why did he want you to do that? I don't know. He, well, he said he was in some kind of trouble and needed help. He said if I would do that, it would help him. Ilsa, you'll have to do better than that. But I am telling you the truth. No, you... Hey, wait a minute. You claim you didn't know what kind of trouble Sebastian was in? No, he didn't tell me. You also claim you don't know anything about the diamonds? A hundred thousand dollars worth? What? I read about that in the newspapers, but... Oh, wait a moment. Are you saying that Sebastian was involved in it? Up to his ears. I'm sorry to hear that, Johnny. But you must believe me. I did not know anything about it. You're either telling the truth or you're a whale of an actress, Ilsa. I'm telling you the truth. Okay. But about that taxi cab in Zurich... I don't understand. Sebastian was trying to double-cross the rest of the outfit by negotiating with me for the return of the diamonds. But apparently there was another outfit after the diamonds. He wanted to make it look to them like he'd passed the diamonds along to take the heat off. You said a man attacked you after I had left your cab. Yeah. He obviously thought you'd slip me the diamonds. So Sebastian was setting me up as a patsy on the one hand and negotiating with me on the other. Who could have killed him? Good question. Could be the outfit trying to grab the stones. Or Sebastian's own crowd found out he was trying to sell them out. And the person who shot at us up on the ridge? Same two possibilities. Which reminds me, you still haven't explained how you happened to come up here to the Kleibach Inn. Well, Sebastian told me he had unfinished business in Zurich, and he would meet me here in a few days, and we would go skiing. I see. Tell me, did you know any of Sebastian's friends? One or two, slightly. Was one of them big and powerful, thick features, almost bald? Mm, No. Why? Well, he's the one who jumped me in the hotel lobby after my cab ride with you. Oh, no, no. I I am certain I would remember him the way you describe him. Oh, there was a man Sebastian spent a great deal of time with, but he was short and stocky with very thick neck. Well, that fits the description of one of the men in the robbery at the Zurich airport. Do you know his name? Why, um... Bruner, I think it was. Could it have been Gruner? Yes, yes, Gruner. The man who sent the postcard to Sebastian. Yeah, that ties in all right. Postcard? Oh, I'll skip that. Was one of Sebastian's friends an Englishman? Mm, Not that I know of. Why? Well, a fellow named Jeffrey Harris here at the hotel has been trying to strike up an acquaintance with me. Claims he thought I was old Bunny Dollar, a friend of his from London. Oh, well. Johnny, if you'll excuse me, I... I'm very tired and upset about this news of Sebastian. I I think I'll go to my room. Yeah, okay, Elsa. If there's anything more I can do... Don't worry. I'll let you know. All right. I'll see you later. Herr Dollar? Hmm? Oh, Otto. Did you enjoy your skiing? Well, let's say it was real interesting. Got a question for you, Otto. Huh? As a man of experience, how do you tell if a woman is lying? (laughs) Okay, Adolfo. As an innkeeper, I learned long ago that one listens to a woman, agrees with her, smiles politely, keeps his eyes open, and believes what he wishes about her. 
Yeah, well, I guess that's as good advice as any. I hear, Dollar, this letter arrived for you from Zurich by special messenger while you were... Oh, yeah, I was expecting it. Thanks, Otto. One more thing. Yeah? Did anybody else go skiing this morning? From the inn? No. I see. But the Englishman... Jeffrey Harris? What about him? He likes to climb the rocks. He went out for a while. Climbing rocks, huh? Thanks a lot. Yeah. Jeffrey Harris could be my boy, all right. But at the moment, I was more interested in the contents of the envelope Police Inspector Honiger had sent me from Zurich. I tore it open and examined the postcard inside. Expense item eight, two and a half, long distance call to Zurich and Honiger. You received the postcard, Herr Dollar? Yeah, from Gruner to Sebastian, a picture of a chalet on the side of a mountain. You say this card arrived in Sebastian's mailbox? This morning. Apparently, Gruner is unaware of Sebastian's death. Uh, What do you make of the card? Well, the chalet in the picture is sort of a small halfway house for skiers. Is it attended? No, empty most of the time. Herr Dollar, possibly the first postcard of the inn was simply for the purpose of guiding Sebastian to Kleibach. The second is perhaps a picture of the actual location of the diamonds. That's what I'm going up there to find out. The trail up the mountain started in back of the inn. I worked my way up the ridge slowly, keeping an eye on every clump of rock, just in case my friend with the rifle was still on the prowl. Near the crest, I stopped for breath. Suddenly, I spotted something moving far down the slope below me. Someone was descending from rock to rock, almost down to the inn. It was too far to tell for sure, but it looked like the Englishman, Jeffrey Harris. I started my climb again. Ten minutes later, I reached the halfway house, the place on the postcard. It was small, just a shelter, and there was no sign of life. Inside, the place was in a shambles, completely torn about. If this had been the hiding place of the stolen diamonds, somebody had sure beat me to it. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... A third part of the key turns up in the form of a corpse. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Inspector Honecker of the Zurich Police, Herr Dollar. Hi, Inspector. Where are you? Downstairs, in the lobby of the inn. I came up from Zurich to see if that picture postcard I sent you was of help in locating the stolen diamonds. Afraid not, Inspector. I located the chalet on the postcard, all right. It's sort of a shelter for skiers up on a ridge. Well? Well, when I got there, the place had been turned upside down. If the diamonds were hidden there, somebody sure beat me to it. I see. So it looks like we're at a dead end. Perhaps not. What do you mean? You recall that in Zurich a large man attacked you thinking that you had the diamonds? Recall it? I've still got the lumps to prove it. What about him? A man answering that description bought a railroad ticket here to Kleibach last night. Oh? 
We have reason to believe that he is somewhere here in the village now. That could mean that the diamonds that he and you are looking for are here after all. I'll be right down, Inspector. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Global Casualty in Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Location, Clybox, Switzerland. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 9, 70 cents. One pot of coffee for Inspector Honiger and myself at the Clybox Inn. Ah, most perplexing case, Herr Dollar. A skillfully timed robbery of the uncut diamonds at the Zurich airport last week... And then these puzzling postcards supposedly giving the location of the diamonds. Yeah, they've got to be the key, Inspector. If we can only figure them out. Look, we know now that Sebastian was in on the robbery and was trying to negotiate secretly for the return of the stones. Yeah, and he told you before he was murdered that the postcard he gave you was a part of the key to the location of the diamonds. That's right. It was signed by a man named Gruner. And according to Ilsa Schaefer, Gruner was a friend of Sebastian's. Her description of Gruner matches one of the men in the robbery at the airport. And what of this young lady, Ilse Schaefer? What do you make of her? Well, that's a, a good question, Inspector. I, I wish I knew the answer. I hope she's in the clear. Hope? Oh, oh I see. All right, so I'm normal. Uh, yeah, she is a very attractive young lady. But there is also the chance that she is involved... That she killed Sebastian. I know. I know. She could be involved or she could be innocent. It's a 50-50 proposition, I guess. Pay your money and take your choice. More coffee, Inspector? Please. Thank you. Uh, what is her story? Well, I finally got her to admit she didn't share my cab in Zurich and leave her purse in it just by coincidence. It was Sebastian's idea to make it look like she'd passed something along to me. But why would Sebastian wish to make it appear that you had the diamonds if he was trying to negotiate with you for their return? That does not make sense. Actually, I think it does, Inspector. It could go together this way. After the robbery, the gang split up. Gruner was to hide the diamonds, then get word to Sebastian as to their location. Of this much, we are fairly certain. Okay, okay. But now, Sebastian gets the bright idea of double-crossing his buddies. He gets in touch with the insurance company I represent, and they send me to Zurich to negotiate with him. I still do not... In the meantime, though, another outfit has moved into the picture and is trying to grab the stones from Sebastian and his boys. Yeah. Yeah, that would explain many things. Sure, sure would. That's why he rigged that deal with Ilsa in my taxi cab to make it look to the other outfit like I had the stones. That would take them off his neck for a while. Yeah, he was playing me for a patsy. But I've got to admit, it was a pretty fair scheme. Then later, Sebastian contacts you and gives you the first postcard. Mm -hmm. He tells you it is part of the key to the location of the diamonds. That's right. But Sebastian didn't move fast enough, so he wound up dead. But uh, his confederate Gruner sent him a second card. Oh, probably mail before Sebastian was killed. It is possible. Now... The first postcard is a picture of this Kleibach Inn. Yeah, and according to Watto, the innkeeper, it's not the best picture of the inn. I asked him about Gruner. He said he thought he'd heard the name somewhere, but that Gruner hadn't been a guest here. Perhaps he is down in the village. Well, I'm going to check that today. But if the diamonds are in the village, why the postcard of the inn? And why the second postcard of the ski hut on the ridge? <sighs> I do not know. Is there anybody here at the inn that you suspect of being an accomplice of Gruner and Sebastian? Ilsa Schaefer, for one. She claims Sebastian told her he'd meet her here in a few days for some skiing. I see. Anyone else? An Englishman named Jeffrey Harris. He seems pretty interested in me. Claims he thought I was a friend of his from London. He might be telling the truth. Yeah, yeah, he might be. But I found out he likes to climb mountains. And he was up there somewhere this morning when Ilsa and I were skiing and got shot at. 
Do you think Fräulein Schaefer could have maneuvered you into that position? Well, if she did, she had a lot of confidence in the marksmanship of her buddy in the rocks. And you told me she suggested a route of escape which ended suddenly at a, a cliff. Which I almost went off of. Yeah, yeah, Inspector, I hate to say it, but she could be the one. And I've got to find out one way or the other. Which means I'm going to stick pretty close to her for the time being. I gather that prospect is not entirely unpleasant to you. But be careful, Herr Dollar. She could be dangerous. So could Jeffrey Harris. On my way to the ski hut this afternoon, I spotted him down the mountain from me. And the ski hut had been torn apart. Yeah. If the diamonds were there, they're gone now. And Harris could be the boy who beat me to them. If he or anybody attempts to leave Kleibach... One of my men at the railroad station will report it. Well, I must be getting back to Zurich, Herr Dollar. Who knows? Perhaps these postcards are just decoys. And the stones are still in Zurich? No. No, I'd bet my bottom dollar they're here in Kleibach somewhere. If I could only figure out the meaning of those postcards. Yeah. Otherwise, why would the man who attacked you in Zurich have come here? He must be hiding out in the village somewhere. Well, perhaps I can turn up something else of help in Zurich. Right now, Inspector, anything would be of help, believe me. After Inspector Honiger left, I studied the postcards again, but I got nowhere. One of the inn, the other the ski hut. What did they mean? I went out on the balcony outside my room and looked up at the mountains. But I couldn't see the ski hut from there. A ridge was in the way. I did see something else, though. Three rooms down the balcony, Jeffrey Harris's French doors were open. His room was empty. So I decided to have a look. I wasn't sure just what I was looking for. Something, anything that would indicate whether or not Harris was involved in the whole thing. I worked my way to the closet, turning up one big nothing. His clothes were hung neatly in place, and in one corner was stacked some climbing gear. I reached around behind it, and my hand touched metal. I pulled it into view. A rifle with a telescopic sight. I sniffed at the barrel. The gun had been fired recently. Ah, good evening, Herr Dollar. Hello, Otto. Look, have you seen Jeffrey Harris lately? The Englishman? Not since late afternoon. All day long he was out climbing the mountain. Yeah, I know. He no sooner got back than he went out again. Before dinner. And it was a good dinner tonight, too. Any idea where he went? None. Could be in the village. Look, tell me something. When he arrived here at your inn, did he have a gun case in his luggage? Mm, he had a lot of climbing equipment, but I did not notice a gun case. Well, he could have taken it apart and packed it in his suitcase. Why do you ask, Herr Dollar? Hmm. Oh, skip it. I'll see you later, Otto. Johnny. Oh. Hello, Elsa. I've been looking for you. Yeah? Have you been able to find out who are shooting at us up on the ridge this morning? I'm not sure, yet. You still do not trust me, do you? I don't know, Elsa. What can I do to prove to you that I am not involved? In what? Anything. The diamond robbery, the murder of Sebastian, the attempt on your life this morning. I, I like you, Johnny. I don't want you thinking such things about me. Look, let's, uh, let's talk about it later on. Why not now? I have to go into the village. Well... Perhaps I could go with you, Johnny. Do you mind? No. Matter of fact, that might be a good idea. Nice in the village tonight, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Quiet, too. You seem to, to be looking for something, Johnny. For someone, Elsa. Who? The Englishman, Jeffrey Harris. Oh, you told me you'd never seen him before you came here to Kleibach. That is right. Then he wasn't a friend of Sebastian's. Well, not as far as I know. Well, an hour ago, in Harris's room, I found a rifle with a telescopic sight. You mean that Harris is the one who shot at you this morning? Otto, the innkeeper, told me Harris went mountain climbing today. I saw him on his way down late this afternoon. But he isn't at the inn now. You think he's down here in the village? Maybe. That's why... What's the matter? Hold it, Elsa. Well, well, looks like maybe the village isn't so quiet after all. What do you mean? I think somebody's following us. What? Come on, I'll start walking. Yeah. Where? Across the street and back away in the shadows. 
Oh, what are you going to do, John? Figure out a way. Wait a minute. That alley up ahead will turn into it. Oh, John. Don't, don't turn your head, Elsa. Okay, into the alley now. Good. He can't see us here. Who do you think it is? I don't know. Bruner, Jeffrey, Harris, even the guy who jumped me back in Zurich thinking I had the diamonds. Keep going. You think he'll come into this alley? That's what I'm hoping. All right, now here we are. The doorway here will do very nicely. Look, you'll see, you keep going down the alley, cut across to the next street and go back to the inn. But what are you going to do? Wait for him. Go on now, go on. No, Johnny. Look, you do as I... I want to stay with Don't you. Don't be silly. It could get a little rough around here all of a sudden. Uh, There's nothing you can do here, Elsa. So do what I tell you. Now get moving. Now. She looked at me a moment, then went down the alley and out of sight. A couple of minutes went by. Nothing. Then I heard steps. He was approaching the alley, whoever he was. Now he was at the entrance. I pressed back into the doorway. A few more feet. And... Oh, wait a minute. He decided not to bite. I edged out of the doorway and back to the mouth of the alley. Then I stuck my head around the corner. Nobody. He must have ducked into a building or down the street. It sounded like Ilsa for the next street. I cut through the alley. Then I spotted a couple of people in front of a small hotel down the street. They were jabbering excitedly. There was a man crumpled up on the ground. Ilsa saw me and ran over. Johnny. Oh, Johnny. What's the matter, Ilsa? He fell out of the upstairs window. Almost in front of Who me. Who is it? It's, it's Sebastian's friend, Gruner. Gruner. The guy who'd been writing postcards to Sebastian. Gruner. The only man in the world who knew where the diamonds were hidden. My one lead. Dead. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up. I find out some people will not hesitate to kill anyone who gets in their way. And that's not so good when the man in the way is me. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Otto, the innkeeper, Herr Dollar. Oh, good. I was away from the desk for a few minutes and just received the message that you called. Look, Otto, I'm at the little hotel down in the village. You're not planning to move out of the Kleibach Inn, I hope. No, no, listen, I want you to do me a favor. Of course. Have you seen Jeffrey Harris? The English gentleman? No. Then keep a sharp eye out for him. Oh. Yeah, and the minute he gets back to the inn, call me. But don't let him know you're calling me. Whatever you say, Herr Dollar... But is something wrong? Plenty. This man named Gruner I've been looking for. You have found him? I've found him, all right. Dead. What? And it looks like his killer is here at this hotel. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Clybox, Switzerland. To the Home Office Global Casualty, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the picture postcard matter. Expense account continued. The murder of Gruner meant that I had lost the one solid lead I had on the whole case. Unless, of course, I could round up whoever put him away. Item 10, one dollar to the desk clerk for watching the rear entrance of the hotel in case the killer should try to get out that way. Well, what are you going to do, Johnny? Go upstairs and take a look. I'm coming with you. No, no, stay here. I won't. I'm coming with you. All right, I don't have time to argue. Now, tell me again just what happened, Elsa. You realized we were being followed along the street. You decided to wait in that alley, and I was to cut through to this street and go back to the inn. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Well, when I got to the street, I heard a man cry out. Then I saw Gruner fall from an upstairs window. He was dead. He fell from a corner room? Yes. Well, that'll be this door over here. Okay. Get back against the wall, Elsa. All right. Be careful, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. Empty. Maybe one of the other rooms, Johnny. Yeah. Hey, hey. Somebody just locked up. That was down the hall. Yeah, come on. That room at the end. Get back, Elsa. Gone. The window. Yeah. Oh, great. A fire escape. Uh Uh-oh. You see someone, Just a flash as he disappeared around the corner. Could you recognize him? There wasn't much light, but it looked like the big boy who jumped me back in Zurich. Then it was he who killed Gruner. Could be. And Gruner was my last lead to those stolen diamonds. You think that man who got away now has them? I don't know. If he does and tries to leave town, Inspector Honiger's man will pick him up at the railroad station. Well, let's go back to the inn. We did... But only because it meant being someplace where I could quietly sit down and think. Try to put together and make sense out of what meager information I had. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I was starving. More coffee, Johnny? Hmm? No, no thanks, no. What's the matter, Johnny? Oh, what's the matter is I'm beat. The stolen diamonds. The stolen diamonds. Unless I can figure out the meaning of those picture postcards Gruner sent to Sebastian, I'm licked. And so far, I've drawn nothing but big blanks on them. Postcard? You didn't say anything to me about postcards. I know, Elsa. Well, look, you may as well know it. Right now, you're about my last hope. Uh, You claim you weren't involved in any of this, that you want to help me. Oh, yes, Johnny, and I mean it. Okay, here's your chance to prove it. How? Take a look at these postcards. They're all addressed to your dead pal, Sebastian. Mm -hmm. Sent to him by Gruner. That's right. A picture of the Clyback in here... And a picture of the ski hut on the ridge. Do they mean anything to you? Well, we are staying here at the inn, and I have seen the ski hut on the ridge. Beyond that, nothing. You're sure? Yes. What is it all about, Johnny? The postcards, I mean. Sebastian and Gruner were together in the diamond robbery back in Zurich. Then they split up. Gruner hid the diamonds and sent these postcards to Sebastian. They're supposed to be the key to the location of the diamonds. And now both Sebastian and Gruner are dead. Which means that if I can't figure out this key, I'll probably never recover those stones. You told me this morning you thought there were others after the diamonds. Yeah, and they probably knocked off Sebastian and Gruner trying to get them. These postcards, the inn and the ski hut. Have you searched this inn? As well as I could. And the ski hut? When I got there, the place had been ransacked. Somebody beat me to it. I saw Jeffrey Harris in the vicinity on my way up to the hut. The Englishman? Yeah. He could be my boy. Maybe whoever knocked off Gruner in the village was working for him. Maybe Mr. Harris already has the diamonds then. I hope to find out if and when he comes back here to the inn. I somehow doubt that he's found them, though. They went after Gruner after the ski hut was ransacked. And that would indicate they are still looking for them. Yes. The inn and the ski hut. Wait, Johnny. Perhaps the diamonds are somewhere on a line between the two places. I thought of that, but it doesn't work. You can't see the ski hut from here at the inn. A ridge cuts it off. And where on a line between the two? They're about five miles apart. I wonder if... Hold it, Elsa. What is it? Jeffrey Harris, just coming in. See you later, Elsa. Well, 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 it's the dollar chap. Yeah, that's right, Harris. The dollar chap. Enjoying your stay at Clyback, old man? Well, let's say it's been interesting. Delightful place, really. I'm a bit of a mountain climber, you know. Yeah. I know. Oh, you do? I didn't think my reputation had spread that much. 
Oh, I'm really just an amateur, but it's great fun. You did some climbing today, I believe. Yes, matter of fact, I did. Splendid place of rock up there. It gave me quite a workout. And you were down in the village this evening? Oh, yes. I say, old chap, you, you seem to be rather an inquisitive sort. Why all the questions, huh? Well, this morning I got shot at up on the ridge. Uh, what's that? This evening a man was murdered in the village. Both times you were in the vicinity. Oh, oh now, look here, darling. Let's not be absurd, right? I, I, I'm sorry that someone was potting away at you this morning, but I assure you I had nothing to do with it, and I didn't even know about the murder in the village. Plus the fact you've been pretty interested in me ever since I arrived here at the inn. Yes, but I've explained all that. I thought at first that you might be my old friend Bunny Dollar from London. Look, let's quit talking about old Bunny Dollar and start talking about that rifle of yours with a telescopic sight. <laughs> we don't be ridiculous, old boy. I don't have any rifle. Well, I just happened to have found one in your closet today. I say, you are a snooper, aren't you? But you must have gotten to the wrong closet. I tell you, I don't own a rifle. It was there, all right, and it was your closet. Well, then somebody left it there by mistake. Now, look here, Dollar. I haven't the slightest idea what you're driving at, but I assure you, I am in no way involved. And I must say, I don't care for your attitude or behavior. Hey, to think I had you confused with old Bunny. Well, you're not in the least like him. You're prowling in my closet. I guess I drew a blank there. Uh, Elsa... Where did she... Hey, Dollar. Oh, Otto. Where did Elsa go? Why, I do not know. She was sitting there a few minutes ago. Perhaps she went up to her room. Yeah. Hey, Dollar, this man you were looking for, Gruner... I'm not looking for him anymore, Otto. Like I told you over the phone, he got himself killed in the village this evening. I know. And that is what made me think you might be interested in this. Oh, hey, another postcard. Where'd you get it? It arrived today. It was addressed to the man called Sebastian in care of my inn. That means Gruner didn't know Sebastian was dead. Hey, hey, this could be the missing part of the key. Key? A picture of the village square. Does that mean something to you, Herr Dollar? I'm sure it means something, all right. But I'm not sure what. I went to my room and put the three postcards side by side. The inn... A ski hut on the ridge in the village square. The trouble was I couldn't be sure this was all there was to the key. Maybe Gruner had planned to send more cards, but he wouldn't be sending any now. Yeah. Yeah, from any point of view, I was getting nowhere. Then I stopped cold. Point of view. I looked at the cards again. You couldn't see the ski hut from the inn, and you couldn't see the inn from the village. But maybe, just maybe, there was some point from which you could see all three. I went downstairs and outside. It was a moonlight night. I started walking slowly toward the village, keeping the inn in sight behind me. Finally, I came to a point in the road where I could see both the inn and the village square in the distance. But I still couldn't see the ski hut. There was a ridge in the way. I started cutting across a field. It looked like a little deserted farm. A shed loomed up in front of me, a small, broken-down barn. And then... Just as I got to the barn, the ski hut on the ridge came into view. I stopped and checked. Yeah? Yeah, I could see the inn, the village square, and the ski hut. And this was the one point from which the scenes on all three postcards were visible. This had to be it. I went inside. The barn was empty except for some straw in one corner. I ran my hands through it. And I pulled out a leather case. The moonlight streaming through the broken roof told me I finally found the uncut diamonds. Somebody outside. I froze against the wall in the shadow. He came in. I let him get close. Then I dove at him. I gave him a couple to the midsection and he crumpled. I dragged him to his feet. No, let us go off. Well, my old friend who jumped me back in Zurich. Who are you? Come on. No, no, don't. No, I, I am Anton. Your outfit was trying to get the diamonds away from Sebastian's boys, huh? Yes. When you jumped me in Zurich, you thought I had them. Then you followed me here to Kleibach. And you killed Gruner trying to make him talk. Okay, who are you working for? Spell it. No, nobody. I am working alone. Don't give me that. You haven't the brains to mastermind a deal like this. Now, who's the boss? I can't tell you. Open up, Anton. Oh. Start talking. That is enough, Herr Dollar. What? Otto. Stand very still. Well, so the little innkeeper is Anton's boss. You stupid fool, Anton. Yeah, well, what could I do, Otto? I, I didn't know he had had me approaching. One blunder after another. But I, I think I get it now, Otto. It was you who shot at me up at the ridge this morning. Then you planted the rifle in the Englishman's room. I realized after I had missed that perhaps it was just as well, darling. Sure. 
Sure, you realized I might be able to help you. You couldn't figure out the location of the stones, although you had one of the postcards. But you knew I had the other two and might be able to figure out the three of them. Why not? So you gave me the third card, hoping I'd lead you to the diamonds. Which you very obligingly did. Give me the diamonds, Dollar. I will take them. Stand back, Anton. What? Huh? But Otto... Sure. You don't think he's really going to split with you, do you, Anton? What do you mean? Otto... Stay where you are, Anton. You have served your purpose. After all I have done for you. What? You stand back! Anton started for Otto, who took his eyes off for a second. That's what I was waiting for. I dove at him just as his gun went off. Anton crumpled, and after a fist in his face, Otto did likewise. I knelt down and picked up his gun. All right, Otto. Just hold it where you are. But my shoulder. I'm hurt. Don't worry, Anton. There's enough of you left to talk to the police. And you know, I got a hunch you're going to be a real cooperative witness. Expense account, 14th and final item. $678.50. Transportation and incidentals home. Total expenses, $1,723 even. Remarks? Otto and Anton were turned over to Police Inspector Honiger. The diamonds are in safekeeping. About Otto. Well, greed is one of the seven deadly sins. It sure turned out to be the deadliest one for Otto. About Elsa? Well, uh... Please consider me available for any future assignments in Switzerland. End of report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, there's uranium, they say, in the Arizona hills. There's also a killer with three victims behind him. And he's looking for another. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Lucille Meredith, Victor Perrin, Forrest Lewis, Stan Jones, and Ben Wright. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. By transcription. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Finitum est. Mr. Who? Finitum est. It is finished. Latin. Oh. Sam? What's left of me, sweetheart? Well, where are you? What happened? Who did it? Here. Everything. And what? What? No, I asked you first. Sam. Now you're making sense. Well, did that Mr. Mortuous get in touch with you? Demortuous he... Neil Neasy Bonham. Oh, Sam, stop it. Second year Latin, F. Speak well of the dead. You mean he's dead? If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. This one ends up worse than Rigoletto. Have your extra handkerchief ready, get some organ music on the radio, and I'll be down to dictate my report on the tears of night caper. <laughs> Dasho Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You know, just a little Wild Root Cream Oil in your hair can mean a world of improvement in your general appearance. Just try it and see. 
See how Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Yes, you'll be glad to discover that just a few drops of Wild Root Cream Oil make a big difference. So if you've never tried it before, get the 25-cent Get Acquainted size and ask for it by name. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Many, many things, Eph. But it's also kind of... raw. Oh, Sam. In time, Effie, my wounds will heal. Oh, I'll bet that that, that Mamie Gagan had something to do with it. I could tell when she came in here that she was going the to be... The mortuous Neil Nisi Bonham. Huh? Latin. Speak well of the dead, remember? Oh, she... Uh, one thing at a time, sweetheart. Let's get this over with. I want to find a doctor. Oh, you're so brave, Sam. Carrying on in the face of... Your face. Sure, sure, sure. You won't be satisfied until you just... just die for your profession. Yeah, well, if I do, Neil Nizzy Bonham, Abby. Neil Nizzy Bonham. That means? Latin means, uh, you have bony knees. Oh. Uh, date July 24, 1949, to Miss Daphne Arlington from Samuel Spade, San Francisco, license number 137596. Subject, the tears of night. Dear Daphne... I hope this will clear up a few things in your mind. I hope it'll let you know how you got where you are and what happened to put you there. It all has an illogical beginning, middle, and end. At three, yesterday afternoon, my loyal secretary and confidant, Miss Effie Perrine, a doll, who has been rehearsing a Cockney play for television, flung open my office door and said, Miss Mamie Gagan to see Mr. Spide. I said, Cooey. Miss Mamie Gagan looked everything the name implied from her lately blonded hair to her genuine alligator shoes. I might add, she weighed in at approximately 160 and was in very good condition. You, Spade. I am he. Uh, sit down, please. Ah. Don't you believe me? I hate gum shoes. They all stink. Uh, something in your background. Perhaps it's a girl. I'm just assuming that you were one. Oh, uh, gum shoes are nosy. They talk too much. That's why I don't like them. Here. For me? Who else, stupid? Oh. And it says, uh, pay to the order of Samuel Spade, $100, signed Mamie Gagan, co-signed Johnny McCall. All right, is it good? You wise guy or something? Sure it's good. I'm the treasurer. Get your hat. In this weather? We gonna go see Johnny. McCall? Yeah. Uh, why are we gonna see Johnny? Johnny wants you should do something for him. Oh, uh, what does Johnny want I should do for him? Come on, Spade, what's the matter with you? He'll tell you. I'd just love to hear you talk, Mame, that's all. All this gas ain't getting us nowhere. The boss is waiting. Gumshoes talk too much. Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe we do, but ours is a lonely profession. Mamie led me to a large Cadillac parked in a no-parking zone. She tore the ticket up and ate it. We got in and charged through traffic towards Burlingame. About a half a mile this side of the main highway, we turned off to the left... And pretty soon, we were winding up a private road to a fine old colonial mansion. There were three private patrolmen were guarding the entrance. They all needed shaves. They kind of nodded as we went up to the front door. Naturally enough, it didn't open, but a peep shutter did. Yeah. It's me, Feely. This is the private peeper the boss wants to see. Open up. Okay. How are you feeling, Mr. Feely? Screw, screw. All kinds of folks around. This way, Spade. Mamie, I got your peeper. Okay. Inside. Here he is, Johnny, flat feet and all. His name's Spade. Hey, I not. know, I know. I picked him myself. Go on, Peter. I hate gum shoes. Boo. <laughs> uh, don't mind, Mamie. She's kind of bitter. Yes, she is. Yes. We did a lousy job on our hair last time. It's all streaky. Yeah, I noticed. Go on, sit down. Nice place, Johnny. Nice place. How's the gross? Oh, ain't as good as running beer, but... Them days are gone. I do all right. Two crap tables, two faro games, a little roulette in the living room, but I have to be careful. Yeah, you seem to have plenty of muscle outside to keep you safe and comfy. Ah, punks, all of them. But the best I can get nowadays, no good gunsels left. Guess they all got married and settled down or something. 
All right, Johnny, it's cool and it's nice out here. You make a living and I got a check for $100. Why? Well, in my line, I don't generally have much use for a private eye. I don't generally like them. Neither does Manny. But I can use one right now. Ever see this before? No? Well, it's a little bit of necklace. Necklace case. Called huh? the Tears of Night or something. Yeah? And it's worth quite a chunk of Gita's. These four diamonds are good stuff. Dame named Daphne Arlington left it here a week ago when she went in for a plunge at the roulette table. She left it for a standby till she raised the cash. Kind of screwy, Dane. You know, a widow with a lot of money. Boyfriend named Lenny Epich. He mm-hmm. paints or something. Mm-hmm. Well, she sent me a check today for the 5G she lost, and I just want you to take this thing back to her. That all? Yeah, that's all. I got my dough, she gets a necklace. You're a licensed bonded investigator, insured, it's safe with you. I couldn't trust any of my punks with it, and I don't like to be seen in public, so you just take it back. It's all very simple. Uh-huh. Now that you've told me how simple it is, suppose you give me the unexpurgated sequel. Did her, uh, check bounce? Yep. All right. You want a drink? There wasn't any check, Sam. She called me a couple of hours ago and said if I didn't have this thing back to her by tonight, she'd call a load of cops and come out here and tear the joint apart. Not such a screwy dame at that. You're stuck. You telling me. If she comes with cop, I'm closed for season. I'm getting old. Oh, you're not old, Johnny. Ah, Feely was running the table. I didn't know he'd taken this thing for security until we counted up. Stupid Feely. Uh, I should have pushed his mush in or something. Letting a dame like that make us a setup. Well, maybe you'll do better next time. Oh, ain't gonna be no next time, Spade. Well, here's her address. Here's the ice. Just take it to her and I'll chalk it up to experience. You better get yourself a new boy at that table, Johnny. You telling me. You telling me. Well, uh, Bye. <laughs> Lenny, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at 8.30, and you know how the traffic is, and if we're going to have a bite to eat... You aren't, Lenny. Where's Lenny? I don't know, Miss Arlena. I'm supposed to deliver some jewelry. Jewelry? That would be mortuous. 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 Uh, yes, but I... What uh... are you looking at? Your throat. Really? Well, really, Mr... Mr. Mr... Spade, Sam Spade. Well, really, Mr. Spade. I'm only waiting for Lenny to get here so we can make the first curtain a streetcar. And we're going to be late if he doesn't get here. You can understand that, Mr. Spade. You're going to be a little early. Streetcar doesn't open until Monday. And already, and he hasn't shown up. Well, good night, Mr. Spade. Hey! The white ermine cape you were wearing and the black strapless thing needed a touch. But you had it. A diamond necklace. In fact, the tears of night, the same one I had in my pocket, Daphne, was hanging around your lovely neck. I re-buzzed your buzzer and knocked on your door for quite a while until it was quite evident that you were not going to open up. Under the hallway light, I snapped open the necklace case. Mortuous, you had said. And mortuous was what it said stamped inside the case. A gloomy word with a gloomy address. The White Hotel on Turk Street. Hannibal Mortuous, at your service, sir. If ever a man had the look of death, it was this one who had its name. He was older than old, cadaverous, and in his skull-like head, his eyes were white. He was wearing a flannel nightshirt. Uh, You'll find me a bit indisposed, Mr. Spade. The clerk at the desk said it was a matter of jewelry. Therefore, Hannibal Mortuous is at your service. Now then, sir, what is so urgent? I uh, came to ask you about a diamond necklace. I found your name stamp on the inside here. Uh, House of Mortuous, most respected name in diamonds, as well as all the lapidary arts, most respected. Fine jewels in the name Mortuous is synonymous the world over. I am the last of four sons. Uh, well, but we'll continue, Mr. Spade. Well, I just want you to take a look at this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how do you come in possession of the tears of night, sir? Well, uh, a man named Johnny McCall, who runs a gambling club, hired me to deliver it to a lady named Daphne Arlington. She lost it at the roulette table. She left it there until she could raise the cash. Mm-hmm. Deplorable, deplorable conduct on her part. 
Daphne Arlington, a most indiscreet young lady, to be sure, to be sure. I recall my interview with her when her late husband, uh, Sidney, ordered this necklace. A lovely body, propelled by a ridiculous mind. For shame, such conduct, a gambling house, the tears of night upon. Well, this is real, Anne, that isn't phony. Mr. Spade, I am a gemologist. The house of mortuaries, of course, it's real. Take a good look. When an artist creates a dazzling thing of beauty such as this, would he be so unlikely as to forget the time, the patience, the agony of his creation? See how each stone is carefully mounted to capture every single pinpoint of light. Mm -hmm. An incomparable masterpiece. An incomparable money. How much money? Well, an no wholesale market, about 10000 Arlington? He paid twenty-five, but he had it, as I say. Incomparable. Yeah. Yeah, well, I uh, saw another one just like it tonight. You are ridiculous. The finest workman at best could only create a crude resemblance. This kind of work demands an artist, sir, an artist. Uh, but tell me, uh, Latin in Angus Elba, huh? Oh, my second year Latin escapes me. Uh, sneak in the grass. Uh, something wrong? Uh, something wrong, yeah. You you were concerned for the safety of this piece. I have a small safe in my room. You may have the key if you care. I'll take it with me. Thank you, Mr. Mortuous. My pleasure, Mr. Spain. Omnia mortuus bonum vocat est. All speak well of mortuus, of panza. Good evening. In the dismal lobby of the White Hotel, I asked the night clerk for some wrapping paper and 20 cents worth of stamps. It was a hunch, plus the fact that outside in the street, I spotted two of Johnny McCall's unshaved gorillas. They were looking up at the front of the building. Mr. Mortuous must have switched off his light or something because their eyes suddenly dropped and I saw them separate, one on each side of the front door. With shoulders carefully hunched, I stepped out into the lonesome night. I hoped they would think I was carrying my thirty-eight, which I was not. They didn't. Here's the peep for Candy. You want to ask him for a match? Candy's nearsighted. That's too bad. This him, Ernest? You got a match, Spade? Yeah, not so close. Candy asked if you got a match. He's a dummy, Candy. He don't answer. Got a match, Spade? What did I tell you? He's a dummy. He don't look like no dummy. Take your hands off. He's a dummy, all right. Ain't you, Spade? See, he's a dummy, Candy. I told him about you being nearsighted and he wouldn't answer. He don't talk. Go on, smart boy. Tell him, tell Candy how sorry you are about him being nearsighted. I told you he was a dummy, Candy. All private eyes like you. Andy asks you a question. He wants to know if all private eyes is like you. I don't like no dummy. We ask questions and he ain't told us nothing. That makes him a dummy. Maybe we find out something if we went through his pockets. Yeah, even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold him, Candy. <laughs> all right, boys. You played the scene real good, and I'll see what I can do for you. Hey, you talk. Yeah. Make him talk again, Candy. Yeah. Make him talk bigger, Candy. <laughs> bigger. Bigger. Hey, he, he talks real nice, but he don't say much. Think maybe he's tough, Ernest? Yeah, maybe. Hold him up. <laughs> oh. See? He ain't so tough. <laughs> I didn't feel like talking on that quiet little street where the only noise was my face pounding on their fists. I didn't have the necklace anymore, but they had to find out the hard way. The hard way for me. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin, 
It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, back to the Tears of Night caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I remember trying to wake up a couple of times... I was dreaming that we were driving along in a giant Cadillac. Big Mamie was sitting on my lap. She was eating a diamond necklace and spitting out cherry pits, which Mr. Mortuous grabbed, looked at through his jeweler's glass, and then tossed into a roulette wheel. Then we had a blowout, and the whole car vanished with everybody screaming, The Mortuous, The Mortuous. Somewhere around 7 in the a.m., I began to get a feeling. Several failings, and all of them hurt. I had been dumped in the grass in a fairly nice neighborhood. In your neighborhood, as a matter of fact, Daphne. And five minutes later, I was climbing the steps to your apartment. I thought maybe you'd let me wash my face in your bathroom. Also, you seemed the logical one to question, since nothing else made sense. You were sitting in a large chair. The drapes were drawn, the door was slightly open, and only the light from the hall seeped in. You had the phone on your lap. The receiver was off. My guess was right. You were looking at nothing. <laughs> oh. oh, Mr. Spade. It's you. You came back. You've been in an accident. I don't think you'll need this. Oh, yeah. Well, then, Mr. Spade. Well, then, I... I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. A gambler or a jeweler? Did they tell you about Lenny Epich? No. He's really a dear, Mr. Spade. Qu- quite the nicest boy I've met since Sidney was killed in that horrible automobile accident. Sidney and I had so many things together. I, I do think he enjoyed being alive with me, I mean. I cried when Sidney was killed. I really did. I cried. Miss Arlington, I... I didn't know what to do. I, I cried. That was three years ago, but Miss... now I have Lenny. He's really a dear. I do think that Lenny will be a very prominent artist someday. I I do. Le- Lenny asked me to marry him tonight. He did? I- I've been very lonely since Sidney died. Lenny isn't interested in, in my money. Lenny has some money of his own. What? What? I didn't My tongue adjusted to my mouth. Did, did that ever happen to you, Mr. Spade? Sometimes, yes. Perhaps I should see a correctionist. I'm glad you came by again. I didn't know you were a detective the first time. Who told you? What, why, Mr. McCall. He... Lily, my career, I, I... I really can't understand, Mommy. Please, Miss I, I know it must be strange to you, but... Look at them. But, but some people live for it. Some people die for it. Please, please, Miss Arling. We can't get anything done. Look. Look. They, they do look so funny. Very funny. I've I seen them count money. So much money. And I, I, I really believe that, that that is all I live, live for. Oh, oh, look at me. You were pointing at something across the darkened room. It took me ten seconds to find the light switch. Stretched out on your floor, they looked funny, all right. Candy and Ernest. Both of them as dead as you can get. Hello, darling. Darling, darling. Uh, I've been waiting all night. I knew you'd 
telephone and give me your answer. I knew you'd marry me. Your name, uh, Lenny Effich? Well, well, yes, but I was expecting... My yes. name's uh, Spade. I'm a private investigator. I'm calling from her apartment. Daphne's? Now, listen. There's been a couple of murders here. Murders? She's had quite a jolt. She's going to need you and all the help she can get to bring her out of it. I've called homicide, and it might be pretty rough for her. I'll be right over. Bring a doctor. Right. And a lawyer. I'm afraid she'll need one of those, too. I've got a good one. We'll be there. Thanks, Mr. Spade. He showed up about the same time the crew from Homicide got there. If the answer is a good guy. He talked fast and urgently, as did the doctor and lawyer he brought with him, and through their combined efforts, you were removed not to police headquarters, but to the private hospital in which you are now a patient. It was obvious from the powder test that you could not have fired the forty-five which ended the lives of Candy and Ernest. It was also obvious that the murders had been done elsewhere, but who had done them remained to be seen. Ah, Spade, I've been expecting you. Come in, come in, sir. I've been amusing myself with your chessboard. Sit down, sit down. Oh, you've had a hectic night. Yeah, your boys are pretty rough. Uh, Candy and Ernest, uh, two men of another world, Mr. Spade, not our world. Allow me to apologize for that action. I uh, want more than an apology, Mr. Mortuous. And if that's my gun and it looks like it, it's got a hair trigger. And if you'll pardon me for saying so, your hands are a little shaky. I underestimated you, Spade. Such an ingenious method of protecting the tears of night. Why, sir, by the simple expedient of placing it in an envelope and mailing it to yourself from my hotel lobby, you hired as guardians the entire United States Postal Service, not to mention the armed forces. Thanks. What happens now? We wait for the mail. Just tell me where I'm wrong, will you, Mr. Morris? McCall wanted me to get caught with it. He didn't know it was real. You'd made a phony for him. Only you found out it wasn't phony when I came to your place. Then there was a double cross. If you can bear my vanity, I have invented a new word. Triple cross. It has a ring to it, hmm? Oh. Including Mamie, hmm? Mamie and her friends have been very valuable to me, but I must necessarily exclude them from sharing the profits. Mamie knocked off candy in earnest? Abetted by the last of the house of mortuous. You planted them in Daphne's place. Mamie and I. A crude touch, I thought, but it had a purpose. I happen to know that Mrs. Arlington has for a long time been on the verge of a nervous breakdown. With two cadavers in her living room, she was very unlikely to discuss a bogus necklace with the police. And I doubt very much if she knew she was wearing the original or the imitation. Flighty girl. That's the lousiest thing the House of Mortuous ever did. She walked in and found them. If you had merely returned the real necklace to her... It would have been simple to make an exchange, and none of this would have been necessary. But then, I know, I know. You just sit here and wait for the mail. We wait for the mail. What about your other playmate? I'm afraid I'll be sought for a murder or two or three this night. Mimi. She got it, too? Yes. Where are the police going to find her? Oh, in my hotel room, which I departed hastily once the room clerk had informed me of your ingenious method for protecting the necklace. I shot her there. You work cheap? Cheap, sir? I don't understand. A $10,000 necklace? It's not quite a king's ransom, you know. The tears of night are worth five times that. I'm afraid I misinformed you as to their value. I didn't want you to become suspicious. You are a really horrible, terrifying old man. I suppose you think you'll get away with it. I don't intend to get away with it. An old man, yes, but I intend to spend my remaining years... They'll pick you up before you get to the airport. I doubt that. I shall turn the tears of night into cash. And with a well-laden purse, I shall guarantee to elude the police over half the world. In two years, perhaps three, they'll get me. But I have spent the money, and... We have a visitor. Caution, Spade, I do shoot well. Answer it, tell them to go away. I'll be right beside you. All right. Open it. Look, one side, Spade. I got a gun. Obvious. Me, me. I thought I'd find you here waiting for the mail. You dirty... You didn't do such a good job on me. Caution, my dear. I have a gun, too. Everybody but me. I can last long enough to let you have it. Not so good, my dear. Your loss of blood has made you groggy. Still good enough? Well, well. It was almost a photo finish. He kind of 
to lean into the wall with a pained and amazed look on his face, and he seemed to try to walk. Uh, Mr. Spade. Mr. Spade, sir, I believe I've been shot. I need a little assistance. I can... I can't seem to hold my feet, sir. I can't seem to hold my feet. <laughs> it was an awkward plan at best. The mortuous... Near Nisi Bonham, Spade. Or if your second year Latin escapes your memory, speak well the day. Period and a report. Oh, Sam. All those people. Four and all. And that poor girl, Daphne. How she must have felt when she saw it. Oh, Sam. Yeah, it was pretty bad. You, you poor darling. Well, it's about time. Then you go right home. In fact, I'm going to take you home. Yeah? Then what? Well, You are a registered nurse, maybe? Hmm? Well, I... Go type that up. I am completely well. And when you return, we shall Indian wrestle. Certainly, sir. And now, listen to this. Shopping note. Tonight or tomorrow, get a family-sized bottle or handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's favorite hair tonic. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now, once again, it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As usual, you're punctual to the minute. Draw up your chair and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. That's it. I see that you have the old black tin dispatch box out again, Dr. Watson. I deduce that you were going over your notes on tonight's case. Elementary, my dear boy. (laughs) And among the records, I came across some notes of cases that I'd almost forgotten. The shocking death of Crosby, the banker, the Adelton tragedy... And some data on the unusual contents of the ancient British barrow. Those stories sound pretty intriguing, Dr. Watson. I shall tell them to you some other evening, Mr. Bell. Tonight, I'm going to recount an adventure that took place in the heart of the beautiful English countryside. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Well, that story began in the small country village of Carnforth. Holmes had recently brought to a successful conclusion the affair of the barrow and furnace wheelchair murders. And we decided that a few days' rest in nearby Carnforth would do us both good before returning to our arduous life in Baker Street. We were staying at a small but comfortable inn. Early on the morning of the third day, I remember, Holmes and I were in our bedroom waiting for those two essentials without which an English country gentleman could not start his day. The early morning cup of tea and a jug of hot water for shaving. As we sat there at the open window... A nearby church bell was tolling a funeral knell. There must be a funeral in the village, Holmes. An astonishing deduction, Watson. There's no need to make fun of me. Pressing sound, isn't it? I suppose so. Has it ever occurred to you, Watson, that the history of bells is full of romantic interest? Well, I can't say that I've thought much about it. Almost every historical event has been accompanied by the sound of bells. They summoned soldiers to arms as well as Christians to church. They sounded the alarm in fire, tumult, and invasion. And many a bloody chapter in history has been rung in and out by bells. You seem to be a mine of information on the subject. Yes, Watson. It's a fascinating subject. Come in, come in. Good morning, my dear. Morning, gentlemen. I brought you tea and your shade and water. Mrs. Nichols said to say your breakfast will be ready in half an hour. Splendid, Mary Oh, uh, Mary, the church bell is tolling a funeral knell. Do you know who is being buried? That I do, sir. I wish it was me. It'll be my turn soon. Poor little thing. I wonder what's the matter with her. I have no idea. Perhaps her father or mother just died. Or a young man. Yes, I bet that's it. She's a pretty girl. And she'd obviously have been crying when she came in. Perhaps that's her fiancé they're burying now. Watson, you have the sentimental imagination of the true storyteller. But we've come here for a holiday. You must give your imagination a rest, too. 
So drink your tea, remove your whiskers, and we'll go downstairs and investigate those kippers. You like your kippers, gentlemen? Excellent, Mrs. Mickle, excellent. Never eaten better. Yes, indeed. By the way, Mrs. Mickle, we heard the funeral bell tolling earlier on. Do you know who was being buried? Yes, I do. Two souls are being buried. And one of them was a murderer. A murderer? Good Lord, in this peaceful village? What happened, Mrs. Mickle? It's where old Threadgold, the corn merchant, found out his wife had been gallivanting around with a young fellow from Bolton. Cut her throat, he did, and unhanged himself. More tea. Thank you. That's shocking. So the peaceful countryside is not as peaceful as it's made out to be, Holmes. A fact that I've frequently had occasion to point out to you, Watson. Has the morning post arrived yet, Mrs. Mickle? Here comes old Gilly up the path with it now. I'll see if he's got anything for you. Murder? What do you make of it, Holmes? What is there to make of it, Watson? A jealous husband murders a faithless wife and then commits suicide. A tragic story, but uh, a simple one. Top of the morning to you, gentlemen. Good morning, Gillian. Any letters for me today? Oh, Mr. Holmes, two letters. One of them's got some newspaper clippings in it, I think. And you've got a postcard from a Mr. Lestrade. He wants you back in London bad, Mr. Holmes. Here you are. Upon my soul, Gillian, you've been reading Mr. Holmes's private correspondence. Just bless your heart, Dr. Watson. If I didn't read other people's correspondence, how would I know what's going on in the village? Mm, you were right, Gillian. It is newspaper clippings. By the way, you heard about the murder of Mrs. Treadgold, I suppose? Heard about it. I told the bell this morning at the funeral. You mean to say that you're the bell ringer as well as the postman? Bless your heart, yes, Doctor. President of the Coral Society, too, as well as being on the Paris Council. You're a busy man, Gillian. That I am, sir. Take this afternoon now. I'm to ring those bells again. Not another funeral, surely? Uh, no, sir. A wedding this time. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Young Sam Perrin is marrying the Slater girl. And you might say I'm responsible for bringing them together. Got some of their letters mixed up, I did. They looked each other up to exchange them, and I pressed them. Before you know what's happening, they're getting married. <laughs> Regular Cupid, you might say I am. Be off with you, Gilly. Other people want their letters. Mr. Holmes doesn't want his skippers spoiled with your idle chatter. All right, Mrs. Crabapples and Vinegar. Uh, One of these fine days, you'll smile. And the world will come to an end. Good day, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. Talkative old busybody he is. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Mrs. Lackland's in the hall. The poor old lady's most anxious to talk to you. Mrs. Lackland? She has the sempstress shop in the high street. Her only son ran away from home a few months back. I think that's what she wants to speak to you about. Oh, but uh, my friend's here for a rest, Mrs. Mickle. I told her that, Doctor, but she won't go away without seeing Mr. Holmes. Oh, very well. Ask her to come in, please, Mrs. Mickle. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Oh, why do you bother to see her, Holmes? Sounds like a trivial matter. The disappearance of an only son can never be a trivial matter. Well, I meant trivial for you, not for her. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, dear. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Please sit down, Mrs. Lackland. That's it. Now, what's the trouble? It's Tom, sir, my only son. He left me four months ago, and I've not seen here nor ride of him since. You've had no message from him since he left? Not one word, I'm fair out of my mind, sir. Have you any idea of his reason for leaving the village, Mrs. Lackland? None, sir. He was a good boy, and he worked hard, and he didn't fool around with those flippity gibbet girls in the village. I think he's met with foul ply, gentlemen. And I want you to find out about him for me, Mr. Holmes. I've heard say in the village that you're the greatest detective in England. Uh, Mrs. Lackland, I'd be glad to help you, but uh, you'll give me no clues to work with. I'm afraid if that I can... If it's money you want, I've got 20 pounds in my postal savings. It's all yours if you can bring my Tommy home to me. But at least tell me he's safe. Mrs. Lackland, I wouldn't dream of accepting a fee. However, I shall give your problem some thought. If I arrive at any conclusions, I'll get in touch with you at once. God bless you, Mr. Holmes. Good morning to you, sir. A good day. Good morning, Mr. Lecker. Poor old thing. I don't see how you can help her, Holmes. Nor do I, at the moment. But a young man who has grown up in a small village like this may have led a life that his mother is totally unaware of. 
You said that you had to work on one of your stories today, Watson. Yes, I had a letter from the editor of the Strand magazine yesterday requesting a manuscript as soon as possible. Splendid. Then you stay at the inn and work on your latest masterpiece while I scour the village to see what may be found out about the missing young man. <laughs> beginning to think you got lost. Hello, Watson. I trust you had a profitable session with pen and paper. Well, I've done about half a chapter. I would have done more if it hadn't been for those infernal bells. Mm, the wedding ceremony that the worthy Gilly told us about this morning. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, well, what did you find out about Mrs. Lackland's son? Among other things, that he had a secret love life unknown to his mother. And the object of his affections was none other than the maid who brought us our tea this morning. Mary? Have you talked to her? No, it's her half day off, and I was unable to find her. However, I shall question her when she brings our tea tomorrow morning. Come in, Mary. Oh, Mrs. Mickle. Good morning, gentlemen. Here's your tea and shaving water. Where's Mary this morning? She didn't come to work. Must be ill again. Unreliable girl. I'm no better than she ought to be, if you ask me. It's no job for me to be carrying tea and hot water upstairs. I hear the village bell tolling for another funeral. Does Carnforth have a burial every morning? I really don't see how the population can run to it. It's another suicide, sir. Another suicide? Good Lord. Old John Larrabee, the baker. He was expecting some money from his son in Australia. It never came. And they foreclosed on his shop. And he hanged himself. Will you be wanting a couple of boiled eggs to your breakfast, gentlemen? No, no, I haven't much of an appetite, thank you very much. Yes, sir. That woman seems absolutely heartless. She almost smacks her lips when she tells us about these tragedies. Yes, Watson, I noticed it. This peaceful village is beginning to seem strangely sinister to me. And since you have no appetite for breakfast, perhaps you'll join me in a little excursion as soon as you're dressed. Of course. Where are we going? To see the maid, Mary. I'm anxious to talk to her before another funeral bell begins to toll. This must be the cottage home. They said it was the one with honeysuckle over the gate. Yes, and there's Mary sitting on the porch. Oh, she's got up. She's coming. She's coming up the path to meet us. Good morning, Mary. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, why have you come here? I'll ask about my health. What should a servant girl matter to gentlemen like you? Oh, you must judge us, my dear. I assure you no, that No, we... Watson. Let's be honest and admit we didn't come here because of our concern for Mary's health. And why did you come here, sir? Mrs. Lackland asked me to try and find her son, Tom. Tom? Yes, Tom Lackland. I thought you might be able to help me, Mary. I could help you, Mr. Holmes. I'd be helping myself, too. Here come Gilly, the postman. Gilly? Gilly, is there a letter for me to die? No, lass. There's nothing for you again. There must be, Gilly. There must be there. No, lass. If the letter would come, I'd bring it to you as fast as my legs would carry me. You know that. Oh. Morning, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Left some letters at the inn for you, Doctor. You had a letter from a lady. Oh, uh, how do you know it was from a lady? It reeked with a smell of violets, it did. And it was written in green ink on grey paper, sir. Amazing deduction. That sounds like your young friend from Daly's, Watson. Oh, how did you know about... Well, I mean, I don't have a young friend from Daly's, Watson. Quite. Gilly, you told another funeral bell today, didn't you? Aye, sir. And a tragic thing it was. Fate, you might call it. Old Larrabee hanged himself because he didn't get money from his son in Australia. I found him, I did. I was the one to cut him down. And right in the post bag was the letter he was waiting for. The letter that had saved his life. Great Scott, what a ghastly piece of irony. That it was, sir. That it was. Well, gentlemen, I'll be on my way. Good day. Good day, Mary. Perhaps that letter will arrive tomorrow. No. We'll never hear from Tom, never. He's ashamed of me. That's why he deserted me. Deserted you, Mary? 
You speak almost as if you were his wife. I am his wife. What? We were married secretly in Rochdale five months ago, come Tuesday. And he never told his mother? He was afraid to. She thought I was beneath him. Tom said he'd go away and get a good job and then return here and fetch me back with him. He went away all right. But he never came back to say me words. Uh, when he left, uh, did he give no clues to his destination? No hint of any kind, Mary? Well, he did want to say, Mary, I'm going to clear out to this puddle and make my fortune, even if I have to bury it. And then he said, bury me fortune. <laughs> That's a joke, isn't it? But I don't know what he meant by it. I think I do, Mary. Watson? We're taking a short train journey as soon as possible. Oh, where are we going, may I ask? We're going to the town of Berry in search of this young lady's husband. What makes you think Tom might be in Berry, Mr. Holmes? Because the famous fortune cotton mills are in Berry. It would seem possible that when your husband joked of burying his fortune, he was talking of going to the mills there. Wherever he's gone, he won't be coming back for me. I know that. No, 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 no. Don't talk like that, my dear. Remember, you have friends, Mrs. Lachlan. How much longer is home going to be? Leaves me standing outside the factory gates if I were a blasted coach. Ah, oh, there he is. There he is. Home. Home. Hello, Watson. Permit me to introduce you to Mr. Tom Lachlan. Tom, this is Dr. Watson. How do you do, Dr. Watson? How do you do? Never mind how I do, young fellow, my lad. How do you do? Your behavior's been absolutely shocking. Shocking. Now, what are you talking about? Leaving your dear old mother and deserting your pretty little bride because you're ashamed of her. You're a scoundrel, sir. You deserve a good horsewhipping, and I have a good mind to give it to you. I don't know what you're talking about, Dr. Watson, but I don't like the words you use. And if it's violence you want, I don't mind telling you I'm amateur heavyweight champion of the county. You are? Oh, well, no need to come aggressive and what? No, let's waste time on being acrimonious, Watson. Let's get back to the station as fast as we can. The return of the prodigal is long overdue. We must give them every opportunity to kill the fatted calf. <laughs> Hi, there's Mary's house. I'm dying to see her. And after this reunion, Tom, I suggest that you both go over and see your mother. I'm sure she'll forgive you. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I'll do that. Well, perhaps we should have warned her. Your sudden appearance may be something of a shock. I think it's a shock that Mary can handle. She must be out. Door's locked. Knock again. If you don't mind, she, she may be asleep. Great heavens! That was a revolver shot. Come on, Watson. Help me break in the door. Now, Dr. Watson, that was a fine place to break off your story. You left me right on the edge of a cliff. Had the young girl shot herself? She'd shot at herself, Mr. Bell. But fortunately, a last-minute lack of courage had made her shot go wild. Holmes and I and the young bridegroom burst into the house and wrested the smoking revolver from her hand. I must confess that the union between the two young lovers was a touching sight. In fact, uh, I felt considerably older than uh, I was as Holmes and I stood there listening to, uh, to Tom reassuring her. Mary, darling, oh. it's all right. I'm here. Oh, Tom, you are. You did come back for me. I thought you never would. I tried to kill myself. But I haven't forgotten it. Oh, there, there, Mary. Everything's going to be all right now. It will be, Tom, won't it? I'm so tired. And now, Tom, I think the time has come to reassure Mary that you did write to her. Oh, of course I did, Mary, darling. And I sent you money and told you that I'd be back here to take you to Ferry as soon as I'd saved up enough. You wrote to me, Tom? Twice a week. And I wrote to Mother, too. Then why didn't I get the letters? And the answer to that should be obvious, my dear. Gilly, the postman, deliberately withheld them from you. Gilly? Great heavens. Why? I have my suspicions. Strong suspicions. But I have to get proof. Tell me, Mary, the day before yesterday, Mr. Treadgold murdered his wife. Do you know how he learned of her infidelity? Well, I'm not sure, but 
Well, did here Mrs. Nichols say that it was through some letters that got mixed up? The letters addressed to her were delivered to his office instead of at the house. Gilly again. Precisely. Surely the whole terrible pattern begins to take shape. Tom. Yes, Mr. Rome. I'm going to lay a trap. To spring it, I shall need your assistance. Of course, Mr. Holmes. I'll do anything. Wait here with Mary until darkness falls. Then muffle yourselves up and go to your mother's house. Wait there in hiding and let no outsider see you until you hear from me. Uh, since you two lovebirds have been separated for four months, I don't imagine that'll be too unpleasant. Quiet, Watson. You understand, Tom? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Good. Then come on, Watson. Well, what's your plan, Holmes? I'll tell you as we go. One thing I can promise you. Before the sun is very high tomorrow, I shall free this village from one of the most subtly evil powers I've ever come in contact with. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Mrs. Mickle. Good morning. I always said that Mary was a no-good girl, and now she's killed herself. But of course, I had to come to her funeral. That's very charitable, Mrs. Mickle, I must say. In any case, the vicar says that the poor girl was of unsound mind. Yes, madam, you can't blame her. Well, I'll be getting into the church. Holmes, this farce is beginning to get on my nerves. What are we accomplishing by burying an empty coffin? You'll soon see, old chap. Come on, let's slip into the vestry. This way. Oh, where are we going, Holmes? Up the stairs that leads to the belfry. Here they are. Well, supposing Gilly turns nasty when he finds out we know his secret. Then we must handle him to the best of our ability, Watson. Well, I must say I do not relish the thought of a tussle high in the belfry of a church. The man must be insane. Obviously. That's why his power must be destroyed. This door apparently leads to the belfry. Keep your wits about you, Watson. Good morning, Gilly. Mr. Holmes! Dr. Watson! You've come to see me at work! That's nice of you! Not often I get company up here! We haven't come up here to see you at work, Gilly. We know your diabolical work only too well. Yes, Gilly, we know your secret. What secret's that? You're mad with power, Gilly. You've tried to control the destiny of this village. In your position as postman, you thought you have the power to give life and death. That I am, sir. And it's a great power that makes a man feel good. Almost like a god, you might say. That's sacrilege, you scoundrel. You were responsible for the murder of Mrs. Treadgold. Aye, sir, that I was. And for the old man hanging himself. You were responsible for John Larrabee's suicide, weren't you? Aye, that I was. Let a big fight to vote me off the village council. I swore I'd make him pay for it, and I did. Your reign is over, Gilly. You'll never toll a bell again. The only one you'll hear will be a prison bell. You can't touch me, Mr. Holmes. You've got no proof. There's nothing you can do. Don't be too sure. I've enough influence to take your job away. You... You... Take me away from me, Bells. I... I live for these Bells. You wouldn't take me away from them. You couldn't live without the power they give you, could you, Gilly? You're trying to destroy me! You are destroyed, Gilly. Yes, you've already failed. Mary's alive. Uh, alive? But the coffin they're burying down there... Is full of stones. You'll be the laughing stock of the village, Gilly. They'll never laugh at Gilly. You can't catch me, Mr. Holmes. I'm beyond your still. She's running up the ladder leading to the bell car. Come back, Gilly. Come back. He, he's mad as a hatter. Quite. What's he going to do up there? He might set fire to the steeple. Commit any madness. I'm going to fetch him, Holmes. No, Watson. He drew a knife as he fled. And with that rickety staircase and the narrow opening leading into the bell chamber, you'd never stand a chance. He'd get you on the first slash. Well, how are we going to get him down? There's only one way. He's in a tiny loft containing his beloved bells. We'll see how much he loves them at close quarters. I doubt if even he can stand the noise in that confined space. Where's that bell rope? Come down, Gilly. Come down from there. Stop! Stop ringing the bells! Not until you come down, Gilly. Stop ringing them! I can't stand it! You're driving me mad! You are mad, Gilly. Mad with power. Come down here, I say. 
I'm coming! Great heavens, he held himself out of the belfry. Holmes, he hasn't a chance of surviving that fall. I have no intention of causing the unhappy man to jump to his death, Watson. Though I cannot help but feel that his poor demented mind may find a happy oblivion this way rather than in the confines of an asylum. Yes, you're probably right, Holmes. It's been a shocking case, Watson, shocking. And once again it proves the old saying that violence does in truth recoil upon the violent. And the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see what's that to you. Um, next week, I think I'll tell you a rather gruesome story about how Sherlock Holmes saved the life and the sanity of a certain Count Romagni. I call it The Adventure of the Carpathian Horror. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Golden Pants Nay. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway, by permission of Eagle Eye and Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us the adventure of the Carpathian Horror. that all night, Henry. Like, huh? Sal, you play too easy. I've been playing this thing all evening. Well, play it some more. Ah, a little. Ah, that's wonderful. Not too loud, Henry, the neighbors. You know. Yeah, that's better. You should be able to get a job in a nice spot easy the way you play. I bet you find a job tomorrow. Well, I tramped all over town today and it was nothing doing. Well, you didn't expect to ring the bell your first day in town, did you, darling? Yeah, I'd better ring it soon. I'm low on dough. I'll lend you some. Excuse me? Yeah, mm hmm. Hello? Sal, this is Bill. What do you want? Not what you think. No? You toss me out of your life, I'm not gonna bounce back. I want. You want what? Do I hear a harmonica? Well, it's not the Boston Symphony. That guy Henry Peterson's with you, huh? The guy you told me was coming to town. Uh huh, and there's nothing you can do about it either. Oh, no? No. When I get through with that joker, he won't be playing a harmonica. He'll be strumming a harp. And now on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> Harmonica and listen to me? You don't have anything to say. I don't go with a gal who still has a boyfriend. I heard that phone conversation just now. It's nothing to me anymore. You're something to him. Henry, you're going to stay here whether you like it or not. Well, I don't like it. And I'm not staying. You have to. I gave up Bill for you. The day I got your letter about coming here to live, I told Bill it was all off. Well, it's all off with us, too. I know Bill Foster's rep and his record. And I don't want to be the reason the cops are looking for him for murder. Henry, if you walk out on me, I'll kill you. <laughs> what a choice. If I stay, Bill will kill me. If I leave, you kill me. I'll take a chance you won't. So long, Sal. Be a good gal. I'm warning you. You leave and I'll use this on you. Oh, the gal has a gun. My mother never told me which way to duck in a case like this, so I think I'll just duck out. Well, think again, music man. I gave up an awful lot for you. 
Bill loves me, and Bill's rich. And I turned him down for you, and now that I did, I'm keeping you. Forget it, will you? You and I were a quick thing that just isn't anymore. Go on back to Bill. I'll go back where I came from. So long. Henry, if you walk out on I me, said I... said so long, Sal. Oh, yeah. Here. Here's a little thing to remember me by. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that, Sal. That hurt. Should have done more than that. Should have killed you. Why don't you fall? Why don't you die? Uh, give me that gun. You don't want the gun anymore. Give it to me. What are you going to do? What I started out to do. Walk out on you. And I'm taking the gun with me. I'm shot bad, but I said I was going out of here. And I meant what I said. Who's that? Me, Bill. Who's me? Turn on the lights and see. This is your apartment. Turn them on. Who are you? I'm Henry Peterson. Henry Pe- Yeah. What's left of me anyway? Hey, what's the matter with you? What are you... Hey, you've been shot. Yeah, nicely, too. I held on just about as long as I could. Just... Long enough to make it here. Oh, you idiot. What are you trying to do to me? What's the idea of coming here? I just wanted you to know who did the job. Your pal, Sal. Sal? <laughs> She's a good shot. This is the gun she used. Oh! Well, you're dying, you jerk. Now, get out of here. I've got a record. If you die here, the police will never believe I didn't kill you. Now, don't frame me, kid. Go on, I'm get out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bill. Just... Just don't think I got the time... Oh, Blackie, are you getting lazy? No, I'm getting this letter finished. No, I'm getting impatient. Yes? Is Boston Blackie in? Oh, yes. Well, I'm yes, Sally yes. Rogers. I'd like to speak to him, please. Yeah, come on in. Thank you. You're Miss Wesley, aren't you? Yeah, I am. How'd you know? I've seen your picture in the papers with Blackie. Oh. Uh, Blackie, there's someone here to see you. See me? Mm-hmm. A very pretty girl. Very pretty girl? You said someone, Mary? Blackie, this is Sally Rogers. And uh, something tells me she's in trouble. Are you, Miss Rogers? No, I'm not, Blackie, but I'm afraid Henry Peterson is. Who's Henry Peterson? He's a friend of mine. He's a professional harmonica player. When he left me last night, he said he'd be back this morning, and I haven't heard from him all day. I'm afraid something's happened to him. What, for instance? Well, I was engaged to Bill Foster before I met Henry. Henry was going to see Bill when he left me. In other words, Bill Foster's happened to him, huh? Well... That guy shouldn't happen to anyone. Are you talking about Bill Foster, the racketeer, Miss Rogers? Yes, Miss Wesley, I am. And Bill threatened to do something terrible to Henry. Blackie, will you help me find him? Your boyfriend has been missing less than 24 hours, Miss Rogers. I don't think there's anything to worry about, but if there is, why don't you go to the police? No, I'm afraid to because of Bill. He may be watching me. Go to the police, Miss Rogers. And if you're afraid of Foster, ask them to protect you. The police would love to pin a rap on Bill Foster. They'll give you plenty of help. Well, if you think I should. I know you should. And if you're not satisfied with what the police accomplish, come and see me again. Thanks, Blackie. I'll do that. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye. So long. Well, you certainly got rid of her in a hurry, Blackie. What's the matter? Isn't she your type? I help people who need help, Mary, and she doesn't. Well, you seem very sure. I thought she was terribly upset. <coughs> and if it was... Hey! Good night. What was that? Oh, gee, someone in the hall just screamed. As if you didn't know. Come on, let's go and see. Oh, Blackie. I have an awful feeling. Mary, it's not a feeling anymore. It's oh. a fact. Look there on the floor. Oh, yes. Near the elevator. That's Sally Rogers. Got a nasty gash on her head. We'll take her into my apartment, and you can do whatever nurses are supposed to do in cases like this, while I have Faraday grab Bill Foster, which is what I do in cases like this. Foster, what did you do with Henry Peterson? Let me handle this, Faraday. Foster, where did you hide Peterson's body? Blackie, I've never even seen the guy in my life. How many times do I have to tell you? We don't want to hear you say that again, Foster. We want the truth. I'm telling the truth. 
Didn't even know the guy was in town till I called Sal and heard him playing the harmonica. Miss Rogers told Blackie you threatened to kill him. Sure, Inspector. Sure I did. But I was just kidding. Some sense of humor. You slugged Miss Rogers outside my apartment, but first you killed Henry Peterson. You did kill Peterson, didn't you? Come in. Inspector Faraday? Yeah, Blaine? Inspector, there's a man out here who wants to see you. Well, who cares? I'm trying to get this guy here to admit he killed Henry Peterson. But the man outside is Henry Peterson. Henry Peterson? <laughs> and I killed the guy, huh? Yes, you... Send him in here, Blaine. Yes, sir, right away. Uh, come in here, Peterson. The inspector will see you. Well, I think you're about through with me, aren't you, Inspector? Sit down, Foster. I have a hunch there's inspector, a Inspector, lot... this is Henry Peterson. Come in, Peterson. Thanks, Inspector. <laughs> what an entrance. What an audience. I understand you think I'm dead. <laughs> uh, I had reason to believe you were. That'll be all, Blaine. Uh, yes, Inspector, sure. Do you know this man, Peterson? This one here? Yes, yes by reputation only. He's Bill Foster, isn't he? <laughs> I know him all. I understand he's supposed to kill me. Whatever gave anybody that idea. Well, I'm sure I don't know, Henry, but I'm glad you showed up before these guys beat a confession out of me. I'd uh, be here. Peterson, uh, I understand you're new in town. Yeah, just got here yesterday. Came in yesterday. Is there anyone in town who can identify you, that is, besides Sally Rogers? Well, let's see now. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I haven't seen anyone else. I have my driver's license right here in my wallet. I'll show you that. Uh, you look at it, Faraday. Peterson... I understand you play the harmonica. Yes, how'd you know? Sure, I play it. Miss Rogers told me. You don't by any chance have a harmonica with you, do you? Yes, certainly. I always carry one right here, sure. But can you play one? Shall I play what you want or what I want? Anything. Well, I don't know that. <laughs> but how about this? <laughs> well, Blackie, what happens now? I don't know. Only I don't feel too badly, because I guarantee you don't know either. That's enough of the harmonica, Peterson. Here's your wallet back. <laughs> Little number I wrote myself, okay? <laughs> well, Faraday, do I go now? Yeah, Foster, you can go. Oh, wait a minute, Faraday. Keep Foster under guard until we've made one more test. What more do we need to believe this guy is Peterson? His driver's license says he is. He plays the harmonica the way he's supposed to. Right. But he ran out on Sally Rogers the way he wasn't supposed to. Let's take Peterson up to my apartment to see Miss Rogers and see what name she calls him. Mary, how's Miss Rogers? Is she all right? Oh, yes, Blackie. Uh, the cut on her head wasn't as bad as it looked. She's lying down in the bedroom. She has an awful headache. Yeah, and I'm going to have one. This guy here isn't Peterson. I'm who I say I am. <laughs> you take me in the south. You'll prove it. Yes, okay, sir. okay. Let's stop this nonsense. Come on, Faraday. Bring him into the bedroom. I'll show you I'm right. Come on, Peterson. I'm right with you. Drive him back. Miss Rogers, mm. are you awake? Mm. What? Oh. Oh, Blackie, hello. Miss Rogers, I'm Inspector Faraday of the police. Hello. Uh, this man says he's Henry Peterson. Oh. Hello, Henry. Where have you been? Hello, Sam, baby. Is this Henry Peterson, Miss Rogers? Of course. Henry, what happened to you? Blackie, I don't know why you're standing there with your mouth open. Except maybe it's because this case is closed. Hello? Bill? Yeah. This is Sal. They let you out of jail at last, didn't they? Couldn't hold me, Sal. Not when I hadn't done anything wrong. You've recovered enough from that smack on the head I gave you to go home, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that ought to teach you to keep Blackie out of this. Bill, what'd you do with Henry? Never mind what I did with him. You did something, I know that. Huh. You think so? I know so. I followed him after he left my apartment. I saw him go to yours. Where is he now? Some place where he won't do either of us any harm. That, uh, bullet of yours finished him, sweetheart. He's dead? Sure. Only if I were you, I'd keep quiet about it. Why? What do I have to be afraid of? He died in your house. And the police will always take my word against yours. Now, look, you. It's because you didn't shoot the guy where he dropped dead right away. I almost got loused up. Now, you keep your mouth shut. And I'll have it closed permanently. You know, I'm pretty sure you would. When they brought your friend to see me at Blackie's, I said he was Henry. I caught on quick, don't you think? Well, stay caught on. We'll go to the chair. Both of us. Don't you worry, darling. This is one time we've not only fooled the police, we've made a fool out of Boston Blackie. (laughs) 
And now, back to Boston Blackie. Harmonica playing Henry Peterson is shot by his girlfriend, Sally Rogers. Wounded, he goes to the home of racketeer Bill Foster, Sally's ex fiance and after telling Bill who shot him, dies. Sally, who saw Henry go to Bill's, comes to Blackie to complain that Henry is missing. Blackie and Inspector Faraday then pick up Bill and are about to charge him with the murder of Henry Peterson when, apparently, Henry Peterson appears very much alive. Sally identifies him as her missing boyfriend, so Faraday releases Bill Foster and the case is closed. As we return to our story, Blackie, convinced that the real Henry is dead, questions one of Sally's neighbors. Mrs. Stone, Sally Rogers had a visitor last night. I wonder if oh, you could yes, tell me... Oh, yes, she did. I heard him playing the harmonica all evening. Walls are thin, you know. Well, I just loved the way he played the William Tell Overture. I've never heard it played like that. It was simply well, wonderful. Well, that's... The way... uh, the, yes, yes, that's fine, Mrs. Stone. But uh, did you see him? Oh, goodness gracious. No, no, indeed, I didn't. He was still playing the harmonica at 10 o'clock. I was fast asleep in bed. Well, And I... besides, I'm not interested in what my neighbor's friends look like. I mind my own business. Yes, yes, of course. No, no indeed, but... I'm not. And there's no use in asking anyone else in the building because no one saw him come in or go out. Oh, you asked around? Well, maybe I was a little curious. He played the William Tell Overture so beautifully. I don't doubt it. Wonder why he played the William Tell Overture when the funeral march would have been so much more appropriate. Yeah, Clarence, I'm going to will you this house of mine for what you've done for me. Well, there was nothing to it, Phil. Anybody could have done it with nobody knowing what poor Peterson looked like. <laughs> well, it was the way you played that harmonica to convince Faraday, though, Clarence. Yeah, it's real <laughs> uh, Lucky you thought to take it along, huh? I had an idea, Sal. I might tell somebody who played the thing. It's a lucky thing they didn't ask me to play anything complicated. <laughs> I'm not that good. Well, you were good enough to cover up for me, Clarence, and... Uh... <laughs> Thanks a lot. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Say, Bill, what did you do with Henry's body? Fed it to the fish. What do you think of it? That's not one of the boys at the door, Bill. You want me to die? No, no, no. Just sit still. Come in. Hello, Bill. Blackie. Come in. Thanks, Bill. I was in the neighborhood. Oh. I didn't know you and Henry were such good friends. Yeah, we get along. <laughs> now. Funny. I thought you two were rivals for the same girl. Oh, that's all. We both though. decided she'll do better back in circulation. You mean you're both in on Henry Peterson's murder? What murder? <laughs> I'm Henry Peterson. So you keep telling everybody. But I told you... Blackie, that... what's with you wasting time on the murder of a guy who ain't dead? I'm still not sure he isn't, and despite Miss Rogers' identification. She could have come to me for help and then been scared into helping you by you. Look, the police told the whole I'm story. I'm not the police, Henry, or whoever you are. Look, you have your harmonica with you? Why, sure. I never go anywhere without it. <laughs> I never know when I might get an audition and land a job, you know? Well, how about auditioning for me right now? Well, sure, sure. How about this? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll pick the tune. Sure. <laughs> go right ahead. Let's hear the William Tell Overture. Yes, William Tell Overture? Yes. Oh, you don't want to hear that? <laughs> you mean you don't want to play it? Well, no, no, I don't like it exactly. That's right. You mean you can't play it? So what if he can't? The musician doesn't know everything that was ever written. That's right, Bill. That's right, yes. But if Henry doesn't know it now, he has an awfully short memory because he played it for Sally Rogers last night. What? How do you know? A neighbor with big ears heard him play it. Oh, yeah? Now play a little of it for me, Henry, or I'll get big ideas. Okay. Go on, play it for him, Henry. Sure. That's not very good, Henry, and you're not Henry. Okay, Come here, get your there, I'll show you. Yep. Yeah. And here's one for you, Blackie. Oh. <laughs> you walked into that one, Blackie. So it looks like I'm the one that'll walk out of here. You're not Henry Peterson, huh? Ah, you fellas. Well, don't just sit and stare at me. Say something. Maybe his jaw is still sore from the poke I gave him, Faraday. Yeah, your eye looks plenty sore from the poke you took. Forced to do that? Yes, and it's going to be one of the last things he ever did. I'll have him here in your office an hour after I leave uh, here. One at a time, Blackie. Let's hear a few words from you, whatever your name is, one at a time. What's your name? 
Clarence Brown. Why did you say you were Henry Peterson? Bill hired me to say it. It's a guy. He hired you to say it because the real Henry Peterson is dead and you know it. I don't know nothing about that. I just did what Bill paid me to do. I didn't ask any questions. Well, I'm going to ask you one. Where's Foster now? I don't know. Don't waste time asking him, Faraday. I said I'd find Foster, and I will. But I'm going to find our man by finding a woman first. All right, all right. All right, now. You men are supposed to be detectives. Okay, bring in a killer. And do it fast. I want a guy named Bill Foster brought in here. I want him here tonight. But, Inspector... I don't Barry, want to hear any I'll... bots. No Wait, bots. Well, All you guys have a description of Foster? You know what he looks like from that picture we had made up. Now, get him. And get him before Boston Blackie does. You either live up to your jobs as detectives, or if Blackie gets Foster first, you'll never live that down. <laughs> Why it is, Mary, but sometimes the simplest lock is the toughest to pick. That's because your heart isn't in your work. If the lock isn't complicated, like you just don't get a kick out of it. Well, I'm going to get a lead to the real Henry Peterson and to Bill Foster's whereabouts out of this lock if I can pick my way into Sally Rogers' apartment. Oh, there. Ah, I did it. Open, Sally. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're in. Well, what are we in for? A long search for nothing? Well, maybe, Mary. But close the door and let's go to work just the same. I don't see what it'll prove if you do find a clue to Peterson here in Miss Rogers' room. She admits he was here. Mary, we don't know what the real Henry Peterson looks like. And I have a hunch of body is going to turn up unidentified very shortly. But that's not as important as finding a lead to Foster. That's what I really want. Mm-hmm. I wonder what was spilled on the rug over here. Hmm? Where? Here. This whole end of the rug near the door. Something was either spilled on it or Miss... Rogers got tired of trying to clean the entire thing. That whole end of the rug has just been cleaned, Mary. Yep. In fact, it's still a little damp from the cleaning fluid. Well, whatever was spilled on it, it certainly made a big stain. Mary, I think the stain on this rug is going to put Henry Peterson's killer in a spot. Faraday, I've got great news for yeah, you. Listen i got better news for me. I'm having you thrown out of here right now. Oh, no, I... Well, look who's here. Well, again, Blackie. What'd you do, Foster? Give yourself up? Sure, right after two of Faraday's men grabbed me at the airport. Just going on a business trip. Sure, sure. You deny you killed Peterson. Do you deny you slugged Blackie, too? No, I did that. He got tough in my apartment and I clipped him. Now, don't tell me you're sore about that. If he isn't, I am. Blackie, Foster admits he hired Clarence Brown to pose as Henry Peterson. But he won't say he killed anyone. I have a reason for that, Faraday. A very simple reason. I didn't kill anyone. No? I'll make you admit it before I'm through with you. If you do, you'll be lying, Faraday. You yeah, he'll see... be lying flat on his back. Come in. Hello, Inspector Faraday. Oh, get out of here, Miss Wesley. I have enough trouble with Blackie. But Blackie said for me to come here. And he asked me to bring Miss Rogers along with me. You remember Miss Rogers, don't you? Yeah, Mother? yeah. Now, both of you get out of here. Uh, Faraday, to... better do some listening, some fast listening. Uh, Miss Rogers, you agreed to come here with Miss Wesley? Of course. She told me I was to hear a confession in the Henry Peterson murder case. Mm -hmm. I couldn't understand what she meant, and as much as Henry is alive, but I came just in case. Peterson isn't alive, and nobody knows that better than you. You mean Bill Foster finally got to him? I imagine the real Peterson finally got to Foster, but... Uh... I'm head of my story. I... You identified a phony as Henry Peterson, Miss Rogers. Why? Foster made me do it. What? He threatened me. Why, that's a lie. What do you it mean? It's a lie. It probably isn't, but it's beside the point. You identified an, an imposter as Peterson because you thought our investigation would stop right there. You wanted that. Because you killed Henry Peterson. Are you kidding? Oh, wait a minute, Blackie. You can't accuse him. Can I? Faraday, there's a spot on the rug in Miss Rogers' apartment. A big spot. She tried to clean it up, but it didn't work. Your laboratory men will prove it's blood. What they don't know is that it's the real Henry Peterson's blood. They don't... Better say that slower. Better listen faster. No. Faraday, Miss Rogers shot Peterson. He staggered out of her place and made it to Foster's apartment. There's a recently cleaned stain on his rug, too. I know. I just came from there. All right, all right. You have a story, Blackie, but you got it backwards. Foster killed him and he managed to get to my place. What? I got scared. And... Lying little rat. Keep him away from me. Hold it, Foster. Hold it. 
I know she's lying. Her next-door neighbor, a woman with very good ears, was a big help to me. She not only heard a harmonica playing the William Tell Overture, but about 20 minutes later she heard what she thought was a backfire the night we know Peterson was killed. That was Miss Rogers' gun going off. Uh, Peterson did get to your house, didn't he, Foster? Sure, and he died there. You could see the spot I was in. He came to tell me it was Sal that killed him, and then he died. I had to get rid of the body. The cops were to build a foolproof case against me. Even had the murder gun with him. And he told you that Miss Rogers shot him? Yeah, that's right. He's telling the truth, Faraday. You can grab Sally Rogers. Don't you get me for anything. Where I'm going, I'm going alone. Grab him, I've got it. I've got it. I've Quiet down, Miss Rogers. Quiet down. Right now, Faraday will take you off my hands because you're going into the arms of the law. Blackie, do you have to play that harmonica? Uh huh. Oh, do you have to play it that badly? Apparently. Blackie, that's the last tune that poor Henry Peterson played, and look what happened to him. And he played it right. Oh, I don't know about that. He ended up on a sour note, too, in the river. Faraday found his body just a little while ago. Oh, I've got to learn to play this thing, Mary. Why? Well, a harmonica solved this case. Well, you'll never be able to solve a harmonica. That's a heck of a note, isn't it? So's that.
Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. I don't know whether going after a ghost is your idea of an adventure, but I think I may have one for you. I don't believe in ghosts either. At least I don't think I do. However, if you're interested, my name is Michael Davis. I'm an artist, and my studio is at 183 Lincoln News. I'm there almost all day. Is at 183 Lincoln News. I'm there almost all day and any day. So if you'll drop around, this may be interesting. Michael Davis. So Mr. Michael Davis didn't believe in ghosts. Well, neither did I. Until I met Mr. Davis. <laughs> to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Haunted Artist. Ghost? Gee, Mr. Holliday, are there such things? Ever see a bank account after March the 15th? Huh? <laughs> Skip it, Susie. Michael Davis. He says he's an artist. Do you know anything about art, Susie? Well, I- I've been to the museum where they have that statue of the Venus de Mille. That's Venus de Milo. The one with that arm? Uh-huh. Oh. Well, art is long and time is fleeting, and the same goes for Dan Holliday. And it looks like a trip to Mr. Michael Davis is in order. See you later, Susie. A half hour later, Michael Davis and I were introducing ourselves and shaking hands. I liked him, and he looked like an artist, except when he grinned. Then he looked and seemed a lot younger than his old 33 or 4. And he grinned as he said... So you advertise for adventure just to get plots for your stories, huh? Yes, that's a general idea. Maybe I'll be able to use yours. Well, this sounds insane, but I think this studio is haunted. Or I am. Why? Do you hear the patter of cold little feet and the clank of chains at night? I wish I did instead of... Oh, come and look. You see that easel in the corner? Mm Mm-hmm. There's a painting on it. I've got it covered now, but... But what? Well, look. Take a good, long look. I did. What I saw was one of those surrealist things. It was a desert with queer figures raising their arms to a brassy sky and a vicious-looking sun. Well, somehow it gave me the shivers. I was staring at it when... Well, Holiday, what do you think of it? <laughs> what am I supposed to think of it? Meaning you don't like it? Well, I, I don't know. I hadn't intended you to criticize it. Just look at it and see if you notice anything wrong. Go ahead, I'll keep quiet. I looked again and something did strike me as being a little odd. I moved in for a closer look, stood there for a moment. Uh Uh-huh. You've got it, Holiday. That stone quarry painted in the right-hand portion of the canvas. Yes, it doesn't belong. I mean, I mean, it's out of place. I didn't paint it. Maybe we'd better go over the signals again today, but I... uh... I lost the ball on that play. I don't blame you. But it's the truth. I did not paint that quarry in there. Look at it. The technique is different. Yes, the brushwork's not like the rest. Exactly. And that painting has to be done in three days. I've been working on it for seven months, and it has to be finished. Why, what's the rush? Oh, I've been invited to hang a canvas in the Bernier Gallery. Oh, which means you've arrived. Bernier's being taught what the big leagues is to baseball. Exactly. You see, Holiday... I started the painting seven months ago. Everything was fine for me. What Davis told me was this. He'd finish work in the evening, cover the painting, and turn in. Then in the morning, when he'd take the cover off the canvas, the quarry would be painted in. It happened six times. The last time was the night before he wrote his letter to Box 13. He was sure no one had entered his studio during the night. He'd locked his windows and doors, but but still it happened. It's driving me crazy. I've lain awake at night trying to catch the person responsible, but nothing doing. He never shows up when I'm waiting for him. Have you told the police? Oh, sure. They they thought I was just two steps ahead of the man in the white coat. You're sure you've locked up every night? 
Look at the door. New locks, two of them. Even the window fasteners are brand new. Those are the only entrances. And exits. No, Holiday. No one comes in through the doors or windows. I'll swear to it. But someone has to, Davis. Unless... Unless I am leaving the rails. No, I don't think so. Thanks. Even my best friends won't tell me that. Well, if... Marshal, darling, I brought dinner. Oh. Come on in, Betty. Here, Mike. Here, take some of these tacos. Yeah. Betty, this is Dan Holliday. Dan, this is my fiance, Betty Harper. Hello, Dan. And my name is Betty. Well, thanks. I'll use it. <laughs> yeah. Mike, darling, mm-hmm. I invited Kit and Ann for dinner. Is that all right? Sure. Uh, will you stay, Dan? Well, I'm afraid I can't. Besides, I'm... I'm unexpected. Oh, no. We've got plenty. Spaghetti, salad, wine. Oh, be careful of that bottle, Mike. Here, let me have it. Peg Bursty. Oh, please, I'm not a child. Oh, that's a matter of opinion. You will stay, won't you, Dan? Well, I... Oh, please do. We can talk some more about my problem. Problem? Your problem, Mike? Oh, yes. Dan's going to help about the painting. Oh. <laughs> and I'm a child, huh? There goes the wine. That was clumsy, wasn't it? Accidents will happen, Betty. If I can put in that bromide. Oh, Mike, I just remembered. We're to go to the Suttons after dinner. Huh? Oh, that wasn't a promise. We can't refuse them again. But Dan's going to... As a matter of fact, I, I can't stay anyway. I have an engagement, too. Well, all right, but you will return tomorrow, won't you? Sure, I'll be glad to. Good night. Well, well, I like this. It looked good. Especially when Mike's own girlfriend was anxious to deal me out. That Betty didn't want me on the team. It was easy to see as the brass button in a collection plate. She didn't drop that bottle of wine. It jumped out of her hands when Mike said I was going to help. Why? Well, I had to find that out. I got to my apartment after dinner and sat down to think about it when... Hello? Is this Dan Holiday? Yes, it is. Who's this? Well, never mind. Just a moment. Hello? Hello? Holiday, you're to keep away from Michael Davis. Forget the whole thing, understand? Well, frankly, no. Am I supposed to? Well, yes. I, I mean, look look here, Holiday. It'll be awkward for you if you continue. Go on. I'm interested. Uh, all right. Just remember what I said. Keep away from Michael Davis or you will be sorry. <laughs> now, listen. This is no joke. <laughs> but I'm laughing. I warn you. Good night. Brother, whoever you were, that was the worst imitation of a squeeze play I ever heard. Are you kidding, Dan? No, someone called me last night, wanted me to keep away from you. Why, it must have been a joke. Does anyone want to keep this painting out of the burner galleries for some reason? Mm, I thought of that. You mean sabotage, sort of? Yeah, that's it. Well, who? No one I know. You're sure, Mike? Of course. Uh... Have you done any work on the canvas today? Yes, I scraped off the stone quarry and started my own work again. Uh, then I've got an idea. What time is it? Uh, four o'clock. Why? Got any ceiling wax? Ceiling wax? No, I haven't. Well, can you get some? Well, yes, there's a store a block down the street, but what do you want with ceiling wax? Well, for one thing, we're going to prove there's no ghost. Or, uh... Or what? Or that there is one. <laughs> Run down and get the wax. All right, you're the boss. Make stuff at home. I'll be back in a few minutes. I worked fast to get the thing done before Mike came back. I took every tube of paint, every brush, every palette I could see and wiped them clean. Then I put them back where they had been, just in time. Mike came back, handing me the ceiling wipe. Oh, will this be enough, Dan? Oh, yes, I think so. Okay. Now, we'll lock all the windows. And be sure to lock. What are you up to? You see, we can find out if someone gets in here while you're asleep. To seal the locks and bolts for this wax and... Yes, but wax can be broken. Uh, it is. Well, no, someone came in the windows of the door. Yeah, but the person could reseal the locks. Sealing wax melts easily enough. Sure, but he couldn't put the imprint of my signet ring back in the wax without getting the ring from me first. And I'm very fond of this ring. Never take it off my finger. Okay, Mike, let's go to work on the windows. All right, that does it. Both windows sealed. If our ghost gets in now, he'll have to break the wax. You know, uh, there's only one thing wrong. What, Mike? I won't be able to sleep tonight. Oh. Well, I'll take something. You've got to sleep because your visitor won't break in unless you do. Dan, suppose those seals aren't broken in the morning, but the painting's been changed anyway. What then? Uh, we both apply for an outside cell. Now, don't do anything more on your painting. And don't touch a thing. Hmm? Why not? 
You want me to help you, don't you? Certainly. And ask no questions and do as I say. And tomorrow morning we may have an answer. It was 11 o'clock that night before I left Mike's studio. He had taken a sedative and was sleeping like a baby. I turned off the lights, checked the seals on the windows. All okay. I let myself out, tried the door. Locked, but good. Then I took the sealing wax and all the hunk of it to go over the keyholes. And I pressed my signet ring against the wax. I even forced the wax into the crack above the door. Initial bet. Michael Davis was sealed in. And whoever, or whatever, was doing the dirty work was sealed out. I hoped. When I got home, I set my alarm for five the next morning. Yeah, it went off all right. I stumbled out of my bed into my clothes and drove to Davis' studio. I wanted to get there before he woke up. I did, because when I listened at his door, there wasn't a sound. I looked carefully at the seals I'd put there the night before. Well, they were intact. I'll swear to it. Then I rang his buzzer. He was quite a sleeper. Apparently taken something and... Who is it? Why don't you come back in a week? It's Dan, Mike. Let me in. Huh? Oh. Oh, sure. Do you always get up this early? I have a contract with the park commissioners to wake up the birds. Fine. Shouldn't happen to a vulture. Sleep all right? Oh, like a top. Disturbed at all? Nope. Okay. Let's look at the seals. You bet. Well, this one's all right. Mm -hmm. So is this one. And the seals on your door were intact, too. Now, take the cover off the painting, Mike. Uh, what if it's been changed again? (laughs) If it has, I'll buy you a new hat. I... I... I wear a size 7 and 3 8. And make it a gray one. To the Haunted Artist, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, the painting was changed. Davis swore he hadn't done it, and I believed him. But if he hadn't, okay, there had to be an answer. I took all the tubes of paint, brushes, and palettes with me when I left Davis. Also, the painting itself. I wouldn't tell him why. Lieutenant Kling at police headquarters was more curious. What are you doing? Taking a home course in detective work? Yes, I'm on my fourth lesson. It's entitled, How to Be a Nosy Cop. What's the gag, Holiday? Look, there's no gag. I just left a guy who's biting his nails so badly he was working on his elbow a few minutes ago. Kling, run fingerprint tests on those tubes and brushes and palettes. Then compare them with the prints on this glass, will you? Whose glass is it? Belongs to another friend of mine. I swiped it when he wasn't looking. Where have you got that big package? A body. Whose? All right, it's a painting. And you don't know anything about art. I knew an artist model was. She wasn't as bad as she was painted. (laughs) Okay, so I don't slay you. All right, I'll laugh at your joke. Ha ha. Now, will you do me that favor? Okay, okay. Fingerprint test in the tubes, brushes, and palette. Compare with prints in the glass, right? How soon can I have them? For anybody else, in a half an hour. For you, three hours. Okay. Great. Be back in three hours. After leaving playing, I went to the Star Times and learned the name of an art expert. Hmm. That is quite good. Yours? No, it's a friend of mine's. Hmm. Good brushwork. Excellent composition. Wonderful color. And with this, this has no place in the picture. Look, uh, I've got a lot of things to do. What I want you to do is look at the painting and tell me whatever you can about it. I'll pay you, of course. Oh, very well. But uh, it will take uh, maybe two hours to do a good job. Uh, you understand? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, sure, sure. I'll be back in two hours. Well, it was a merry-go-round. From Kling to the art expert, from him back to Kling. A little less than three hours, Dan. Haven't you finished? <laughs> sure. There's your stuff and here's the report. What's the matter with you? 
Clang. There's no mistake about this report, is there? Mistake? Look, Dan, our boy knows his business. Bet on it. Anything you like. Weren't... Weren't there any other prints at all? None. The prints on the paint tubes and the rest of that stuff were the same as on the glass. All from the same person. But it can't be. I've got news for you. It is. Well, the only person who could have touched those tubes and brushes was Davis himself. Yet why should he sabotage his own painting? One that meant so much to him. And yet, he was asleep when it happened. Or was he? I stopped thinking about it then. I had to get back to the art expert and find out something. Well, it was a day of surprises because when I saw him... Yeah, a fine thing. They pushed me and they took a painting. Ah, who? Well, I'm standing here looking when they come in. I have no time to see who they are. When who? They, they pushed me. They, they grabbed the canvas and they're gone. Did you call the police? Yeah, yeah. The police come, but I can tell them nothing. I, I... Never mind, never mind. Were they men? The ones who took the painting? One, one man, one woman. You're sure there was a woman? Young man, I'm an art expert, but I also know other things. I know a woman when I see one, even for a second. All right. Never mind them now. What did you find out about the painting? Well, not much. I had not much time. But I can tell you this. I think that the right side of the picture was painted by somebody other than the one who painted the rest. You mean that stone quarry wasn't painted by the same artist who did the rest of the picture? No, I do not think so. There's a different technique. One that is familiar. And I think I recognize it. You do? Well, what's his name? The one who painted the quarry. Well, it's a peculiar technique. Uh, some years ago, I handled some paintings by this man. And... All right, all right. Who is he? Luigi Antonetti. Oh. Where can I get in touch with him? Well, uh... what? I want to see him. Where can I reach him? <laughs> oh, you're crazy, young man. Luigi Antonetti is dead. Oh, that was great. One more twist like that, and I need a corkscrew to take off my hat. There was one person who could answer a few questions for me. Betty Harper. I got her address from Davis and told him to hold base until he heard from me. I guess Betty didn't expect me. What? Mr. Holliday, I... I was just getting ready to go out. Correction, you just came in. Where's that painting? Painting? What are you talking about? Betty, I, uh... Oh, hello. Hello. Kit, this is Dan Holliday. Kit says Mr. Holliday. Oh, you Holliday? Oh, that voice. The voice of doom over the phone. Well, really, I... Uh... Kit, that was a bad job. Well, I... Quiet, Kit. Where's that painting? Now, Mr. Holiday. You know, you've let yourself in for a vacation on the taxpayer's money with that trick? Now, really, it was a joke, wasn't it, Betty? Mr. Holiday, Kit really thought he was helping out in a practical joke. Well, wasn't I? Look, will you go? Now, Holiday... Oh. Is... All right. But I must say, it all turned out very stupidly. Okay, Betty. So you've got the painting. Yes. Now, will you please let me alone? Will you let Mike alone? Not before I find out what's going on. What if I told you his career would be ruined? His life ruined, too? Would you still go on? Maybe I don't believe that. But you've got to. I love Mike, and I'm trying to help him. Help him? Look, if Mike doesn't finish that painting, it won't hang in the burners' galleries. What becomes of his career then? You're robbing him of his chance, not helping him. Then I'll rob him of it. I'd rather do that than... Than what? I said enough. Oh, please, please, you've got to believe me, Dan. All I want is for Mike to, to be happy. And all I want to know is what's going on. And what does Luigi Antonetti have to do with all this? How did you find that out? It doesn't matter. Is Luigi Antonetti still alive? He's dead. And how can he paint that quarry on Mike's canvas? Get out of here. You get out. All right. All right, but I'll find out. If you do, when any harm comes to Mike, I swear I'll kill you. Now get out. <laughs> That was all from Betty. I would have bet my last penny she was doing what she was doing for Mike. But why? Why? Then I got an idea. Find out about Luigi Antonetti. I looked him up. Found out he'd lived in a small town about 250 miles away. He painted there. Okay, so I drove to the little town. Sure, I found out. He was dead all right. I was even shown his grave, and when I looked at it, I wanted to reach back and chip the icicles off my spine. How could a dead man paint? There was only one answer. He couldn't. Then I learned something else. Antonetti had a pupil, a pupil named Michael Davis. 
More questions, and finally I found an old school teacher who remembered. Michael, of course. Wonderful boy. Luigi Antonetti taught him painting. He said Michael had a brilliant career ahead of him. I see. Well, Mr. Evans, do you know what became of Michael? I think he went to the city, although I haven't heard. Where did he go? I believe shortly after he graduated from high school. Uh, that must be 16 years ago. Yes, it was right after his best friend was killed. His what? Yes, poor boy. He fell into the old quarry. Quarry? Stone quarry? Well, yes. It was one night after a senior party. I think, yes. Both lads, Michael and Arthur, were in love with the same girl, you see. Would uh, her name be? Betty Harper. Well, it's amazing you should know that, yes. How about this, Arthur? Well, it was quite dark. Arthur, I believe, went back to get something. The bridge across the quarry must have broken. Michael was upset for days, even though Arthur was his rival for Betty. Thank you. He... Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. You'll excuse me, but I, I've got to hurry. <laughs> Yeah, but I had to put more pieces together. So I went back to the city and back to the art expert. Yeah, yeah, it's not only possible, Mr. Holliday. It's quite probable. In his early years, he would use his teacher's technique. Next stop, the psychiatrist. Certainly, Mr. Holliday, that's quite possible. There are numerous case histories similar to it in general form. Things began to fit together. The different technique, that of a dead man, yet only Davis's fingerprints on the tubes and brushes. Betty's concern and her willingness to see his career stop rather than have me find out the reasons for everything that happened. But I had to bring the whole thing out in the open. So later in Mike's studio... Let me get this straight, Dan. You say I'm doing that myself, ruining my own painting? Yes, you are, Mike. Don't listen to him, Mike. No, please don't. What's the matter with all of you? Mike, you've got to listen to me. And he's got to listen to me and Dr. Rawlings. Why did you bring a doctor? I'm not only a doctor, Mr. Davis. I'm a psychiatrist. Sick. Are you trying to tell me I'm crazy? No, no, of course you're not. But you will be if you don't let us help. Now, listen, you want your career, don't you? Certainly. All right, you won't have it if you don't let us help. It won't be helping. Oh, Mike, send him away, please. Mike... Mike, do you remember a person named Arthur Denning? 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 No, I don't. Now, will you let him alone? Betty, believe me, this is better for him. Ask Dr. Rawlings. Tell him, Doctor. I'm sure Mr. Davis has a guilt complex. Oh, yes. And unless we find out why, he'll never finish this painting. Perhaps never finish any other. Why not? What would stop me? Your own mind, Mr. Davis. Mike, you know as well as I that no one came into your studio the night we sealed it up. No one. You were the only person in here. Now, do you see? Not quite. What do you want me to do? Well, Dr. Rawlings told Mike what had to be done. Davis agreed. It took only a few seconds for Rawlings to inject a drug into Davis's arm. Then we waited. Waited until... All right. He's under. You asked a question, Mr. Holliday. Mike. Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Now listen, Mike. It's 16 years ago. You're in high school. A senior. There's a senior party. It's night. Remember? Yes. It's... It's dark. Who's with you, Mike? Betty. Betty and Arthur. What... What happened that night, Mike? Uh, I killed Arthur. I don't know. Be quiet. How did you kill him, Mike? He... He had to go back for something. I told him to take the shortcut over the quarry. Then, then what happened? I forgot. I forgot. You forgot what? The bridge. The bridge was broken. It was dangerous. But I forgot. I wouldn't have sent him. Yes, I know. He was killed, wasn't he? Yes. I loved Betty. So did he. Everyone would have said I killed him. But I didn't. I didn't. I just forgot about the bridge. I didn't mean... To... All right. I... That's all. But I... I thought he did it deliberately. You see, Miss Harper, his conscious mind refused to admit his guilt, so he forgot completely. His conscious mind forgot to protect him from the terrible feeling of guilt. But ultimately it came out. He learned painting from Luigi Antonetti 16 years ago. So it was natural at first that he used Antonetti's style, technique. Then, 16 years later, his mind goes back, back into the past, controls his hand, and he paints as he did 16 years ago. But he paints that quarry, the quarry which was associated in his mind with his guilt, or what he thought was his guilt. 
And now? What about now? Now? When he wakes up, we'll tell him and he'll be all right. For good. show have come several new painters of distinction. Not the least of them is Michael Davis, whose intensity of feeling and whose brilliance... That's good enough, Susie. Well, it looks like he's all right, doesn't it? Gee, isn't the human mind wonderful? Well, that depends on which way you look at it. Uh-huh. I was psychoanalyzed once. Oh? And what did you find out? We've got a lot of mail to open, Mr. Holiday. Oh. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. An original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. That of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund McDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Chandu, the magician. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of White King Soap present for your enjoyment, Chandu the Magician. Would you like to make magic your hobby? Want to do magic tricks just like Chandu? Then send today for Chandu's first magic trick offer. Chandu calls it the Assyrian Money Changer. It changes pennies into dimes right before your eyes. And you can have this trick for your very own by sending 25 cents and a White King box top to Chandu, Los Angeles 21. Listen, you take a penny from your pocket or handbag and lay it on the table. Now cover the penny with the mystic ruby block. Then remove the block while everyone watches closely. And behold, in place of the penny, there's a silver dime. Begin your collection of Chandu's magic tricks with this thrilling Assyrian money changer. Just send 25 cents in coin and the top from a box of White King soap to this address. Chandu, Los Angeles, 21, California. Chandu will send you his Assyrian money changer postpaid complete with instructions. Send for Chandu's Assyrian money changer tonight. secret link between the Balkan castle of Sistava and the black magic of ancient Egypt suddenly confronts Frank Chandler when Betty Regent finds in her room a tiny statuette of the evil Egyptian priestess Oriunda. And by his occult powers, Chandler has already learned that somewhere in the maze of underground rooms is one devoted to the dreadful practice of the black arts. But meanwhile... Chandler has discovered that Jan Metzos, the foreign minister, is searching for a lost plan of the castle, for many years the meeting place of malcontents from all Europe. On the pretext of a social call, Chandler tells Metzos he has found the plan. And to his astonishment, Metzos offers to make him a secret member of the government staff. To unmask the man behind Metzos, Chandler agrees. It is now an hour later. As Chandler returns to the castle, Dorothy Regent meets him at the door. Chandu, the magician. Oh, Frank, I've been imagining all sorts of things. Were you planning to visit me in the Lobova prison? Oh. Oh, you have your hat on, Dot. 
Well, I was going to walk down into town to ask how Mrs. Mason is. <laughs> uh, well, if you must know, I was going to see Mr. Mason if you weren't back by noon. What's the American consul for? Well, what did you think Metzos was going to do? Order me shot? Well, it's not funny. He's quite capable of it. You remember what happened to that radio correspondent in Greece? Well, you can take off your hat. Metos and I are pals and buddies, or whatever the current phrase is. I'm sure you are. It's true. Oh. And I suppose you know you forgot to take the plan of the castle with you, after all. I left it here purposely. Why? Well, stir up the fire, will you, Frank? Well, it looks as if you'd been poking at it. Now, Frank. Oh. You know, I wonder if there's ever been any research done but on why a woman always manages to ruin a perfectly good fire. Where's Bob? You and Betty are out riding with Nicholas. And you needn't talk about my spoiling the fire. <laughs> what about Mr. Metzos? Well, I told you. We're friends. He wants me on his team. You're joking. No, I'm not. The moment I told him I had the plan of the castle... You don't hmm. mean he admitted sending people here to look for it? Yes, he did. Frank, he must have sent that little image of the priestess. That's not like Metzos, not... You know, that image must have come here from Dimitri somehow. Oh, if we just knew how. I'm beginning to think I do know. Well, then tell me, for heaven's sake. Not until I'm sure. Oh, Frank, I'd rather know. No matter who it is or what it is. When I come back from Paris, we'll find out. Paris? Yes. I told Metzos I'd give him the plan of the castle. If you do, we're going to move. I'd rather camp out like the gypsies. No, Dorothy. Well, you know how ruthless that man is. He'd think nothing of blowing up the castle with us in it. Give it me would... a chance to tell you. He wasn't hunting for that plan just for fun. Metzos is pretty uneasy at the moment, Dot. He's working under orders from outside the country. And he thinks Dimitri's being set to replace him. Oh, I don't care anything about that. I just don't see any sense in giving him that plan. You see, Metzos is working on some scheme of his own. And he's afraid he's been found out. But... Uh... He practically told me so. Oh, you can't believe anything he says, Frank. Why should he tell you that? A foreigner, an American. Well, it seems he was suspicious of me when I arrived, so he had some questions asked in Washington. Oh? He was given to understand that I'd been handed an insignificant job over here as a punishment. What? Well, even so... I... Men with grievances, real or imaginary, have built up men like Metzos from the beginning, as they did Roxo. Oh, and Hitler... Why must you give him the plan of this place? Dot, he knows there's a room here where such men have always met. And he can't trust anybody. Well, I don't... Don't you see? Care. I'm going to give him a duplicate plan. Oh? With a few minor alterations to keep him occupied. I hope Robert won't be too busy to make it for me. Robert? Well, I'm sure he can do it if he has the time. Where is the plan? Oh, right there on the table, under the newspaper. Listen, Frank. Why don't you let... Robert's a chemist. He'll know how to imitate the old ink and age sheepskin so that it'll look like this plan. Oh, Frank, I'll take it to Paris for you. You can tell me just what you want. Oh, I know he's busy, but I could at least see him. Oh, you don't want me to go. I'm sorry, Dot. Well, I think I'd better go myself. I suppose so. <laughs> when Robert's busy, he doesn't know I'm there anyway, as the children say. Now, if Metzos gets impatient and sends for the plan, make some excuse. Don't tell him I've gone away. The way they watch the railway station, he can't help knowing. I'm not going by train. There's no other... Oh, I see. Yes. I'm going in my own way. As soon as I've seen Mason. He should have that report by now. Report? I've sent to London for Dimitri's dossier. As soon as I've read it, I'll go. <laughs> How'd you know which way we'd gone, Dimitri? The spy Forrest is a favorite of Nicholas. Where is he, Bob? Oh, I let Betty and him get ahead of me. He wanted to show us the view from the top of the hill, but... Excellent. I... What do you mean? I stopped and I heard you coming. I wanted to see who it was. I'm very happy to know you waited for me. Oh, you'd have caught up with us at the top anyway. You misunderstand. You mean you wanted to talk to me? You find that surprising? We are friends, aren't we? Oh, sure. I guess so. Uh, let us ride more slowly. If I wish to see you or Betty, it must be away from the castle. 
I am not a welcome caller. Well, you see, I... Look, Dimitri, I've been wanting to ask you this. What's that music you said nobody but your friends could hear? It is not easy to explain. Well, I wish you'd try. I will put it this way. All one's friends have uh, a quality by which you recognize them. A sense of humor, a talent for drawing. The music is mine. Well, I... I, I don't know. You do not believe me? Well... Well, I know I heard it. But why does Nicholas hear it, too? He's known you a lot longer than I have. Are you certain he does not? I asked him. Yeah. When was this? When he came up to the castle yesterday. I am sorry you spoke of it to him. Why? For several reasons. I don't get it. You will come to understand. I hope so. Because you know what? Every time I hear that music... It seems as if I'm somebody else. Indeed. Yeah. I'm rude to my mother, and, and I get into arguments with my uncle, and... You know what I think I'd better do? No, Bob. I think I'd better tell my uncle about it. Oh, no, you will not. Well, why not, for Pete's sake? Say, that music isn't some kind of black magic, is it? How dare you? Well, Uncle Frank said you knew a lot of those secrets. Like... So he knows. Like... Like the, the black magic temple under under the Sphinx in, in Egypt. What's the matter with me? Listen to the music and to my voice. Huh? You will never speak of this to Chandler nor to anyone else. You understand? Yes. I guess so. No matter how deeply the music enters your mind, you cannot open your lips to speak of it. Remember. I'll... remember. Bob! Where are you? Oh, here I am, Bette. Dimitri rode up to... Oh, what's the matter? Nicky's horse threw him. He's lying on the ground up there. Oh, I'll go back with you. Did it, did it knock him out? Yes, he must. Oh. oh, hurry, Bob. Uh, Betty, wait here with me. Let Bob go and see what can be done for Nicholas. Oh, I can't, Dimitri. Will you come with us and help? Uh, that would not be wise. Come on, why don't you? Nicky might even be dead. If so, I cannot afford to be seen near him. Oh, Dimitri. Have you forgotten the stories of my friends who have died? Well, if you acted like this when they were hurt, it's no wonder people talked about you. I'm going back. Betty. Please let go of the reins, Dimitri. There is nothing you can do for Nicholas, my dear. Let go! What a lovely child you are. All fire and spirit. Dimitri, please. It's awful to sit here talking like that when Nicky might be... Not at all. Look at me, Betty. What? Look at me. I want you to promise to be my friend as Bob is. Alchemist of old spent his lifetime trying to change base metals into silver and gold. But now, Chan Du will teach you this secret of the ages. With his mystifying Assyrian money changer, you can change pennies into dimes. Chan Du will send you this magic trick for just 25 cents and a white king box top. Listen, place a penny on a table. Now cover the coin with the mystic ruby block the magic money-changing block. Then utter the magic word, so coot. Now remove the block, and in place of the penny, there is a silver dime. You boys and girls will want to start your magic collection with this Assyrian money-changer. Here's a fine pocket trick for you men to spring on your friends and business associates. And if you ladies want to be sure your guests have a good time at your next party... Try entertaining them with Chandu's magic trick. Just send 25 cents in coin and a box top from White King Soap to Chandu, Los Angeles 21, California. That's 
Chandu, Los Angeles, 21. Make magic your hobby. Make White King your wash day soap. You'll love White King. Chandu the Magician is based on the original radio drama created by Harry A. Earnshaw and is written by Vera Oldham. The makers of White King invite you to listen tomorrow at this time when the story resumes. Chandu the Magician. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Runyon Theater. Once again, the Damon Runyon Theater brings you another story by the master storyteller, Damon Runyon, and this one, Blood Pressure. And to tell it to you, here is Broadway. Thanks. It is maybe 11.30 of a Wednesday night and I am standing at the corner of 48 and Broadway thinking about my blood pressure. Now, this is a proposition I never give much thought to before. In fact, I never hear of it before I go to see Doc Brennan on this Wednesday of which I speak. Now, the reason I think of my blood pressure goes back to that afternoon. And what happens after that is enough to put me in the rack for good. And I will tell you about it in a minute. <laughs> And now, back to the Damon Runyon Theater and the comic masterpiece, Blood Pressure. Well, as I am saying, I never think about my blood pressure before that Wednesday afternoon, when I go to see Doc Brennan, because I am feeling a little like the lining of a $5 suit of clothes. I go to see Doc Brennan, and the scene is as follows. Well, 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 Broadway. I'm a little surprised to see you here. I am a little surprised myself. But to tell the truth, Doc, I am a little seedy. Oh? In what way? I I seem to have something wrong with me which I cannot get over. Okay, Broadway, have a chair. We'll look you over. Sure. Uh, diet pretty regular? When I eat, it is very regular. Uh, cold? No. Hmm. All right. We'll take a look at your blood pressure. My what? Blood pressure. Ever had it taken? I do not even know I have such a thing. Well, I'm afraid everyone has it, if he's alive. Uh, roll up your sleeve. Uh, way up. What are you going to do? Take your blood pressure. With that thing? Oh, come on, come on. Stop acting like a baby. Now, put your arm on the table. Uh, palm up. Now, we'll... Just wrap this around your arm up here. You are choking my arm. Now, we'll see. That is not my temperature going up in that thermometer, is it? <laughs> if it were, we could bake pies in your head. No, nope, it's your blood pressure. Hmm. How am I? You're a nervous man, aren't you? I have some moments like that, yes. I thought so. Uh, Broadway, take it easy for a while. How long have I got? Oh, it's nothing like that. Now, just relax. Take it easy. Your blood pressure is way over normal, so you've got to avoid excitement. Any kind. Doc, that is not easy to do. Well, you've got to, unless you want the top of your head to blow off. Oh, when I come in here, I know there is something wrong. <laughs> ah, don't be so alarmed. Just do as I say. Relax, avoid excitement, undue strain. You'll be all right in a couple of weeks. Thanks. I will be seeing you. Certainly. Uh, that'll be ten dollars. Ten, Bob? I... 
Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, come back and see me in a week, Broadway. Sure. So long. So I leave Doc Brennan's office feeling low with high blood pressure. I take it easy for the rest of the day. Then I have something to eat at Minty's and take in a movie. And then, like I say before, it is about 11.30 and I am standing at the corner of 48 and Broadway. I am thinking about my blood pressure when I feel that somebody is standing next to me. I look up, and what happens is like this. Well, 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 here we are. Uh... Oh, <laughs> hello, Rusty. Uh, what is the score? Oh, just about even. I am glad to see you, Broadway. You are? Yes, because I'm looking for company. I just get back from Philadelphia. Oh, you are just back from Philly? Yeah, I was there on business. Business? Yeah. You hear about it? All I hear is that Gloomy Gus meets with an accident in Philly. Yeah. He is now in a hospital. Oh? He is likely to be there for quite a spell. At this much I can imagine. He should ought not to have welched on a bet. Somebody got to him for doing it. I wonder who the somebody is. I have no idea. Have you? No, no, no idea. The cops are looking for the citizen who plays soccer with Gloomy Gus. I can imagine. However, that is neither here nor there. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, I am just on my way home. You are just standing when I come up to you. I am resting. You are tired? Doc Brennan tells me I need to take it easy because my blood pressure is up. Up where? From what he says, it is about a foot and a half over my head. Well, good night. Just a second. What? How much dough do you have on you? Oh, I, I do not have more than a couple of bobs, Rusty. But you are welcome to it. Here. A couple of bobs is no good to high-class guys like you and me. Hey, uh, let us go someplace where we can pick up a few pounds. I huh? have got to go home. I wish company. Yeah, but, Rusty... I hear there is a little dice game at Nathan Detroit's. You will accompany me. I gotta go home. I, I gotta put my blood pressure to bed. You do not like my company? Any other time I will be glad, but now I... Pretend it is some other time. Come on. The two bombs you've got will just get us a taxi to Nathan Detroit's place. <laughs> Maybe you are wondering why I am so anxious not to go with Rusty Charlie. Well, when I tell you that he once takes on Harry the Horse, Little Mitzi, and Angie the Ox all at one time, you will have more than somewhat of an idea how rough Rusty Charlie is. And there is bound to be excitement, not to mention trouble, wherever he goes. But one does not argue with Rusty when his mind is made up. So we find ourselves a little later at Nathan Detroit's place where a little game is in progress. We walk in, the citizens look up... Rusty Charlie! Well, now, why does everyone stop talking? Well, uh, to tell the truth, it is a little surprised to see you here, Rusty. Oh, you think I am in Philly, huh, Louis? Yes. I am not. Like you say, you are not. Hey, look, boys, do not let me disturb the proceedings. Proceed with them. Eh? Uh, yeah, Louis. Nothing. Go on with the game. The various citizens do not like this. In fact, several of them give us nasty looks. Harry the horse gives me one that raises my hat because he figures I steer Rusty Charlie to the game. I can feel my blood pressure pushing my veins out like inner tubes. And that is not all. The dice comes to Rusty Charlie, and I know he has no money. But he takes them, looks around, and the scene is as follows. Seems that the little cubes are now mine, huh? <laughs> sure they are, Rusty. Ah, uh, good. Uh, Louie, uh, give me your derby hat. Huh? My hat? What for? You ask too many questions. Just pass me the iron lid. Sure. Sure, Rusty. Thanks. Now, uh, any of you guys ever hear of peekaboo dice? Well? Uh, I, I never hear of it. 
And well, it is a very popular game in some quarters, and I will now teach it to you. What is it like, Rusty? I will show you. I, uh, I shake the dice like this. Then I toss them in a hat, so. <clears throat> see, catch on. We are not able to see the dice. That is why it is called peekaboo dice. I will now play for keeps. That way? You do not like it? Uh, sure. Sure. Anybody else who does not wish to learn this fascinating new game? <coughs> you say something, Edgy? I just clear my throat. Okay. Here I go. Sure. Go ahead. I will shoot a hundred bucks. I cannot put it on the line because I am holding the dice in one hand and the hat in the other. So you will have to trust me for a minute. <laughs> Is uh, that okay? Sure. Well, who fades me? Angie, fade me. Now look, right. That what? You're faded. Okay. <laughs> Here I go. Well, 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 now, what do you know about that? Uh, what do you throw, Rusty? The hard point, a big ten. It was not a seven or eleven? No, no, I guess I am not too lucky tonight. <laughs> but I tell you what, Louie. What? Since this ten is a very hard point to make, I will uh, take the odds of two to one. That is about right for a ten. Good. Put up a thousand against my five C's. Me? Put up a grand that Go you... ahead. Maybe I will not make it. But I... Go ahead. All right. Here. Here. Here I go. I draw five. Well, I will have to try again. <laughs> oh, I am having a tough time tonight. That is an eight. But I will try again. <laughs> A ten! A ten! I make a ten! You do? He makes a ten. Well, I pick up the money. <laughs> now I am tired of playing. Come on, Broadway, let us go. I, I, I think I will stay here a while, Rusty, and watch the game. The night is very young. Not for me. Old age is already caught up with me. Ah, that's a lot of bunk. Come on. Now that we got dough, we'll do the town. It's all on me. Uh, so long, boys. Goodbye, Broadway. Good luck, Broadway. Oh, Rusty. Yeah, Louie? About that ten that you make in my derby. What about that ten, Louie? I do not see the dice in the hat. <clears throat> I do not think I will have to worry about my blood pressure anymore. Because this is the last I will ever hear of my blood. Be quiet, Broadway. Uh, now, Louie. What about that ten? Well... I would just like to know, do you make it the hard way? Yeah, yeah, I throw two fives. I make it the hard way. Well, uh, see you around, boys. I feel my back crinkling up when I leave the room, because I think maybe somebody will take exception to Rusty Charlie's method of playing a dice. But we get to the street with our heads still on, and I think now I will leave him. I think wrong. The evening is still young, as he says. He is right. In fact, it is the longest evening I ever spend in my life. And how it ends is something I will tell you about in a minute. Now, back to the Damon Runyon Theater and the comic masterpiece, Blood Pressure. Well, like I say, we leave Nathan Detroit's place, and Rusty Charlie is 1,100 bobs better off than before. This, as you know, is due to a funny way he has of playing dice. So we stand on the street for a minute. Rusty is thinking. 
Then he looks up and says, How are you feeling now, Broadway? Oh, terrible. I feel like my blood is all gathered together on top of my eyes. Oh, that ain't good, is it? But as soon as I get some sleep and rest, it'll be all right, Doc Brennan says. You sure? What you need is a little quiet after that game upstairs. <laughs> okay. Rest and quiet it is. Oh, thanks, Rusty. Uh, for a very pleasant evening. Uh, I will now go home. Home? Well, that is what you say. I do not remember mentioning home. But the... it is only one o'clock in the morning. There will be a lot of noise around your hotel. That will not be good for you. I will put cotton in my ears. You will get an earache from that. No, I am worried about you because you have such a funny look on your face upstairs. <laughs> like you're scared. Who, <laughs> <For> me? <laughs> in fact, you still look pale. Hey, you must rest. Sure, sure. Good night. I will take you to Knife O'Halloran's Little Bohemian Club. Oh, no. Not there. Why not? You say I need rest and quiet. You will get it at Knife's place. At this time of the night, there is not much to do. Look, Rusty, last week two guys get bumped in there. There was always a fight. Well, not this time of the night. That is only when the rough citizens gather there. You and me will sit at a table... Just rest. Oh, Rusty, please. I gotta go home. Ah, there's a taxi. Hey, hey, taxi! Rusty, remember my blood pressure. I am thinking about it. Come on, get in. I do not wish to go. You will go. I need company. Little Bohemian Club, Bub. Yeah, and the name is Duke, not Bob. Okay, what do I care what your name is? Just get going. Do I not see you someplace before? Maybe. I've been places. Yeah, remember? Hey, I never forget a guy as big as you are. I used to fight for a living. I sure, heavyweight. Would have been champ. Only I broke my hand on a guy's head. I sure. Rusty, Rusty. What, bro? This guy is going too fast. He's doing 60. Yeah, I... yeah. Hey, you! Slow it down, will you? Hey, you hear me? <laughs> Slow it down! Well, what's the matter? Scared? Slow it down! <laughs> okay, hey, Duke, uh, this is when we get out. Huh? But you sent the Bohemian. I changed my mind. We get out here. Okay, Bob. Say, Duke, uh, maybe you do not hear my friend tell you to slow it up. Look, I got so many trips to make in a night. I got to make time. My friend here is very sick. He cannot stand excitement. And you are driving too fast. Go boil an egg. Hey, 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 let go. Rusty, look out. Brother, you asked for this? Yeah. Look at him. He is out like a light. He could never have been a champ. Falls too easy. What do you hit him with? Just with my fist. Now, when you look at where we are, there's not a camp in sight. How will we get to the little Bohemian Club? We will not, huh? Oh, we'll take this cab. Steal it? Borrow it. Come on. Hey, do you know that I once drive a cab for a living? Get in. But, but the cops will look for us. Broadway, get in. You cannot stand excitement. We must get you to Knife's place so that you can sit down where it is quiet. I will never forget that ride. Rusty drives faster than Duke and looks in only one direction, straight ahead. He tells me later that side street traffic makes him nervous and he does not like to look at it. Then he ditches the cab a block from the little Bohemian Club and we walk to the club and go in. <laughs> See, there is hardly anyone here. We will sit down and be quiet. The cops will trace that cab. So what? I do not steal it. It is right on the street. You have a funny way of looking at things. Do not worry about it in your condition. Just take it easy. Here, we will sit here. I want to go home. You must rest, Foist. I will never forgive myself if anything happens to your blood pressure. What else is there left to happen to it? Ah, this is the life, Broadway. I got 1,100 bobs in my pocket. We're sitting in a nice, cozy little club. And you are getting some color back in your face. You see it as cozy in here? Look how dim the lights are. Knife runs this place good. He knows what his customers are. Yes, he does. Now relax. Take it easy. You know, 
When I first see you tonight, I do not believe that story about your blood pressure. But since we are going around and about, I can see that you are telling the truth. It is sad to see one's friends go one by one. Please stop putting the lid down in my face. Why do you not shut your eyes and try to get some rest, huh? I will sit up with you. Well, we sit there. I am too weak to get up. But Rusty has a good time seeing his friends. There are only one or two fights that night, and Rusty says he keeps out of them because of my blood pressure. It gets later and later, and finally it is about five in the morning. It seems I fall asleep in the chair, and it is not until I feel Rusty shake in my arms that I look up, and the scene is as follows. Hey, Broadway, look. Come on in the door. Huh? Cops! You know, from the way they are looking around, I feel that they are looking for us. Us? Hmm. Rusty, remember, I asked you not to take that cab. I asked you not to come here. Broadway, it is not like you to desert a friend in need. Point one out to me. Do I let you stand at 48 in Broadway when I first see you? No, I feel sympathy for you because you are a sick man. I spend the whole night trying to cheer you up and make you forget that you are at death's door. And now... And now those cops are coming over here. Yeah. I will have to convince them that I am innocent. How? Stand up. Again, I ask. How? I do not intend to spend some time in a clink. Especially since I only borrowed a cab for a little ride. Stand up. We will face them together. I am able only to look up at them. Good morning, gentlemen. The fight does not last long because Rusty is pretty well limbered up due to the rest of the evening's activities. Before long, there are three gendarmes out of action. Rusty grabs me and carries me from the club, and it's not until we are a block away that he puts me down and says, Did you ever get you out of that real nice? Oh, thanks. Do not mention it. Now, I am going to do something else for you. Oh, no. Rusty, look, you do enough for me. I can ask no more of any fight. I am now going to take you home. Home? That beautiful word. But I, I am able to find my way home myself. I am going to take you to my home. You have a home? My wife will make us ham and eggs because it is now almost six o'clock and time for breakfast. You... You have a wife? Is there something strange about me having a wife? Uh, no, 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 of course not. Hey, will you meet a Broadway? Oh, you will be taken with her, like I was. Anyway, uh, how does ham and eggs and coffee sound to you? Anything will sound good to me. As long as it takes us in off of the streets. I never figured before that Rusty Charlie has a home, much less a wife. And I think what a wonderful life she must lead. Anyway, it is about a half an hour later that we get to the East 40s, and Rusty leads me to his house. It is very peculiar how all the people we meet there move to one side as Rusty goes past. Then we go upstairs, and Rusty unlocks the door. Staring in the room is a cute doll with red hair. She looks up as we look in, and the scene is as follows. Well, 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 Tootsie, I figured that you would be up and about. <laughs> yes, I'm up. You're awful late, Rusty. Oh, not for breakfast. <laughs> How about it, Tootsie? Oh, sure. And I wish you to meet a very good friend of mine, Tootsie. This is my dear companion, Broadway. Hey, Broadway, this is Tootsie. I am pleased to meet you, Mr. Broadway. How are you? I am fine. How are you? Well, that is what I am about to tell you, baby. Broadway is not a well man. No, I, I figure that putting on a cargo of your ham and eggs will do wonders, though. How about it? I'll have them ready in a jiffy. Sit down. You too, Broadway. Don't go away now. What do you think about Broadway? Oh, I think she's a very pretty doll. But a real small one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no more than five feet even. It is funny to think of you having such a small doll for a wife. Oh, we are very happy. Well, I started breakfast. Now you can both tell me where you went and what you did. 
I want to hear all about it. Yeah, well, Tootsie, uh, there I am, coming home early, and I am walking along when I run into my friend here. Uh, you know what he tells me? No. What does he tell you? He tells me that he is sick and is not going to live very long. So I figured that he needs cheering up. So we go around and about here and there. I see. He didn't die, did he? Oh, I think he looks a lot better than when we first start out. And he is a... Uh, uh, let's see. What, Rusty? Why are you holding one hand behind your back? Because I have something in it. For you and your friend. Rusty, is that a baseball bat? I thought I got rid of that. But you didn't, you big lummer. Now, baby, wait. Come look. home at six in the morning, huh? Look, I put that down, Rusty. It's too late. Bring company home for breakfast, well, huh? I... Tramp around all night and leave me at home, huh? Yeah, but... Expect me to smile when you put your big empty head in here, huh? Tootsie, be careful. I hate baby, you're heightening me. I told you the last time you pulled this trick, I'd teach you a lesson. Well... This is a lesson! Oh, 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 Tootsie, take it easy, will you? Hey, excitement is bad for my friend here. And you! Who, me? Yes, you! So you're the trombo that keeps my husband out until all hours. You're the trombo that drags him around to nightclubs, huh? Please, Tootsie, I am a sick man! Get out of here before I fix it so that you'll never be able to get sick again! Get out! Hey, Tootsie, wait! Shut up, you! Get out! Goodbye! Hey, it is nice meeting you! I get out the door and listen for a couple of seconds to what is going on inside. I figured that any minute I will see Mrs. Rusty Charlie come through the door without opening it. But nothing more happens, and I figure this is the end of the most horrible evening I ever spent. But it is not the last I hear of it, because the payoff comes later on that day. And I will tell you about it in a minute. <laughs> discovered that there is quite a knot on it from that baseball bat. So that afternoon, I go to Doc Brennan's again, and the scene is as follows. Mm-hmm. Quite a nasty bump, Broadway. How'd you get it? Just fix it up, Doc. Oh. All right, this may sting a little. Nothing can hurt me now. Okay, here we go. <laughs> the stuff stings, doesn't it? <laughs> Will the bump go down? You'll never know you had it in a couple of days. Uh, by the way, how are you feeling? As a matter of fact, Doc, I wish to speak to you about my blood pressure. Yeah, I it won't do it... any harm to check it again, just to make sure. Uh, roll up your sleeve and put out your arm like you did yesterday. You been taking it easy? Doc, I want to explain... Well, just relax. Now, get this on. I am afraid to look. Broadway, I told you something yesterday. I wish all my patients were as smart as you. What? Good night's rest, relaxation. That's what you needed. Blood pressure's down to normal. Uh, Ten dollars, please. And so ends the famous Damon Runyon story, Blood Pressure. Listen in again next week for... The Damon Runyon Theater. The Damon Runyon Theater with John Brown as Broadway is directed by Richard Sandville and the story is adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. Vern Carstensen is in charge of production. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, 
bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Gloria Swanson, William Holden, and Nancy Gates in Sunset Boulevard. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Sunset Boulevard, a busy thoroughfare in the heart of Hollywood, is far more typical of the motion picture capital than even Hollywood and Vine Streets. Here you will find the site of the first motion picture studio, the swank offices of the actor's agents, the night spots. And very far out, almost to the Pacific Ocean, the homes of the screen stars themselves. And this is where tonight's play takes place in the home of the famous but forgotten glamorous actress of the silent days. Recreating her original role is Gloria Swanson, one of the most glamorous women of silent uh, or talking pictures. Also playing his original role in this Paramount picture, which, by the way, received 11 nominations for Academy Awards, is that excellent actor William Holden and Nancy Gates, making her first appearance on our stage. Yes, Sunset Boulevard, with its many Lux girls traveling from studio to studio, is as representative of Hollywood as the Lux girls themselves. For in this capital of beauty, Lux toilet soap is a favorite complexion care. Now here's Sunset Boulevard, starring Gloria Swanson as Norma Desmond, William Holden as Joe Gillis, and Nancy Gates as Betty Schaefer, with John Wingraff as Max. <laughs> Twenty minutes ago, a murder was committed on Sunset Boulevard at one of those great big mansions between Hollywood and the beach. You're going to hear a lot about it because an old-time movie star is involved, one of the biggest. The police haven't arrived yet, but they're on their way, I guess. The victim's body is still floating in the swimming pool. Nobody important, really. Just a movie writer with a couple of B pictures to his credit. A poor dope. He always wanted a swimming pool. Well, he got the pool. Only the price turned out to be a little high. Let's go back about six months and find the day when it all started. Things had been pretty tough. I hadn't sold a story in months. But I knew a big shot over at Paramount who always seemed to have liked me. And the time had come to take advantage of it. He was a smart producer with a set of ulcers to prove it. All right, Gillis, you got five minutes. What's your story about? Well, it, it's about a baseball player, Mr. Sheldrake. No? The poor kid was once mixed up in a holdup, but mm -hmm. he, he's trying to go straight. I uh, I submitted an outline a while back. I imagine your story department's got a report on it. Baseball story, huh? Uh, yeah, with a real good gimmick at the end. You got a title? Bases loaded. And you got exactly the man for it right here on the lot, Alan Ladd. Be a great change of pace for him. Come in, come in. Hello, Mr. Sheldrake. Hello, on that basis loaded, I have a two-page synopsis. You may want to look at it. Oh, thank you. Personally, though, I wouldn't bother. Oh? What's wrong with it? It's from hunger. <clears throat> I'm sure you'll be very glad to meet Mr. Gillis. He wrote it. This is Miss Schaefer from the reading department. <laughs> right now, I wish I could crawl in a hole and pull it in after me. If I could be of any help, Miss Schaefer. I'm sorry, Mr. Gillis. I, I just didn't think it was any good. Just what kind of material do you recommend? James Joyce, Dostoevsky? Perhaps the reason I hated Bases Loaded is that I knew your name. I'd always heard that you had some talent. That was last year. This year I'm trying to pay the rent. That'll be all, Miss Sheva. Thank you very much. Goodbye, Mr. Gillis. Look, I, I don't want you to think I thought this was going to win any Academy Award, but I'm over a barrel, Mr. Sheldrake. I need a job. I haven't got a thing. Any kind of assignment. Additional dialogue. Rewrite. There's nothing. Honest. Mr. Sheldrake, well, could you... Could you let me have 300 bucks... It's for my car. They're after my car. I mean yourself as a personal loan. Could I? Gillis, last year somebody talked me into buying a ranch in the valley. So I borrowed the money from the bank to pay for the ranch. This year I had to mortgage the ranch so I could keep up my life insurance, so I could borrow on my insurance, so I could pay the bank. Then there's a little matter called income tax. Now, in case you don't... Well, that was that. I drove out of the parking lot. No place in particular. Just driving and trying to think things out. 
The time had come to wrap up the whole Hollywood deal and somehow get back to Ohio. I stopped for a traffic light. Behind me in the mirror, I saw a very familiar car. Two gentlemen from the friendly finance company. I jumped the light and stepped on the gas. I was on Sunset Boulevard now, heading toward the beach. Suddenly a tire blew out. There wasn't time to think twice. I turned off the road into a private driveway. I ducked behind some fancy shrubbery and waited. I was safe. The house was a great big white elephant of a place. The kind crazy movie people built in the crazy 20s. A neglected house gets an unhappy look. This one had it in spades. Dismal and damp looking. All grown over with some devouring sort of ivy. I started wondering how anyone could ever... You there! Why are you so late? Oh, I, uh... I beg your pardon, but I'm, uh... uh in here. Come in. I uh, just left my car in the driveway. I had a blowout. I thought maybe Go I... inside. Have him come up back. Wipe your feet. Go on. You're not properly dressed for the occasion. What occasion? Go up the stairs. Now, suppose you listen to me for just Madame, a minute. Madame, it's waiting. For me? Okay. If you need any help, call me. So I went up the staircase. It led to a huge bedroom. On a table covered with a Spanish shawl was a monkey. A dead monkey. I guess I just stood there staring. You should have been here hours ago. I put him there because he always liked to be near the fire. Well, I've made up my mind that he'll be buried in a garden. Uh, any city laws against that? Uh, I wouldn't know. I don't care anyway. I want the coffin to be white. I want it specially lined with satin. White. Or maybe deep pink. Now, I warn you, don't quote me a fancy price just because I'm rich. Look, you've got the wrong man, lady. I, I had some trouble with my car. I thought this place was empty. It is not. Get out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, excuse me, but I haven't I seen you before? Get out. You're Norma Desmond. You used to be in silent pictures. You used to be big. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. Yeah, I, I knew there was something wrong with them. They're dead. They're finished. There was a time when they had the eyes of the whole wide world, but that wasn't good enough for them. Oh, no. They had to have the ears of the world, too. So they opened their big mouths and out came talk. Talk. Yeah, well, that's where the popcorn business comes in. You buy yourself a bag and plug up your ears. Look at them in those front offices. The masterminds. They took the idols and smashed them. The Fairbanks is the Gilberts, the Valentinos. And who have you got now? Some nobody. Well, don't blame me. I'm not a producer, just a writer. You are. Writing words. Words. More words. Well, you've made a rope of words and strangled this business. Shh. You wake up the monkey. Get out. Max! Okay, okay, I'm going. Just a minute, you. A writer, you said. Well? Are you or aren't you? Oh, sure, sure. The last story I sold was about Okies and the Dust Bowl. But you'd never know because when it reached the screen, the whole thing played on a torpedo boat. I uh, happen to have written a script myself. It's the story of Salome. I, I think I'll have DeMille direct it. And you'll play Salome? Who else? Only asking. I, uh, I didn't know you were planning a comeback. I hate that word. It's a return. A return to the millions of people who have never forgiven me for deserting the screen. Fair enough. Salome. What a woman. What a part. The princess in love with a holy man. He rejects her, so she demands his head on a golden tray. Kissing his cold, dead lips. They'll love it in Pomona. <laughs> they love it every place. Read it. Read my manuscript. Read the scene just before she had him killed. Now, look, never let another writer read your material, Miss Desmond. He may steal it. I'm not afraid. Max! Yes, madame? The young man is staying for a while. Oh, get some champagne. So I started to read... Sometimes it's interesting just to see how bad, bad writing can be. This promised to go the limit. She sat in front of me, coiled up like a watch spring, defying me not to like what I read, or maybe begging me in her own proud way to like it. It meant so much to her. It was sure a cozy setup, 
that bundle of raw nerves and Max and the dead monkey. Later on, just for comedy relief, the real guy arrived with a little coffin. It was all done with great dignity. He must have been a very important chimp. It got to be evening. I was feeling a little sick at my stomach, what with the champagne and that tripe I'd been reading. By then, however, I'd started making up a little plot of my own. Well, well, you're not going to stop reading. This is fascinating. Of course it is. All it needs is maybe a little more dialogue. What for? I can say anything I want with my eyes. Well, it certainly could use a little editing. I will not have it butchered. Oh, of course not. Just a touch here and there. You can find somebody. Oh, I'd have to have somebody I could trust. Uh, when were you born? I mean, what sign of a zodiac? I don't know. What month? What date? Oh, December. December 21st. Sagittarius. I like Sagittarians. You can trust them. Thank you. I... I want you to do this work. Me? <laughs> oh, no, I'm busy. I, I've got a job. I don't care. And I'm pretty expensive. I get 500 a week. I wouldn't worry about money. I'll make it worth your while. Well, maybe I'd better take it home and look it over there. Oh, no. I won't let it out of my house. You'll... You'll have to work here. Well, it's getting kind of late. Are you married, mister? Uh, the name is Gillis, single. Where do you live? Hollywood. Aldo Nido Apartments. There's something wrong with your car, you said. There sure is. Why shouldn't you stay here? Uh, look, I'll come back tomorrow. Nonsense. There's a room over the garage. Max will take you there. Max? Max, come here. <laughs> I felt kind of pleased with the way I'd handled the situation. Sure, I'd work on a script. Meanwhile, my car would be safe, and the money prospects looked very good indeed. This garage room has not been used for a long time. Uh, I guess it's okay for one night. She's quite a character, isn't she? She was the greatest of them all. You wouldn't know. You're too young. In one week, she received 17,000 fan letters. Yeah. I sure turned into an interesting driveway. You did, sir. Good night, Mr. Gill. I pegged him as slightly cuckoo, too. A stroke, maybe. Come to think of it, the whole place seemed to have been stricken with a kind of creeping paralysis. Out of beat with the rest of the world, crumbling apart in slow motion. When I woke up the next morning, all my belongings were there. Suitcases, books, even my typewriter. I threw on some clothes and ran over to the house. Of course, your things are there. I brought them myself. Is that so? Well, who said you could? Who asked you to? I did. It seemed like a good idea if we are to work together. Well, there's nothing in the deal about my staying here. you like it here. Besides, you can't work in an apartment where you owe three months' rent. I'll take care of that. It's all taken care of. Max... Unpack Mr. Gillis' things. That's been done, madam. Well, pack them up again. I didn't say I was staying. Then suppose you make up your mind. Do you want this job or not? Yes, I wanted the job. I wanted the dough. But it wasn't so simple getting some coherence into those wild hallucinations she called a script. And what made it even tougher was that she was around all the time, hovering over me, afraid I'd do some injury to that precious brain child. Oh, just a scene I threw out. What scene? Well, the one where you go to the slave market. It's better to cut directly to John the Baptist. Cut away from me. Well, honestly, they don't want to see you in every scene. Don't they? Then why do they write me fan letters every day? Why do they beg me for my photographs? Why? Because they want to see me, me, Norma Desmond. Okay, okay. Put those pages back there where they belong. So I put them back. You don't yell at a sleepwalker. He may fall and break his neck. That was it. She was still sleepwalking along the giddy heights of a lost career, playing crazy when it came to that one subject, her celluloid self, the great Norma Desmond. It wasn't all work, of course. Sometimes there'd be little bridge games at the house, friends of hers, actors, dim figures you might still remember from silent pictures. I used to think of them as her waxworks, fragile and old. They'd come and they'd go, quietly like ghosts. They never spoke to me. 
I don't believe they even asked her who I was. On other nights, Max would operate a motion picture machine. We'd see a movie right in her living room. A silent movie. I guess I don't have to tell you who the star was. They were always her pictures. That's all she wanted to see. Still wonderful, isn't it? And no dialogue. We didn't need dialogue. We had faces. Oh, those idiot producers. Those imbeciles. Haven't they got any eyes? Have they forgotten what a star looks like? I'll show them. I'll be up there again, so help me. One morning, Max came in with bad news for me. The men from the finance company had paid us a visit. They'd found my car and towed it away. Don't be ridiculous, Joe. They took your car. It's not a matter of life and death. Well, it is to me. That's why I took this job. Now you're being silly. We don't need two cars. We have a car. And not one of those cheap new things made of chromium and spit. Misada Fischini. Have you ever heard of a Misada Fischini? All handmade. Cost me $28,000. So Max got the old bus down off its blocks and polished it up again. It was upholstered in leopard skin and had one of those car forms, gold plated. That's a dreadful shirt you're wearing, Joe. Yeah? What's wrong with it? Nothing. You should work in a filling station. And I'm getting rather bored with that same sport jacket and the same baggy pants. Max? Yes, my love? Take us to a good men's shop in town. The very best. Take us there now. But I don't need any clothes, and I certainly don't want you buying them for Why me. begrudge me a little fun? I just want you to look nice. And, uh, must you chew gum? Last week in December, the rains came. It came right through the old roof of my room over the garage. So she had Max move me into the main house. I didn't much like the idea, but it was better than sleeping in a raincoat and galoshes. You should be quite comfortable here, Mr. Gilly. Uh-huh. Whose room uh, was this? It was the room of the husband, or the husband's, I should say. Madame has been married three times. Yeah. Hey, what's the matter with the door? There isn't any lock. There are no locks anywhere in this house, sir. How come? Madame has had some moment of melancholy. There have been some attempts at suicide. Oh, we have to be very careful. No sleeping pills, no razor blades. We turned off the gas in Madame's bedroom. Why? Her career? She got enough out of it. She's not forgotten. She still gets those fan letters. Those letters? I would not look too closely at the postmarks. You send them. Is that it, Max? I'd better press your evening clothes, sir. Mr. Gillis has not forgotten Madame New Year's Eve. No. No, I hadn't forgotten the party. I dreaded it. But I was curious as to who would be there. I heard voices. Max ushering in the orchestra. A little later on, they started to play. I went downstairs. This was the night I was to find out how she felt about me. I'd been an idiot not to have sensed it coming. That sad, embarrassing revelation. She was dancing alone, a tango. And then she saw me and came over to the foot of the stairs. of Sunset Boulevard, starring Gloria Swanson as Norma Desmond, William Holden as Joe, and Nancy Gates as Betty. If there had been any hope of ducking that New Year's Eve party, believe me, I wouldn't have been there. As it was, I had put on that dinner jacket from the best shop in town and went downstairs. Oh, you look absolutely divine. Turn around. Oh, please. Come on. Perfect. Wonderful shoulders. And I love that line. Oh, it's all padding. Don't let it fool you. <laughs> Cute. You know, this floor used to be wood, but I had it changed. Valentina said there's nothing like tile for a tongue, though. 
You tango, don't you? Not on the same floor with Valentino. Norma, it's uh, it's late. What time are they supposed to get here? Who? The other guests. There are no other guests. This is for you and me, Joe. Oh? Hold me tighter. Okay. You think this is all very funny? <laughs> A little. Be patient, Joe. You think it's nice. Not funny. You think it's very nice. So we danced. Norma Desmond and I, in a room big enough for a softball game, to the music of a 20-piece orchestra. What a wonderful year it's going to be, Joe. What fun we'll have. I'll fill my pool for you. I'll open my house from Malibu and have the whole ocean. And when our picture's finished, I'll buy you a boat and we'll sail to Honolulu. Oh, stop it. You're not going to buy me anything anymore. Don't be silly. I'm rich, Joe. I'm richer than all this new Hollywood trash. I've got a million dollars. Keep it. I own three blocks downtown. I've got oil and bakery fuel. Pumping, pumping, pumping. What's it for? But to buy us anything we want. Cut out that us business. What's the matter with you? Has it ever occurred to you that I may have a life of my own, that there may be some girl that I'm crazy about? Who? Some car hop? Some dress extra from central casting? What I'm trying to say is that I'm all wrong for you. You want a Valentino, somebody with polo ponies, a big shot. What you're trying to say is you don't want me to love you, is that it? Well, sing it. Sing it. She left the room and rushed upstairs, and the orchestra kept playing. Well, I'd had enough. I grabbed my coat and left. I thought about a friend of mine, Artie Green, an assistant director. There was bound to be a New Year's shindig going on in his apartment. I walked down to the boulevard and hitched a ride into town. Well, what do you know, Joe Gillis? Hi, Artie. Where you been? I dropped by your place a couple of weeks ago on the land. Well, I, I, I moved out to a deep freeze. Oh, uh, look, I'll give you a full report later. Uh, meantime, could I uh, stick around here for a while? Oh, this will go on all night. No, I mean, uh, could you put me up for a week or so? Well, sure, Joe, sure. Just stand by, kid. I'll get you a drink. Hello, Mr. Gillis. Oh, hello. Any shape, remember? Joe Drake's office. Oh, yes. I've been hoping I'd run into you, Mr. Gillis. What for? To recover that night you stuck in my back? Well, I did feel a little guilty. So I got out some of your old stories. Why, you sweet kid. Please, I, I would like to talk to you. Come on, let's, let's go in the kitchen. I didn't pay much attention to what Betty was trying to tell me. Too much noise, too many people having a good time. But suddenly I knew I was feeling good again and that she was part of that feeling. I told her to wait for me. I'd be right back. I had to make a phone call. I'm sorry, Mr. Gillis, but I cannot talk to you now. Yes, you can. Now, look, Max, I want you to get out my old suitcase and pack all of my... I old... have no time to do anything now. The doctor is here. Doctor? What's going on? Madame Good. The ray is up from your room, and she cut the ray. Max. Max. Hello, Max. Hey. Hey, Joe, where are you going? What did you do to him, honey? Scare him or something? Who is he talking to, Artie? Why would he leave like that? I don't know. How do you like that guy? Thank you for coming back, Mr. Gillis. How is she? The doctor says she will be all right. Be careful, Mr. Gillis. Be careful what you say to her. Norma. Go away. Don't look at me. Go away and let me alone. What kind of a silly thing was that to do? To fall in love with you. That was the idiotic thing. It sure would have made attractive headlines. Great star kills herself for unknown writer. Great stars and great pride. Go away. Go back to that girl of yours. Look, I... I was making that up because I thought the whole thing was a mistake. I didn't want to hurt you. You've been good to me, Norma. 
you're the only person in this stinking town who has been good to me. Then why don't you just say thank you? Just get out. Not until you promise to act like a sensible human being. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. Norma. Happy New Year, Norma. By the following day, if it hadn't been for her bandaged wrists, no one would have dreamed that here was a woman who tried to kill herself. Immediately, Max, immediately. Take the script over to Paramount and be sure you deliver it to Mr. DeMille in person. Very good, madam. You're really going to send it to DeMille? Well, this is the day. This is the day, Joe. Look, here's a chart from my astrologer. She's read the Mills horoscope. She's read mine. Did she read the script? <laughs> Norma, scripts don't sell on astrologers' charts. But, darling, I'm not just selling the script. I'm selling me. DeMille always said I was his greatest star. When did he say it, Norma? Well, all right. It was quite a few years ago. But the point is, I, I never looked better in my life. You know why? Because I've never been as happy in my life. Now hurry, Max, hurry! It's for you, madame. The telephone. Paramount is calling. Now, do you believe me, Joe? Paramount is calling. I told you the mill would jump at my story. It's not Mr. DeMille in person, madame. Someone by the name of Gordon Cole... He says it is very important. Certainly it's important. The very idea of having some assistant call me. Say that I'm busy and hang up. Very good, my name. How do you like that? We made 12 pictures together. His greatest successes. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's shooting. <laughs> I know that trick. He's trying to belittle me. He's trying to get my price down. I've waited 20 years for this call. Now DeMille can wait until I'm scored. About three days later, she was good and ready. Incredible as it may seem, there had been more of those urgent calls from Paramount. So she put on a half a pound of makeup, fixed it up with a veil, and set forth to see the mill in person. Joe, are you sure you don't want to see Mr. DeMille with me, dear? No, I'll wait outside. It's your script, Norma. It's your show. Good luck. Thank you, darling. Uh, Max, what are we waiting for? The gate, madame. All that noise, will you please? To see Mr. DeMille. Open the gate. Mr. DeMille is shooting. Have you got an appointment? No appointment necessary. I'm bringing Norma Desmond. Norma who? Norma Desmond. Jonesy, it is you, Jonesy. What? I'm Miss Desmond. Oh, how have you been, Miss Desmond? Just tell that officer to open the gate. Sure, Miss Desmond. Okay, Mac, open it up. Yeah, they can't drive on the lot without a pass. Miss Desmond can. Open it up. Where is Mr. DeMille shooting, Jonesy? Page 18, Miss Desmond. Thank you, Jonesy. And teach your young friend some manners. Tell him without me, he wouldn't have any job. Because without me, there wouldn't be any Paramount studio. Max, page 18. It wasn't possible. How could a man of DeMille's intelligence see even a glimmer of hope in a script as bad as the one she'd sent him? But he came out of the sound stage and put his arms around her and then led her into his head. Mr. Gillis, the extra, the electrician, they fall all over each other just to get a look at her. You see that row of offices? That used to be Madame's dressing room. The whole row. Oh, that didn't leave much for Wallace Reed. Oh, oh, that sign over there, Max, Reader's Department, it reminds me, I, I want to look up somebody. I'll be back in a few minutes. Well, for heaven's sake, come on in, have a chair. Hello, Betty. I just thought I'd tell you that if you still think there's anything in that story of mine, go ahead, take it, it's all yours. Why? Well, it's no good to me. Help yourself. I mean it. That doesn't make sense. Besides, I'm just not good enough to do it by myself. Well, what about all those ideas you had? You don't even know what they are. Maybe they aren't any good. Oh, look, Joe, please, if, if you're busy, maybe... Well, maybe we could work evenings or, or even six o'clock in the morning. Artie would just love that. No, for the next month, Artie won't mind at all. He's out of town. Incidentally, we're engaged. Oh? Huh. Well, good for you. You, you couldn't find a nicer guy. 
That's what I think. Anyway, he's on location in Arizona, so I'm free every evening and every weekend. Look, Betty, it can't be done. It's out now. Now stop being chicken-hearted and write that story. And don't make it too dreary. Get a few laughs in it. So long, Betty. Good luck. How oh, honest to goodness. I, I hate you. As I walked back to the car, I saw someone talking to Max. He was just leaving. Then Max turned to me and looked at me helplessly. What's the matter? That man, one of the mill's assistants. Well, the reason for all those telephone calls to Madame, it was not the mill. It was the property department who called. Property department? The car. They saw the car when I brought the script here. They want to rent the car for a Bing Crosby picture. <laughs> and the mill's going to tell her that? He will know what to tell her. He remembers her. He will not break her heart. Take it easy. She's coming. You see? Look at her. Look at her. She's radiant. Well, how'd it go? Oh, it couldn't have gone better. It's practically set. Of course, he has to finish this picture first. It's a circus picture. But I'm next. I'm sure I'm next. <laughs> he said nothing would please him more than, than to work with me again. Norma. Oh, it's, it's nothing. I, I just didn't realize what it would be like to come back to the old studio. <sighs> oh, what are you waiting for, Max? Forgive me, Mother. Your arm, Mother. After that, an army of beauty experts invaded the house. She went through a merciless series of treatments like an athlete training for the Olympic Games. She went to bed every night at nine. She was absolutely determined to be ready. Ready for those cameras that would never turn. Joe, darling, are you, are you there? Uh, yes, Norma. Oh, don't turn around. Keep your eyes on the book. I, uh, I just came down to say goodnight. I, I don't want you to see me. I'm, I'm not very attractive at the moment. All right, good No, I, I lost... A pound and a half since Tuesday. Good. Uh, you were going to read all night? Oh, for a while. You went out last night, didn't you, Joe? I, uh, I went for a walk. No, you didn't. You took the car. It's all right, it's... It's just that I don't want to be left alone. Not while I'm under this terrible strain. All I ask is for you to be a little patient and a little kind. Norma, I haven't done anything. Of course that... you haven't. I wouldn't let you... Good night, darling. Yes, she was right. I was playing hooky every night. That story of mine that Betty Schaefer had dug up kept going through my head like a locomotive. I'd phoned her, and we'd started working on it, just the two of us in her office, nights when the studio was deserted. And sometimes when we got stuck, we'd walk around the lot, just wandering down alleys between the sound stages or through the sets they were getting ready for the next day's shooting. It was on one of those walks that Betty first told me about her nose. So naturally, my family expected me to become a great star. Anyway, the studio made a test, but uh, they didn't like my nose. It slanted a little. Oh, they're crazy. Oh, no, they're not. So I went to a doctor and had it fixed. Then they gave me another test. This time they were crazy about my nose, but they didn't like my acting. That's the saddest thing I ever heard. <laughs> oh, not at all. It, it really taught me a little sense. So I got a job in the mailroom, then stenographic, and now I'm a reader. Three cheers for Betty Schaefer. I will now kiss her nose. If you please. May I say that you smell real special? Must be on your shampoo. No. No, that's not shampoo. It's more like freshly laundered linen handkerchiefs. And may I suggest that if we're ever to finish our story, you stay at least two feet away from me at all times. Now let's walk back to your office. It was long past midnight when I got back to the house. Max was waiting for me in the patio. Mr. Gillis, you must be very careful. Madame may be watching. Mr. Gillis, 
I'm not inquiring where you go every night. Well, why don't you? I'm writing a script, and I, I'm going to finish it. It is just that I am greatly worried about Madame. You're not helping her any, feeding her lies and more lies. What happens when she finds out there isn't going to be any picture? She will never find out. That's my job. It's been my job for a long time. I made Norma Desmond a star, and I cannot let her be destroyed. You made her a star. I discovered her. I directed all her early films. And she's turned you into a servant. It was I who asked to come back. Humiliating as that may seem. You see, I was her first husband. The following night, as usual, I was in Betty's office. Betty was strangely quiet. It wasn't like her. Something had happened. Sorry, Joe. I don't want to talk about it. Oh, is it about me? What have you heard? No, no. It's Artie. He, he sent me a telegram. Oh, anything wrong? He wants me to come on to Arizona, Joe. He said it only, only cost $2 to get married there. Why don't you? Well, stop crying, will you? You're, you're getting married. That's what you wanted. I don't want it now. Why not? Don't you love Artie? Of course I love him. I always will. I'm not in love with him anymore, that's all. What happened? You did? Oh, Joe. Joe. She'd been a fool not to sense there was something phony in my setup. And I'd been a heel not to have told her. But you just can't say those things to somebody you're crazy about. Maybe I'd never have to. Maybe I could get away with it. Get away from Norma. Maybe I could wipe the whole nasty mess right out of my life. As soon as I got back to that peculiar prison of mine, I went to Norma's room. The door was closed. But I could hear her talking. It's you for calling you, Miss Stoneleg Mashifa. But I really feel it's my duty... Never mind who I am. You don't know, Mr. Gillis. Exactly how much do you know about him? Do you know where he lives? Do you know how he lives? Miss Schaefer, I'm trying to spare you a great deal of misery. Very well, then. Ask him. Ask him. Give me that phone. No, don't. No. Give it to me. That's right, Betty. Ask me. Or better yet, why don't you come out and see for yourself? The address is 10,086 Sunset Boulevard. Don't hate me, Joe. Don't hate me. I found a script in your room. Your name was on it. Your name and hers. I called her up because I need you. I need you as I never needed you before. Oh, look at me. Look at my hands. Look at my face. Look under my eyes. How can I go back to my work if I'm wasting away under this torment? You don't know what I've been through these last week. I bought myself a revolver. I did. I did. I stood in front of that mirror, but I couldn't make myself do it. Don't just stand there hating me. Shoot at me. Strike me, but don't hate me. Oh, no, no. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> going to do. Over and over, she kept repeating those words, sobbing, hysterical. I left the room and went out of doors. I kept walking around. And then I saw some headlights and a car turned into the driveway. Betty had come. Joe, what is it? What's wrong? I didn't know what to do, so I jumped in the car. Come on in. Come on in the house, Betty. I don't know why I'm scared, Joe. It's something awful. Take a look around, Betty. Ever been in one of these old Hollywood palazzos? They built them like this when they were making 18000 a week and no taxes. You live here, Joe? You bet. Whose house is it? Whose? Well, there are a hundred photographs of her in that one room. If you don't remember the face, you must have heard the name. Norma Desmond? 
Why did she call me? Did you ever see so much junk? She had the ceiling brought all the way over from Portugal. Uh, and look at this. Joe, what about Norma Desmond? That's what I'm trying to tell you. This is an enormous place. It's lonely here. So she got herself a companion. Very simple setup. An older woman who's well-to-do. A younger man who's not doing too well. Can you figure it out yourself? No. All right, I'll give you a few more clues. No. No, I haven't heard any of this. She never called me and I've never been in this house. Now get your things together and let's get out of here. All my things? My 18 suits, my custom-made shoes, the six dozen shirts, the cuff links and the platinum keychains and cigarette cases? Come on, Joe. Come on where? Back to a one-room apartment I can't pay the rent for? Back to a story that may sell and very possibly may not? If you love me, Joe. Look, sweetie, be practical. I like it here. Maybe it's not very admirable. Well, you and Artie can be admirable. I can't look at you anymore, Joe. How about looking for the exit, then? This way. Good luck to you, Betty. You can finish that script on your way to Arizona. And uh, when you and Artie get back, if the two of you ever feel like taking a swim, there's a pool out there. Italian marble and soft-colored lights. Thank you, darling. Thank you, Joe. Get out of my way. I'm leaving, Norma. Joe, don't move. You can't leave me. You can't. I said I'm leaving. No, you're not. Thanks for letting me wear the handsome wardrobe, and thanks for the use of all the trinkets. The jewelry's all in the top drawer. It's yours, Joe. I, I gave it to you. And I'd take it in a second. Only it's a little too dressy for Dayton, Ohio. What I gave you is nothing. You can have anything you want. What is it you want? Money. You'd be throwing it away, Norma. I don't qualify for the job. Not anymore. You can't go. Max, Max! I can't face life without you. And you know I'm not afraid to die. That's between you and yourself. You think I made that up about the gun, don't you? All right, see, I do have a gun. I suppose you don't think I have a courage. Oh, sure, sure. You don't. If it would make a good scene. You don't care, do you? Well, hundreds of thousands of people... Oh, wake up, Norma. You'd be killing yourself to an empty house. The audience left 20 years ago. Now face it. That's a lie. They still want me. No, they don't. What about the studio? What about the mill? He couldn't hurt you. He couldn't hurt anyone. The mill was trying to spare your feelings. The studio only wanted to rent your car. Wanted? What? The mill didn't have the heart to tell you. None of us had the heart. Come on in, Max. Go on, tell her. It's a lie. They want me. I get letters every day. Do her that favor, Max. Tell her there isn't going to be any picture. There aren't any fan letters except the ones you write. Max! That isn't true! Madame is still the greatest star of them all. I'll take Mr. Guinness back to the car. You heard him. I'm a star. Norma, you're a woman of 50. Now grow up. There's nothing tragic about being 50, not unless you try to be 25. I'm the greatest star of them all. Goodbye, Norma. No one ever leaves. I left her standing there. I grabbed my coat and started out. She kept calling me. No, no, no! I could hear her running after me. No, no! I was out of the house now. The air suddenly felt fresh again, clean. I started across the patio. She called to me once again. No! But I didn't stop. I kept on going. Suddenly, it was a great effort to keep on walking. I was alongside the pool now, and if I could only... Well, this is just about where you came in. Back at that pool again. The one I always wanted. Only now the place is crawling with people. The police, detectives, reporters, photographers... They took pictures of me in the pool, and they took pictures of me out of the pool. They were very careful with me. Gentle. It's funny how gentle people get with you once you're dead. Well, the newsreel guys are roaring in now. Here's an item everybody can have some fun with. The heartless so-and-sos. What would they do to Norma? Even if she gets away with it in court, crime of passion, temporary insanity, the headlines are going to kill her. 
forgotten star, a slayer, aging actress, yesterday's glamour queen. They're talking to her now up in the house, the boys from Homicide. They found her upstairs, sitting at her dressing table, arranging her hair. Won't talk, Captain. State of shock, I guess. Miss Desmond, please. You don't deny having killed that man. Just answer us yes or no. Did you intend to kill him? Who is he? Where did you first meet him? Where does he come from? Newsreel men are here with the cameras, Captain. Tell him to go fire a kite. This is no time for cameras. Miss Desmond, is there anything at all you want to tell us? Cameras? Is that cameras? What is it, Max? The cameras have arrived, madam. They have. Tell Mr. DeMille I'll be on the set at once. What is this? It's one way to get her downstairs, isn't it? Okay. Have the car right outside. Everything will be ready, madam. Thank you, Max. You'll pardon me, gentlemen, but I, I must get ready for my scene. Hey, the cameramen were at the foot of the stairs. A dozen reporters firing questions, but Max didn't even bother to look at them. It was the cameras he was interested in. Quiet, everybody! Miss Desmond is coming. Max. Turn up the light. Are you ready, Norma? What is the scene? Where am I? This is the staircase of the palace. Oh, yes. Yes. Down below. They are waiting for the princess. I'm ready. All right. Come out. Action. So they were turning after all. Those cameras... Life, which can be strangely merciful, had taken pity on Norma Desmond. She came down the stairs. They were not policemen. They were not photographers or reporters or just the morbidly curious. To Norma, they were her public, her fans. And she was back again, working with the mill. I can't go on with the scene. I'm too happy. Mr. DeMille, do you mind if I say a few words? Thank you. I just want to tell you all how happy I am to be back in the studio, making a picture again. You don't know how much I've missed all of you. And I promise you I'll never desert you again. Because after Salome, you will make another picture and another picture. You see, this is my life. It always will be. There'll be nothing. And the cameras and those wonderful people out there in the dark. All right, Mr. DeMille. I'm ready for my close-up. Mr. Keeley will tell you about next week's show. But first, here's Libby Collins with a very exciting question. Who is the lovely Lux girl? Oh, you mean who is the mystery star in the big Lux girl contest? That's it. The lovely Hollywood star with her eyes masked out. Her pictures appearing in newspapers everywhere. On posters and grocery stores all over the country. Give our listeners a clue, Libby, to help identify her. Right. Our Lux mystery girl is the star of metro goldwyn Mayer's Too Young to Kiss. That makes it easy for everyone to identify her and to enter this wonderful Lux contest. The prizes, John, are simply wonderful. Why, the first prize is $5,000 cash plus a Ford Victoria sedan. And there are ten more Ford Victoria sedans to be given away. And 214 karat gold diamond boulevard watches. Plus $10,000 in additional cash prizes. Over $60,000 worth of prizes. And everyone easy to win. Besides, it's really fun to enter the contest. First, you identify the mystery star. Then, complete the last line of a jingle. Now, here's the jingle. June is her name. The last is da-da-da. That's where you fill in the star's name. I'll repeat it. June is her name. The last is da-da-da. Her lovely skin's beyond comparison. Her beauty soaps the one for me. Da-dee, 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 da-dee. Everyone knows lots of nice things about Lux Soap to help write that last line. Yes, for instance, Lux Soap has active lather, rich, creamy lather that cleanses gently but thoroughly, leaves skin softer, smoother. It's a firm white cake with a delicate flower-like fragrance. Comes in a generous big bath size, too. Nine out of ten screen stars are Lux Girls. So go ahead, enter this big Who is the Lovely Lux Girl contest right away. 
Get the entry blank at your grocer's tomorrow. The picture of the star to be identified, the jingle, the rules, and the address are all on the blank. Send in as many entries as you wish, but with each entry, attach two Lux Toilet Soap wrappers, either regular or bath size. The contest closes October 15th, so start now. Get your entry in right away. Just think, $60,000 worth of prizes, over 1,200 opportunities for you to win. And now, here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And we want them to come forward for a well-deserved curtain call. Gloria Swanson, William Holden, and Nancy Gates. It gives me to welcome you to the Lux Radio Theater. Thank you very much, Bill Keeley. Uh, Gloria, I understand that you're leaving town tomorrow to attend a big fashion show in the East. That's right, Bill. I've designed a lot of clothes for the show, and I'm delighted over my new creation. Well, we're delighted that you could make our Lux Radio show. Gloria, with all your activities, motion pictures, stage, your radio and television shows, dress designing, manufacturing... Now, Bill, that's enough about me. What about Nancy Gates? Me? Well, I, I just recently signed with the studio, Miss Swanson. And I do think I'm very fortunate to start off as a member of Paramount's Golden Circle. You sure are, Nancy. I was a member of the original Golden Circle players, and it was one of the best breaks of my career. Well, Bill, I, I think the Golden Circle is filled with very talented young people. And, of course, all the girls would like to be a glamorous star like you, Miss Swanson. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Thank you. And now, what about Bill? What have you been doing recently? <laughs> well, I just finished a picture at Paramount with Nancy Olson and Bill Bendix called Submarine Command. A submarine commander? That's something I haven't done. <laughs> The picture I just finished, three, four bedroom C, is all about a stage but attractive scientist and motion picture star. He knows everything about atomic radiation and nothing about the warm human chemical radiation that takes place between uh, the male and uh, the female. <laughs> he learns. Yes, indeed. <laughs> he learns. <laughs> You're just the one to teach him. <laughs> Sounds like a real comedy hit. And speaking of hits, Gloria, a Lux Soap is a real hit with everyone. Well, now, that's not new, Bill. For a long time, we screen actresses have depended on Lux Toilet Soap. That's right, Miss Swanson. And we hope to be screen actresses wouldn't think of missing our Lux Soap facial. And I don't want to miss the announcement of next week's show, Bill. Uh, next week, we'll have a salute to the motion picture industry. We call it Movie Time USA. And we'll present scenes from seven important new productions with 15 of our top stars. They will be Mary Alden, Anne Blythe, Leslie Caron, Claudette Colbert, Gary Cooper, Wendell Corey, Bing Crosby, Dan Daly, John Derrick, Joanne Drew, Jean Kelly, Vera Ralston, Donna Reed, Forrest Tucker, and Jane Wyman. Oh! Just a little, just a little something they whipped up. <laughs> Whoa, that's going to be a great, great, super great show, Bill. Now I must say good night. We'll all be listening. Good night and all our best wishes. There we are. Thank you so much for bringing us home. Not at all, Lady Ford. Hope you enjoyed the party. Oh, my wife and I did very much, yes. Good night. Good night, Sir Clifford. Good night, Lady Fall. Good night. Most kind of you to give us a lift. A pleasure. <laughs> that was a very nice party. Yes. Uh, I didn't realize it was so late. It's two o'clock. There's no light in Cynthia's room. No, oh, she'll have gone to bed hours ago. <sighs> I'm tired. We're getting too old for these late nights. <laughs> you go up to bed. I'll bring some hot milk. Thank you, dear. The funny smell of gas. Yes, it's gas, all right. Someone must have left a gas tap on in the kitchen. Uh, I'll go and see. Uh, don't worry, dear. I joke. There is a strong smell. Gosh, it's overpowering. Where's the switch? What the hell? Don't send ya! Send ya! BBC.
NBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Blackmailer. Sir Clifford Forbes, Inspector. Oh, good morning, Sir Clifford. Thank you, Sergeant. Oh, it's, uh, it's very good of you to see me, Inspector Hood. Do you mind if I smoke my pipe? Of course not. Now, just begin wherever you like and see if we can help you. Well, as you know, Inspector, my wife and I and our daughter live in Winchester. Our daughter, Cynthia, is barely 19. She's our only child. Well, last summer we took her to Spain. Cynthia met a Count Raymond Alvaro. They fell in love and became engaged to be married. He travels between Madrid and London frequently and has been to our home two or three times. When do they propose to get married? Uh, in the autumn. I understand, sir. About two weeks ago, Cynthia came to London to go to a rather special party with her fiancé. Since her return, she's been a completely different girl. Different, Sir Clifford? It was as if she was terrified of something. My wife and I got nowhere with her. And then a couple of nights ago, we'd been out to dinner, we came back and I found Cynthia with her head in the gas oven. I was just in time to save her. The well, next day, she tried to gas herself again. The doctor got her into a nursing home where she's under constant watch so that she can't do herself any harm. Of course, I realize, of course, that an attempt to commit suicide is an offense. Oh, no need to worry about that, Sir Clifford. It wouldn't be our job in a case like this to aggravate the situation. We'd want to try and help. Thank you. If we can, and that's the problem. Your object in coming to Scotland Yard is to see if we can find out what's at the back of your daughter's attempts on her own life. My wife and I and the doctor have talked it over, and it's quite obvious since they will never tell us what's wrong. It would appear from what you say that it's linked up with this visit to London. She was perfectly all right when she went, but she was a different person when she came back. Well, I'm afraid, Sir Clifford, I don't see what action we can take. But there must be something responsible for our daughter's state of mind. But it isn't a police matter. So far as we're concerned, she's receiving proper care and attention in the nursing home. The danger of her taking her life is diminished. And when she recovers, she'll leave the nursing home and that'll be that. But can't you investigate what's behind it all? Well, how could we? To start with, we should have to question your daughter. Which, if she let us do so, might only succeed in aggravating her condition without achieving any results. I see. Uh, Sir Clifford, if later you would discover something which you felt we could act upon, uh, please communicate with me again. All right. I'm afraid I've just wasted your time. No, no, no. Please don't think that. I only wish there's something we could do. It's dreadful to feel so helpless. Yes, I really am very sorry. Just a minute, Sir Clifford. What is it? It's just occurred to me that I could put you on to someone who might be able to help you. Who, Inspector? Well, he's a personal friend of mine, as a matter of fact. Perhaps you may have heard of him. His name is Dr. Morell. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sir Clifford Forbes. I have an appointment with Dr. Morell. Oh, yes, Sir Clifford. Uh, Inspector Hood rang up this morning about you, didn't he? Yeah. It's very good of Dr. Morell to see me at such short notice. <laughs> I know. If you'll come this way... As Inspector Hood has pointed out to you, Sir Clifford, it would appear evident that your daughter's present condition is in some way connected with her visit to London. Well, that seems to be the case, Dr. Morell. Was she looking forward to the visit? Very much. It was the first time she'd been on her own. In fact, my wife would prefer to have gone with her. Why didn't she? Well, after all, Cynthia's no longer a child. Besides, she'd be in the company of Raymond, her fiancé. Count Alvaro? Yes. She stayed at Christie's Hotel. Uh, yes, they know us. We always stay there whenever we come up to London. Where is Count Alvaro now? In Madrid. He's due to return to London any day. Did he know of your daughter's illness? Uh, no. They've been writing to each other and she received a letter the morning of her first attempt to gas herself. Did you read that letter? My wife did. She doesn't usually open her daughter's correspondence, of course. But in this case, we thought it might have something to do with what had happened. But there was nothing? No, it was the sort of letter one might expect. Very affectionate, a love letter. It's one of our worries. What is going to be Raymond's reaction to this dreadful business? Doubtless that's worrying your daughter, too. They're deeply in love with each other. He, he'll have to know, I suppose. Well, if he's deeply in love with her, that shouldn't affect the situation. I don't know. He's most sympathetic and understanding, but he comes from a very distinguished family. 
He may feel obliged to reconsider whether under these unhappy circumstances he should go through with the marriage. Did your daughter discuss her visit on her return home? Oh, hardly at all. That was what made us realize something was wrong. How long did she stay in London? She went away on the Friday and returned late uh, Monday evening. The object of the visit was to attend this big party with Count Alvaro? That was to be on the Saturday night. Uh -huh. She was going to a theater with him as well and visiting some of his friends. Uh, he had to return to Spain on Monday morning early. That was why Cynthia came back by herself. So far as you know, uh, she was in his company most of the time when, of course, he would have looked after her. We're pretty sure of that. He's most kind and thoughtful. She's about ten years older than Cynthia, and I think that was why she fell in love with him, because he's so reliable. It would appear that whatever it was upset your daughter and set in train these unhappy events transpired when she was alone. I suppose so. Mm -hmm. We can't very well get in touch with him without giving away what's happened. Where does he live when he's in London? Well, he's got a flat in Cavendish Street. Uh, you would describe him as a man of wealth? Oh, yes. His family are very rich. He travels a lot. My secretary, Miss Frail, had better come in and take notes of everything you can remember relating to your daughter's stay in London. Uh, very well. Any detail that you can recall may have some significance. I'll get Miss Frail now. Oh, five o'clock and still mass is to be done. Well, I, I've got all the notes, Dr. Morell. Thank you, Miss Frail. Sir Clifford Forbes talked at length, but the only useful information we seem to have is the hotel where his daughter stayed. That may well prove a source of information. I hope so. I also have this snapshot of the young woman and her husband to be. Oh. Mm. She's very pretty. Though a little insipid, don't you think? He's attractive in that dark Spanish way. Shouldn't have thought she'd have been his type at all. Does it necessarily follow that a certain type of man must be attracted to a certain type of woman or vice versa? Oh, yes, Doctor. It's all a matter of uh, chemicals. Oh, but then surely you know that. I've often wondered. The chemicals that go to make up one individual's character and personality can have tremendous effect upon someone else's chemicals. Sometimes they act like a magnet, drawing each to each. Sometimes the reverse, they repel each other. At other times, the moment the opposite lot of chemicals meet and collide, there's a terrific explosion. Which is precisely what will happen now, Miss Frail, unless you stop your interminable chatter. Oh, I'm so sorry, Doctor. Was I going on? No, uh, where were we? Um, are we going to see the daughter? It may be necessary. Uh, first, however, inquiries at the hotel where she stayed might yield some results. Uh, some member of the staff might have noticed something amiss. Christie's Hotel. Hmm, I'll ring up for you to see the manager. Do that, Miss Frey. Uh, come in. Yes, sir. No, come in, Lily. Uh, this is Lily, Dr. Morell, who looks after the floor where Miss Forbes had her bedroom. Uh, this is Dr. Morell and Miss Frey. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Miss. Good afternoon, Lily. I sent for you because Dr. Morell would like to ask you about the time when Miss Forbes was staying here. Two weeks ago. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Doctor, I remember it very well. Miss Forbes had the same room she always had when she stayed here with Sir Clifford and Lady Forbes? That's right, sir, she did. We are an old established hotel, Dr. Morell, and uh, some of our guests like to have the same accommodation they've had before. Uh, this was the first time that Miss Forbes has stayed here alone? Yes, Doctor. In fact, we have one or two little jokes about it while she was here. Well, that is... What were you going to say, Lily? It's this, miss. I was remembering that it was only the first two nights that she was in a joking mood. Friday night and the Saturday night. When I saw her before she went out to the party. I saw her again next evening and something seemed to have upset her. Uh, did you obtain any idea what was wrong? I asked her, but she said it was nothing. She looked as if she hadn't slept a wink all night, poor thing. And she'd been so happy and full of life when she arrived. I felt ever so sorry. Uh, come in. You uh, sent for me, sir? Uh, yes, Henry. Uh, this is Dr. Morell and Miss Prale. Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Uh, Henry was the floor waiter, Dr. Morell, who served Miss Forbes. And you used to take breakfast to Miss Forbes in her room every morning? That's right, sir. Can you remember any incident about Miss Forbes which impressed you at the time? Well, only that on uh, Sunday morning she was in a very upset state and she ate no breakfast at all. Miss Forbes had appeared perfectly normal the previous morning? Oh, definitely. Well, like she always was when she stayed with Sir Clifford and Lady Forbes. It was the same thing the next morning, Monday. 
the day she went away. All she had was a cup of tea, right off her food she was. She offered no explanation for her sudden lack of appetite? No, sir. I did ask her if there was uh, anything wrong with the food or anything, but she said it wasn't that. And she wouldn't say what it really was? No, miss. No, thank you, Henry. And will you tell Parks to come up? Yes, sir. Uh, Parks, the hotel porter, he might prove more talkative. Well, it isn't how talkative, but what they say that matters. <coughs> Quite. No, uh, Parks won't be long. It was about 12 o'clock. I was outside the hotel and I saw Miss Forbes come out. I asked her if she wanted a taxi. She shook her head and hurried across the street. I saw her stop and talk to a man in a doorway. He looked as if he'd been waiting for her. Did you get a clear impression of him? Oh, I'd know him again, if that's what you mean. He wasn't wearing a hat, and he'd got very fair hair. He was thick-set and middle-aged. I saw Miss Forbes give him something. It uh, well, looked like a big envelope, and he gave her something in return. He walked away very quickly, though he had a bit of a limp. Miss Forbes hurried back across the street to the hotel. She was putting something in her handbag. It slipped to the pavement and I saw it was a small envelope. I was going to pick it up for her, but she was too quick. She snatched it up and dashed past me. Uh, later on, I got a taxi for her to take her to the station. She wasn't looking at all well, I thought, and, well, she barely spoke to me. You have been most helpful. Now, thank you, Parks. Oh, anything I can do to help, sir. Good afternoon, sir. No. Good afternoon, miss. Good afternoon. Well, that's about it, Dr. Morell. We're very grateful to you. I can't think of anyone else in the hotel who could give you any more information. I was hoping someone might have seen Miss Forbes when she came back from the party. Well, it might have been useful, especially if she'd been accompanied by someone whose description we could have obtained. Miss Forbes must have come in when the night porter happened to be absent. But surely it would have been her boyfriend, Count, whatever his name is, who brought her back. It may not have been. Well, I fear I put you to a great deal of trouble. Not a bit, Dr. Morell. I do hope that this sad business will soon be cleared up. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. Oh, good evening, Sir Clifford. Well, the doctor's in the laboratory. Will you hold on, please? Dr. Morell? Ah, uh, Miss Frail, uh, just turn off that thing, would you? Uh, yes, uh, doctor. Uh, take that test tube and put it on the rack. Uh, but, but doctor... Uh, don't drop it. No, doctor. I fancy I'm arriving somewhere in determining the difference between blood groups in relation to the criminal tendencies of the person involved. Yes, I'm sure you are. Uh, my belief that any emotional upheaval must give rise to certain glandular reactions, which in their turn might have an effect upon the blood, undoubtedly has some basis. Doctor, Sir Clifford Ford and on the telephone. And if this effect remains apparent in the blood for a length of time afterwards, the conclusion to be drawn... Uh, Sir Clifford Ford... Why didn't you tell me instead of standing there gossiping? Yes, Dr. Morell. I'll speak to him. Dr. Morell here, Sir Clifford. When did you discover this? 250 pounds. I understand. Yes, yes, just as soon as I have any news. Goodbye. Well, what is it, Dr. Morell? What's he found out? On the morning before his daughter left to return home, she cashed a cheque at her London bank for 250 pounds. 250 pounds? That's a lot of money. Miss Forbes happened to be somewhat well off. Oh, how lovely. There appears to be no trace of the cash. You mean it's all gone? Whatever on? Murder. What? Murder of the soul, Miss Frail. Blackmail. <laughs> Sure as eggs. It's what I suspected from the start. You mean that was the blackmailer whom Miss Forbes met outside the hotel? The hotel porter's description fits. The fair hair, the limp. That was all I needed. That'll be criminal records on the line, if you'll excuse me. Inspector Hood here. He's identified him, has he? I was pretty sure. Send the dossier up. Is it the man you think? Yes, Miss Frail. Harry Fox. The last time I got him four years. He can't have been out more than six months. Like most criminals, he continues to pursue the same nefarious trade, even though he knows that by so doing, he must inevitably encompass his own destruction. Well, that's your theory, I know, Dr. Morell. It is more than a theory, my dear Inspector. Here is demonstrable proof. Oh, that poor girl. But how could she have got caught up with someone so horrible? What is this man's mode of operation? Oh, the old stuff. 
works with an accomplice, puts some story over on his victim. I know Harry Fox, and I can just see in my mind how he'd work it in this case. It would be at the party this girl was at. He'd be a guest there. Oh, he'd wriggle his way in, trust him. He'd size up the situation, pick the right moment. Miss Forbes? Yes? Sorry to barge in like this, but, uh, Count Alvaro... What is it? Has anything... It's all right, Miss Forbes. Something's happened. He's been taken ill. It's uh, nothing. Raymond, where is he? Really, it's nothing serious, but uh, he's gone back to his flat. He's not hurt. Just a fainting attack, that's all. He sent me to ask if you could come along. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, has he got a doctor? No one's on the way. I'm a friend, by the way. I'm staying with Raymond. Let's hurry. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I've got a taxi waiting. We are nearly there, Miss Forbes. Poor Raymond. He seemed perfectly all right while we were dancing. Oh, then he went to get a drink. Oh, it was a sudden attack that hit him, but uh, not to worry. I expect the doctor will be there now. Oh, I do hope he's all right. Here we are. Thank you. I'll just pay the driver. I've got a key. Uh, come on in, Miss Forbes. Come on in. There you are, Dr. Morell. That's about how it would go. He gets her into the flat, dopes her drink or coffee, and when she wakes up, she finds she's been photographed, looking as if she's been on one of those wild parties or in Harry Fox's amorous embrace. Mm, quite a vivid imagination of yours, Inspector. Well, I tell you, I know how Fox works. Oh, absolutely sick. The victim has to buy back the photographs. Takes quite a time because Mr. Fox naturally hangs on to the negatives. Why was she such a fool as to pay up? That's what I can't understand. Well, I mean, if I was ever caught like that... Well, not that I ever should be, of course. Of course not. I'm sure you would. But if I ever was, I know what I'd do. What? This might be quite interesting, Miss Frail. I'd beat the brute over the head with my umbrella or, or whatever I could lay my hands on. I believe you would. Too. Then I'd send for the police. Or for you, Dr. Morell. You flatter me. You may rest assured that a blackmailer would never single you out for his attention. Mm, just let him try. Now, the point is, you see, he invariably picks his victim very carefully. Someone he knows will react to the situation the way he wants. Who will think of the scandal, the shame, exposure, and who panics. He's a real psychologist. Are you, Dr. Morell? Uh, to a certain extent, he can weigh up the character of the person he proposes to enmesh in his toils. As in the case of this girl, he played upon her youthful inexperience, and in particular, upon the fact that she was engaged to be married. Her prospective husband would be horrified by what had befallen her. Poor thing. What are we going to do, Dr. Morell? Meet Mr. Fox. Oh, I think that might be arranged. Come in. The Harry Fox dossier, Inspector. Oh, thanks. There you are, Dr. Morell. Have a glance at it. There's also some stuff on a character he's worked with in the past, uh, with the photos. Right. Oh, by the way, Sergeant, I'd like to have a chat with dear Harry. Where's he hang out of an evening? Harry Fox, Inspector. Oh, I think I know where you can pick him up. He's at the Grey Parrot Club every evening. I think he'll be long, Inspector Hood. Why, don't you like this joint? It gives me the creeps. <laughs> Not to worry. Dr. Morell will join us any minute. You'll feel safe enough then. Oh, I feel safe enough with you. I wonder why he left us on the way here from Scotland Yard. To make a phone call, he said. Well, he could have done that from your office. Perhaps it's someone he doesn't want us to know about. A secret girlfriend, Miss Frail? Inspector Hood, as if he'd... Oh... Oh, you were fooling, weren't you? <laughs> He's got some card up his sleeve, I shouldn't wonder. Well, what happens when this fox creature does turn up? Rather depends on what ideas Dr. Morell's got. Hello, Great Parrot Club. Palm here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'll tell him as soon as he comes in. So long. Well, I wonder who that phone call was for. This is the sort of place where customers leave or collect messages. Mm, looked a bit sinister to me. Fox will never recognize you in this murky lighting. That barman was on to me the moment I came in. They can smell a flatty a mile off. Oh, here's Dr. Morell. Oh, Miss Frail's been quite worried about you, Doctor. 
Did you make your phone call all right? You should know, Miss Frail. What do you mean? As if I could read your mind. Ah, that tune. I do know who you phoned. But you are improving, Miss Frail. But I, I don't... What is this going on? A mental telepathy act? Miss Frail will now expound. Don't you remember, Inspector? The phone call the barman took. That radio was playing Beautiful Dreamer. La, 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 I la, la. got it. You were humming that, Dr. Morell, so you must have heard it when you phoned the bar. <laughs> How clever of you. Oh, we plodding flatties get by now and again. But why did you phone, Dr. Morell? Did you... What is it? Fox, you just come in. The fair hair and the limp. Yes, but he doesn't look at all horrible. Well, if he did, he'd hardly get very far in his chosen trade. No, I suppose not. Well, what do we do now? Dr. Morell, it's for you to say. He's the barman speaking to him. I think we might be getting along, Inspector. Hey, but, but what about him? I merely wanted to be sure he received the message. We can be waiting for him. Come along, Miss Frey. I don't follow it at all. Then just follow me. I think we'd better, Inspector. Dr. Morell always knows where he's going. Here we are, Dr. Morell. Is this the address? My message to Fox will bring him back here. What now? If your driver will proceed a little further along, we can await Fox's arrival. All right, Sergeant. Stop here. Turn round on the other side of the road, between the street lamps. Yes, Inspector. We shouldn't have to wait long. coming along now. Maybe him. It's slowing up outside the house. It's him all right. He's getting out of the taxi. Let him go in. What's on the clock, driver? Three bob, sir. All right. Ah, thank you, sir. Funny about that firm message. Wonder what's in the wind. What do you want? What do you mean? You phoned a message to me at the club. Come in. He's gone in, Doctor. I think this is the moment for us to make a move. Come on, Sergeant. Here's Dr. Morell, matron. Oh, how do you do, Doctor? Good morning. Uh, this is Miss Frail, my secretary. Good how morning, do you do, matron. Miss Frail. Yeah, the doctor has driven down from London for a few words with my daughter. Yes, doctor. Well, if you'll come this way. I'm afraid Miss Forbes hasn't had a very good night, but she's a bit more relaxed now. Miss Frail and I'll wait here. Dr. Morell, Miss Forbes. He's come to see you. So long as he doesn't ask me any questions, I can't tell him anything. Well, I'll leave you, doctor. If you would. Miss Forbes. Yes, Doctor? I have something for you. I fancy it might interest you. What is it? You ought to show some curiosity towards it. It's cost you a considerable amount of money and might have cost you more. What do you mean? It's the negative of a photograph. Oh. Oh, you know. You've suffered an unhappy experience for which you have nothing to reproach yourself. How did you discover it? I had a conversation with a fair-haired individual who was responsible for trapping you into going to his accomplice's flat where you expected Count Alvaro was awaiting you. Yes. Yes, that's how it's happened. Yeah. He, he was called away suddenly during the party. Then this man arrived and he said I was to go with him to the flat where Raymond had been taken ill. He said he was a friend of his. I believed him. And, and then there was the coffee he gave me. And I don't remember anything until I woke up and found myself there. It was horrible. Horrible. And then the photograph... You may dismiss it all. It's finished. Just relax. Relax. It's been like some dreadful nightmare. Try to think of it in that way. A nightmare. And now you're awake and it's done with. Now you can sleep again, feeling secure and safe. I can't believe it's over. Relax and sleep once more. No one can harm you. No one. Relax. 
Really? How is she, Dr. Morell? How did she take it? I left her sleeping. Oh, how can we ever thank you? If it hadn't been for you, I don't know what we should have done. You may rest assured that there is no cause for any further anxiety. I told you, Dr. Morell, we'll put everything right. There remains one minor matter to be attended to, uh, which I didn't mention to her. What's that? Well, I thought it best to leave it to you to discuss with your daughter. Uh, it concerns Count Raymond Alvaro. You mean he knows? I fear so. But why? Why did you have to tell him... Uh, how did you get in touch with him? Don't you think your daughter would have wanted him to know anyway? Well, she couldn't not tell him, surely. No, only I must confess I was hoping he'd never have to know. Why should it matter if he really loved her? Yes, yes, but, but you see you've spoken to him, Dr. Morell. I have. But where is he? Is he back in London? He's in London and he knows everything. What did he say? How did he react? That's what you will have to explain to your daughter. You mean he... He was never in love with her. It was her money which attracted him. How dare you say that? Well, because it happens to be true. You see, he makes a practice of attaching himself to impressionable young women of means and with access to wealth. Count Raymond Alvaro, or whatever he calls himself, uh, found such a victim in your daughter. But, but it can't be true. How do you know this? I had the dubious pleasure of seeing his picture in a dossier at Scotland Yard. It was the same man in the snapshot you gave me with your daughter. You never mentioned anything about that to me. Oh, didn't I, Miss Frail? The man with her in the snapshot. Yes, I remember uh, now. You observed he looked attractive in a dark Spanish way. Mm. And he hasn't been back to Spain at all? A discreet inquiry I made at his flat in Cavendish Street revealed that he was, in fact, there. Uh, but the letters he wrote? Uh, they were easily arranged. Inspector Hood and I called at his flat last night. I was there too, wasn't I, Dr. Morell? Accompanied inevitably by Miss Frail. We apprehended him and his accomplice, a man named Fox. The ensuing interview proved eminently satisfactory for us. I just can't believe it. I knew it. It must be an awful shock. You mean he isn't Count Raymond Alvaro at all? Uh, one of many aliases he uses. His real name doesn't matter. All that need concern you is that he is a professional blackmailer. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Moreau, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frey. The artists taking part were... Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Inspector Hood, Philip Ray, Sir Clifford Forbes, Douglas Young, Lady Forbes, Madeline Christie, Cynthia Forbes, Ruth Trancer, Hotel Waiter, Hayden Jones, Hotel Manager, Humphrey Morton, Lily the Maid, Beryl Calder, Matron, Molly Rankin, Harry Fox, and other parts, Ian Sadler. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. You're invited every Saturday over most of these NBC stations to a one-hour concert by the renowned NBC Symphony. Tomorrow's symphony performance features Metropolitan Opera star Helen Trouble as guest soloist. For tomorrow's broadcast, the orchestra will be under the baton of the widely acclaimed conductor, Wilfred Pelletier. For the world's great music, hear the NBC Symphony, brought to you tomorrow and every Saturday. Transcribed. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell brings you mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes, who's calling? Mr. John Blake? Well, is this a matter of business? That's fine, Mr. Blake. I'll just call him. Archie, I'm not here. Tell him I'm up in the plant room with the orchids. Uh, I was going to call him to the phone, but he's up in the plant room with his orchids. Uh, what sort of a case is this, sir? Really? Really, is that so? Is it a man or a woman? Oh, I understand perfectly. It's a man. Well, at least that's something different. Yes, sir. Very urgent. I understand. And I assure you, Mr. Wolf will be here waiting for you. The fee? Oh, um, shall we say about, uh, oh, a thousand? I will not see any kind until after dinner. Fritz is having mountain quail on toast. Yes, Mr. Blake. Come at once. What were you saying, boss? 
And found you, Archie, nothing but business. All the time. What's the problem? I don't know. And at a thousand dollars, considering our bank balance, I'll help him poison his great grandmother. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's that renowned genius who is the bulkiest, bulkiest, most ponderous, and most brilliant detective in the world. Yes, none other than that chair-borne mass of unpredictable intellect, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> What we chose to refer to as the case of the hasty will began, of course, with an urgent phone call from the mysterious John Blake. At the moment, Nero Wolfe was seated in his chair, which was specially built for his 300 pounds, and I was giving him a lecture on the importance of money. Archie, that will do. I'm not interested. You will be when you learn you can make no more purchases of beer and Skittles. you passed up two cinch cases now. Each would have meant a healthy fee. Let us hope this Mr. Blake has a nice, fat problem that will take us days to solve. Archie! Yes, sir? Answer the door. Good evening. I'm John Blake. Oh, yes, yes. Come in, Mr. Blake. You have no idea how welcome you are. Archie, show Mr. Blake in and close the door. That draft is unbearable. Uh, this way, sir. Mr. Wolf doesn't care for anything resembling air. Oh, I'm Archie Goodwin. Hey, good evening, Mr. Blake. Mr. Wolf, uh, I have a little business for you. Now, uh, before you say anything, I know you're not a lawyer. I'm not a member of the bar, let us say, Mr. Blake. Of course. What kind of business, Mr. Blake? I have here a short will, which uh, I have typewritten myself. I, I haven't signed it yet. Uh, also, I have here a sealed envelope containing a letter which I want you to be prepared to deliver to the addressee. A will and a letter. Very well. Yes. Uh, do you know who I am? Seems that I've certainly seen you before. Same here. I just can't place you. Well, I'm John Blake, president of the Plymouth Building and Loan. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture many times. You have a staff of the best attorneys in the city, Mr. Blake, and this is most assuredly the business of attorney. Perhaps. But in this particular instance, I wanted an individual who had no interest in me, uh, nor uh, previous knowledge of my affairs. I see. Also, I wanted the person who was, well, uh, shall we say, not too well fixed. Well, you certainly could Archie. Have... Imagine Mr. Wolf being in need of money. Just why can't your attorneys handle this? You'll know in a moment. But when I leave here, I want you to forget the whole thing, uh, for the time being. Indeed. You have said it. Here's the will. You may read it. Archie. January 25, 1951. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marcia Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. So, simple enough, isn't it? That's all. Now, the pen, please, and I'll sign it. Now, then, you sign as witness, Mr. Goodwin. You retain the will, Mr. Wolfe, and the envelope here, which is addressed to Hillary Brake, my brother, who is now living in this city. Your brother? He's just recently returned from 25 years in Australia. Though Hillary has written me several times, I have not favored him. We've, uh, we've been estranged these many years over, uh, well, a certain unpleasant situation which this enclosed letter will clear up. Are you in fear of your life, Mr. Blake? Murder? No, Mr. Wolfe. There was a time, yes, but, uh, well, not now. You will know what to do with the will and the letter, though, when the time arrives. Now, uh, as to your fee, you said uh, a thousand? Well, we usually receive... A thousand uh, will do. Well, here's a check, all made out. If you're thinking of suicide, Mr. Blake, we must warn you. If you don't care to go through with this, please say so. I'm not planning on suicide, I assure you. We have taken the job, Mr. Blake. <clears throat> and good evening, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for your kind indulgence. Well, that's the simplest little thousand we ever made. I believe, Mr. Goodwin, you're going to be quite surprised. I want you to get acquainted with John Blake's secretary. You will more than earn this thousand, young man. Archie! 
Archie, is that you? Yes, boss. What time is it? It is 6 p.m. The clock is right in front of your eyes. I'm thinking, Archie, it's very interesting. Very. An entire day has passed since the visit from John Blake. Did you learn anything from Blake's secretary? I did. He left his office late yesterday, she said. His daughter Anita is quite upset because he didn't come home. Check his club? Yup. I didn't talk to the daughter, but I learned that she's engaged to a young fellow named Wilbur Martin. She told the secretary that her father had been acting strangely of late, a bit morose. And what does the daughter feel has happened? Anita's afraid he's been kidnapped. You haven't met nor talked to any other than the secretary? Not yet. And so far, no one's called the police. Good. We must, for the time being, prevent that. What did you learn of Blake's brother from Australia? He's been here only a year. They've met only once or twice since his return. The secretary thinks the breakup was because of their love for the same woman. Hillary became very wealthy in Australia. Very well, Archie. It is time for you to visit Miss Anita Blake at her home. I'd love to, boss. She's a mighty purty gal. Fooey. Archie, you can do me a great service. Anything. Be sure to close it tightly as you leave. Close what? The coal chute, of course. I'm awfully glad you could come, Uncle Hillary. Wilbur seemed to think you might know something about Father's disappearance. No, I don't know, Wilbur. Uh, I'm just as nonplussed as you are. When did you see your brother last? Oh, it's been four or five months. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. What do you two think has become of him? Surely you know his recent actions better than I. Well, at first I thought he'd been kidnapped. Now I'm afraid it's suicide. Oh, I say, really now... Have you been putting such ideas into our head, young man? On the other hand, could have been murder. Indeed. Well, I suggest that the police be called. The hospitals, the morgue, every place. Have you thought of doing that, young man? I was going to. Oh, really? Then what are you stalling about? I'll just step into the library and do it myself. Oh, it can't be, Wilbur. It just can't be. Miss Blake, there's a Mr. Goodwin to see your father. Oh, I'll see him. Thank you, Miss Blake. I'm Archie Goodwin. This is my fiancé, Mr. Wilbur Martin. Mr. Martin? How do you do? What is it you want, Mr. Goodwin? Is your father here, Miss Blake? Why, no. No, he isn't. What is your business, Mr. Goodwin? Why do you want to see Mr. Blake? As a matter of fact, I don't really want to see Mr. Blake because I don't think he's here. I came to see Miss Blake. Just who are you? I'm a detective. Police? Private investigator with Nero Wolfe. John Blake has disappeared. I know you're trying to keep it out of the press because you think he's been kidnapped. We have called the police. Oh, what do you think has happened to my father? I think he's dead. Oh, dear. What, why do you think that? Yes. Just what do you know, Mr. Goodwin? Oh, Anita, I want to ask you a few questions. I think it's advisable Mr. Blake. To... Yes? I, I thought you were done for. That is... I don't think I... Uh... This chap is a detective. I'm sorry about this, Mr. Blake, but curiosity got the better of me. I hope I haven't wrecked things. What are you talking about? You remember the agreement. What agreement? Mr. Goodwin, do you know who you're talking to? Why, yes, John Blake. Oh, no, Mr. Goodwin. This is my uncle Hillary, my father's brother. Hillary? Hillary Blake? Yes, my father's twin brother. John and Hillary were twins? Of course. That's news to me. I didn't know that. What did you know about him? Well, now that I look at him, now that I can recall his speech, there is a difference. And now, why do you think John Blake is dead? I've just come from police headquarters. You mean he's been murdered? No. From all indications, he's committed suicide. Suicide? Are you sure? Poor father. Oh, I was afraid of this. This morning, a hat and an overcoat were found on the East River docks near Pier 9. In the coat was a typewritten copy of a will made yesterday. The hat bears the initials J.B. There was a will? Yes, Could you identify the hat and coat, Miss Blake? Well, yes, of course. Very well. Come in, Sergeant. This is Sergeant Hanlon. Miss Blake, do you recognize this coat and hat? Yes. Oh, yes, I do. They they were fathers. Wilbur. Suicide. I can't understand it. But the hat and coat are not conclusive evidence. What about the will found in the pocket? Show them the will, Sergeant. Read it, Miss. You read it, Wilbur. Hmm. To my daughter, Anita Blake, I do hereby bequeath all my property, personal and real, 
including the portrait painting of her mother, my dear deceased wife, Marsha Blake. This will supersedes any and all instruments previously drawn. But no signature. I have the original. Here you are. Where did you get this? Notice the signature of the witness? Archie Goodwin. You witnessed his signature? In Nero Wolfe's office. But Mr. Blake had his own attorneys. Nevertheless, he came to Mr. Wolfe to take care of the will. If we hadn't recognized him from his photos in the papers, I wouldn't have witnessed the signature. Anita, is this your father's handwriting? Yes. Yes, it's his, all right. But there still isn't proof that he's dead, nor that he committed suicide. No corpus delecti. And the body may not be found for days. But this evidence we have here certainly indicates that a body will be found eventually. Maybe not, Mr. Goodwin. It's possible they could have... What were you going to say? Nothing. Miss Blake, in a way, I blame myself for your father's death. How do you mean? I had a sort of premonition. It's obvious now why he came to Nero Wolf. Is it? He wanted someone who didn't know him personally. His own attorneys would have been able to see through his plan and prevent his carrying it out. But he made a will. Why did he draw this new one? Yes, that's what I don't understand. Well, I still am not convinced that he committed suicide. Mr. Blake, here is a letter he asked to be delivered to you. Oh, well, now. Perhaps it will shed some light on the problem. What does it say, Uncle? Uh, Joe says, uh, hmm, Hillary, 25 years now, jealousy and bitterness have kept us apart. I know why you stayed in Australia all these years. I know you loved Marcia. She was rightfully yours. But I loved her too, and I couldn't go on without her. I know you've despised us both, and I've uh, pretended to despise you. I had to pretend, because I lied to Marcia. I told her you were engaged to marry a woman in Sydney. Marcia was innocent. I was to blame. Uh, when Marcia died last year and you wrote that you were coming back, I knew then that your resentment had faded, but I didn't answer you, and I've kept away from you because I couldn't face you. I've told you all this because things have happened, which you will learn soon enough, that have decided me to close my book and write Finney. I uh, have made a new will, leaving everything I possess to Anita. Anita is young, Hillary, and I beg you to watch after her as though she were your own, which, but for my selfishness, she might well have been. Forgive me, Hillary. Hmm, well, this, uh, this certainly indicates suicide. But what does he mean by things have happened? That, Miss Blake, is the motive for which we'll just have to wait. Yes, for that and the body. Well, boss, up here in the conservatory a bit early, aren't you? How are the orchids? Well, it's a nice sunny morning. Even though it is around zero outside, the sun is fine for them. And behold, Archie. Huh? What is it? The dendrobium scorostel. The b- b- Yes, indeed. What about it? Showing two buds. Most encouraging. Indeed, indeed so. Boss, I can't take the steam heat here. Tell me, this painting of Marcia Blake, is it large? It hangs over the Blake mantle, about three by four feet. I find it most intriguing that John Blake should mention the painting in so short a will. And Hillary, does he seem to offer any suggestion on this problem? He has very little to say. Wilbur has definite ideas, and he's in there pitching all the time. He has a rather unpleasant way about him, though. You have talked with Inspector Kramer? I have. And asked Miss Anita and Hillary to meet you at the morgue to look at the body? Right. And I left Wilbur out of this gathering. This body is practically unidentifiable, huh? In Kramer's opinion, it is. After you're finished down there, I'd like to have a chat with this Wilbur Martin. Okay, but you'll get nothing out of him. I've tried. Archie, you're becoming so conceited. Soon I fear I'll have to... uh... Fire you. If it were summer, I would forthwith resign. Run along and close our coal chute behind you. Morning, Inspector Kramer. Up early. Yeah, Goodwin. I just love to come down to this morgue. This is Miss Anita Blake and her uncle Hillary Blake. How do you do? do? Good Good morning, Mr. Goodwin. I hope you don't object too much to my joining the proceedings. Oh, I know, Wilbur. I suppose it's all right. Please, Mr. Goodwin, what's happened? There's a body here, rather badly bruised and cut and in a bad condition, but I think you should look at it. Oh, I... I'm sorry, Miss Blake, but I'm afraid it's necessary. Very well. 
I'll be all right. No, I'd like to come along. Oh, yes, Wilbur, you must. Well, come on, this way. Say, Miss Blake. Oh. Now get hold of yourself, Anita. Please, you must. Yes. Yes, that's Father. And you, Mr. Blake? It's certainly hard to say. It looks as though it might be John. Was there no means of identification on the body? No jewelry or... Father never wore any jewelry. There was nothing but this suit here. Nothing in the pockets. Yes. That's Father's suit, all right. I know. Oh, Why? Why did he do it? Come along now. That's all for today. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Wilbur Martin. Ah, oh, yes. How do you do, Mr. Martin? Sit down. Thank you, sir. No, no, no. Take the red leather chair. That's right. So glad you could come. Archie, uh, Beavers. Uh, tell me, Mr. Martin, you saw the body? I did. Whether it was John Blake or not, I'm not sure. But Anita feels positive enough. You are skeptical about the suicide theory, huh? Well, yes, I am. Are you trying to cast suspicion on someone else? No. He thinks he was murdered. I do, but not by you, of course. Certainly not. <laughs> but who would know that John came here, signed the will, and gave us the letter to his brother? He must have contemplated suicide, don't you think? Are you positive it was John Blake who signed the will? Hmm, how interesting. You think it was his brother Hillary who came here, posing as John, huh? It could have been. But the man was quite gray and had no Australian accent. Hillary could have dropped the accent for a short while and grayed his hair, and they were twins. It's so enlightening, Mr. Martin. Do go on. After he left you here, he could have killed John and thrown him in the river. And left his overcoat and hat on the wharf. And why would Hillary kill John? Well, I... Well, there may have been several reasons. Maybe because of Marsha. Well, uh, there's several reasons. Tell me, did John Blake object to your engagement to Anita? No, why should he? I don't know. <laughs> Amelia asked. Anita Blake identified her father's handwriting. She identified the body. You still believe it's murder? Maybe she only thought it was his handwriting. You had best be careful, Wilbur. In trying to make a murder out of this, you might place yourself in a most unhappy position. I checked the letter and the will with papers at John's office, and the handwriting is identical, in my opinion. Maybe Hillary is clever at forgery. Maybe. Did you have the experts check the writing? Not yet. Then how can you tell unless you had a bona fide sample of Hillary's writing? Hmm... I take it that you found a sample of Hillary's writing? Some letters from Hillary to John? Yes. I found a package of them. In John's desk at his home. That, Wilbur, is most encouraging. Here they are. Several of them tied together. Some written in 1928 and a couple in 1948. Now, we'll tell you something. We never thought John committed suicide either. You... You didn't? No. And before you go, Wilbur, write your name here on this pad... Very well. Thank you so much. I hope we shall see you tomorrow. Well, I'm surprised, Inspector Kramer, to see you out in such inclement weather. I like the cold spells. Sit in the red leather chair. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Good. Have your experts finished checking the will and the letter? Yep. But not all through with a package of Hillary's old letters that Wilbur found. What's the verdict? If this is forgery, it's the cleverest bit of forgery we've ever come across. My men say the will and the letter you received appear identical with the specimens from John's office. Indeed, the will and the letter then do seem to have been written by John Blake. Yes. But on the other hand, and this is unusual, by comparing this letter from John with a letter Hillary wrote from Australia in 1948, we found characteristics in both men's letters which were definitely similar. Then, Inspector, you feel that Hillary might have written the letter and signed the will. That it was Hillary who came to my office? It's a tough thing to prove, but I think that's being on the right track. Inspector, what about the rest of the package of letters I got from Wilbur Martin? They're still working on those down at headquarters. Uh, what about young Wilbur? Well, so far, can't see much in him to worry about, but it's a bit early. Archie, 
Phone out to the Blake Mansion and tell Wilbur Martin that we've uncovered the whole thing. And if Wilbur's in on it, he'll be gone before you get there. We can pick him up later. Okay. I'll let you know about the rest of Hillary's letters. Good. We won't phone out there until you're finished. And I'll call you as soon as possible. Archie, I want you to look into the affairs of the Plymouth Building and Loan Company. See what you can learn about the actual uh, stability of the company. Okay. Boss, please put on your muffler and overcoat and open a window. A candle couldn't burn in this place. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm on my way. What is it, Wilbur? What's happened? I came out as soon as I heard. Well, what's happened? Speak up, man. You haven't heard? You don't know? No, what? Look, look at these headlines. Plymouth Building and Loan Crashes. Wilbur, what does this mean? It means your father embezzled the funds of the company and he has gone to the wall. What? Yes, closed the doors. Oh, no, Wilbur, no. I can't believe such a thing. I'm sorry, Anita, but there it is in black and white. Then this is the motive for John's suicide. Why? Why? Because he, well, he knew he was caught. What else? He could have put the money back, couldn't he? Yes, but maybe he lost it by trying to make more to cover up the shortage. I don't think he lost it. You don't? No. Oh, nonsense. He must have. Else why would he kill himself? Maybe he didn't kill himself. Oh, this is awful. Oh, please, please, Anita. You mustn't worry. I know this is very embarrassing for you, but it isn't your fault. Now, let me take you away for a while. We can run down to Mexico until this blows over. You won't take her to Mexico. You won't take her anyplace. Just what do you mean? What's wrong with you, Wilbur? You're acting stupid. You... Your father may have fleeced the company, but I don't believe he lost the money. Wilbur. He hid the money, and your uncle Hillary found the hiding place, and he set up the suicide to cover your father's murder. Hillary killed him. Oh, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why, this doesn't make sense. I have all the money I need. Yes, you have now. Pack your things, Anita. I'll phone the airport for reservations. You can't leave at a time like this. You won't leave this room. Do you know what can be done to you for threatening people with firearms? I'll call the police. You don't need to call the police. I've just talked to that detective, Mr. Goodwin. He's on his way here. The police have uncovered everything. I know you killed John, and you have the money. Wilbur, you're out of your mind. I know what I'm talking about. Get out of here. Get out. I won't leave. No one will leave till Goodwin comes. Ah, Archie, come in, Miss Bake. Mr. Blake, Mr. Martin, glad you were all able to accept my invitation. You too, Inspector Kramer. Yeah, I know how glad you are I could be here, Wolf. Please be seated, folks. Hillary was going to Mexico on the next plane and taking Anita with him. Mexico? John Blake stole the money from the company, but Hillary found out about it and killed him. Mr. Wolf, this is utter nonsense. Mr. Blake, Inspector Kramer's handwriting experts have examined the will and the letter left with me. They have also checked them with your recent letters from Australia. Indeed. And your letters from Australia show a definite resemblance, having the same characteristics as the letter and the will you give me. You you mean you think that I signed the will and wrote the letter? Definitely. Ridiculous. But there's something else. The will mentions a painting of Marcia Blake, Anita's mother. Archie, where is that painting? Did you bring it? It's here. Uh, bring it in here, Sergeant. Uh, just a moment. I hope you don't mind, Miss Blake. What are you doing to it? Tearing off the paper backing of the picture. Yes, and there you are. There's the reason for the whole thing. Bonds. Pasted in the back. Thousands of dollars in negotiable bonds. Then Hillary did know about the money. He killed John for all this. He had a neat order the picture to be credited for shipping. I did no such thing. Nevertheless, you didn't kill John Blake. Certainly he did. Look at these two letters from Hillary Blake to John here in America. What are the dates? September and November 1948. Those were supposedly Hillary's most recent letters to John. And look at these letters, June and July 1928. Notice any difference? All are signed by Hillary, but the ones dated 1928 are not at all like the ones written in 1948. Not the least similarity. The ones dated 1928 were written by Hillary. But those dated 1948 were written by John. By John? How do you mean? Carry on, Inspector. You're under arrest, Mr. Blake. Not for murder, because there's been no murder. You're under arrest on a charge of embezzlement. Embezzlement? Oh, but how And you... you, Miss Blake, are under arrest as an accomplice. What? I don't understand. Mr. Wolf. Wilbur, you yourself unearthed the old 1928 letters, rarely written by Hillary from Australia. The recent letters are not in the same handwriting. They were poorly forged by John in 1948. Furthermore, we checked with Australia and learned that Hillary Blake died in Sydney ten years ago. And this man here is really John Blake posing as Hillary to escape the penalty for looting the company. Anita, 
It just doesn't seem possible. Anita knew all about it, and they might have gotten away with it if they hadn't come to us, Archie. What a fantastic plan. I'm giving you back your thousand dollars, Mr. Blake, but I'm afraid it won't do either of you much good now. Thank you so much, Inspector Kramer, for dropping in. Well, boss, that was a clever bit of deduction. You really think so, Archie? It was quite a blunder for so clever a man as John Blake. Why did he make the mistake of coming to us? There are many holes in the plans of the criminal mind. He must have forgotten about the 1928 letters or he would have destroyed them. And he underestimated Wilbur's intelligence. And I thought he was a dope too, but he was half right. He really slipped up on the body in the morgue. Inspector Gramer was most kind to cooperate with us in that little act. Anita was too eager to identify the first body she saw. And the painting... You sensed there was more importance attached to it than the fact that it was a work of art. True. Some beer, please, Archie. Coming up, boss? Now, that brings me to an unpleasant subject. What's that? You were talking about resigning. Are you still in that frame of mind? Resigning? When did I say anything like that? Then you're going to be content with conditions as they are? Why, of course. What are you saying? And you don't mind it a bit as long as this dreadful weather continues? Well, not at all. I... Don't mind what? Going in and out of the house through the coal chute. (laughs) (laughs) You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by John Edison was based on the characters created by Rex Stout and produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In tonight's cast were Harry Bartell as Archie Goodwin and Victor Rodman, Louise Arthur, Hal Gerard, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Disappearing Diamonds. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Mysteries on the air, bringing you Phil Cole, the famous girl detective, and another opportunity to win your share of the $50,000 in cash prizes to be awarded the winners in this thrilling contest of skill. Every week at this same time over this same station, your Phil Cole Radio Tube dealer brings you transcribed the exciting Phil Cole Radio Mystery Contest. Big weekly prizes, gigantic grand prizes. You may win just by answering the easy contest questions you will find in Philco Radio Mystery Book Number 2. If you haven't your copy yet, get it right away from your Philco Radio Tube dealer. In a moment, Philco, the girl detective, is going to solve the double X mystery. As you listen to the broadcast, those of you who already have Philco Mystery Book Number 2, open it to pages 6 and 7. Then you can follow the action on the diagram. Listen carefully. Take notes. Be prepared to win your share of the $50,000 in cash prizes. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the double X mystery. Our scene opens in Dr. Raymond's hospital, a famous private establishment. It is 11 o'clock in the morning, and Phil Coe and Tom Taylor are visiting a friend named Mrs. Brown, who is gravely ill. Phil has been ringing for the orderly, but receiving no response, she has gone into the corridor to look for him. I'm awfully sorry, miss, but uh, I didn't hear the buzzer. I'm Jad, the orderly. Oh. I hope you don't mind, miss, but I was having a smoke and a glance at the morning paper. Oh, that's all right, Jad. I was reading about last night's jewel robbery. 
That there diamond's quite valuable, ain't it? Yes, that was a famous faith diamond. Well, there was a lot of shooting, and the police think they winged the bloke what stole it, but he got away. You know, coincidence is a funny thing. What do you mean, Judd? Oh, well, of course, it don't mean nothing. But a chap named Oliver came to the hospital early this morning with a bullet in his leg. Said he shot himself while cleaning his gun. Oliver's at the end of the corridor in room double X. Did Dr. Raymond report it to the police? Oh, yes. They were here to investigate. But there's nothing to it. Smythe, that's Mr. Oliver's valet, he witnessed the accident. They're English chaps. Oh. You know, an hospital gives a bloke a chance to study human nature. Now, take this chap Oliver, for instance. He gave me quite a chuckle this morning. <laughs> Is it so funny to have a bullet in your leg? Uh, oh, no, it wasn't that. But when his nurse, Miss Rapp, was getting him ready for the operating room so they could probe for the bullet, she asked him to take out his false teeth. You know, Miss, uh, they make you take your dental plates out when you're taking an anesthetic. Oh, yes, of course. Well, Oliver kicked up an awful fuss. Said the nurse would lose the false teeth or maybe break them. But he finally took them out and put them in the pocket of his hospital gown. Most irregular. Oh, hello, Phil. Where have you been? Oh, uh, I've just been talking to Judd. Uh, Mrs. Brown's asleep, so we'd better not go back. Yes. Hello, here comes Miss Rapp. She's the nurse of the Englishman I was telling you about, Mr. Oliver. Excuse me. Aren't you Miss Phyllis Coe, the detective? Yes, Miss Rapp. Something awfully strange has happened in room double X. What has happened? My patient, Mr. Oliver, was operated on a little while ago. Before they brought him back, I went into the room to get it ready and found everything all torn up. What do you mean by torn up? They'd been asleep in the room. Before I could finish getting things in order, Mr. Oliver arrived. Even in his drowsy condition from the anesthetic, he noticed the state of the room and became very excited. Was anything missing? Only a pair of silver-backed military brushes. I'm worried, Miss Coe. Won't you come into room double X and have a look around? All right, I'll come. Is double X this next room on the right? No, that's room Z. The one right beyond it is double X. Come right away, will you please? Of course. And Judd. Uh, yes, miss. You better go down and report this to Dr. Raymond. Yeah, right away, miss. And I was planning a lovely luncheon for just the two of us. Hey, what's going on out here? Sounds like... like Tom Taylor. Tom Hurry! The... <laughs> you look like a spook in that hospital gown. I feel like little Eva. <laughs> well, Phil, this is Harry Jewett. We were classmates at dear old Montague. Harry, this is Phyllis Cole, who loves me dearly. Oh, I move that last be stricken from the record. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Jewett? How do you do? You remember Harry? He was one of the best guards that ever broke a setter's neck. Well, what about you, Tom? You did some mean tackling yourself. <laughs> you don't look very ill, Mr. Jewett. No, Miss Cole, but I suppose my address will be room Z for the next week or so. My doctor insisted that I come here for observation. The old football injury to my stomach is kicking up again. Well, when did you get here, invalid? Just this morning. This is the first time I've had my door open. Just opened it. But the guy next door has been raising cane, and I heard footsteps scurrying around here in the corridor, corridor, so I thought I'd open the door and investigate. What's it all about? No, you tell him, Tom. I'll go next door to Double X and do a little investigating myself. All right. If you need any help, give a war hoop. All right. May I step in, Miss Rapp? Oh, just a minute, Miss Cole. Mr. Oliver, this is Miss Cole. I don't care who she is. Why don't people leave me alone? I just want to ask a few questions, Mr. Oliver. Who is this other gentleman? I am Smythe, Mr. Oliver's valet. Oh, of course. Uh, Mr. Oliver, have you any idea who ransacked your room? No, I have not. In my opinion, your military brushes were stolen by a common sneak thief. Uh, Miss Rapp, I think you should notify the police. Police? <coughs> now, look here. I'm a sick man. Mr. Oliver, I'm only trying to help Get you. out, both of you, and stay out. And tell that clumsy orderly to stay out, too. I brought Smythe over here to take care of me. I won't need anyone else. I'm sorry I disturbed you. Come, Miss Rapp. Harry and I were just about to dash in there with a the Marine. By the sound of that guy, I thought sure he'd have a stroke. I'm afraid Mr. Oliver doesn't like visitors. Oh, Miss Cole, uh, Dr. Raymond will be up shortly. Oh, thank you, Judd. Uh, now, let me get these four rooms straight. Mrs. Brown, whom we came to visit, is in room X, and Mr. Oliver is directly across from her in room double X. You, Mr. Jewett, occupy room Z next to Mr. Oliver... And in room Y, across from Z... Oh, is... You wouldn't be interested in that room, Miss Coe. It's empty. Mm, I'll go in and have a look anyway. I'll be right out. Well, tell me, Harry, what have you been doing all these years since graduation? Oh, one thing or another. Nothing to boast about. How about yourself? Oh, you've never read any of my deathless novels? Say, look, she's found the brushes. Well, where were they, Phil? On the floor of the closet. Look here. The silverbacks have been pried off. To me, as though the thief was searching for something little, something that might have been hidden in the brushes. You're right, Tom. Uh, now, Judd, tell me, have you been in that empty room this morning? Uh, uh, me? Oh, no, Miss Coe. Oh, come now, Judd. Why don't you tell the truth? What do you mean, Mr. Jewett? Well, I was sitting in my room about an hour ago, and I saw Judd come out of room Y. 
It's directly across the hall, so naturally I would see it. He's right, miss. I was in there. But just to sneak a smoke and look at the morning paper. But I didn't take them this, those precious notes, so help me. Here comes Dr. Raymond, Miss Coe. Oh, well, how do you do, Dr. Raymond? Oh, good morning, Miss Coe. It's been a long time since I've had the pleasure of giving medical testimony in one of your court cases. Now, what is all this about silver brushes being stolen from Mr. Oliver? Apparently, Doctor, there's been a sneak thief in the hospital. I found the brushes in this empty room, and I think the police should be notified. Oh, but, Miss Coe, if this gets into the papers... I... Well, all right, Dr. Raymond. Well, Tom, it looks as though our luncheon plans haven't been spoiled after all. Oh, incredible. Well, Harry, we'll drop in tomorrow. Okay, Tom. It's swell seeing you again. And nice meeting you, Miss Cole. Thank you, Mr. Jewett. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'll return to my bed of pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You two haven't met. Uh, Dr. Raymond, this is Mr. Taylor. Well, Hello, Dr. Good, Mr. Taylor. If you want me for anything, Dr. Raymond, call me at home. I'm in the book. Uh, thank you, Miss Cole. I shall. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, sir. Well, Tom, what do you make of it? Think Judd stole the brushes? No, I think he probably dropped them when he was moving the furniture in room double X. Saw they were broken and hid them in the closet so he wouldn't be punished. What do you think? I think we haven't heard the last of it. Come on, let's find that heavenly food you've been boasting about. <laughs> Phyllis Cole speaking. Uh, this is Dr. Raymond at the hospital. Oh, yes, doctor. Uh, my patient, Mr. Oliver, he's been murdered. What? Uh, yes, strangled to death. Judd, the orderly, I, f I found him just a moment ago, about 1.30, about two hours after you left. Was anything stolen? Uh, no, but the body is lying on the floor. The bandage is brutally torn from his leg. The bedclothes are all torn apart. Had he been dead long when Judd discovered him? No, only a few minutes. Uh, please come over, Miss Cole. All right, Dr. Raymond. I'll be right over. Dr. Raymond says you discovered the body. Please tell me everything. There ain't much else to tell, Miss Coe. I brought him his broth and found him here, like this. Where was Smythe, his valet? He went out to do some errands, he said. He saw me in the hall and asked me to get the broth. Well, uh, did you do it immediately? Yes, Dr. Raymond. That is, I, I ordered it immediately. It was one o'clock, and since the other patients has their lunches at 12.30, I had to phone down for it. It came up about 1.20. What did you do in the meantime? I went around to the other rooms and collected the trays. Were the patients all in their rooms? Oh, yes, miss. The other end of the hall is all surgical cases confined to bed. Your friend, Mr. Jewett, is the only man on this floor who can walk about. But he was lying down complaining of stomach pains. He couldn't eat a bit of his lunch. He didn't touch his tray. Thank you, Judd. Uh, please leave the room now and send Mr. Jewett in. Yes, Miss Cole. Well, have you learned anything? Oh, just a moment, Dr. Raymond. I want to question the nurse. Uh, Miss Rapp, where were you between 1 and 1.30? I was across the hall in room X with your friend, Mrs. Brown. I stayed with her while her special nurse was at lunch. Oh, thank you. You may go. Oh, how careless of me, Doctor. I don't suppose I should have asked Mr. Jewett to come in here. Do you think moving around would seriously affect his condition? Well, to be truthful, I really don't quite know what his trouble is. He arrived this morning and asked to be admitted. He has no physician of his own, and uh, we're waiting for our stomach specialist to arrive. I see. Well, come in. Hello, Mr. Jewett. Miss Cole, this is a frightful thing. Oh, here, here, now. Don't excite yourself. Here, you'd better sit down. Oh, I'm all right, Dr. Raymond. Matter of fact, I'm thinking of leaving the hospital. I ate a tremendous lunch with no ill effects. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Did Tom come back with you, Miss Cole? No, but I left word where I was going. Uh, Dr. Raymond. Yes? I'm going to ask you to do something very unusual and quite unpleasant. Well? I want you to remove Mr. Oliver's false teeth from his mouth. Well, why, Miss Coe, I... Well, I suppose I can do it. Yeah, let me look. Yes, the plate comes out rather easily. Well, here you are. I thought so. This plate is an odd shape. There's a sizable bulge in it. I press this catch. The plate swings open on a tiny gold hinge. And here's what the thief was looking for when he murdered Oliver. A diamond? Yes, Doctor. The faith diamond. Now you'll have to call the police. And then they can arrest you, Mr. Jewett, for murder. Sorry, but I won't be here. I'll take charge of that diamond, Miss Cole. Come on, hand it over. Oh. Jewett, put on that gun. Stay where you are, both of you. Don't move, Jewett, or I'll drill you. Smythe! Drop that gun, Jewett. Oh, good work, Smythe. Thank you, Doctor. And now, Miss Cole, I'll take that stone. Just a minute. Mr. Smythe, will you kindly explain yourself? Well, Oliver and I came all the way from England to get the faith diamond. As for Mr. Jewett... 
as you Americans would say, he's been muscling in on our racket. And now, Miss Cole, if you haven't thrown that stone onto the bed within five seconds, I shall be forced to mess things up a trifle with this little pop gun. One, two, three. <coughs> Tom! Why, Tom, have you forgotten that tackling from behind is illegal? I'm afraid you've knocked Smythe out. Phil, are you all right? Oh, yes, I'm quick. Can you stop it? Stop it! Come on, folks. Oh, oh. <laughs> he's jumped through the window. Take care of Phil, Doctor. I'll run down. No need to, Taylor. This is the top floor. Why do you suppose Phil Cole, the girl detective, suspected Harry Jewett? He really trapped himself, you know. Do you know why? You heard everything that happened, everything that was said. With the help of your Philco Mystery Book Number 2, it should be easy for you to answer the contest question. You must have this Philco Mystery Book to enter the contest. So go and get yours free right away from your Philco Radio Tube dealer. Nothing to buy, of course. It's yours just for the asking. Listen to Philco Radio Mysteries every week at this time over this same station. Enter every weekly contest. It will be fun. It will be exciting. Think of it, $50,000 in cash prizes for the winners. Doesn't that sound worth working for? Be wise and have your Philco radio tube dealer check up on your radio tube. Maybe you need new Philco tubes so that you won't miss any detail of any Philco mystery program. Don't let weak or noisy tubes spoil your opportunity to win. Names of major winners in this week's contest will be broadcast as soon as possible on a following Philco mystery program. Next week, Phil Cole, the beautiful girl detective, is going to solve the mystery of the last will and testament. It's about a strange crime that happened up at Lonely Winds, the estate of rich old Daniel Bosworth. I'll be seeing you up there at this time over this station. Just a moment, Suspense, with Ann Southern. Billy, turn that radio down. How can we play bridge? Okay, Mom. I like the auto light show, but not so loud. Whose deal is it, May? Mine, Mary. My husband, Ed, always listens, too. When he's home on Thursdays, our house sounds just like his service station. I know what you mean. Tonight's probably spark plug night. You'd think the announcer with his commercials would be enough, but no. It's switch to auto light resistor spark plug. I know. Batteries and ignition systems. <laughs> well, Dora, what are you dreaming about? Oh, Autolite? You mean the show with Ann Southern? Oh, Mary, tell Billy to turn up the radio again. I wouldn't miss the Billy, phone. Billy, will you turn the radio up? Your Aunt Dora Yes, went... ma'am. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Ann Southern in Anton Leader's production of Beware the Quiet Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Minnesota with a crisp lemon. Okay, coming right up. Say, 
Your name, Margie? Yeah. How'd you know? You generally come in here with a heavy set guy, black wavy hair, wears a dye big diamond? Yeah. Yeah, he was in a while ago. Said that Teddy he'd be late, but for you to be sure and wait for him. But I can't wait. I gotta get home to my I gotta get home. How late do you say it be? Oh, about an hour. Oh, for crying out loud. Okay, give me some nickels. Yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Hello? Mr. Banning, please. Yeah, Mr. Arthur Banning. <laughs> Arthur? Margie. Uh, I- I'm going to be late for supper. Yeah, uh, I ran into a girl I used to know at Lincoln High. She wants me to have a drink with her. Yeah. And say, will you pick up some hamburger on the way home and start the potatoes? I'll be there as quick as I can. Bye. Here's your drink. Well, here's mud in your eye. Um, uh, there's a young fellow down the end of the bar who wants to buy you one. No, thanks. Well, it looks like a nice guy. That tall blonde fellow over by the mirror? None other. And you got a whole lot to kill. Is he... He isn't drunk, is he? No, nah, he's had a few, but he always carries it good. I might help pass the time. Say, what's it to you anyway? Five bucks. I said, I'd sure appreciate it. He offered you five bucks to get me to have a drink with him? Yeah. <laughs> he is kind of good looking. Well, okay. Sure, what the heck, I'll have a drink with him. Okay, so you're married. Nothing wrong with having a drink together, so what? I figure what your old man don't know won't hurt it. I said I'd have a drink with you. If you've got any other ideas, I'll buy my own. Oh, no, don't get me wrong, honey. I spotted you as a good kid the minute you ankled in here. You just like excitement, that's all. And I'm the guy that can dish it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, I'm a private eye. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, like you hear about on the radio. Gee, what a break for me. You just stick around me, honey, and you'll get plenty of excitement. Yeah, I'll bet. You know, you take this new client of mine now. Bet you anything he makes our headlines tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Ten to one, or you'll murder his wife. Oh, yes, sure. He hired me to find out if his wife's been stepping out. I felt kind of sorry for the guy. He probably doesn't have the money to take her out himself. He's a bank teller at Second National. Bank teller? Bank teller? My... What's his name? Uh Uh-uh, honey. No, no, that that stuff's confidential. Matter of fact, I'm not supposed to talk about cases at all. Oh, go on. I won't tell anybody. Well, no, you don't look like the kind of babe that blabs everything she knows. How about that drink, huh? Sure. Hey, Charlie, two of you, huh? In the works. You know, he, he sort of gave me the creeps, this guy. Just sat there eating his lunch, calm as you please, and all the time figuring how to kill his wife. How'd you know what he was figuring? Well, for one thing, he didn't want evidence for a divorce. He sort of looked at me funny and said, I just want to know, that's all. If Margie is stepping out, I'll take care of it my own way. Margie? Yeah, yeah, that's his wife's name, Margie. Uh, hey, what's the matter? Uh, nothing. N- nothing at all. Hey, you don't look so good. Maybe you drank the last one too fast. No, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm just naturally pale, that's all. Y- you were saying about this client? You figure he's going to murder his wife? Oh, sure, sure. It's in her back. Either that or suicide. Suicide? But he's more the type for murder. Oh, one of those big, brutal guys. Sort of, sort of mean looking, huh? no. <laughs> Quiet, mousy. Kind doesn't have much to say. Those are the guys you gotta watch. But why? Because they never let you know what they're really thinking. Not until it's too late. They don't? You know, most guys, when they find their wives stepping, will raise cane. Maybe they'll even get a divorce, but they don't get sore enough to murder. <laughs> yeah. But these quiet fellas, you know, they put the little woman on a pedestal. You wouldn't catch them out with other women, not in a million years. And when they discover their one and only has been kicking up her heels, oh, brother, watch out. Sorry. And the worst of it is, they go on acting like nothing's wrong, you see. And then all of a sudden, wango, they explode. They explode? Yeah, yeah. You know, like I always say, beware the quiet man. Like this new client of mine, for example, calm. You never met anybody calmer, but i What does bet... he look like? Oh, uh, well, he's just about average, I guess. Brown hair, getting sort of thin on the top. A little bit stoop-shouldered. 
medium height? Wear glasses? Yeah. Yeah, you know him? No. No, I, I don't know any of the boys. Excuse me. Hey, where are you going? I've got to make a phone call just to remember something. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Ralph? Margie? I can't see you this afternoon. No, I'm not sorry about you being late. But whatever you do, don't come into Charlie's place. Yeah, that's where I am now. You bet there's something wrong. There's plenty wrong. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Ann Southern in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Dora, we're down 200 on that hand. Oh, are we? It's easy to see there's no playing bridge with you girls with suspense on. So let's stop playing and switch to auto light spark plugs or whatever for the rest of the half hour, huh? Oh, Mary, I could kiss you. You're such an understanding sister-in-law, and I don't want to miss a single word. What about you, May? Dora, did you know that my husband knows Frank Martin, the auto light salesman? He does? Mm -hmm. Well, then let's listen to Mr. Martin. Right now, you can get Autolite resistor spark plugs almost anywhere in the United States. They're sensational. Why, no other spark plug will give and maintain such performance. Autolite worked with leading car and truck manufacturers, and they ignition engineered a 10,000 ohm resistor right into the Autolite spark plug that permits a wider spark gap setting and maintains it far longer than in other spark plugs. Actually, when you replace your narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you can tell the difference in your car. Oh, dear. And to think that I'll hear every word of that again from Ed when I get home. Now, here's the simple lowdown. As a result of the wide gap in the resistor spark plugs, your engine idles smoother, you have better luck with lean gas mixtures and save gas. And within established limits, you reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Yes, and today you can get the resistor spark plug from almost any of Autolite's 60,000 dealers. That's the biggest spark plug news in years. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Ann Southern as Margie in Beware the Quiet Man, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> there in the phone booth a minute after I hung up. I wasn't scared exactly, but I had to let those words sink in. Either this guy I'm talking to is crazy, or else Arthur's planning to murder me. I went back to the bar. I had to find out. Oh, beautiful. I thought you got lost. Sit down, hmm. sit down. Thanks. Now, about this fella, the one who's going to murder his boss. Oh, let's get in the shop, Doc. I want to hear about you. I don't even know your name. Did he say what made him think she was stepping out? Ah, she's supposed to belong to some bridge club. The bank told his wife's got up. But uh, friends of his saw her downtown a couple of times on a bridge date. Is that all? You know, honey, you're pretty smart. You, you, you make like you're really interested in that guy's work. Oh, but I am. You know, I had a little doll once. I thought plenty I would have married her, maybe. But only every time I, I started talking about a case, she shut me up. Never mind about your little dolls. What about this guy? <laughs> hey, you're jealous. Well, what do you know? I'm not jealous. I only want to know. It's okay, honey. It's okay. Sure, a cute little doll like you doesn't want to hear a guy spotting off about another dame. Yeah, maybe I had a few too many. I just want to hear about this bank teller. Have you met his wife, maybe? No, but he showed me a picture of her. Oh. Then you know what she looks like. Oh. <laughs> hey, what's the funny? Uh, never mind. The joke's on me. <laughs> Uh, maybe you better not have many more to drink. You're acting kind of screwy. Oh, I feel wonderful. Well, here's to you. A long life. Yeah. A long, long life. Yeah. Down the hatch. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Poor little Margie. You know, you showed me a snapshot of her in a bathing suit. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, was she stacked. As a matter of fact, uh, about your height and uh, build... 
Yeah, blonde like you, too. Was she as pretty as I am? I, I couldn't see her face. It's kind of blurred. He, oh. He's bringing me a better picture of her tomorrow. Oh, I think I'd like another drink. You know, honey, you better start taking vitamins or something. You're pale as a sheep. I said I wanted another drink. Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, say, Charlie, two more of the same, huh? Okay. Yeah, poor little Margie. You know, that's one thing I can never figure out. The cute little dolls with flirtatious eyes always pick some homely, quiet gink when it comes to settling down. And the handsome He-Man who has to beat off the dames with a club, what does he do? He marries a drab little pigeon. <laughs> Yeah, that's why we get so many axe murders, I guess. Axe murders? Only in this case, you'll use a gun. But he doesn't have a... I mean, most bank clerks don't own guns. Oh, well, this one does. Now. Uh, give me a light, will you? Yeah, sure. There you are. Hey, maybe if you lay off a booze, honey, and take a tonic or something, you'll feel better. <laughs> Look at your hands. They're trembling. How do you know he has a gun? Oh. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Why'd you tell me? Tell you what? You got a squeamish stomach. All this talk about guns and shooting. No, honey, I'm sorry. I won't say one more word about it, I promise. I'm not squeamish and I don't need vitamins. I want to know how you know this bank teller guy has a gun. All right, so I'm going to a pawn shop and buy one. Oh. You know, honey, I, I could really go for you. It's a funny thing, we never even introduced ourselves. That's something we got to do. My name's Coulson. Lem Coulson. What's yours? You mean that man bought a gun and now he's home waiting to murder his wife in cold blood? Oh, no, no. He won't do anything until he gets my report. Oh. You see, tomorrow I check with her friends to see if she's been going to Bridge Club like she's supposed to. Yeah. And I meet my client for lunch and get a picture of Marcia. Mm. And I take it around to the downtown bars to find out if she's been seen with anybody. And then I give my client the report when he gets off work. Yeah. And then? And if his suspicions are right, and they usually are... It's all over but the shooting. The shooting? Yeah. Bang, bang, honey. That's all. Bang, bang. <sighs> say, uh, what'd you say your name was? I've got to get home. <sighs> Hello, dear. Hello, Arthur. Oh, I was beginning to worry about you. Well, uh, I really couldn't help being late for dinner. I wanted to leave, but Maybelle, that's her name. You know, the girl I used to go to school with, she kept talking, yucky to yucky, and I just couldn't walk out on her in the middle of a sentence. Oh, that's all right. I didn't mind. The, the potatoes are already like you told me. Shall I... Uh... No, no. I, I'll hurry dinner. You just sit down and read the paper. Huh? Well, well thank you, dear. You all right? You, you look a little flushed. Oh, well, I'm, I'm fine. I was just rushing, that's all. Uh, be ready in a minute. Uh -huh. Did you have a hard day, darling? All usual. People are taking out more money these days than they're putting in. Yeah. Prices are awful, aren't they? Hmm. I mean, nothing happened today? Oh, a, a funny thing. Man came rushing in this morning, first thing the doors were opened. Wanted to withdraw all the money from their joint account before his wife beat him to it. Seems she was leaving him for another man. Oh, how awful. Oh, yeah. And while he was there, she appeared. You should have heard her carry on. She was a real shrew. Well, what happened? Oh, nothing. He didn't say a word. He, he was a gentleman. But I'll bet if he'd had a gun, he'd have killed her. Oh, oh well. <clears throat> Seems things like that happen all the time. Newspapers full of it. Are you mad at me, Arthur? Hmm? Are you mad at me? Am I mad at you? Why, no. Should I be? Arthur, darling, I, I've got something to confess. Well, fire away. I didn't go to Bridge Club last week. No? I thought you'd die before you gave up Bridge. Oh. Really, honey, you look awfully seedy. No, I'm fine. I, I feel fine. I, I had sort of a quarrel with Lorraine. I, I, I didn't want to tell you because you're always talking about how women can't get along with each other. Instead of going to Bridge Club, I went shopping. Instead. <laughs> fine. Only I hope you didn't go over the budget. Oh, no. That's good. I always said bridge was a waste of time. Then you're not angry about anything? Why, no. Why should I be? Oh, Arthur. What's the matter now? I don't deserve a swell husband like you. <laughs> oh, I'm not so hot. Oh, you always do the dinner dishes and bring me my breakfast in bed on Sunday morning. The only morning you have to sleep. Arthur, I'd feel terrible if anything ever happened to us. Well, what's going to happen? Suppose someday you got real mad and exploded. Exploded? 
Yeah. What if it wouldn't have got a gun and shot me dead? Oh, for heaven's sakes, Margie. Where do you get those crazy ideas? You mean, no matter how mad you got, no matter what I did to make you mad, you wouldn't shoot me dead? And Margie, you know I'd rather die than hurt one hair on your head. Oh, well, they're not suicide. Say, how many drinks did you and Maybell have? Arthur, I want you to know I'm going to change. I'm going to be a better wife from now on. I'll stay home all the time and darn your socks. You? <laughs> Darning socks. You just wait and see. I'll get up every morning and, and make your breakfast. Oh, Margie, you know you won't do any of those things. I will, too. The nonsense. Women like you never change. I will, too. I'll change right away. Tomorrow. Besides, I don't want you to. Oh, come here, baby. I want you to stay just exactly the way you are right now. Just exactly, Arthur? I love you very much. Just the way you are. Oh, Arthur. <sighs> hey, that reminds me. I made an appointment for you tomorrow at 10. You're having your picture taken. A picture? I showed a fellow that old snapshot of you today. The one we took at the beach? Oh. It was so dog-eared he couldn't see what you looked like, and I realized we didn't have a single decent picture of you at all, so but, I... But why have it taken tomorrow? Well, the studio next to the bank is having a special advertising the new 60-minute service. 60-minute service? Yeah. That way I can pick up the finished picture before I go to lunch. I don't want my picture taken. Well, now you're being silly. I won't. I won't do it. Well, honey, what's the matter? Don't touch me. I won't have my picture taken. I won't. sleeping powder and go to bed. The gun. He did buy a gun. It's all true. Every word of it's true. You never to call me here. No, no, it isn't all right. Arthur bought a gun home last night. Yes, a gun. Maybe he was keeping it for a friend. That's all he'd say. Yeah, I, I think so. Just a minute, I'll look. Well, the gun's gone. He must have taken it to work. Oh, don't you see? As soon as he finds out for sure, he'll kill... No, 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 no. I never want to hear from you again. I've got to think. I've got to think. Oh, not the door, girl. Oh, Lorraine. Well, who'd you expect, darling? Frankenstein? Aren't you going to invite me in? Well, I was just going out. Don't be silly. You're not dressed. I'm in a hurry, Lorraine. Well, I... So am I. I'm late at the beauty shop now. But I was driving past anyway, so I thought I'd drop in and give you the latest on the girls at the bridge club. Oh, well, some other day. I've... Honestly, Margie, this is choice. You know what I heard about Mrs. Dentler? You know, she's the wife of Ben Dentler, the new teller at the bank. The one from Chicago. Lorraine, if you don't mind. Oh, that's right. You haven't met her. Of course, you haven't been around lately. Well, she's kind of a pretty little thing in a plucked eyebrow sort of way. But, but it... you should hear what her husband told my husband. Lorraine, I... Of course, I promised Dad I wouldn't breathe a word. But Ryan, out loud, Lorraine. What? What brought that on? I haven't time to stand and gossip. What's wrong with you today, anyway? You're as nervous as a cat. I'm all right. Perfectly all right. But here it is. 10.30. 10.30? Good heavens, I'm a half hour late. Well, goodbye. I've got to run. Oh, darling. Be sure and read the Gazette tomorrow. They're running a story about our bridge benefit. Okay, goodbye. Pictures and everything. They didn't have time to take a new picture, but I gave them when we took the Valentine party. The one I was in? They're publishing it? Why, sure. I don't want my picture in the paper. But yours was the only flattering one in the group. The reporter picked you out right away. He seemed quite smitten. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes, he asked all about you. Of course, I told him that you didn't come to meetings very often. The Gazette doesn't use men reporters for society. Well, they do now, dear. He didn't sound much like a reporter, though. He kept calling me, honey. Tall, blonde, fast talker. Why, uh, yes. And you gave him my picture? Well, of course. What was his name? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, yes. Funny name. Mm -hmm. I think it was Cluson. 
Lem Cluson. But, Charlie, it's a matter of life and death. I've got to get a hold of Lem before noon. Well, like I said, he ain't been in. You sure he never told you where he was? No, he's come to him for some private detective office. Oh, give me some nickels, lots of nickels. i got some telephoning to do. Like me to take the agency. Do you have a man named Cluson working for you? Lem Cluson? No? Thanks. Brandon Agency? I want Mr. Cluson, Lem Cluson. Oh. Yeah, I guess I have the wrong number. Hawksaw Detective, I'm looking for a man named Lem Cluson. No, I don't want to hire you to find him. But you're the last one in the book he's got. Okay, sorry. No luck? No. I just remembered. Lem said the guy he worked for just opened up in town. Probably ain't in the phone book yet. Go on, Dick, get out of here. Frank, tell us suicide. Extreme read Ah, that fresh kid, just because I won't let him in here peddling his papers, he yells in the door. Did he say banks to yourself? He yells in here every darn day. Oh. Hey, wait, wait. Hey, you didn't finish oh. your drink, huh? Hey, Newsy. Newsy. Oh, I told you. Hey, boy. Hey, newspaper. Hey, boy. Give me a book. Boy. Read all about it. Frank, suicide. Hey, you, boy. Paper lady? Did you say suicide? Right in the Second National Bank. You want a paper? Yeah. Here. Guy's wife steps out with another joke. So the poor dope says goodbye, Marge, and pulls the trigger. Here you are, lady. Frank suicide. Read all about it. Well, well, if it isn't Margie. Get away from me, Lem Cluson. Heard you were looking for me. Well, here I am. Boy, have I got a lot to tell you. Let me alone. I want to read. Oh, that write-up's no good. Here, give it here. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Now, come on into Charlie's, and I'll give you the inside. Give me back my paper, you, you murderer. Murderer? Hey, wait a minute. Oh, I get it. You figure he bumped himself off on account of my report. <laughs> That's a screwy part. He didn't even wait for the report. I got it right here in my pocket. Take your hand off my arm. Oh, look, honey. Now, come on. You're coming into Charlie's if I have to drag you. Why don't you leave me alone? Eh, I figured you'd be so. Might spotting off the way I did in Charlie's yesterday. But how did I know who you were? Yeah, here we are. Hey, Charlie, yeah. two bourbon highs double. I don't right? want to drink should have seen my face this morning when that screwy friend of yours gave me the picture of your bridge oh, club. Oh, never mind. And there you were, as real as life and just as cute. I says to myself, why, you dumb ox, you got that little doll worried sick. And then when I read in the paper about my client giving your husband the gun to keep for fear he'll use it on himself, I think, holy cow. What did you say? And then I think, I bet she figures I planned the whole thing just to scare her. What do you mean? Oh, now, don't try to kid me, Margie. You know you figured that client of mine was your husband. That he was going to bump you off? You mean he wasn't? No, no. Your name's Banning, isn't it? Yeah. Well, my client's name was Dentler. Benjamin Dentler. <laughs> Funny thing, his wife being named Margie, too. Yeah, I never thought he'd do it anyway. Oh, I think I'd like that drink after all. Well, here's that, honey. So that's the gossip Lorraine was trying to tell me. Dentler, the teller from Chicago. You know, I've been thinking a lot about you. And Arthur you? really was keeping the gun for a friend of his. Hey, I'll tell you what, honey. I know a quiet little spot across town where we can eat, dance, anything we want. You might have told me about Dentler. It's a cute little place, baby. They got a knocked out band and what a flush. I wonder why Arthur wouldn't talk to me about it. Well, what do you say? Say? To what? Well, you and me, honey. Our date. Oh. <laughs> You're asking me to step out with you? <laughs> Why not? How about my husband? Oh, that mousy little guy. We got nothing to worry about from him. But I thought you always said, beware the quiet man. You never know what they're really thinking. But this is... No, but. If you'll pardon me, Mr. Lem Clusen, I'm going home and start his supper. <laughs> Thank you, Ann Southern, for a splendid performance. Miss Southern will be back in just a moment. Dora, I apologize. That show was better than a sick no Trump hat. Why, Mary? First thing you know, you'll be in Ed's class, quacking about Autolite resistor spark plugs like Donald Duck. Deal me a great big hand, Mary, and watch me get back that 200 we went down. You know, I must get me a set of those spark plugs. Why not? Ask Ed tomorrow to put a set of those Autolite resistor spark plugs in your car. 
Oh, well then, May, will you tell Ed I'll be over tomorrow? I certainly will. My old car is going to get Autolite resistor spark plugs, too. Yes, switching to Autolite is safe, sane, sound, sober judgment and a sure way to spark plug satisfaction. That's why everybody's switching to Autolite. Autolite means resistor spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition systems. The lifeline of your car. And now, here again is Miss Ann Southern. Hmm. I've enjoyed this appearance on Suspense very much. And as a regular Suspense listener, I'm looking forward to next week when Martha Scott stars in Crisis, a powerful study in... Suspense. Anne Southern appears by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, producers of Julia Misbehaves. Starring Walter Pigeon and Greer Garson. Tonight's suspense play was written by Toby Hall, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Martha Scott in Prices.